This world is built on looks. If ugly people have no money, they have no right to reproduce. Even money won't help the especially ugly ones to get a girlfriend. And Shen Lan is just such a man. He is so awful that he should not even dream of having a family. Shen Lan was originally an incredibly handsome man who fell in love at first sight, but after he was exposed to strong acid during an experiment, he turned into a monster so creepy that people were afraid to look at him. No girl would dare look at his face for longer than a second. Then he made the decision to become a respected man, to impress others with his noble soul. For 20 years, Shen Lan went to the most remote and war-torn countries to operate in tense day and night as a highly trained physician. Eventually, he became famous at home and abroad, was honored by the United Nations, and became an example to ordinary people. On the front line, a rocket flew into one of the Red Cross tents. In the tent, Shen Lan was performing the operation. Seeing the rocket and realizing the hopelessness of his situation, Shen Lan was finally relieved. If he could start over, he would want to live a carefree life and not deny himself anything. If heaven gave him back a pretty face, he'd use it to seduce pretty women. The missile flew into the tent where Shen Lan was, exploded, and burned everything around it. Shen Lan's spirit fell into darkness. Suddenly, he opened his eyes and found himself in bed in a spacious room. Shen Lan did not understand where he was, because he should have been torn to shreds. He walked around the room, noticed the antique robes, and assumed he had been transported back in time. Then he went to the mirror and saw his face. He could not believe that he had regained his former appearance of the incredible handsome man. Shen Lan decided that the heavens were favoring him, his wish to regain his appearance had just been fulfilled. He was now certain that a carefree life would be assured for him as well. Suddenly, he experienced a terrible headache. It was the memory of the previous owner of the body. Shen Lan had never heard of this place before. He was in Xuanwu City, Mujin County, which belonged to the Kingdom of Yu. The previous owner of this body was Shen Lan's namesake. Golden on the outside but rotten on the inside, this Shen Lan was so puny that he was unable to lift his arm, an absolute freeloader. After ten years of school, he couldn't read a thousand words, so they kicked him out. His classmates called him a dumbass and a loser. Though he had the same attractive looks, he was a complete idiot. In addition, a loser and a clingy one. He only went crazy because two years ago, he met the daughter of the Exu family. The girl was strangely ill, so they needed a son-in-law to make a wedding outfit for the seriously ill so that evil spirits and disease would retreat from her, and this idiot, disregarding the mortal danger and protests of family members, became the named son-in-law. No one expected Xu Kain Kuan to really recover from the wedding and even become even more attractive. Since then, Shen Lan led a shameful existence. In time, even the maids and ordinary workers of the Exu family began to insult and abuse their son-in-law at will. Fortunately, the younger mistress was very wise and virtuous, and she forbade the servants to treat the young man so rudely, so Shen Lan continued his luxurious life. Although they never became real spouses, for the boy to be able to see and hear Exu Qian Qian's voice was already an incredible happiness. However, half a month ago, Shen Lan became seriously ill. The youngest mistress of the Exu family sought help from many doctors, but they were all powerless. Shen Lan was growing weaker by the day, and it looked like his day had come. When the former Shen Lan died, the new one took over his body. Shen Lan was glad that he was the son-in-law of a wealthy family, though fictitious, so that a carefree life was in his hands. Suddenly footsteps were heard outside the door. Shen Lan put his ear to the door and heard voices. It was said that Shen Lan should have died long ago, and it was laughed at that he wanted to be a son-in-law in the Exu family. The girl told another, as if she saw the manager adding something to the medicine. Then the two girls decided to see if Shen Lan had given up the spirit and went into his room. But they were surprised to find a perfectly healthy son-in-law. The girls screamed in horror that Shen Lan's son-in-law was alive and immediately ran away. Shen Lan remembered what the girls had said about the poisoning 
and realized that heaven wasn't treating him very well. He didn't want to be the son-in-law of the Aksu family and wondered what could be done. Afterward, he thought there was something else on his mind. Shen Lan closed his eyes and in his subconscious saw the computer he had taken with him to Africa, on which all his data were stored. His eyes now seemed different to him. With his eyes he could scan objects, see what was inside them. He saw right through it. Now Shen Lan had the ability of an X-ray machine, but he did not understand how it happened. Did that bomb make his computer and X-ray machine move with him? Now Shen Lan could combine their abilities, scan any object, and get detailed information about it. Suddenly his wife, Kyu Chien Qian, entered the room. She said she was glad to see her husband healthy. Mistress asked Dr. Li to check on her husband. The doctor took Shen Lan's pulse and, cowering apprehensively, told Su Qian Qian that the boy was perfectly healthy. Su Qian Qian suddenly became angry, but then calmed down and let a tear flow, saying that she was no longer expecting good news. Shen Lan felt like everyone thought he was an idiot, and he couldn't see what was going on. The madam then asked the doctor to leave so that she could talk privately with her husband. As soon as the doctor closed the door behind him, Hu Chen Qian told Shen Lan that she was happy that he had recovered. Shen Lan saw that Hu Chen Qian was pretending to be an innocent sheep, and all the memories of the former owner were embellished. Could it be that she poisoned him and has come now to remove the witness? His wife told him that all these days his parents had been worried about him, coming many times to pick him up. Shen Lan realized that she wanted to chase him away. Suddenly Zhang Jin broke into the room. He told Su Qian Quan that her mentally retarded husband wouldn't understand anything if she was delicate with him. He walked over to Xu Qian Chen and kissed her, and then told Shen Lan that she was now his bride, and added to drag his ass back to the village doghouse. Shen Lan realized that he had been divorced. Su Qian Qian used to be seriously ill, and she was looking for a man to ward off trouble. Only Shen Lan, that fool, was willing to marry her, and now he was used and thrown away. Su Qian Qian sat down on the bed next to Shen Lan and told him that they were not right for each other. Shen Lan understood that he should not have stayed in this family. Shen Lan answered them that he would return home. Zhang Jin gave him two hours to get ready. As soon as they left, Shen Lan jumped out of bed and began to look at himself in the mirror. He didn't like Shu's family and with his beautiful face, only true noble women could be his targets. And then Shen Lan heard Zhang Jin saying behind the back of the room that they had to hurry. Zhu Xi's family was wooing in Suanwu County, they had high positions, and if they got married, then his marriage to Xu Qian Qian would not be such a significant event. Su Qian Qian told us that Jin Mulan, the princess of Xuanwu County, was arrogant and never came to her meetings. Zhang Jin said that the Jin Mulan family had been a powerful noble family for hundreds of years, so the marriage proposal to the princess was still a secret, and he asked Xu Qian Qian not to tell anyone about it. Shen Lan decided that the powerful and lonely girl Jin Mulan was what he needed. Shen Lan did not have time to pack, so he was kicked out of the Hu family's possession. The head of the guard also accused the boy of stealing money and disrespecting the Xu family. Shen Lan understood that he was deliberately doused in slop so that Miss Ku could marry clean. Luckily, he protected his face, because if he had been disfigured, it would have been the end. Shen Lan decided to return home. In one of the rooms of the Xu family's estate, the head of security returned to his master and said that everything was ready. Su Qian Qian asked her father if it had been done too openly. After all, it might have affected her reputation. The head of the Exu family, Kaxu Guangyin, answered her that this was the only way to make Mr. Zhang Jin happy, and he was the best option for her. By nightfall, Shen Lan had almost reached the village. But then he ran into the robbers. He knew they wouldn't let him go that easily. The robbers tied the guy up and led him to a dug hole they were going to bury him alive. And then the head of the gang came out to them and ordered them to bury Shen Lan. Shen Lan turned to past memory and remembered that the head of the gang's name was Tian Heng. 
He scanned him with his gaze and saw something in the bandit's body. Shen Hang saw the guy staring at him and asked him what was the matter. Shen Lan answered him that there was a needle in Tian Hang's body and it had to be removed because his life was in danger. He added that the needle was now in the Orda and if it reached the brain, death would be imminent. The bandit wondered how did the guy know that. Shen Hang said that it didn't sound like Shen Lan was an idiot, as many people said. Shen said he could remove the needle. Shen Hang replied that he couldn't let the guy go. He said that his family had large debts, and he was promised a lot of money for killing Shen Lan. Shen Lan instantly remembered what happened three months ago. Then he had just joined the Exu family. His father came running and made a scandal to get Shen Lan back home. As a result, the Exu family servants kicked him out the door. Shen's father must have been injured then. The previous owner of this body was truly incorrigible, falling in love with Xu Qian Qian. He did not even take care of his parents. It was as if Qian Hang had read Shen's mind and told him that he would have to find another way to stay alive. Shen remembered his family and decided that his brother and parents would not be spared either. Big Hang said that since he and Shen had no animosity, they would kill him before they buried him. The executioner swung his sword over Shen's head, and he shouted out that he would give a thousand gold pieces. The executioner immediately stopped. Shen Lan told Tian Hang that he would give him a thousand gold pieces in ten days. Qian Hang replied to Sheng that he had three days to bring him a thousand gold pieces. Shen surmised that Hang seemed to have made a deal with the Exu family to get a hundred gold pieces from them this term for killing him. In the end, he agreed. Shen and Hang ordered to let the guy go and asked for a receipt, but the bandits didn't have one. Shen Lan bloodied his finger, tore a piece of cloth from his shirt, and with blood wrote a receipt on it. The head of the gang said that if Shen did not bring the gold, he would kill his family. Hang ordered his two robbers to follow Shen. Shen Lan walked home and thought about how he could make money. And then he had an idea with which he could not only earn a thousand gold pieces, but also take revenge on the Xu family. The mugger drove the guy in his way, not letting him stop and think hard. The people of this world put the military above all else. Even the small village where Shen's family lived had a stone fort. There were about two dozen vigilants in the fortress, guarding the village. Most of the peasants lived by the river. Only the Shen family's cabin was far away in the middle of the mountainside. Because Shen's family were outsiders who had moved to the village more than a decade earlier, they were unable to blend in with the local population. At Shen Lan's house, meanwhile, his father got out of bed, coughing up blood, and wanted to go after his son again. His mother stopped him. The father then declared that if the Exu family did not return his son to him the next day, he would be crushed to death by their gate. Then Shen's younger brother, Shen Jian, came up and said that he would take a pair of crutches and bring his brother back tomorrow, and if that didn't work out, he would sacrifice himself. His leg was broken, and at that moment Shen Lan entered the house worshipping his parents. The family was very happy to see Shen Lan. Everyone cried. He apologized and said he would never go to the Exu family again. Parents noticed that their son became smarter. The younger brother asked Shen Lan if he had been kicked out of the Exu family. Shen nodded his head affirmatively. The mother said she did not want her son to stay with the cruel head of the Exu family. She told her son that as soon as he and his father earned money, he could marry again, and she suggested that he look out for the widow Liu from the village. Shen Lan replied to his parents that he was not thinking about marriage, and then offered to have his father examine him. He put his hand on his father's head and felt a fever. There was inflammation in his body. Shen Lan looked at his father with x-ray eyes and saw that his once broken ribs had misfolded. Speaking of treatment, the first step was to drain the lungs and remove the lesion. Then reduce inflammation with herbs that have an antibacterial effect. The last step is to restore vitality with tonic herbs. In this way, he could cure his father. Then Shen Lan decided to examine his brother's leg. With x-ray vision, Shen Lan saw that his brother had a fracture, 
the injury had already begun to inflame, further delay could have been a problem. The younger brother asked Shen Lan, did he think their family didn't have enough money for a dowry? Shen Jian said that when he became a cripple, he would throw himself under the wagon to blackmail its owners. Shen Lan replied to his brother that if he did not heal his leg immediately, he was dead. Did he ask his brother when he was injured? He told me that the day before yesterday, he had tried to go to Xu Castle, but the guards had thrown him out into the street, and on the way to the village he had been ambushed and had hurt his leg in the fight. Shen Lan told his brother that he would cure him. The next day, Shen Lan went to the mountain to gather medicine. It took him a whole day to find enough herbs. Back at the family home, he began boiling tissues, knives, and needles in water, lit as many candles as he could, and created a primitive operating room. Relying on his medical skills, he successfully repaired his brother's broken bones and made a puncture to drain the blood that had accumulated in his father's lungs. The family was pleasantly surprised that Shen Lan managed to cure them. After the family found out how clever and skillful Shen Lan had become, they no longer wanted to marry him off to a widow, they decided to take a broader view. The mother suggested opening a doctor's office, and once they had saved up some money, they would marry their son off to the daughter of the village headman. Shen didn't like that kind of candidate. He decided to go outside to unwind after the operation. He was met on the street by robbers who reminded him that Shen had two days left. Shen Lan returned home, and immediately his mother ran out to him, carrying a metal basin in which she offered to wash her son. Shen Lan took the dishcloth from his mother and said he would wash himself. My mother was very surprised. She tearfully asked her son what happened. After all, he used to love that his mother washed him. Shen Lan understood that this was like the former idiot Shen, and that if she thought he was used to a rich life, she might be upset. As a result, Shen Lan let his mother wash her feet. Mother was only too glad. Shen Lan promised himself that he would return all the care that the previous scum Shen owed his family. The next day, when Shen Lan and his family were eating breakfast, two robbers assigned to Shen broke into their house. He said he was running out of time and had to go make money. The mother saw the two big men and asked Shen who they were. Shen Lan replied to his mother that it was his comrades. His mother invited her son's companions to the table and offered to feed them porridge. The comrades refused, saying that they had already eaten. Shen Lan told his mother that he would go with his comrades to the city, heard that a very good teacher had arrived there. When Shen and the robbers were already leaving, his mother managed to put a chicken egg in his hand so that he would not be hungry on the way. Four hours later, on their way to Xuanwu, they met two men on the road who were arguing over lost land documents. Father and son argued that the croupier was cheating. A robber named Chayan Shizen said hello to Uncle Lei and Brother Dalu. They got to talking, they hadn't seen each other for a long time. Shizen invited them to visit. Uncle Lee answered him that they would come back the next day. Then Shizen hugged them both and told them that his father had said that they should not pay back the money that was owed to his family. Shizen chatted with his acquaintances and led them farther and farther into the woods. Then he returned, wiping the blood off his sword with a piece of cloth. Shen Lan immediately realized that Tai and Shizen killed those two. After that, Tian Shizen ordered the other robber to call his brothers to get rid of the two corpses. Shizen approached Shen and apologized for the delay, explaining that he was just meeting two old acquaintances. And the two of them continued on their way. On the way, Shen Lan asked his companion if it was true that the middle-aged man was his uncle. Qian Shizen replied that the man was a refugee and had been friends with his father for a long time, and he often babysat him as a child. Shen asked how much did Shizen's uncle owe. He replied that he owed three gold coins, which in time, together with interest, turned into 25 gold pieces. He added that the two men couldn't pay up for a long time, and yesterday they lost all their money in a gambling stall. Shizen told Shen Lan that he knew that he was just stalling, because it was impossible to earn a thousand gold pieces in a couple of days. 
Then Shen Shizen raised his sword and asked Shen how he looked at Shizen, finishing everything now and not wasting two days of his time. Shen Lan answered him that a thousand gold coins was the savings of hundreds of families over decades. For an ordinary beggar to earn that much in two days was unrealistic, but only he was not an ordinary man. He said he didn't need two days for that, today was enough. Shizen asked the guy if he was sure. Shen replied that he only needed three hours. Suanwu City is one of eight cities in Eugene County. There are 25 townships with a population of more than 250,000 people under its administration. In the city alone, there were more than 30,000 people. The walls of Xuanwu are 12 meters high and 5 kilometers long, and the soldiers patrolling the city are dressed in armor. Upon entering the city, Shen Lan immediately went to the richest shopping district and stopped in front of only one pavilion the Jinxiu Pavilion. Shen Lan said that he would not only make money here, but also take revenge on the Xu family. Like the Xu family, the Lin family of Jinxiu Pavilion was also involved in the silk and cloth business, but on a somewhat smaller scale. However, the Lin family was also known as one of the richest families in Xuanwu, and most importantly, the Lin family was a rival of the Xu family. Shen and the robber entered the pavilion, where a courtier came out to them. He asked them what business they were in. Shen Lan asked the courtier to tell his master that he wanted to make a big deal with the Lin family, which would allow him to earn at least another 5,000 gold coins a year. The courtier grinned at Shen. Then Shen Shizen told the courtier that he was from the black-robed gang and told him to call the head of the Lin family to discuss the deal. The courtier invited the gentleman to come through and wait for the head of the family. After a minute, an influential merchant of the city, the owner of the Jiangsu Pavilion, the head of the Lin family, Lin Mo, came out to them. He asked them what kind of deal they were offering him. Shen Lan told Lin Mo that he had a recipe that he could sell to the Lord for 2,000 gold pieces. But Lin Mo was not interested, and he invited his guests to leave. After that, Shen Lan put a piece of golden silk on the table and offered Lin Mo to look at it. Mr. Lin took the silk in his hands and was surprised by its golden yellow color. Shen Lan told Lin Mo that the Exu family became rich because their silk was so yellow that it was provided exclusively for the king. Shen suggested to Lin Mo that he wonder what would happen when he delivered this perfect golden yellow silk to the king's weaving house. And he added that the Exu family was swept away by Mr. Lin to the dustbin of history, and his family would become the richest in the city. Lin Mo asked Shen Lang, how could he be sure that it was he who created this dye and not picked up this scrap of silk somewhere? Shen replied that he had brought all the necessary materials with him, and he would make the right dye in two hours. Lin Mo agreed and gave Shen Lang a backyard to make dye there and allowed him to use the help of servants. And if Shen Lan would make the dye on the spot, Lin Mo promised to make a deal with him. For the deal, Shen Lan offered a bargain amount of 2,000 gold coins. Mr. Lin replied that he would not bargain. After that, Shen Lan proceeded to make the dye. Last night when Shen was brewing medicine, he also prepared gold dye. In fact, the process was simple. Sophora japonica buds are steamed until they get yellow juice, then they add white vitriol and continue to steep, then the yellow color turns into a noble bright golden yellow color, so the dye is ready. The yellow dye made from gardenia in this world is weak and not bright enough. From the one Shen Lan made, it differs like heaven and earth. Two and a half hours later, Shen returned to Lin Mo showed him a dyed gold flap, and demanded 2,000 gold coins. Mr. Lin couldn't believe it was true. Lin Mo gave Sheng the money, and in exchange he received the formula. Lin Mo himself took the formula to test it, and within an hour the golden dye was made. Shen Lan was about to return home when suddenly the Xu family appeared. Mr. Xu accused Shen of stealing and selling their secret formula. Shen Lan at first did not understand how they got into Lin Mo's chambers, but then guessed that it was set up by Master Lin. Lin Mo apologized to Shen and explained that his son was studying at the Tannen Military Academy, and the Xu family's son-in-law, 
Xiang Jin was a city guard commander and his father was the county governor, so he could not do otherwise. Shen Lan figured out that the Lin family had decided to sell him out in exchange for his son's exam. The head of the Exu family continued to accuse Shen Lan of stealing the formula, on which they spent a lot of money. Su Chien Kan, sobbing, said that if Sheng didn't have enough money, he could have asked her for it instead of arranging such a thing. Suddenly, three officials of the city of Xuanwu also arrived. Mr. Xu told them that Shen Lan had stolen their secret formula and asked them to do something about it. Su Chien Kin suddenly asked her father to give her ex-husband another chance and then suggested that Shen confess to stealing their secret dyed formula. She said that if he confessed that he did it because he didn't want to break up with her, they wouldn't prosecute him, but that he was just confused. Shen Lan pondered that if he confessed, perhaps the Exu family really wouldn't immediately harm him, but Shen Lan could not be underestimated. Shen Lan asked the Exu family what proof they had that his gold dye was stolen. Mr. Xu replied to Sheng that he was an uneducated scum, so he could not learn the dyed formula, and his family had been working in silk production for a long time, perfecting the yellow dye. Shen Lan said that in other words, the Exu family had no proof of his guilt. Then Shen turned to the officials and said that if he could make a gold dye even better than the one he had just made, wouldn't the truth be revealed? Su Qian Qian told Sheng he might have stolen the formula, but he wasn't a professional, so he just needed to get a little more serious, and it might well turn out better than now. Shen Lan replied that in that case, they would not take yellow, but purple. Now in this world, it was harder to paint not yellow, but purple. The purple dye must be extracted from dyed sea snails and shells, and it takes 300 such shells to produce one gram of dye. At present, the great dynasty of Yan has not yet mastered the method of extracting purple from seashells and snails, and uses a mixture of red and blue dyes. Therefore, the result of such a dye is terrible. It not only turns out dull and uneven coloring, but also fades very easily. So purple became an insurmountably difficult task in this world. Shen Lan said that he would only use an inexpensive and easy way to make purple dye, and the Xu family could use all their power. Then he asked if Xu's family could dare to do such a thing. Su Qian Qian told Sheng, if he makes the best purple dye, her family will have nothing to say. Shen Lan said that in this case, the head of the Xu family would have to apologize to him. Xu's head replied to Shen that he had to win first, and then they would talk. Shen Lan announced that in six hours they would measure up and asked the officials who had arrived to be witnesses. Then Shen Lan went into the backyard again and began to process the litmus lichen he had prepared in advance. After grinding it and boiling it with ash and urine, you could get the brightest purple color. But Shen Lan wasn't just going to make purple dye, he wanted to make something that exceeded the perception of people of this era. Six hours later, the sides came out to determine the winner. The Exu family introduced their bright purple dye. Everyone in attendance remarked on its beauty. Tzu Chien Qian handed the recipe book to the Xuanwu city archivist, Wang Liang, who decided that Shen Lan had indeed stolen the recipe from them. Without waiting for Shen to present his dye, the officials ordered the guards to seize him. The guards had already run to the backyard when suddenly Shen Lan appeared and shouted to them to stop. Then he pulled out a piece of cloth dyed with his brilliant and vivid purple dye. Everyone gathered immediately noticed that Shen's dye was brighter. Shen Lan asked the head of the Exu family, was this dye not enough to win? Immediately, he reached into his sinus for another strip of cloth. Shen Lan pulled out a rainbow silk, which with its radiance dazzled everyone gathered. He created this dazzling silk by segmented dyeing in all the colors of the rainbow. The officials marveled at the beauty of the silk and declared that it was indeed a masterpiece. After that, Shen Lan turned to the archivist for justice. The archivist asked the head of the Exu family if the rainbow dye had been stolen from them. Mr. Xu replied that no and immediately hurried away. Su Qian Qian apologized to Shen Lan and left as well. Shen Lan thanked the archivist for his work, 
while knowing in advance that he had a grudge against Zhang Jin. Three years ago, Shen Lan was playing with flowers in the forest when a bear hunt began nearby, and the hunters unknowingly chased the bear right at him. The bear was about to attack Shen Lan when suddenly the rider thrust her spear into the beast's head and killed it. Later, Shen Lan, digging in his memory, learned that the rider was Jin Mulan, the daughter of Count Xuanwu. Jin Mulan sent a man to heal Shen Lan, who bruised his head, and visited him because he was injured because she was leading that hunting party. At the time, Wang, who was a distant relative of the Count's family, had just passed his exam and was deeply in love with Jin Mulan. To win her favor, he personally came to teach Shen Lan. But during the time he taught, he never saw Jin Mulan, and his intention to get close to her failed. He often cursed Zhang Jin during his training, so Shen Lan dared to take such a risk. But right now the archivist didn't have much sympathy for him. The officials and the archivist left. Shen Lan also went out into the street, where he immediately ran into Xu Qian Can's carriage, who told him from the window that she had underestimated him earlier. She said she didn't know he could paint, and asked why he hadn't told her about it before. He answered her nothing, then she offered him back as a servant for ten gold coins a month. She suggested that if he would pass on the recipes for purple and rainbow colors, she would prepare the best dye house for him, so that he could devote himself to the craft and become a better craftsman. Su Xian Qian said that if he loved her, that way, he could help her. Her carriage drove away further, and suddenly she shouted for Shen Lan not to forget that he owed Chan Hang a thousand gold pieces. Shen wondered how did she know that. Chu Qian Qian shouted that if her family didn't see the recipes, Shen should have realized what would happen. Shizen reminded Shen Lan that he had about 14 hours until sundown, and after sundown, they would come to his house to demand payment. Shen now understood that the Exu family and the Black Robe Gang might strike at his family in order to force him to hand over the dye recipes to them. And even if he agreed to serve the Xu family all his life, Shen understood that his parents would not be left alone. It was necessary to solve this problem once and for all. Carriages accompanied by horsemen and military chariots rode down the street of Xuanwu City. Ra Jin returned to inspect the troops. And then Shen Lan saw a rider, the daughter of Count Jin Mulan. Shen decided that she had already saved him once, so he decided to do it again. As Jin Mulan in red armor on horseback rode down the street, Shen Lan suddenly stepped out of the crowd and stood right in the way of the Count's daughter. Jin Mulan's horse hit Shen Lan, and the guy fell to the ground. The rider stopped the horse and hurried to the wounded man. The Count's daughter approached Shen, looked at his handsome face, and thought he seemed familiar to her. Jin Mulan commanded that Shen be taken to the Count's residence and given medical attention. This was the very moment that would decide the fate of Shen Lan. The Count's servants took the boy to the residence. The earldom was not in the city, but in a castle estate, about ten kilometers from Xuanwu. The Exu family was very wealthy but their house could not be compared to the residence of an earl. After all, the Count's family, the Jin family, had been a noble family for centuries, and the land they were granted already exceeded 5,000 square kilometers. In the meeting room of Count Xuanwu's residence, Jin Mulan greeted her parents. Count Xuanwu Jin Xiao asked his daughter how the review went. The daughter replied to the Count that the review went well. It did not disgrace the Jin clan. The Count said that if her older brother was even a third like Jin Mulan, Suenwu County would not be afraid of being left without an heir. Jin Mulan asked her father, was the situation very bad? The Count replied that the state of Yu was setting a new political course and greatly reducing the military power of the nobility by depriving them of their fiefdoms. People were in turmoil, old and new forces were shifting, the situation was unstable, and now the county was in a precarious position. Jin Mulan asked her father not to worry and promised that while she was in Xuanwu, the county would not collapse. She promised that she would never marry, stay at home to help her brother and protect the legacy of the Jin family. The count complained that his son Jin Nukong had no ability at all. A servant entered the hall and told the earl that he had a visitor. 
The count inquired who had come to see him. The servant replied that it was a lad the mistress had picked up. He said he had urgent business with the earl, and then the servant added that it was about the lady's marriage. The count ordered the boy to be brought to him. A moment later, Shen Lan was already standing in front of the count, the countess, and their daughter. Shen Lan paid his respects to the count. The count asked Shen what his business was with his daughter's marriage, and to himself he noted that the guy had a handsome face. Shen Lan stated that he knew that Zhu's clan was going to propose. Zhu Hongli wants to marry Jin Mulin. The count's family was dumbfounded by this news. The Zhu family is one of the most influential in the state of Yu. Not only the emperor's relatives, but also the provincial governor and the commander-in-chief of the southern regions also come from the Zhu family. The count asked Shen Lan how he had this information, which even he himself did not know. Shen Lan replied that he had previously been the ex Zhu family's adopted son-in-law. Su Chin Qian and her new fiancé of Zhang Jin unceremoniously discussed the matter thinking him an idiot. The count suddenly thought the name Shen Lan was familiar. The servant told the count that Shen Lan had stolen the Su family property and molested a woman, so he was expelled from the family. Now the count considered Shen Lan a bum with a handsome face who was a member of a wealthy family. But still, the count wanted to confirm the authenticity of Shen Lan's words. The Count ordered several groups of men to be sent immediately to scout the official roads and if they found any of the Zhu family to inform him at once. The servant ran off to do his bidding after his master's words. Then the Count turned to Shen Lan and said that he treated him well, and if what he told the Count was true, the Count promised to reward him generously. The Count asked what Shen Lan wanted for such important information. The Count was willing to give Shen whatever he wanted. Shen Lan understood that it was cool that the Count had promised a big reward before the case was verified. In other words, once Shen Lan said a word, they would not dare touch him again. He could even cause them quite a bit of trouble. However, he did not just want to destroy the three families. Shen Lan asked the Count to allow him to stay at the residence and give him such an assignment. Of course, Shen Lan did not want to work. He only wanted the opportunity to get close to Jin Mulin. As long as he could stay in the Count's house, he had the opportunity to find a way to get close to the girl, then attract the goddess with his performance, and finally marry her. The Count announced that from then on, Shen Lan would follow the hair of the princely house and study. The Earl added that Shen Lan's parents had spoiled him, but his earldom would not do so and would make sure to hone his talent well. Suddenly, a servant ran into the hall. He stated that he had bad news for the Count. Zhu Lin, commander-in-chief of the Southern Zhu clan, arrived in Nujing City last night and was already on his way to Xuanwu. The Count and his family were surprised by this news. Shen Lan didn't even think that the Zhu family people could move so fast. Now he needed time to prove himself, but Shen Lan had little time. Four or six hours remained before his goddess Jin Mulin would be given to another. But Shen Lan was not going to give his goddess to anyone. In his residence office, Count Xuanmu was pacing from side to side, worried about the secret visit of Commander-in-Chief Zhu Lin. The Count stated that he had figured out Zhu Lin's plan to take them by surprise and not give them, the Jin family, a chance to disagree. In his opinion, they were trying to destroy the foundations of the county and deprive them of military aid. The countess asked her husband if they could refuse. The count replied that the Zhu family was huge. If they refused, it would be the same as quarreling with them, and the king himself might have been behind this marriage proposal. Jim Yulin picked up a dagger and told her father that she could mutilate herself. With a shout, the Earl snatched the dagger from his daughter and said he had to protect the family's age-old heritage, but first he had to protect his own daughter. The Count added that even if his daughter mutilated herself, the Zhu family would still ask for her hand. Jim Mulin said that the Zhu family would not ask for her hand unless she married right away and brought her husband into the family home. The Count told his daughter that Zhu Hongsu had a brilliant future ahead of him, that he was the perfect son-in-law. As a father, he could not sacrifice her happiness for the benefit of the family, so the Count asked his daughter to think again. 
Jane Mullen fell on her knees in front of her father and said that the opportunity to contribute to the family was the greatest happiness for her. And after her parents died, her younger brother would not be able to keep her ancestral heritage, so she declared that she would never marry outside the family. After his daughter's owls, the Count took a brush and wrote the names of his daughter's chosen ones on a scroll. Then he handed the scroll to his servant and told his daughter that he had to find the best candidate for Jin Mulan in such a short time. All the people he listed in the scroll were excellent, so he suggested that his daughter choose someone herself. The Count told the servant Jin Zhang to find these five as soon as possible. And then Shen Lan turned to Count and Mrs. Jin Mulan and asked them if he could take part in the rivalry. He approached Jin Mulan and confessed to her that he wanted to marry her. The Count did not tolerate such a prank and called Shen a brat. But then the Countess reassured her husband, telling him that she had heard that Shen Lan was mentally retarded and was still a child, so they should not have stooped to his level. The Count exhaled and ordered the servants to give the boy ten gold coins and escort him home, and the next day ordered to send someone to take Shen Lan to the residence to study. Jin Mulan, looking at Shen Lan with wide open eyes, asked him, was he the second fool? Shen Lan did not understand who was the other fool. Why did Jin Mulan call him that? It turned out that Shen Lan had the nickname the second fool in the village. Just because there was another big fool, and the two were friends, so they became a duo of fools. And the name that Jin Mulan learned about when confronted by Shen Lan was the second fool. Since then, the girl has looked upon him as a child, and recent events, again, have caused Mulan to become disillusioned with the deceitfulness of the adult world and to befriend the simplicity of a child. So she told Shen Lan that she would put him on the list of elected officials so that he could participate as well. The Count did not understand what he was so worried about. Jim Mulan just had the kindness and sympathy to include him. The Count understood that this idiot would never be chosen, but he did not understand why he was so angry. The Count sat down on the step and ordered Shen Lan to the sixth room. Shen Lan didn't mind that Jin Mulan called him a second fool because it was good that he was able to be remembered by her. Two hours later, six young men were seated in a screening room. The only judge in choosing a son-in-law for the count was Jin Mulan. Time was running out, she had until noon to choose a candidate, and the wedding was to take place in the evening. And so the selection of a son-in-law for the county officially began. Room 1, Candidate Wang Lal, Suan Wu City Archivist. Wang Lyal had known Jin Mulan for more than 10 years and had academic degrees, making him the strongest candidate. Fascinated by the girl since childhood, he abandoned his concentrated train for Jinxi, came to Nujin County, and became an archivist, only to use the service for his own purposes. Almost everyone in the county believed that he would be a future son-in-law of the county house. Jin Mulan asked the archivist what he could give her. Wang Liang, knowing that Jin Mulan treasures the heritage of the county more than anything else, replied that after they marry, he will pass the exam, and henceforth Mulan will fight and he will write, they will manage the county and make it even more prosperous, and of course they will make sure that the age-old foundation of the Jin family will increase from generation to generation. Jin Mulan thanked cousin Wang Liang and went to another candidate. She went into the room of Mo and the three candidates of the Jin family, one by one, and asked everyone the same question. When asked what he would present to Jin Mulan in the future, Mo Yi replied that he would pass the military service examination and become a master of the world, lead the militia, and lead the soldiers and horses of the county to war. Continuously building up merit would take the Jin family to the next level. Others responded to the same question by saying that they would present Jin Mulan with devotion, go through fire and water for the lady, and strengthen the Jin family. After getting five answers, Jin Mulan reached the last room. Jin Mulan asked Shen Lan if he joins the county, what can he present to her in the future? Shen Lan thought about many things before answering. Thought about the fact that there were too many of those things he could have given her. First, with his own eyes he could see what injuries Jin Mulan might have sustained, he could see what vessels she had clogged. He could also improve the smelting of steel in the county, 
and increase the level of armament of the Jin personal troops. He could also moonlight as a gynecologist, and if Jin Mulan had a problem with that, he could easily help her. Shen Lan understood that all these things might have interested Jin Mulan, but they would not have impressed her. In response to Jin Mulan's question, Shen Lan replied that he could give her her freedom. He added that he would give her freedom as long as she did not have a lover. But the last phrase about the lover really hurt Jin Mulan. She called Shen Lan a fool who didn't have an ounce of brains and immediately left. Jin Mulan entered the Count's office. She told her father and mother that she had made her choice. The Countess was surprised that her daughter didn't need a quarter of an hour to do it. The Count said that Mulan wouldn't act crazy. He asked his daughter, who did she choose? Wang Liang or Moe? The Count said that as soon as the candidate is determined, he will send a dozen messengers and send out invitations to the wedding so that his daughter can marry in the evening. Jin Mulan replied that the husband she chose was Shen Lan. The Count was extremely surprised at his daughter's choice. Jin Mulan explained to him that the three young men of the county were her subordinates. She definitely could not accept them. Wang Liang and Mo A were excellent, but she did not want her husband to claim the county when her parents were gone to fight her brother. She said that it was Shen Lan who gave her hope, and his answer was to give her the freedom to do whatever she wanted, as long as she did not have a lover. She declared that if she married Shen Lan, she would not have to worry about the Jin family's legacy. Jin Mulan bowed to her father and asked his permission to marry Shen Lan. The Countess told her daughter that this Shen Lan was very bad and that he had a bad reputation in town. Jin Mulan asked her parents, since Shen Lan had a bad reputation, shouldn't that have tempered the anger of the Zhu family? Mrs. Mulan believed that if she married too well, the Zhu family might not want to settle, but would be happy to see their enemies defeated. Jin Mulan had only one requirement for her husband, good looks, and Shen Lan was the best for her in this respect. The Countess wept. The Count struck the wall so hard in desperation that it cracked. The Count asked the servants where his stubborn son was. The servant replied that the hare was in class at the time. The Count exclaimed, what was the point of his son's teaching if everything depended on his sister's self-sacrifice? The Count ordered Jin Zhang to bring a whip. The Countess asked why her husband needed a whip. The Count replied that he was going to teach the brat a lesson today. The Countess asked her husband to wait, took another whip, and said he would go with him. The Count and Countess went into their son's chamber and flogged him so hard that the whole county screamed. Manager Jin came into Shen Lan's room and asked him to follow him into the guest room, and later the manager was also supposed to pick up Shen Lan's family. Jin Zhang was calling Shen Lan to him, and that meant his victory. From now on, Shen Lan was the son-in-law of the richest family in Xuanwu City. Now Shen Lan wanted to show Xi and Hang where the crayfish had wintered. He turned to Superintendent Jin and asked if he could get his parents as soon as possible. Manager Jin did not understand why there was such a rush. Shen Lan explained to him that someone wanted to hurt his family. Manager Jin had no idea that there were people in Xuanwu City who were plotting something against Shen Lan's family. Even if he was good for nothing, Shen Lan was now Count Xuanwu's son-in-law. Superintendent Jin now understood the risks at stake. Manager Jin replied to Shen Lan that he understood his request and would deliver his family safely, and he suggested that Mr. Shen should rest well and prepare for the wedding ceremony. In the evening outside the city of Xuanwu, in the building of the Xuanwu Militia of Thousands, which served as a gathering place for the Black Robe Gang, in his apartment, Chen Hang was nibbling on a roast turkey in the company of a beautiful lady. He knew that his time given to Shen Lan was running out. Shen Hang called Shizen to him and ordered him to take his men and bring him Shen Lan's family. Afterwards, Chan Hang added that if Shen Lan agreed to tell the Dai formula, Shizen would have to finish them off, and if he did not tell, he ordered to kill them painfully. The crime and law of Xuanwu City came to a head because of Shen Lan. Those who were on the side of the law received wedding invitations, while others were going to kill his entire family. But they all had one thing in common, 
They did not know that Shen Lang was now the son-in-law of Count Xuanwu. Therefore, the sudden announcement by the Jin family that Jin Yulin was getting married, and that the wedding would take place immediately, caused a commotion throughout the city, but had no effect on Tan Heng, who had made his move. At night, Shizen and his gang rode to Shen Lan's family home. Shizen loudly announced that allegedly by order of the city authorities, the Shen family was hiding their fields and evading taxes, so they should be arrested immediately, and if they resisted, they would be killed on the spot. Shizen got off his horse, walked up to the house, and kicked in the front door. In the house, Shen Lan's parents and brother grabbed their axes and crutches and were ready to give Shizen's gang a battlefield resistance. Shizen grinned and asked Shen's family if they really wanted to fight him. Shen's father answered him that even though they were useless, they were willing to fight and die. Shizen declared that their resistance was treason, punishable by law, and then drew his sword from its sheath and raised it over the heads of the old men. Suddenly Shizen felt a powerful aura nearby. He turned around and saw Superintendent Jin, who had come for Shen Lan's family. Shizen told Manager Jin that they were here under orders to arrest the Shen family, so he asked him as an outsider in the case to leave and not interfere. Manager Jin replied that he really shouldn't have interfered with the city authorities, but that his master had invited the Shen family to the wedding, so he asked Shizen to make an exception and let them go with him. Shizen asked the warrior to identify himself. Jin Jun gave him his name. Shizen didn't understand why Jin Zhang from Xuanmu County came here. Shizen asked Jin Zhang if he had misheard him when he heard that his master had invited the Shen family to the wedding. Jin Jun replied that he had heard correctly. Shizen said that since the county needed these people, he would not prevent it. Jin Jun thanked Shizen, and then other warriors entered the house and led Shen Lan's family away. Shizen was the last one to leave the house. His subordinates told him that this would make the head of their gang furious. Shizen answered them that it was all Shen Lan's tricks, and now they only had to pray that he didn't get deep into the Zhu family for otherwise their whole gang would have to go home and say goodbye to their parents, wives, and children. After that, Shizen and his subordinates rushed to report to their commander. After a while, Shizen flew into Tian Heng's chambers while he was copulating with his girlfriend. Shin Heng immediately became furious and told Shizen if he didn't have a decent reason for breaking in so unceremoniously, he would have to poke his eye out. Shizen informed the commander that Jin Zhang from the county with a dozen warriors had taken Shen Lan's parents and brother, saying that they would attend the wedding at the residence. Hearing this, Tian Heng yelled at the girl to get out, and then dressed and said that he had heard that Jin Mulin of the county was getting married, heard that they had invited the son-in-law to the bride's house. Shizen did not believe such a thing was possible. Chen Heng also could not believe that Shen Lan, who was no better than a weed, could rise to the county. Chen Zhang decided that his gang should prepare in advance and went to town. An hour later, Tan Heng arrived at the Lin family home. Together with Mr. Xu and Lin Mo, Tan Heng sat in the secret room and told that the Count had suddenly sent out invitations for the wedding. Mr. Xu did not believe that Shen Lan should be the groom. Lin Mo told them that he had already received an invitation, and in the evening himself will see whether Shen Lan will be the groom at the wedding. And if Shen Lang really will be the son-in-law of the Count, then they will have time to prepare for everything in advance. Chen Hang declared that he would also go to the wedding. Even though he did not have an invitation, he was convinced that no guests would be turned away from such a party. Mr. Xu said that his daughter was on her way to the wedding, and he was going to give a wedding gift. Meanwhile, at the Count's residence, everything was ready for the wedding. Su Chuan Qian wanted her husband Zhang's opinion on who would be Jin Yulin's groom. One of the influential and noble sons or rare talents. Zhang told his wife that she would soon see for herself. As the guests gathered, Shen Lan sat in the palanquin. According to local custom, the bridegroom is carried from the bride's house to the temple and then carried back to perform the bows and marry as if he were a young bride. Although it was an undignified event, it raised a great deal of speculation about the identity of the groom. 
All the guests wondered what kind of family Chin Mulan's groom would be from. The fireworks rang out. The groom's palanquin was approaching the guests. The count and the countess also came out to meet him. A servant announced loudly that the bridegroom had arrived. Shen Lan, wearing red robes and a mask over his eyes, appeared to the crowd. Many of the guests immediately recognized him. Xiao Lan walked down the carpeted path, stood in front of the entrance to the Count's residence, and then a beautiful bride in a shining snow-white dress, Jin Mulin, descended the steps down to him. The servant loudly announced that happy hour had arrived. The bride and groom made their first bow to heaven and earth. The second bow was for the parents. And afterwards, husband and wife exchanged bows. After the ceremony, the couple was to head to the bridal suite. But before they left, the chief of Xuanwu City, Li Wang, came up to the count and asked if he could find out, before the newlyweds left for their place, what talent they had picked up for Madame Mulan. Suddenly, the commander-in-chief of the southern regions of the state of Yu, the governor of Pingnan, Zhu Lin, came to the wedding. He said that he was on his way to visit the count, but he never expected to be at his niece's wedding. Su Lin said that the Count had not notified him of such an important event, and if he had not come, would he not have missed the whole celebration? The Count and the Countess bowed obediently to Su Lin. The Commander-in-Chief demanded that the groom's mask be removed in order to find out whom his niece was marrying. And after him, the whole crowd demanded that the groom's mask be removed. The groom took off his mask, and everyone saw Shen Lan's face. All the guests were extremely surprised. Suddenly Zhang Jin laughed. Then he reproached Jin Mulan in front of everyone that her wedding was a fake. Zhang Jin decided to tell the guests that Shen Lang had not learned a thousand words in ten years of study, and after being expelled from Hantry School, he was again expelled for stealing money and molesting maids. He didn't believe that this scum could be attracted to the county, and that Jin Mulan could be interested in him. Zhang Jin was sure that their wedding was a sham. Following him, the whole crowd of guests began to shout about the fake wedding. The Count asked Zhang Jin if he had any evidence that Shen Lan had a low intellect. Suddenly out of the crowd came Yan Xiang, an honor student at Hanshui School, who had a degree in Sutsu and came from an ordinary family, who said that he had attended the same village school with Shen Lanam, and that he was not only of low intelligence, he was mentally retarded. Shen Lan asked Yan Sun if he had proof that Shen Lan was an idiot. Yan Sun chuckled and said that Shen Lan had studied for ten years and could not read even a thousand words. This assertion was his proof. Yan Xiang offered Shen Lang a test. Yan Xiang had to write some words, and if Shen Lang could read them, he would prove that he was not a fool, and if he could not read them, he would prove the opposite. Shen Lan agreed. Yan Sun was brought writing utensils, and he wrote three words on a wide scroll. Many of the guests could not read these words. Yan Xiang joked with Shen Lan, suggesting that he surrender and resign himself to the title of fool. But no one knew that Shen Lan, at this very time, was using the computer in his head. Shen Lan replied that the first character, which also sounds like Hus, denotes a plant that can be used as medicine, is taken from the little odes of Shijing, where stanzas about greenery are often found. The second character was pronounced Su, which generally means flawed jade, and by the second interpretation means the royal family. The third character was very rare and had many readings. The first is pronounced vertical, meaning the same. The second is pronounced like a run-on, meaning a top-down motion. The third is pronounced let go, which means to go back. The fourth is pronounced as one and is a surname derived from the ancient Jiang Shai. Yan Xiong could not believe that Shen Lan knew the meaning of the words he had written, which made the guy feel bad. He began to fall, but the crowd picked him up by his arms. The annals of this world were once destroyed, after which a large number of ancient oriental books were found and they became the new history. Shen Lan reproached Yan Sun that he himself had not fully learned all the rules of reading and came running to test him. After that, Shen Lan asked Master Zhang if he correctly interpreted the words written by Yan Shang. Zhang Boyan, 
former mayor of Xuanwu and Yan Sun's teacher, replied to Shen Lan that he had interpreted everything correctly. After that, Shen Lan suggested to Yan Sun that he would write some words for him and he should read them. And without waiting for an answer, Shen Lan took the brush and wrote four columns of different hieroglyphics. Shen Lan told Yan Sun that if he recognizes at least four characters, then Shen Lan will obey him. Yan Shang nervously ran his eyes over the canvas with unfamiliar symbols and eventually confessed to the entire crowd that he himself was an idiot. The guests laughed at Yan Sun, and the former mayor Zhang Boyan told the idiot to go home and not embarrass himself. Zhang Boyan asked Shen Lan if he knew the ancient script. Shen Lan replied that he only knew a little about it. Zhang Boyan said that there was one character that his students could not recognize, and then asked if Shen Lan would be willing to help him with it. Originally, the Count's younger brother was the town governor. However, because the king restricted the rights of the old nobles, the Exuanwu couple gave up the position 11 years ago, and the king sent his man. From then on, the task of every town governor was to separate from the county and fight it in secret. The great scholar Zhang Boyan, who found himself on the other side of the county, was no exception. Shen Lan agreed to take Mr. Zhang's test. Zhang Boyan went to the canvas and wrote the ancient character on it. But it turned out that Shen Lan knew this character well. Yan Xiong again began to mock Shen Lan, thinking that he did not know the meaning of the character. Shen Lan asked if Zhang Boyan had tried to find out the meaning of this character from the context, even though he did not know the pronunciation. Zhang Boyan replied that meaning was far more important than pronunciation. Shen Lan stated that he knew how the word was pronounced. Yan Xinong swooped down on Shen Lan and began to reproach him that he could not know the pronunciation of the word without knowing the context of its use. Shen Lan offered Yan Sun a bet. If it turns out that Shen Lan knows how to pronounce the word, then Yan Sun will slap himself, and if not, Shen Lan will have to slap himself. The guys hit the ground running. Immediately thereafter, Shen Lan stated that the word was pronounced as Yuan. Yan Xiong asked what could prove Shen's answer correct. Shen Lan, meanwhile, went on to say that the word had the same meaning as the spike. Zhang Boyan did not believe that Shen Lang could name the meaning of the character without sources. Meanwhile, Yan Xiong flew up to the former mayor and asked him if Shen Lan's answer was correct. Zhang Boyan replied that Shen Lang had indeed mastered writing and could even identify such a rare style of writing the characters and knew how to pronounce them correctly. The guests could not believe that Shen Lan was so educated. Then Shen Lan asked Yan Zun to keep his word. Yan Shang got angry, shouted that he would remember this day, and in front of everyone slapped himself and then bowed out. Afterward, the Count told Shen Lan that he should have taken Jin Mulan and gone to pay his parents his respects. The servants announced the beginning of the banquet. But suddenly, the commander-in-chiefs said to wait with the banquet. Zhu Lin smiled at the groom and said he would remember him. Shen Lan thanked the Lord for the honor. Shen Lan's parents did not show up at the wedding, simply because they considered themselves people of modest status, so they refused to appear in the hall for fear of embarrassing their son. Shen Lan's parents felt uncomfortable at the Count's residence. They also would not wear the brocade clothes the Xuanwu family had sent them, for fear they might ruin them inadvertently, so they remained in rags. When Shen Lan and his wife stopped by, they paid their respects to the Shen family and bowed. Shen's parents told their son's wife that there was no reason for her to bow down. Shen Lan suggested that everyone drink sweet rice wine. After that, Jin Mulan left her husband to talk to her parents and went to her guests. After Jin Mulan left, Shen's family experienced strong emotions. Later, Shen Lan's parents did not bother him, so they went home. Shen Lan, at his brother's insistence, entered the newlyweds' chambers and sat down on the bed. A few minutes later, Jin Mulan came in and sat down next to her husband. She was so beautiful that Shen Lan could not believe he married her. Jin Mulan told her husband that today he had shown himself differently from what was rumored about him.
Shen Lan said that in the Exu family, he was in bed, he was almost thought to be dead, then his mind was opened. Jin Yulin told Shen Lan that there were some things she wanted to make clear to him. She told him that she had never intended to marry and wanted to devote herself to her family. Only because Zhu was forcing her into marriage did she have to hire a husband. Nominally, they were husband and wife. That was not to change in this life, and she could not marry another. Jim Yulin apologized to Shen Lan and said that he could not fulfill the obligations of husband and wife. Shen Lan understood that he still needed to win the heart of his goddess. He told her he understood everything. Jim Yulin said it was unfair to him, but it was their wedding night and she could not leave Shen Lan alone. Mistress Mulin ordered her maid, Xiaobing, to come into their room. Jim Yulin told the maid that she was to serve her son-in-law well on this wedding night. Shen Lan stated that it was not good. Mistress Mulin replied that she could not be too selfish and keep him all her life. She told Shen Lan that he would marry Chao Bing, and as early as possible they would have a child to give to their parents. Shen Lan said that since his wife was so kind to him, he dared not refuse. Shen Lan told Cao Bing to help him undress. After that, Jin Yulin left the honeymooner's room. Left alone with the master, Xiao Bing began to tremble with embarrassment. She wanted to say that she had come to offer the gentleman a pillow, but before she had finished her sentence, she immediately burst into tears. Shen Lan asked Xiao Bing, didn't she want that? The girl didn't say anything back to him, she just kept crying. Shen Lan pondered, not only did Jin Yulin not like him, but so did this Xiao Bing. Shen Lan did not want to forcibly be nice and make others love themselves. He told the maid that she could go to bed in her room. After these words, the girl ran out of the room like a bullet. Shen Lan recalled that he had originally entered the Count's house to protect his family and himself, and now that it was done, he did not need to be greedy. With these thoughts, he fell asleep. The next morning, his wife asked Shen Lan to take some gifts to his parents. She could not go with him because of her military duties. Jin Yulin invited her husband to talk about his goals for the future. Shen Lan replied that he had no goals. Mrs. Mulin declared that it doesn't work that way. Then Shen Lan answered her that his goal was to kill the Kexu family and make Su Chang Chen weep in his lap. His wife answered him that the county could not feud with this family and offered her husband cakes. Then Shen Lan asked her if he could kill Tai and Hang. Jin Yulin replied that this one would not work either, because Tai and Hang was a shepherd of the Xuanwu people's army, was under the subordination of the town governor, and under the patronage of the Zhang family. If the county opposed him, it would also oppose the town governor and the new laws. Then Shen Lan decided to use his status to punch Tai and Hang in the face. Jin Yulin did not have time to answer as Shen Lang stood up from the table and hurried somewhere. Meanwhile, at the residence of Count Xuanmu, Shen Lang was at the morning reception of his father-in-law and mother-in-law. After the departure of his newly wife, the guy was left to himself, and not to waste time, he decided to devote time to the parents of his beloved. At the residence of Count Xuanmu, Shen Lang was a new man with a still dubious reputation. His former life constantly reminded him of himself. In the years that Shen Lang had spent in the Exu family, he had become known as the second fool and a truly untalented man. His intelligence was doubted by everyone, not excluding his parents. Jin Mulin chose Shen Lan as her husband only because of his stupid and frivolous behavior. The girl in her early childhood has chosen for herself the path to follow for the rest of her life. She was born only to dedicate herself wholeheartedly to the Xuanwu dynasty. She was never interested in family life. The only requirement for her future husband was a complete lack of desire to take the throne. A man could not even afford to think about future power in the Xuanwu family. All military, economic, and political affairs were taken solely by Jin Mulin immediately after her father and mother would no longer be able to rule the city. Shen Lan was the best candidate for the simple and tempting role of the foolish husband. To justify his precarious position in the Xuanwu dynasty, Shen Lan decided to pay more attention to his wife's parents.
After all, the approval of his father-in-law and mother-in-law was the best way to gain a foothold in the palace. With a look full of respect and adoration, Shen Lan offered a cup of tea to his new parents one by one. The Count and Countess of Xuanwu at all times put the happiness of their only daughter first, so they did not oppose her recent choice either. Of course, Jin Zuo and Jin Zhang were stunned by Jin Yulin's husband. Rumors of the young man's promiscuous lifestyle reached the palace of the Xuanwu dynasty as well, but Jin Yulin managed to convince her parents that her choice was the right one. After all, Shen Lan is the only candidate who poses no threat to the future of the Xuanwu family. The day after the wedding, Count Xuanwu at the morning reception decided to learn as much as possible about his son-in-law. There was no time to socialize with his relatives. The decision about the wedding was made in a matter of hours, but despite the absurdity of the situation, all members of the family held themselves with dignity and spoke with confidence about the happiness of the newlyweds. Count Suanmu inquired about Shen Lan's plans for the coming day. The young man decided that it would be better if he would not inform his new father-in-law and wife about all the details of future revenge. Shen Lan explained that today he needed to hurry home and spend some time there before Jin Mulan returned. Shen Lan's parents had endured many hardships and hardships to raise him into a worthy man. His marriage and his new position in the Xuanwu family could easily be seen as disrespectful to the loved ones who gave life. Shen Lan felt a great responsibility, and so he decided to spend the rest of the day on his knees before his parents, fulfilling his filial duty. Count Xuanwu appreciated Shen Lan's act. Of all moral principles, the most important is honoring one's parents. Jin Zuo was especially pleased to realize that Shen Lan was now also his son, which meant that a similar attitude could be expected of him. Although Jin Yulin respected her parents, being a girl of iron character, she rarely showed her feelings. Shen Lan gave his father-in-law and mother-in-law hope for a happy old age, because a man who respects his parents will also love his wife's parents. Count Xuanwu, delighted by the young man's words, immediately wrote off a huge number of gifts intended for Shen Lan's parents and brother. He instructed his son-in-law to go home immediately and devote himself wholeheartedly to the service of the family. Shen Lan, courteously thanking Count and Countess Xuanwu for the grace shown, hurriedly departed. Although he was a confident man, but to be alone for a long time with people he had only seen for the second day was too much. Shen Lan left the reception chambers, leaving his father-in-law and mother-in-law alone in the huge hall. Now that there was no one to hide his feelings and choose words, Count and Countess Suanwu decided to share with each other impressions of the first conversation with the newfound son-in-law. Jin Zhang was pleasantly surprised by the young man. He was completely unlike that Shen Lan who was walking through the streets of the city with the number one fool in his arms. Count Xuanwu completely shared his wife's thoughts. Shen Lan did not disgrace their dynasty last night. On the contrary, he appeared before the public as a worthy successor of the Xuanwu family. In the square in front of the Xuanwu dynasty castle, Shen Lan was completing preparations for his departure to his old, dilapidated thatched house, where he was always welcome. The carriage was almost ready, and the lad gave his attendants one last order. On the way, if they were to pass through the black-robed gang, they would have to stop by their ringleader, Tan Heng. For the old bandit, Shen Lan had a special thing prepared. One of the attendants brought the young man a horse. The Xuanwu dynasty had left its distinctive mark here as well. The horse was of a rare breed with soft, shiny-in-the-sun short hair. Its long mane flowed in golden streams down its graceful but powerful neck. One glance was enough to realize that fortune had been given for this delightful horse. Shen Lan was delighted with the gift of his wife's parents. If he was going to show off and slap left and right, he should have gone on the road on this thoroughbred horse. The carriage, which the servants had diligently prepared for half a day, might have been left abandoned in the square. For two minutes now, the servants gathered in the square, and the attendants silently watched an entertaining picture. The young husband of the formidable manager Jin Mulin, famous in war weather, could not get on his horse. Shen Lan repeated one attempt after another, but all his actions led to the already expected result. The guy, like a sack of potatoes, 
kept falling off the horse. His back was no longer able to withstand the endless blows, and Shen Lan was slowly beginning to doubt his undertaking. He realized that in the eyes of the experienced warriors who were to accompany him on his way home today, he looked terribly ridiculous. In order not to completely lose the respect of the men, Shen Lan, diligently pretending that nothing had happened, referred to the bad weather. The day was unusually sunny, and according to the lad, totally unsuitable for long walks. A few minutes later, the X1 Wu Dynasty carriage set off. The black-robed gang didn't expect anything new from today. The ringleaders were discussing plans for new crimes, and the rank-and-file hooligans were honestly on duty at the base gate. One of the guards noticed the Dexuan Wu Dynasty carriage approaching. Panic immediately reigned throughout the area. The bandits sounded the alarm, and those who were bolder gave the command to shoot. Fortunately for Shen Lan and his entourage, there was no shooting. The leader of the gang arrived at the post of duty in time, and demanded the immediate cessation of any action towards the approaching crew. Although the bandits noticed the Dexuan Wu Dynasty carriage, but they did not have the intelligence to imagine all the consequences that threatened them after the massacre of a member of the Great Family. The carriage stopped at the very gate. The head of the local gang, Chen Heng, himself came out to meet the guest of honor. His loyal subordinates had already reported everything that had happened to him at the entrance to the gate. The leader's face was shining with a strained smile. Squeezing out the remnants of politeness, Chien Hain gritted a greeting to the arriving guest through his teeth. He was very irritated by the thought of yesterday's wedding, and Shen Lan's appearance was even more infuriating. Chien Hain thoughtfully apologized for the misunderstanding that had recently occurred between them. A few days ago, in the forest on the outskirts of the city, the ringleader and his gang grabbed Shen Lan and tried to take his life. Shen Heng and Shen Lan entered the house, accompanied by bandits and Xuan Wu Dynasty warriors. The ringleader wanted to proceed as quickly as possible to the matter with which the young man had come to him. All the previous fears let go of Tian Heng as soon as he heard about the debt. As it turned out, Shen Lan had only arrived in the den of bandits to pay off a debt of 1,000 coins. The guy was convinced that a person who had a debt simply had to pay it off. To such a loud statement, Chien Heng immediately responded with loud laughter. Knowing Shen Lan's new situation, the ringleader didn't take any chances and announced that no debt had ever existed. In front of the boy's eyes, Chien Heng burned a scrap of old cloth on which was written in blood, I owe Tian Sheng a thousand gold coins. With this gesture, the bandit tried to erase from Shen Lan's memory the events of that terrible night, when the guy had just found himself in an unfamiliar world and had already found a huge amount of trouble. To the surprise of everyone in the room, Shen Lan demanded that Tian Hain return the debt. The bandit was horrified. In his whole life, he had never seen anyone more insolent than the man opposite. Shen Lan did not relent. He spoke so convincingly that even the ringleader's assistants, who themselves had witnessed that night, began to doubt their leader. Shen Lang demanded 1,000 gold coins immediately. There was nothing to be done. The only proof was the contract that Tian Hang had just burned with his own hand, so luck was on Shen Lang's side. He confidently used his position at the court of the Xuan Wu dynasty, and a large chest containing 1,000 gold coins was already on the table in front of him within minutes. But the money Shen Lan received was not enough. He decided to consolidate his success by refusing the interest. Shen Heng, who caught the insolent boy's hint, immediately laid out in front of him a bundle of 100 gold coins, explaining his action to his subordinates by the fact that any transaction, even between brothers, must be fair. The money was finally received, but Shen Lang was in no hurry to leave. For Chien Heng, he still had one last question. The young man was interested in the whereabouts of Tian Shizhen. The ringleader became wary. It turned out that yesterday the bandit's son had arrested Shen Lan's parents and threatened to kill the entire family. Such treatment of himself and his relatives could not forgive the young man, and therefore intended to take revenge on the offender. Chan Hang also could not allow his son to be harmed. Shen Lan's behavior pissed him off, but the bandit tried to restrain himself, because before him was not a ragamuffin from the street and the honorable husband of the future ruler of the city.
In order not to let himself and his son down, Chen Hang decided to lie. He told Shen Lan that Tian Shizhen had gone to Balin City and would not return until a few months later. The boy sensed the bandit's excitement and immediately realized that he was being lied to, but did not show it and left everything as it was. Before he left, Shen Lan once again asked Tian Hang to notify him of Tian Shizhen's appearance in the city. Shen Lan and his entourage withdrew from the reception hall. Tian Hang, no longer able to restrain himself, jumped up from the table and ordered to immediately chop up and burn the chair on which his guest of honor was sitting. Tan Hang's son came into the room and asked his father to calm down. He understood what a big mistake he had made, but no one had time for despair and self-deprecation. Tian Hang strictly forbade Tuan Shizen to leave the territory of their bandit den in the near future. The young robber's life was now in great danger, so the father took all measures to save his child. The door opened and Shen Lan appeared in the room. He proudly approached the frightened father and the equally frightened son. Everyone was at a loss. Some loser had managed to fool the bandits whose family had kept the whole city in fear for generations. Shen Lan, not hiding his arrogance, laughed at his son, who was able to overcome 500 kilometers in a couple of seconds. But the young man's cheerful mood was immediately replaced by a nasty desire for revenge. Last night, when the whole town had already fallen asleep, at the edge of the forest in the thatched cottage the light was dimly lit. At the door of the ruined shelter crowded the men of the Dark Robe Gang. At the head of the armed men was Tian Shizhen, the named son of the gang leader Qian Heng. He came to the poor family with only one purpose. Shen Lan's new situation kept him and his father worried, so Qian Shizhen decided to eliminate the cause of all the troubles, namely Shen Lan and the people close to him. Shen Lan kept his menacing gaze on Qian Shizhen, who came to his house with a dozen armed men. The bandit broke down the door and tried to take Shen Lan's sick parents and younger brother. If Jin Zhang hadn't arrived in time, it's not hard to imagine the tragic consequences this would have had for everyone involved. Shen Lan was seething with anger that had been building up within him for a long time. The young man considered his desire to break the offender's legs quite appropriate and fair. But Shen Lan did not want to soil his lessons on the bandit, so he ordered Tian Hang to punish his named son. The boy understood that by doing so he would cause even more pain to his abusers, who last night had almost taken away the most important thing from him. The father looked at his lost son. How this could have turned out, no one understood. A couple of days ago, before the new Shen Lan appeared in the city, the gang of bandits led by Tai and Hang had put fear into the whole neighborhood, and today they themselves found themselves cornered. Shen Lan demanded immediate compliance with the order. The young man fully understood all the privileges granted to him by the new title of son-in-law in the Xuanwu dynasty. Shen Lan wished as soon as possible to see his father and son Qin kneeling before him. The guy believed that through such an act, he would be able to earn respect in the eyes of his attendants and then all members of the Xuanwu dynasty. Xin Shizhen is the 13th named son of Tian Heng. Hitting him was like punching a black-robed leader right in the face. Such humiliation no leader could endure. Tan Heng already looked straight into the eyes of the self-righteous boy without the slightest fear. It was better to die a dignified death than to spend a lifetime hiding from the shame he had suffered. This was exactly what Tan Heng thought, so it was worth nothing for him to sacrifice himself for the sake of his and his son's honor. Fortunately, last night, immediately after the news of Tian Heng's attack on Shen Lan's house became known, Tian Heng rushed to the Zhang family for help and used 35% of all proceeds from the five casinos that had been faithfully subordinated to the head of the dark robe for many years. For himself, Tian Heng had arranged everything in the best way, so now he was ready to fight worthily for the future of the entire black robe gang. After all, if the leader along with the name Sun were to fail, then their subordinates would suffer a similar fate in due course. Overwhelmed with anger, Tan Hang slammed his fist on the table with all his might. The wooden, seemingly very sturdy table broke into two equal parts as soon as the leader touched it. Chips flew in all directions, and the dust that lay thickly on all surfaces began to cover the eyes. The bright and cozy room became dark and dirty in an instant. 
The Xuanwu dynasty warriors who accompanied the young lord rushed to shelter Shen Lan from the impending danger. Tan Han cast fierce glances at all his honored guests, and blood rushed to his head. The man could no longer restrain himself. No one had dared, until this moment, to so freely offend the people whose life and honor he was responsible for. Shen Lang only shook his hands in response to such insolence. He reminded Tian Hang that when his named son came to kill the poor family, he did not think about offense and injustice. The shocked bandit continued to laugh. Shen Lan was just an adopted son-in-law in one of the richest families in this big city. Such outrages could cost him dearly, so Shen Hang saw no great problem in pointing out the young man to his true place. Count Xuan Wu loves the people entrusted to him as his own children, and so when the hour of difficult choices comes, he will give up his personal feelings and take the side of the public. This is when Shen Lan will once again lose all the wealth and honors that were originally not intended for him. Tan Hang is the herdsman of the People's Army of Xuanwu City, and therefore he unconditionally obeys the orders of the town governor, and if Count Xuanwu demands the removal of Shen Lan, he will do so without delay. Feeling dubious superiority over the young man, Tan Hang continued to disrespectfully list all his explicit and implicit superiority. It wouldn't be easy to eliminate him, since he was part of the department, and any actions directed towards members of the management team were solely decided by the city governor. In this case, Shen Hang was indeed left defenseless. He had no powers beyond that of Count Xuanwu. Shen Hang admitted that initially he wanted to pay tribute to the young man and perhaps make friends with him. Shen Lan, with his insolent and unceremonious behavior, completely changed all the plans of the bandit. Now Chen Heng and the thought of friendship with the son-in-law of the Exuanwu dynasty is repugnant. Shen Lan once again managed to get away with it, but the leader of the Black Cassock is not the last person in this city. His recent visit to the Zhang family gave him some advantage. Shen Lan had no intention of giving up. The desire for revenge was stronger than common sense, and the young man once again repeated his order. Tian Hang could not hurt his named son, so Shen Lan threw a meaningful look at his attendants, to which the warriors silently turned away. In his predicament, the lad was alone. None of the honorable servants of the Xuan Wu dynasty did not want to take on the dirty work, and Shen Lan himself was beginning to doubt his cruel plan. Time passed, and neither side ventured into open conflict. The warriors stood as silent statues at the entrance to the den, the bandits hid away from their prying eyes, and the ringleader along with his frightened named son watched the young man. It was difficult to read anything in Shen Lan's eyes, but by Tian Heng's considerable look, everything was becoming clear. Shen Lan, noticing the unkind change in all the people around him, decided to immediately remove himself from the den of bandits. Indeed, he chose the wrong time for revenge. As the son-in-law of the Xuanwu dynasty, it was only his first day, so his position, although slightly better than before, was still just as shaky. The reputation of being a rambunctious second fool only made the young man's new life more difficult. And now Shen Lan, fully aware of what he had done, was going to his old thatched house to his ailing parents. Before leaving the den, the lad blurted out an incoherent reason for his quick departure. Tan Hang was clearly being pampered by a young man who didn't have the courage to go against him. Only Shen Lan was not the type to let his obsessions go easily. He promised to return tomorrow and take full revenge on all the people who mocked him today. After leaving the den of the black-robed gang, Shen Lan headed for his home without stopping. He didn't want to make his sick parents wait for him, but he didn't want to die at the hands of a brutal assassin anymore. The mother looked at her son in awe, holding his beautiful white palms in her straightened hands. No one was able to recover from the events that had overtaken the family in the past few days. Everyone was terrified and hopeful that their beloved eldest son now had a high position in the court of the Xuanwu dynasty. His mother anxiously asked her son all the details of his new life. Shen Lan assured his family that he was living his best life in the palace. There was no one who would allow himself to be rude to the son-in-law of a great dynasty. His wife's parents, like herself, are favorable to Shen Lan and bestow upon him and his family the best gifts. 
Today, the lad brought with him a cure for his wounds, which Jin Mulan had prepared especially for her husband's younger brother. This healing remedy was capable of curing injuries of any severity in a short time. The younger brother, who had so ridiculously lost the ability to walk, now wanted to personally thank his savior. Jin Mulan was truly a kind and sensitive goddess. The whole Shen Lan family was eternally grateful to her. The boy's parents were not left without gifts. Shen Lan gave them a large sum of money, which was to go to build a new house of good bricks and high-quality tiles. At first, his father was wary after all. It will not be good if people think that Shen Lang is a thief and steals money directly from the chests of the Great Dynasty. Shen Lan decided to let his father's statement pass his ears and immediately explained that the money that his father was now clutching so tightly in his hand, he had honestly earned himself by selling the recipe of the dye he had invented. The boy walked over to his younger brother. Right now, Shen Jin is sick and unable to move fully, but as soon as he recovers, Shen Lang will immediately take him with him to the palace of the Xuanwu dynasty and ensure a good and prosperous future. The sun was slowly but surely disappearing behind the horizon line. The edge of the forest was gradually enveloped by dusk, and Shen Lun and his companions had to leave on their way back. The road to the county could not be called a short one, so it was necessary to move immediately in order not to run into gangs of bandits at night. The mother, seeing her son off, told him about the great fool Dasha, who had not been seen in this county for days. It was rumored that he was seriously ill, so Shen Lan, changing his route, immediately went in search of him. Dasha was the only friend of the former Shen Lan. He, like his comrade, had relatively low intelligence. When children in the village bullied Shen Lan, Dasha used his body to protect him from a pile of flying stones. Dashe was born weighing six kilograms, and though malnourished every day, he grew to two meters by the time he was 18. Although he looked strong, he was a simple, clean, and harmless man who never fought. Dasha had a hard time. Three years after his birth mother died in childbirth, his father married again, and since then he lived like a foundling. He slept on the ground in the yard, ate sour rice gruel and corn, and if he couldn't work, his stepmother would kick him out of the house. When Shen Lan and his men heard about the accident, they rushed to Dasha's house in Maple Leaf Village. The stepmother and her native son were sitting on a ramshackle wooden bench in the dilapidated house. The appearance of a second fool in the house with the warriors frightened the wicked old woman, but she decided not to show it. Shen Lan came as close to her as possible and held out a bag full of gold coins. With this money, the stepmother was supposed to feed her adopted son well, but I know the old woman, she would rather spend the money on herself than feed poor Dasha on it. According to her, the boy was supposed to be working now, but where exactly, she did not know. The old woman's own son, Dasha's half-brother, who had been watching the guests from a dark corner all this time, said that his relative had long since rotted away in the deep mountains. Shen Lan in horror ran out of the filthy house harmful old woman. He immediately gave the men an order and began to look for his faithful poor friend himself. Two hours later, with the full moon already high in the sky, Shen Lan finally found Dasha's disfigured body. Fortunately, the boy was alive. His pulse was weak, but his breathing remained steady. Feeling the presence of other people, Dasha came to his senses. He was incredibly happy when he opened his eyes and saw the face of the other fool, his best and only friend. Dasha confessed that he had missed his comrade very much all this time, but he had not been able to find an opportunity to see him. Shen Lan's eyes filled with tears. He blamed himself for finding out about his friend's disappearance too late and would hardly be able to help him anymore. After gaining strength, Dasha was still able to explain what had happened to him. Dasha and his younger half-brother liked to take walks in the woods. During another walk, the half-brother behaved terribly unreasonably and attracted the attention of the tiger. The tiger, whose calm was disturbed, instinctively lunged at the young men. Dasha, wanting to save his brother from imminent death, shielded him with himself. With its powerful paw, the tiger struck the weakened body and broke several of the boy's limbs. Dasha's father had no money so he carried his own child into the woods near the mountains to let him die a painful death. Shen Lan did not know what to do. 
A thousand thoughts swirled in his head, and each of them was filled with unbearable compassion and a desire for revenge. Shah had indeed turned out to be a great fool. His half-brother was constantly bullying him, throwing him in the mud, ruining his new clothes. Shen Lan was convinced that it was unacceptable to protect such a horrible man at the cost of his own life. The boy held the hand of his best and only friend and swore to himself to take revenge on all those who had wronged him. Shen Lan sat on his knees by Dasha's disfigured body. How many days his friend lay in the mountains was not known. Hungry and bleeding, Dasha did not lose hope and clung to the life flowing away from him with all his might. Shen Lan understood that the six days that had supposedly passed since the boy went missing was enough to cause irreparable damage to his health. Dasha confessed to his friend that he seemed to be dying, and even at his last minute, the big fool wasn't thinking to himself. The only thing the big guy regretted was not being able to protect his little friend. Shen Lan could not hold back his tears. Dasha's words touched him to the core, and the feeling of his own helplessness finally took root in the young man's mind. The X1 Wu Dynasty warriors accompanying the young lord stepped back so as not to disturb the farewell of the two faithful comrades. They felt sorry for both friends, but their military situation did not allow them to succumb to a sentimental moment. The big fool howled. His whole body, which a minute ago had been like motionless rags, tensed up and bled. Dasha jumped up on his exhausted legs and rushed straight toward Shen Lan. Running up to the young man, he wrapped his arms tightly around him, covering his entire body. The attendants couldn't stand on their feet and fell to the ground. Shen Lan didn't even have time to understand what happened before he found himself a motionless puppet in the hands of the big fool. The big man did not let the young man out of his hands. He only incoherently repeated that no one else would dare to hurt the second fool. Dasha's mind was clouded. He did not realize that by doing so only more harm to himself, rather than save his friend from imaginary danger. Shen Lan's requests to calm down did not seem to reach Dasha, but the reaction of his ailing body was not long in coming. The guy's mighty arms turned into long, helpless sticks and released the frightened Shen Lan from their embrace. Dasha collapsed. Tears no longer flowed rapidly from Shen Lan's eyes. Now was not the time to despair. A friend had to be rescued immediately. Shen Lan could not let his comrade die so shamefully and painfully. The big fool was being swiftly loaded onto the wagon. Dashe was slowly losing consciousness. In his delirium, he pondered how he would care for his father when he grew old, how he would protect his only friend from the village boys with the huge stones. Once again, Shen Lan realized what a sincere and bright person Dashe was. Having been abandoned by his own parents, he had not lost his faith in people. Outraged to the core, Shen Lan ordered the carriage to be touched. The carriage instantly moved and headed straight for Dasha's house. Shen Lan decided that this was not the right moment to head back to the county. Shen Lan, not restraining himself from violent expressions, expressed to the old stepmother all that he thought of her. The young man could not understand how he could leave his son to die in a remote forest at the foot of the mountains. The stepmother merely grinned and continued the meal. The table was set beautifully. The money that Shen Lan gave to the old woman to feed Da Sha, she, as expected, spent on herself and her own son. The half-brother, taking the example of his mother and not at all embarrassed by his words, announced that such a fool does not care where to die, in the hospital or in the middle of the mountains. The insults to his only friend Shen Lan could not take any more. With a quick step, he walked to the table and with a single movement turned it over with all its contents. The stepmother and son, who had not expected such an action, fell out of their chairs. The old woman, who was trying to come to her senses, watched as her own son was beaten by the newly minted son-in-law of the Hexuan Wu dynasty. Shen Lan spared no blows. The anger that had been building up inside him all the time had to break out at some point. The old woman flew up to her surplus child. Dashi's condition had never interested her before, and she was even less interested now. Even though her half-brother now suffered unbearable pain, it still could never compare to the suffering that the half-dead Dasha had endured while lying in the forest at the foot of the Deaf Mountains.
The distraught stepmother lashed out at Shen Lan, showering him with the most vile words. She prophesied the second fool the same horrible death that now awaited Dasha. The lad forcefully pushed the mad woman away from him, and she fell with a crash, dragging the basin of water behind her. The stepmother continued to scream in a terrible fit. She threatened to take revenge on Shen Lan, disregarding his new position at the court of the Xuan Wu dynasty. The words of the terrible old woman did not hurt the young master in the slightest. He once again courteously explained to his stepmother that by attempting to kill him, she was first of all betraying her county. Also, Shen Lan did not mind to meet one-on-one -on -one with the old woman's husband and therefore invited him to the palace of the Xuan Wu dynasty. After Shen Lan left Da Sha's house, he rushed back to the Count's palace without stopping. Count Suan Wu was well stocked with medicines, so going back there for treatment was the best option. At the main gate, the young lord's carriage was stopped by a group of soldiers. Shen Lan was puzzled by the behavior of the men, so he decided to personally inquire about their intentions. It turned out that the carriage son-in-law of the ex Wen Wu dynasty stopped none other than the head of the inner guard of the residence of Count Xuan Wu. Jin Cheng, who also had a claim on Jin Mulan's heart, demanded to begin an immediate inspection of the carriage. One of his subordinates loudly announced that there was someone in the carriage. The chief of the inner guard was enraged by the young lord's arbitrariness. Letting in unauthorized people into the palace is strictly forbidden, so the subordinates of the chief was already ready to throw the stranger out of the county. Shen Lan made an attempt to stop the guards, but he did not believe in a successful outcome. The guy was well aware that the true attitude of his escorts was the same as that of Jin Zheng. They would follow him, but when confronted with a truly serious threat, they would leave him unscathed. Shen Lan was once again left alone with his problems. His dying friend was lying in the carriage, and the palace guards wanted to get rid of the stranger in the carriage immediately. Shen Lan could only count on himself. Da Xia had done too much good for the boy in his life, so now it was Shen Lan's turn to save him. The young lord made the decision to lead the transport into the city himself, ignoring the interfering guards. This was a great danger for Jin Zheng, since he was the one in charge of the security of the county. There was a commotion at the gate leading to the ex Wan Wu Dynasty Palace. At the shouts of the guards, Jin Mulan came running along with her father. Upon learning what caused the conflict, Count Xuan Wu immediately sent the guards to get a doctor, and Jin Mulan took control of the carriage, explaining that Shen Lan too poorly know the city. Jin Mulan climbed onto the carriage and took control. One look at her was enough for Shen Lang to be convinced that he was not alone. There are people in this city who care about the fate of the second fool and his family. Jin Zheng, finding himself in an awkward position, tried to take matters into his own hands. He didn't want to suffer more embarrassment and lose his authority as the head of the palace guard. Jin Zheng began to obstruct the movement of the carriage, so he tried to impress Count Xuan Wu, because the man did not deviate from the laws prescribed by Jin Zuo. But only Jin Mulan could not bear another insolence of the palace guard chief. Realizing that in the carriage lies her husband's dying friend, the girl decided to immediately get rid of the annoying nuisance. In her hands, Jin Mulan clutched a long whip, which by long custom always accompanied her, and ordered Jin Zheng to turn his back now. The chief of the guards froze in horror. Until this moment, he had never had to face his mistress's wrath before. Frozen in place with horror, Jin Zheng could only utter a few incoherent words, but Jin Mulan remained unyielding. The man, almost fainting, still turned his back to the mayor and immediately received a whip. The whip left a long, full-blooded trail of blood on his back. Jin Mulan, who didn't even change her face, explained that she hit Jin Zheng for two reasons. First, he did not help the earlier man, and this was against the principles of Xuan Wu County. Second, the head of the palace guard did not treat his new master, namely Shen Lan, with enough respect. Jin Zheng dutifully lowered his head and promised not to make such mistakes in the future and correct his attitude towards his master. Shen Lan looked at Jin Mulan and was proud to know that she was his wife. A few dozen minutes later, Da She received medical attention after all. Thanks to Jin Mulan, who knew the surroundings well, Shen Lan managed to get his only friend straight to the doctor.
County doctor Nzeshi was finishing examining the injured man. Years of experience instantly helped the doctor identify the location of the bleeding. The wounds had been inflicted by a tiger, so from the upper sites of the blows, one could easily identify internal problems as well. And Zeshi assured Jin Mulan and her husband that there would be no complications for Besha. The doctor understood exactly what actions were required of him going forward. First, bloodletting had to be performed so that Dasha's body would not undergo another infection. Then time was needed for the broken bones to properly fuse together. Shen Lan, who closely observed the doctor's every action, did not doubt his professionalism in the slightest. Not possessing X-ray vision, unlike the young man, and Zeshi identified the sore spots from the first time and suggested a competent method of treatment. It would not have been possible for Shen Lan to achieve a better result without the right conditions. Jin Mulin was as concerned about Dasha's life as her husband. She once again asked the doctor if he could save the injured big fool. And Zeshi had no doubts about the patient's recovery. Dasha is by nature a very hardy and tough man. If it were anyone else, he would have died in the first hours. And Zeshi needed time and rare medicines to finally raise the big fool to his feet. Shen Lan and Jin Mu Lan were truly grateful to the wise elder. And Zeshi asked the pair to look after Da Sha while he himself went to the forest located on the slopes of the remote mountains. That was the only place to gather the very rare herbs needed for the medicine that the weakened Da Sha needed now. The young men remained to look after the victim. Jin Mulan smiled and looked Shen Lan straight in the eyes. The girl was happy. Her husband's older brother was not in any danger, which meant that Shen Lan would feel much better now. Except that Jin Mulan was a little wrong. Dashe was not Shen Lan's older brother. The guy tried to explain to his wife that their nicknames had nothing to do with kinship. Shen Lan only became the second fool because there was already one fool in town at that time. Jin Mulan laughed. She was a charming, intelligent girl, but sometimes she said strange things. Shen Lan was not in the least embarrassed by this. On the contrary, at such moments, he fell more and more in love with the beautiful Jin Mulan. Jin Zuo walked into the doctor's small house. His father-in-law asked his son-in-law to report to his office as soon as possible for an important conversation. Count Xuanwu was not as friendly as he had been during the morning reception, and Shen Lang immediately noticed this change. Although the young man felt some guilt for what had happened, but he did not fully understand what Count Xuanwu was now asking him to confess. Da She was Shen Lang's best and only friend. He had protected him since he was a child from cruel adults and village boys with stones. Shen Lan simply could not betray him as Dasha's family did, and the Count's court is the best place to treat him. The young man was sure that leaving his friend in the remote mountains would dishonor himself even more than he was now. Only Count Swan who had no complaints about what had happened tonight. He was more concerned about the unseemly behavior of his son-in-law in the Black Cassock. Shen Lan took advantage of someone else's authority to extort money from the gang leader Xin Heng. In addition, the guy swore to break the legs of the 13th named son of the leader. Not daring to object to anything, Shen Lan fell on his knee in front of his father-in-law and loudly thanked him for saving his family. Count Suan Wu was a little puzzled. Shen Lan went on and on about his life before he married Jing Mulan. Chu's family paid bandits a hundred gold coins to kill the boy and his whole family. The father-in-law immediately became enraged. No one could treat members of the great Xuanwu dynasty family so cruelly. Jin Zhu swore to Shen Lan to take revenge on the bandits and get justice for the whole Shen family. Since the guy threatened Tian Heng and his son in front of many witnesses, Count Xuanwu advised him to stay in the palace for a while and not go to crowded places alone. Only in the palace of Count Shen Lan would be provided with complete safety, and Count Xuan Wu promised to solve all other problems himself. But if Shen Lan did not go to the den of bandits tomorrow, he would disgrace not only himself, but also the entire Count's family. Jin Zuo accepted his son-in-law's offer, but before he left, he had to learn the Jin family way of life by heart. It was this way of life that helped the entire Jin clan to lead a dignified existence and not go astray. Shen Lan did not have a chance because even Count Xuanwu himself took a month to learn the entire guidebook.
For the sons and daughters of the Jin family, memorizing the family order is a painful memory for every generation. Shen Lan learned from Mulan that it took her 23 days to memorize every page, while the Earl's hair has not finished learning until now. Of the thousand learned, he could forget 300 words, so he will probably never finish it in his life. Shen Lan, on the other hand, managed to memorize it in a little over an hour. The young man decided that it was a little unseemly to go right away to report his progress, so he postponed everything until morning. Meanwhile, in the chambers, the Count and Countess were discussing their newfound son-in-law. Jin Zhang insisted that Jin Zhu cancel his punishment, otherwise Shen Lan might hold a grudge against them, but the Count was adamant. Jin Zhang expected that in the months that the young man was doomed to spend in his room, he would learn the calm and restraint that he sorely lacked. Jin Zhang decided to make a wager with her husband just in case his son-in-law surpassed him in learning the Jin family way of life. At night, the countess tossed and turned from side to side. Not having slept, she decided to go to the kitchen and make walnut soup for her beloved son-in-law. But to her surprise, the light in the study had already gone out and Jin Zhang, who was in charge of guarding the chambers, reported that Shen Lan had fallen asleep before 9 o'clock in the evening. Countess Xuan Wu really did not want to lose to her husband. Early the next morning, Shen Lan was already rushing to his father-in-law's quarters with a report. Jin Zhao met the young man and immediately rebuked him for idleness. Countess Xuan Wu, returning to her chambers, immediately reported to her husband that Shen Lan had gone to bed too early. Count Xuan Wu could not believe his son-in-law. Even Jin Mulan, who was famous for her outstanding mental faculties, took a full 23 days to learn the family routine. Jin Zhuo was disappointed in his test and demanded that a whip be brought immediately to punish him. Countess Xuan Mu ran up to her husband. She insisted that she would never inflict punishment on the young master. What would the Xuan Wu dynasty say to the poor parents when they learned of their child's abuse? Shen Lan really did learn it all. He could tell any paragraph from the ancient book without any doubt, and so he insisted on checking it out. Jin Zhuo was not against it. His confidence that the young man in front of him was lazy and insolent was over the top. Therefore, when Shen Lang told the fifth chapter of the pattern without mistakes, Count Xuan Wu came to his senses and already demanded another check himself. Shen Lang could not doubt himself. His ability, which was handed down to him when he moved between worlds, helped him easily study the most complex reference book, which contained the information of dozens of previous generations. Now Count and Countess were listening to the 16th chapter that they knew for a long time. There were no doubts. Shen Lan was able to learn the Jin family way of life, and in just three minutes, without mistakes, told the most difficult chapter. Only Jin Zhu had little proof. Not believing in such miracles, the Count named several more chapters in a row and even read out one paragraph, asking Shen Lan to continue. He absolutely did not expect that the young man would easily connect and even be able to interpret it from the spot and give his thoughts on it. Shen Lan's performance was perfect. He was able to learn the Jin family way of life in one hour and told it with dignity to the Count and Countess. Jin Zhang reminded her husband of the wager they had made the previous night. The countess won, and Jin Zhu became visibly nervous. He asked his wife to leave him alone with his son-in-law. The countess left the room, taking with her the whip the guard had brought. She went straight to her own son, wishing to punish him at once for his failure to remember the family way of life. Jin Yu Kong tried his best to memorize the book, but he lacked perseverance and his memory, which was much worse than that of the rest of the family, was constantly failing him. While the boy was learning new words, the old ones were being forgotten all by themselves. His parents looked upon their son as a disappointment and were not stingy with all sorts of punishments. Count Suan Mu wished to learn his son-in-law's secret as soon as possible. No one had yet been able to learn the family way of life in one hour. Shen Lan confessed that four days ago, when he woke up after a serious illness, he found that his mind had mysteriously changed, and now he could not forget anything. Count Suan Wu explained to his son-in-law that he had achieved great enlightenment. Once upon a time, a similar thing had happened in the Jin family. 180 years ago, 
Jin's ancestor, who was on the brink of life and death, also reached enlightenment and turned from a loser to a martial arts genius. He did so much for the family that the king of the country wanted to give him a rank, but he refused and asked instead to grant him lands. It was in his hands that the lands granted to the Jin family reached their peak. They had a total area of 5,000 square kilometers, only now there was not even one-third of them left. Count Suan Wu pinned his last hopes on his son-in-law. If Shen Lang was able to achieve enlightenment, then he would be able to return the former glory of the ex Wan Wu dynasty. Shen Lan, who had fulfilled his part of the agreement, was already ready to pay a nasty visit to his offender leader of Qin Heng. Although Jin Zhuo was not openly against revenge, but the precarious position of the nobles did not allow to act recklessly. In the past three years, a large number of old nobles had lost their fiefdoms and titles. One of them is said to have lost his life as well. Jin Zhao felt sorry for his son-in-law, but he couldn't do anything right now either. Count Xuan Wu promised Shen Lan in the near future in any way possible to restore justice. Shen Lan explained to his father-in-law that the Exu family and the Ling family were his personal enemies, and he should deal with them himself. Otherwise, the guy wouldn't be able to hold his head up proudly for the rest of his life. Shen Lan gained an advantage over all of them by joining the X1 Wu dynasty, but it wasn't enough. All the noble families gradually lost their possessions, and power slowly passed into the hands of the emperor. Now the city no longer belonged to the X1 Wu family, and Shen Lan should behave much more carefully. His father-in-law was delighted with his son-in-law's words, and therefore did not interfere with his plans. Shen Lan was the last hope for the Count, in which he especially wanted to believe. Qin Heng ran many enterprises, gambling houses, brothels, money loans, and so on. The most profitable of these were the gambling houses, which accounted for 60% of all income. In the entire city of Suanwu, Tian Heng had five gambling houses that held the monopoly. The Place of Good Fortune was their name. The way Shen Lan decided to deal with Chen Hen was very simple. The young man was going to visit each of the five houses and win all the money. Shen Lan needed to win more than those behind Chen Hen could afford. As he approached the gambling house, Shen Lan constantly picked up the whispers of the people around him. They were talking about the appearance of the second fool, and not all of the residents were aware of his new title. Those who knew of the Xuan Wu dynasty kinship wondered how easy it was for a son-in-law to decide to go to the playhouse. The Xuan Wu dynasty was at all times famous for its harsh rules, which if broken could be signed a death sentence. The crowds were sure that Shen Lan would not get away with such behavior. The guards who accompanied the young lord today were also surprised by his visit to the playhouse. One attendant already wanted to stop the lord, but a second warrior forbade him to do so. They had been hired to watch Shen Lan, not to hinder him. Only the second warrior was not transfixed by nobility. He, like most men in the city, dreamed of the beautiful warrior Jin Mulan. Upon learning of her marriage to the city's chief loser, he was irritated and repeatedly contemplated a plan of revenge. Shen Lan's decision to visit the playhouse only amused the guardian. He quietly watched the young master and wished him a speedy death. When Shen Lan entered the playhouse, he was immediately noticed by Tian Shizhu, one of the named sons of the ringleader Qian Heng. The young man's appearance made him terribly happy, because Chen Lan was now completely under their control. In Chan's gambling houses, the laws of the county were never in effect. Today was no exception. If the young master disappeared unexpectedly, they wouldn't even look for him. Tian Heng would take care of that. Chen Shizhu, being personally unfamiliar with Shen Lan, decided to behave with him as with an ordinary visitor. The young gentleman was escorted to a free table and immediately offered to play a couple of games. Shen Lun was not against it, after all, that was exactly why he had come here. There was just one small problem. The young man had not brought any money, and to participate in games without betting was at all times impossible. So he had to borrow money. Chen Shijin always had a certain amount of money prepared for that occasion. Lending money to gamblers was a common practice. As a rule, visitors without much knowledge or experience got into a lot of debt, with no way to win back. Shen Lan named son was ready to give even tens of thousands of gold coins. The greater the amount of debt, 
the more dire the consequences for the young master. This was exactly what Chen Shiju had assumed, thinking one last time about the possibility of sending Shenlan into the debt pit. Chen Shiju tried not to help his father, on the contrary, he just wanted to get his attention and praise from him. All of Tai and Heng's sons fought for his favor in order to later solely manage his enterprises. Shen Lan asked to open a promissory note in his name in the amount of 1,000 gold coins. This amount was enough to win the first victories in the gambling house. A moment later, Shen Lan signed a promissory note and exchanged all the gold coins received for plain chips. After consulting with Qi and Shijin, the young man decided to play more or less. In the more or less contest, three dice are rolled, less than nine points is less, more than nine points is more. The casino croupier vigorously shuffled all the dice among themselves, thus announcing the beginning of the competition. In front of Shen Lan stood a wooden cup. The guy had to guess how many points were hidden under it. After putting all the chips forward, Shen Lan confidently declared that he would choose more. The spectators of the competition customers of the gambling house amicably aghast. No one had ever gone all in with such a huge amount of money. People were loudly shouting that the newly minted son-in-law of the Xuan Wu dynasty was indeed a fool. The game promised to be exciting. The bets were placed, and everyone gathered in the gambling house waited impatiently for the results of the first tournament. The croupier, obviously testing the patience of the visitors, began to slowly lift the wooden cup, behind which were three dice. The crowd froze. The place had never been so quiet. And then, after a few seconds that seemed like an eternity to those watching, Shen Lan was declared the winner. The dice had 13 points, just as the young lord had foreseen. The visitors all agreed that the second fool was just lucky, since he won a thousand gold coins on the first bet. Chen Shijin, to everyone's surprise, was pleased with his opponent's victory. He needed to keep the young man as long as possible in his establishment. Only when Shen Lan got into really big debts would it be possible to act. The bets were placed again. Shen Lan again went all in. The observers gathered their strength and counted that in total, the guy would get 2,000 gold coins. Such money in this gambling house, no one had ever managed to win. Tian Shijin looked at Shen Lan as if he were crazy, but there was nothing to do. The bets were made, and they could not be undone. In addition, the named son still had hope that soon the brash Xuanwu dynasty player would lose and get bogged down in unaffordable debts. The croupier, who had never yet had to roll dice for such large sums, looked at the wooden glass with excitement. Fortunately, the dice again yielded a sum of more. There were 15 points on the table. Shen Lan had won. The crowd cheered. Many of those watching had never seen 4,000 gold coins before. Qin Shiju was beginning to get noticeably nervous. The revenue of this casino never exceeded 2,000 gold coins. If the young master continued to raise the stakes and win, Tan Heng's gambling house would go bankrupt in an instant. Qin Shiju decided to play the next game himself. He was a master at shaking the dice. They usually fell out the way he himself wished them to. But more importantly, he had an uncanny ability to change the number of points when the dice were already on the table. In the entire gambling house, only Tai and Shiju knew this trick, which is why he became the named son of Tai and Heng and manager of the casino. Chi and Shiju took the dice in his hands and shuffled them properly, not in the least bit doubting that Shen Lan was losing. After all, the young master only had one last choice to make, which would lead nowhere else. Shen Lan, having carefully studied the contents of the wooden glass, changed his mind to continue playing more or less. In addition, the bets were not made by absent-mindedness croupier, and thus the young gentleman could not lose anything. The game, more or less, did not like Shen Lan only because the outcome depended solely on the luck of man. In the next round, it was customary to play Paiju. Tian Shiju was already beginning to believe that his opponent would never remember such a game. The bandit was the acknowledged champion in Paju and had no equal in skill. If playing more or less, Shen Lan could still rely on his luck, the next game required him to have a well-developed strategy. Paju in this world is relatively simple. 32 dice are placed on the table and each player draws two of them. Victory is determined according to the value of the dice. 
The greatest treasure is the oldest combination, followed by the sky dice, then a pair of earth dice. Peju is much more complex than more less, which is based solely on luck, so there are many different tricks and tricks. For example, the marks on the back of the dice. Although Shen Lan had the nickname of the second fool, but to guess the tricks was not difficult for him. The young man immediately demanded that someone from the casino, not interested in winning or losing, to buy new dice. Only after Shen Lan personally verified the fairness of the game could the tournament continue. Qin Shiju was surprised at his opponent's request. The secret of the House of Fortune was known only to its owner and the closest subordinates. No one ever doubted the authenticity of the dice or the fairness of the competition. People who lost fortunes here referred to their small margin of luck. Not a single visitor reproached the establishment for cheating and cheating, much less demanded that the gambling equipment be replaced. Noticing the awkward glances that Qin Shiju threw at his assistants, Shen Lang abruptly got up from the table, intending to immediately leave the gambling house and tell the whole city about the stinginess of its owner. Shen Lan was not going to obey the wishes of the black-robed ringleaders named Sun. His reputation was already weak, and the young lord did not want to expose his dynasty to disgrace. In addition, there was another reason why Shen Lang could not lose. The guy had enough experience to immediately guess Chen Shiju's true intentions. The bandit, trying to gain the favor of his named father, was ready to kill Shen Lan as soon as he showed even a single weakness. The entire Shen family was in great danger, as was the reputation of the Xuanwu dynasty. Chen Shiju could not let his honorable visitor go so quickly. In the few minutes that Shen Lan spent in the gambling house, he won as much as 4,000 gold coins. The monthly income of the House of Fortune never exceeded 2,000 gold coins. Qin Shiju had practically bankrupted his named father's establishment, and now he needed to do everything possible to make Shen Lan lose. An assistant who was standing not far from his boss's plane table promised to deliver as many as 10 new sets of Peishu in the shortest possible time. Qin Shiju, in order to make his image more responsible and serious, strictly forbade his subordinate to buy new sets of Peiju from their own store. To be sure, the assistant went to various merchants' shops to get the kits. Qin Shijin never doubted his skill. He himself called himself nothing less than the number one gambling expert in Xuanwu City. Peiju's new kits, although somewhat worried about him, but the self-proclaimed title gave him a faint confidence. Besides, Shen Lan was still a second fool to him, one that any boy could fool. Even if Qin Shiju didn't cheat, he would definitely be able to win. A few moments later, ten brand new sets of Peiju, purchased from various market stalls in this city, were already lying on the plain table. Qin Shiju watched the young master with anticipation as he carefully studied each chip. Shen Lan needed to be as careful as possible, and so he looked through each Peiju box with his super X-ray vision. The ability told him that all the sets were in perfect order and there were no problems in them. Shen Lan simply chose one box that caught his eye and offered Tian Shiju, who was tired from the endless waiting, to pull the dice first. The named son did not mind at all and was already holding the two chosen chips in his hands. Shen Lan studied the dice with an X-ray. It was a pair of tens, the sixth highest of the combinations. The named son of the leader of the Black Cassock was not bad luck, and so he bet a hundred gold coins. Although the amount was large for the first bet, but after the previous rounds, it was not able to delight anyone watching. Shen Lan, still studying the chips with his X-ray vision, decided to draw the fifth combination. The bets were placed. The young lord confidently pulled out a stack of a thousand gold coins. The audience was unstoppable. The men, among whom were many new visitors, scolded and could not contain their astonishment. Shen Lan, making a huge bet, did not even look at his dice. The visitors didn't understand how they could be so unreasonable with an entire fortune on which they could live comfortably for the rest of their lives. A thousand gold coins, this dice game promised to be incredible. Chen Shiju only laughed at his opponent. Unaware of the young master's super ability, he naively increased the bet and did not doubt in the least the correctness of his actions. Now the bandit's bet was not a hundred, but a thousand gold coins. 
The croupier asked the contestants to crack the dice. Tian Shiju turned pale in exactly one second. He lost. The establishment was bankrupt. The visitors watching on the sidelines were stunned by the defeat of the great master of gambling. The situation became even more absurd when the men noticed that Shen Lan's lead over the bandit was only one point. Shen Lan would not be Shen Lan if he did not embarrass his opponent. The young master could have chosen any combination of the highest order that would surpass Tian Shiju's combination, but then the tournament would not have been as impressive and memorable. The first seconds after the end of the round passed, and Tian Shiju's consternation was replaced by a desire to teach the insolent boy a lesson. It turned out that Shen Lan was not such a loser, as was commonly said about him in Xuanwu City and the surrounding villages. Qian Shiju once again blamed it on the slacker's luck and offered to fight again. This time, the black-robed ringleader's named son would definitely not allow the young lord of the Xuanwu dynasty to defeat the main gambling house of the county. However, that was only the beginning of the fight. What happened next was a nightmare for Tian Shizhen. At every hand, Shen Lan, in spite of his dice, immediately laid out chips worth a thousand gold coins, and then he would win, win, and win again. Visitors to the gambling house had never seen such exciting competitions. The number one gambling god in Xuanwu City was subjected to barbed taunts, and Tian Shikyu could not stand them. Tan Heng could never forgive his named son the public shame. The main gambling house in the city was defeated and was left owing the young lord 13,000 gold coins. Tian Shiju, citing a sore head, ran away from the casino, not knowing what to do next. Early in the morning, Tan Heng arrived at the Xu family home. Yesterday, Shen Lan had promised to make him break his own arm and legs to his named son. Tan Heng sought protection from his patron. Count Su did not mind helping, and besides, he himself had accumulated too many grievances against the young lord. After receiving a title in the Xuanwu dynasty, Shen Lang had crossed all boundaries and forgotten about his former ties with the Ku family. Only the old aristocracy was not as strong as before, and therefore it could not provide support for all of Shen Lang's insidious endeavors. Tan Heng did not yet know that his main gambling house was defeated and owed the young lord 13,000 gold coins, so the bandit naively made plans on how to make the Xuanwu dynasty get rid of the newfound son-in-law. Tan Heng, along with Count Su, did not move to laugh. They were already anticipating the moment when the Xuanwu dynasty, including Shen Lan, would beg them for mercy. The door to the reception chambers slid open, and a terrified Tian Shijin ran into the room. Gasping after a long run, the boy struggled to tell his sworn father and master the terrible news. Tian Heng was not willing to listen to his son. He rebuked the boy for his intemperance and unworthy behavior before their lord. The bandit's physical training also frustrated his father. He dreamed of raising his son to be an excellent warrior, who would later be able to take control of the black-robed gang. Only now, in front of Tian Heng, there was not a brave warrior on his knees, but a weak, frightened boy who still could not recover his breath. Shin Shiju diligently bowed out, trying to win back his father's benevolent mood. In the next few minutes, the boy would tell him news that would confuse all plans and make not only the black-robed gang, but the entire Xu family as well, doubt the future. Count Su reassured Chan Heng. He convinced the ringleader that his son was respectful enough and therefore did not deserve punishment. Shin Heng turned his attention to a more important matter. The entire morning that the man had spent in Count Su's reception chambers, he had been thinking about Shen Lan's loss. According to Tian Heng's calculations, 10,000 gold coins was enough for the entire Xuanwu dynasty to stand against his son-in-law at the same time. 10,000 gold coins was a considerable sum, even for the Count's court. Under the pressure of the new laws, their land was reduced, but he still had to maintain an army of almost 3,000 men. Count Suanwu loved his people as his own children, and did not want to oppress their freedom, so the finances of the county further failed to make ends meet. Tan Heng and Count Xu estimated that the county was now making a loss every year. Once Shen Lan lost a thousand gold coins, he would either be expelled from the county or killed on the spot. 
Shen Shiju did not understand how to tell his father that Shen Lang not only did not lose 10,000 gold coins, but also won 13,000. Looking straight into his father's eyes, Chen Shiju understood that such speeches were not expected from him now. Both the leader of the black-robed gang and Mr. Xu only won victory. Neither of them could afford to let the X1 Wu dynasty reach the peak of its power again. Count Xu decided to ask the ringleader what he would do if the X1 Wu dynasty refused to pay such a huge debt. Without hiding smugness, Chai and Heng explained to the Lord that Shen Lang had borrowed a large sum of money from their establishment just to play gambling. It was written in black and white on the paper, promissory note. In addition, Tai and Hang does not force anyone to visit his establishment on purpose. This is why the House of Fortune in the city has a relatively clean reputation. Even if the case is referred to the governor, he will still have something to say for himself. Thus, Tai and Hang was going to disgrace the entire Count's court once and for all. Now, behind the black robe leader was the town governor and the governor himself, who were even higher in status than the Count's court. Even if Chuan Hang disgraced the Xuan Wu dynasty, there was nothing the family members could do about it anymore. The so-called age-old nobles, who had lost their lands and military might, would take their time and wait to die. Shen Lan was the only obstacle preventing Count Xu and Tai Hang from implementing the new Xuan Wu city policy. With Governor Zhang Chong completely on the side of the black-robed ringleader, all that was left was to eliminate the insolent boy and not incur any punishment for it. There was nothing to worry about. Shen Lang himself signed the promissory note in front of a dozen witnesses. All that remained was to take the document in his hands and go to the county to demand the money. Shadow Hang had personally vouched to carry out the errand. He would go to the palace of Count and Countess Suanwu this afternoon, and when the time came, he would watch the shocked expressions on the faces of the members of the great dynasty. Chan Hang was already anticipating their gazes, directed at Shen Lan, and filled with a sense of disgust. Finally, Chan Hang and Count Xu paid attention to Chan Shichu, who had been kneeling on his knees all this time with his head guiltily drooping to the floor. The gang leader wanted to know immediately how much money Shen Lang had left in his main playhouse. Qin Shishu, pale with the touch of impending punishment, quietly named the sum of 16,000 gold coins. Tan Hang was already ready to shout with joy and praise his named son, but the latter, completely lost, told his father that 16,000 was the debt of their establishment. Chan Hang, not wanting to listen to anyone else, threw his named son into the wall. All plans turned against the black robe. Tain Han couldn't stop blaming his son and lord for what happened, who had pushed the ringleader to take this dangerous step by promising complete safety. Count Su did not know what to reply to the enraged man. He himself and his family were in a dangerous situation. Ku Chain, Shen Lan's ex-wife, offered to personally check the situation and then act according to the information received. The governor and the mayor were still on their side. A quarter of an hour later, Tian Hang was at the gate of his main gambling house. People crowded outside the casino, demanded the boss immediately pay the debt. Shen Lan, not accustomed to wasting time, managed to win 19,000 gold coins and help some visitors to get another 7,000 gold coins. It turns out that Tian Hang owed the whole city exactly 26,000. For the head of Tian, 26,000 gold coins was an almost unaffordable sum. This amount of money was almost the bulk of all his savings, which he had been saving for many years. Even though Chayan Hang received a pood of gold a day, he always had the added expense of maintaining a hundred personal fighters. In addition, he had to share his income with others. He had noble patrons who protected him when necessary. Among them were the town governor and other officials belonging to the noble families of Xuanwu City. And now it appeared that if he tried to cash such a sum, he might not only be on the verge of bankruptcy. He was also losing the ability to disperse the gold due under the arrangements. Shen Hang looked at Shen Lan and did not understand how this despicable man could even play in the casino and win, especially such sums of money. And on top of that, he also dared to bring along the other gamblers, who also ripped off not small winnings. Chan Hang was in indescribable anger. 
He mentally called the young man every unflattering epithet possible. The man did not understand how this vile brat, that was what he called the boy, dared to take such a risky step and use the most dangerous method of all possible methods. Shine Heng was frantically looking for a way out of this situation. He thought that the best way was to slander Shen Lan and call him a crook. In this way, it was possible to shift the problem from a sore head to a healthy one. But only then a new problem would arise. The young man was the son-in-law of Count Xuan Wu, and by and large, no one had the right to touch him. And apart from that, the guy was supported by several hundred ordinary players from the common people who were winning with his help. They would also come to Shen Lan's aid. And they would do so only even for their own benefit in the future. This was another additional problem that was difficult to deal with. In the meantime, the young man took and unwrapped a bundle filled to the top with earned game chips. He showed the contents to the head of Tian and asked him to pay the bills immediately. He stressed that such a big man as he could not refuse to pay his debt. Chien Hang jumped off his horse and politely, as politely as possible, invited Shen Lan to go inside the House of Fortune. He said that inside the building they could discuss all the details. The young man agreed, but the men around him became indignant. They demanded immediate payment for the chips they had earned. The players worried that Tai and Hang would run away again and not give them the money. The men voiced their objections and doubts. Then Shen Lan reassured the disgruntled men and asked them not to worry. He gave his word that he would never betray the interests of each of them. In addition, Shen Lan promised to satisfy them without fail. The men began to talk over each other. They believed the young man's words. His attitude toward them was important to them. To take even just the fact that the young lord brought them a lot of money. And on top of that, Shen Lan was the count's son-in-law and an impeccable handsome man as well. This meant that he simply could not cheat or not keep his word. The two lords and the guards of the Xuanwu house went to the second floor of the House of Fortune. Here, the head of Tan once again showed his true face. He angrily muttered through his teeth that such tricks of the young man were absolutely ruthless. The man added that his actions were causing his arms to break, as well as the legs of Tian Shizen, who was his most precious named son. Tan Hang asked the young man if this was how the good reputation of Xuanwu County was achieved. Shen Lan, meanwhile, turned toward the window. He listened to the head of Tian while he watched the beautiful fiery sunset. It was slowly setting behind the peaceful city. Then the young man said that if you take it to scale, then of course everyone needs a reputation, but he didn't need it. Then Shen Lan explained that for someone like him, reputation is just a burden. If it is good, all it takes is one bad deed and it is gone in the blink of an eye. If it is not there, everyone will praise him for doing something good, but he is still the same prodigal son. The head of Tian spoke again. He wondered if this wasn't a shameless way to get him to break Tian Shizen's legs. Shen Lan confirmed the man's considerations and praised his shrewdness. But the man cried out in anger, does the young man think that relying on this 19,000 gold coins as a bargaining chip, he can so easily make him break his own arm and Tian Shizen's legs? He added that if he did so, he would lose not only a pair of legs, but all his power. The head of Tian did not calm down and kept talking. The man said that if they found out in the city that he lost a large sum of money to a lowly son-in-law of the Count, adopted by his wife's house, no one would be afraid of him. Besides, he added that if the young man lost the money, he would still find a way and earn it again. And Tian Hang did not want to lose his reputation, because he knew that if he lost it, it would be over for him. He voiced this phrase to Shen Lan as well. Then the young man, smiling, told the head of Tian that he was unfairly accusing him. And he added that he wasn't going to do all that at all. The man's name is simply impossible. And then leisurely clarified exactly what he meant. Chan Hang looked questioningly at the young man. But as it turned out, it was purely about exchanging 19,000 gold pieces for Tian Shizen's legs. It turned out that Tian Hang had misjudged the demands. The head thought about it. Now it turned out that the young man was not so much craving revenge as he was simply greedy for more money. And he decided to himself that he would never give him 19,000 gold pieces.
Tan Hang supposed that 2,000 was still negotiable. And that was if the lad had assiduously begged for such leniency on his part. As it was, such sums were out of the question. Tan Hang had made up his mind. But Shen Lanu had his own opinion on the matter, which he voiced. The young man said that the head of Tan should not only pay him 19,000 gold coins, but also break Tan Shizen's legs. The man was indescribably enraged by what Shen Lan said. He had an uncontrollable fit of rage. Tan Heng was ready to tear and throw. The only thing that stopped him was the presence of the guards of the Xuanwu house, who were guarding the young man. In his anger, the head of Tian frankly shouted to the young man that Tian Shizen was going to kill his entire family precisely on his behalf. For that reason, he could never harm his named son. And then he growled that all his demands could remain mere dreams, including the issuance of numerous gold coins. Tan Heng muttered that he had no intention of giving him a single gold coin. The head went for a more desperate move. Calming down a bit, thinking on the move, Tian Heng suggested inviting the elders of the Xuanwu house or someone else to try to demand at least a debt from him. And he said that it would be interesting for everyone to see if they would break the legs of the impertinent young man. Then the head of Tang tried to shame the young man. The man said that Count Xuanwu had always kept his face and valued his own reputation. He also added that in the past few centuries, there had not been a single son of his who had dared to go to a casino and dared to gamble. And now, when a young man intends to take the gold he has earned in this way by demanding a debt from him, he is only summoning imminent trouble upon himself. For such behavior is fraught with physical harm to him precisely from the Count. Tian Hang dreamed of his father-in-law beating his son-in-law and breaking his legs. The head of Tian tried to get ahead of the event and beat Shen Lan. The man went to the window overlooking the courtyard, opened it, and shouted. The players were still standing below, waiting for the results of the conversation. They turned their eyes to the speaker. Tan Hang told them that since he could afford to open a gambling house, he could also afford to lose money. He then added that all their winnings would be paid out today. Then he called the clerk and asked him to exchange all the customers their chips for money. The men were pleased. They began to show their contentment and admiration with enthusiastic shouts, only now for the head of Thanum. Then the man turned to the young man and asked him to look at these simpletons who can only ingratiate themselves solely with the powerful. He stressed that the players had already forgotten about their former virtue. Tan Heng decided that they would no longer help cause a disturbance. The head thought this was the best way out of the problem. The man could not contain his admiration for his train of thought and reported in his voice that the gambler's money would soon return to him in any case. He believed that the gamblers would simply hold on to it temporarily. With a sly chuckle, the head of Tang said that one could even bet that in less than half a month, more than 9,000 gold coins would be back in his hands. Thus, the head of Tang intended to pacify the players, so that they did not agree to further support Shen Lan and cause him trouble. It seemed one thing was solved. In addition, he expected that the Count would not be able to recover his son-in-law's gambling debt from him. Chen Heng said that the 19,000 gold coins won by the young man could now be considered worthless. The head of Tian also added that he would not give him a single penny, and Shen Lan could not do anything for it. Again, he suggested only dreaming of breaking Tian Shizen's legs with his help. Shen Lan calmly listened to the head speech and watched his demonstrative behavior, then applauded the bladder. The young man said that on his shameless face, he detected notes of charm inherent in himself. But afterwards, he questioned whether he thought he could hide from him and continue his dirty work. The young man stressed that it was useless for the head to continue fighting as long as his casinos were open and functioning. Since he, if he wants, can win as many gold coins as he wants in any of the gambling establishments. And he added that not only would he win himself, but he would bring all the gamblers with him to victory. Then Shen Lan approached the head of Tan at point-blank range and additionally mouthed that until all of his casinos are closed, he will win until he goes bankrupt. And he questioned whether he intended to send someone after him, who could not let him into the establishment or dare to harm him. While Chief Tang was digesting what he had heard, Shen Lan looked out the window at the men gathered below and asked them not to leave. 
He explained that he intended to take them to other establishments where they could win more gold coins. Then with a shout, he called for the head of Tyan to be bankrupted. Now the men were chanting his name again, and this time emotionally admiring the young man. Shen Lan turned around and went to the exit, warning that he did not intend to enter any more conversations, but was going to continue gambling. Shen Lan, as promised, returned to the gambling house and began to play again. Once again, the young man had turned up a wave of victories. He also brought several hundred gamblers with him to the casino, who swept through the establishment, picking up big winnings like a swarm of hungry locusts. The men went crazy with their luck. 100% winnings were guaranteed. Every wager brought in a profit. They only had to bet their chips together with Shen Lan. It was a pure pleasure for them to play this way. It was easier than just picking up ready money. The game was in full swing. The croupiers lost each game in bewilderment. The casino staff were watching and were already standing there with dead pale faces. Before their very eyes, the owner was losing colossal sums of money, and it was a lot of money. At first, the amount the assembled company won was 3,000 gold coins. Then it increased to five. After a short time, it was already 7,000. The debts of the House of Fortune were growing before our eyes. The servant constantly reported the situation upstairs. He also informed the master that Shen Lan won only one gold coin each time, and the rest went to the players who came with him. The head of Tian was furious, and that rage increased with each new report. His second son came up to him and offered to kick Shen Lan out of the casino with his own hands. Without waiting for his father's approval, he fled to the first floor. While in the gambling hall, Shizu called out to the young man. When Shen Lan turned around, he said that if he didn't get out of here himself, he would get help. The young man looked at the son of the head of Tian and calmly asked him what exactly he wanted, why he was distracting him from the game. Then he asked if Shiza was going to beat him up. Then Shen Lan playfully informed the young man that he felt sharply ill and that if you hit him, he would go to bed for a long time. A little later, the young man smiled and told Shizia that his wife would kill anyone who dares even to hit the Count's son-in-law. And he added that it was not only for the offender, but for his whole family as well. These words made the enemy incredibly angry. He shouted, asking if someone here is dissolving his hands. And then he could not stand it and ordered to kick Shen Lan out of the gambling establishment. At this point, the young man laughed and asked who dared to fight with the warriors of Count Xuanmu or hurt the son-in-law of the Count himself. What was going on in the House of Fortune did not please the players. It kept them from winning. Now, they were even angry. The men began to shout that since they had opened the casino, they should have the courage to lose with dignity. They also wondered if the owner of the House of Fortune was going to keep paying his debts. The customers also stood up for Shen Lan and added that the masters would have to fight them first and then attack the esteemed lord. The son of the head of Tyan did not know what to do in this situation. He saw and understood that gamblers were very fickle in their views and unpredictable in their actions. Not long ago, they were chanting his father's name, and now they were going after the man who offered to make them easy money. The young man decided that the only option left was to find a way and get rid of all the gamblers at once. At this point, the head of Tan came down. He said that the House of Fortune was closing for the day and would suspend its gambling activities for a certain period of time. The man also added that all winnings would be paid tomorrow. There was a strong reaction of indignation on the part of the customers. They thought that they would be denied payments altogether and would not be allowed to play any more. Then Shen Lan reassured those present and suggested to go to other gambling houses belonging to the head of Tian, since the House of Fortune is closed. There were still four establishments where the young man intended to take a company of gambling men and collect winnings. The men liked such an offer. Head Tian watched what was happening and mentally blamed himself for not burying Shen Lan back then in the forest. He madly regretted that he had not dealt with the problem when it was still in the bud. He now realized that he had let the tiger loose in the mountains and was now feeding it himself. The customers walked toward the exit of the House of Fortune. Then Chief Tang ordered Shiza to follow them and stop all the gambling houses belonging to their family. The man was left alone and overflowing with anger.
He needed any way to solve the problem that had arisen, and was growing bigger and bigger each time. The five casinos that Shen Lan was going to go to brought in more than 60% of the income for the Black Robe Gang. They were Tian Hang's gold mine. Even when they were closed, the head of Tian was losing a lot of money every day. And now these casinos were closed. But even with such a big loss of daily profits, there was no way the man could or would concede victory to Shen Lan. The situation with Shen Lan and the casino was not the hardest blow for the head of Tian. As it turned out, it's not the outsiders that hurt the most, but their own. After a recent showdown at the House of Fortune, a clerk approached Tian Heng. He beckoned the man to follow him to Mr. Zhang Jin. The servant showed him where to go and added that he was already expected. The head of Tian immediately went after the messenger. When he entered the room, he saw the head of Shu sitting and waiting for him. The latter immediately spoke. The man said that he had heard about the closure of several gambling houses. Chief Tan dryly confirmed the rumors. Then the head of Exu recalled that a share of 35% of the gambling houses of Tian Hang was given to the Zhang family in exchange for their patronage. Now that the gambling houses that were under the leadership of Tian Hang had closed, not even having time to bring in the promised profits, it caused considerable inconvenience to the protection side. The patrons expressed their displeasure and concern about this. Chief Tzu emphasized that he was a representative of the Zhang family and was authorized to go out and question Tian Heng about the situation. The man emphasized that all of these gambling houses were good, working, and had no problems aggravating their prosperity. Now the only question he was interested in was why they had closed. The man wanted a detailed answer. Then the head of Tian sadly reported that this was a forced measure. And he added that if the gambling houses are not closed in the present time, then in the future the losses will be incurred not only by him, but by all those concerned. Then Chief Tzu asked if Shen Lan's playing skills were that good. The man was only able to confirm the fact. He said that he did not know and could not explain the reasons for this incredible phenomenon. Naturally and unquestionably, the head of Xu blamed everything on Tang Heng. Then the head immediately offered to deal with the enemy quietly. After all, he was willing to take such a desperate step. But Xu doubted the rightness of the cardinal move. Even more he doubted whether Tian would dare to do such a thing. Chief Xu pointed out that Shen Lan was constantly surrounded by the Count's warriors, and it would take a very good master to kill him. The man also added that even if their plan worked, then Count Xuan Wu would have his hands untied and be free to use his sword against them. And Xu didn't know if they would be strong enough to stand up to the heavy cavalry of the house of Xuan Wu. Head Tian thought about it. The head of He Tu asked what exactly Shen Lan was trying to achieve. Tian replied that he wanted him to personally and publicly break his son Qin Shizen's legs. The head of Xu was surprised. He did not understand what the actual problem was for the head of Tian in this matter. That's what he told Tian Heng. And then he added that he already had many named sons. And he added that even if one gets hurt and fails, he has someone to replace him. But Chief Tan stated that Shizen was one of his most distinguished successors. He loved his son and trusted him. The man stressed that if he broke his legs in front of everyone, it would finally disappoint all his subordinates and then his reputation as a gang leader would be completely and irretrievably destroyed. Suddenly, the men heard a man's voice coming from behind the screen. Chief Tian recognized the speaker. It was Zhang Jin. He was an unobtrusive witness to his and Hu's conversation, and before that, he didn't appear and didn't speak. Now, after thinking about the situation, he communicated his decision. The man insisted that Tian should agree to Shen Lan's condition. Zhang Jin stressed that one should not delay in taking decisive action in this matter. In addition, every day of delay in the operation of gambling establishments costs everyone too much. He added that it is better to agree to the conditions put forward sooner than later. To somehow cheer the man up and spur him on to decisive action, Zhang Jin promised Tian that one day Shen Lan would surely die. And when that time came, he would let him personally deliver a crushing blow. Zhang Jin emphasized that Shen Lan was not a particular problem worthy of attention. He only saw him as a mere pawn who played no special role in the main game.
The man stressed that their main goal was the county of Xuanwu. The head of Tian was so furious that he clenched his fists. Blood began to come out of his clenched palms. Zhang Jin went on talking. He said that when they got rid of the county of Xuanwu and took their territory and all the military power belonging to them, then Tian was waiting for a promotion and great success. The man also promised him the position of deputy mayor. But he stressed that all this would only be possible if they successfully executed and completed their big plan. The head of Tian obediently listened, then bowed to Zhang Jin and bowed out. A quarter of an hour passed. Now the head of Tian acted decisively and purposefully. He immediately invited Shen Lan to the House of Fortune and told him that he agreed to break Tian Shizen's legs in public in order for them to separate and stop making a showdown. But the young man listened to the head of Tian and said that this was the price that had been demanded before. Now, however, the terms have changed somewhat. At the questioning expression of the head of Tian, Shen Lan replied that his other named son, namely Tian Shizi, had just dared to shout at him and even threatened to beat him up. And the young man stressed that among all this was the most outrageous thing of all, he pointed his finger in his direction. And now it should have been up to the head of Tian to respond to such an act by his son. Shen Lan said that he should, in addition to the previous conditions, also break Tian Shizu's arms and legs. The man was furious. A new fit of rage was upon his head. He angrily shouted that there was a limit to his patience. To this, Shen Lan replied that if the man again did not agree to the proposed conditions, then the rates would continue to change. Tian Hang analyzed the horror of the whole situation and realized that he could not refuse to fulfill these requirements. And Shen Lan added that otherwise he would have to break not only the legs of his named sons and the arms of one of them, but also every bandit sent to his house for the mayhem they were about to commit. The head of Tian could no longer contain himself. The man shouted out that he would kill him. Everything was so possible and even more desirable. Tian Hang stood up, swung around, and grabbed the young man with both hands. Infatuated with a sense of revenge, stupefied with rage, he lifted the Count's son-in-law above his head with ease. The angry Tian could not be appeased by anyone. No one could stop the furious head. It would no longer be necessary. The man held Shen Lan above him and tried to tear him to pieces. The man was very determined. The head of Tian fought this way to get rid of all possible problems once and for all. He was blinded by rage. The young man's last sentence resurfaced in his mind, where he threatened to change the terms of the price in the future if he refused him now. Chan Heng really wanted to rip this guy apart. Just now. At this moment, he craved his blood more than anything else. Tear him apart on the spot. Kill. Destroy. Revenge. Anything to never see or hear him again. At the same time, other thoughts flashed through Chan Heng's mind. The man knew that he should not do that. Revenge in a fit of rage was desirable to the point of madness, but impossible to the extreme. Now, almost in hand, he held the one who had ruined and destroyed the business to which the man had devoted several decades of his life and hard work. Business had just gotten better and was booming. The gambling business promised great prosperity in the future, and now everything was falling apart. Finally, the head of Tyne gathered the last remnants of his patience and dryly pronounced his decision. He was willing to break Tyne Shizen's legs and Tyne Shizu's arms and legs in public. At this point, Shen Lan made further instructions regarding the punished. After punishing the sons, Tyne Hang was to expel them from the Black Ribbon Gang. Visiting, sending doctors, and giving money for treatment were also forbidden. The crippled young men were to be left to themselves, and being in the situation in which they would refuse, they themselves looked for a way out and help. At the same time, Shen Lan added that if he suddenly deemed these two unhappy enough, then he would go back to the gambling houses and lead all the casinos to another collapse. Another wave of anger swept over the man. But the head of Tyan had no choice but to agree with everything, and he grabbed himself by the head and agreed with every item of the demands put forward, and in the end ironically promised to fulfill all of Shen Lan's conditions. After a short time, people began to gather at the entrance to the House of Fortune.
A place of honor was also set aside, and a chair was placed for the main spectator, Shen Lan. A little later, Tain Shizen and Tain Shizi were brought out. The young men were tied up. The locals immediately recognized them. Only, they did not understand what had happened and what the guys had done. But one thing was clear to everyone, that the case was going to be serious. Onlookers guessed that the head of Tan would punish his sons for some wrongdoing. Although everyone understood how Tai and Hang felt about the two sons. The locals knew that the head up to this point had always forgiven them and turned a blind eye to the many transgressions of these two young men. The onlookers were talking loudly among themselves. The guards told everyone to be quiet. The head of Tan came out and approached the two bound young men. The man spoke. He turned to his named sons and asked how much he valued and treasured them before. And now the man expressed his displeasure that they, because of their personal dislike for young Master Shen Lan, had decided to get even with the latter, and did it behind the head of Tian's back. Only by their actions, they almost brought great misfortune to their family. Next, Chen Heng shouted that Mr. Shen Lan was not only Count Xuan Wu's son-in-law, but also his close friend. Now the two unruly sons were accused of insulting a respected man. Tian Hang went on to say that he had to punish them severely for breaking family rules, and he added that if he didn't, he might be the head. Then he told his servant to bring him a stick. The head of Tan moved closer to the first son and quietly whispered a request in his ear that he not blame him for what had happened. The man then grabbed a stick, stepped back, swung it around, and began kicking the young man in the legs. Tian Han continued hitting him until he heard a crunch, which was evidence of broken bones. Shizen fell to the ground with his legs mangled. People watched this bloodthirsty spectacle and were horrified. Everyone knew that Xian Shizen was the most valuable son of the head. At the same time, they could clearly see how Tian Hang had really broken the guy's legs. Now the head approached his second son. Shiza understood what was about to happen to him. He turned to his father and asked if he was really going to do the same to him. Chan Hang only shouted for him to keep quiet, and he himself swung around and hit the guy. Chan Shiza started shouting that he wouldn't accept his punishment. He mouthed that he had done everything for the Black Ribbon Gang, but his father didn't listen to him. He couldn't listen to anyone now either. Tan Hang continued striking until the bones in both legs cracked. The mangled and bloodied Shiza fell down. Then the head of Tian began to break his arms. The man struck his upper limbs with the stick until the bones cracked here as well. From the pain, Tian Shiza fainted. Now he was silent. The punishment was carried out. Those who saw what was happening murmured that Tian Hang had not just broken Shizen's legs and Shizu's arms and legs. They whispered that the head immediately destroyed both his support and the prestige he had earned. His warriors knew that these were the two guys who had always been unwaveringly loyal to the head and very agile in any job. There was never any remark to them. In their eyes, what they now received was unfair. Each of the sons of the Black Ribbon Gang now wondered if any of them would be the next victim of the same massacre. After these events, Tain Heng's reputation was quite shaken. More specifically, it simply crumbled like a house of cards. He lost the trust of everyone in the Black Ribbon Gang. After all that, the head of Tain turned to Shen Lan and asked if he was satisfied with the result of the punishment. The young man replied that he was almost satisfied with the results. Then he added that the head of Tain should remember what he had said yesterday. Shen Lan stressed, however, that, as he had already ascertained, Tan Heng was a man of his word. Then he asked if the man remembered well what they had said yesterday. The head of the Tian grumbled angrily that he remembered everything very well. And then he asked the Count's son-in-law how much he would have to pay to make up for today's losses. And under his breath, Chien Hang muttered that he wished that the young man would wait for a while and wait for Xuanwu County to disappear from the face of the earth. Then Chien Hang would no doubt get even with his enemy. Suddenly, Shen Lan said that it was late, and they still hadn't finished. The head of Tian looked questioningly at the young man. Then he roared, how could it be that all this was not yet over? But Shen Lan kindly added that he did not insist on anything at all, and was not forcing anyone to do anything. And simply, as if casually, he added that this was just a statement of fact. 
Now Chien Hang just wanted to live out the day. The man looked at the Count's son-in-law, discouraged, and the young man, smiling modestly, said that the day before he won 19,000 gold coins in his gambling house, and rhetorically asked to either agree or deny this fact. But since everything was known without further confirmation, Shen Lang added that evade paying debts from Tian Hen exactly will not work, and asked to give him the money immediately, as very soon his wife will call him home for dinner, and tardiness was not part of his lifestyle. Then Chief Tan nervously informed him that he had lost more than 10,000 gold coins today alone, handing out debts to customers. This already meant that the House of Fortune's budget was almost empty. Tian Heng had already frankly told Shen Lang that there were no coins left in the treasury at all, and there was no place to get them from, even though the young man would demand them immediately. And in the end, he muttered that Shen Lan is too greedy. Tan Heng wanted, in every way, to avoid settling such a big debt. Then Shen Lan said that he understood the difficult situation in which Tian Heng found himself. In this regard, and on the basis of the fact that he is a loyal friend of the head, he will not force the man to give the last. The young man offered to give away a small sum at once, only 2,000 gold coins. And for the remaining 17,000, he asked to write a promissory note. This message finally enraged Tain Heng. Another wave of anger swept over the head. No, it was already overwhelming him. The man furiously shouted that 2,000 gold coins was the most that House of Fortune could do right now. To give up that money was to declare bankruptcy. Tian was nervous and furious. He tried any way he could to bring down the amount owed. Furthermore, the man didn't understand how a person could be so unscrupulous and go this far. In his eyes, Shen Lan, no matter how much you give, it would not be enough. Moreover, to give the gold to this upstart Shen Hang had no intention whatsoever and now he was spinning like a frying pan. But the young man was also not going to back down from his decisions. Now he suggested to the head of Tian that their matter should be settled sooner rather than later. At the same time, he added that he was very much afraid of a situation where one day he would not be able to control his legs, and not holding back, would go to play in his casino again. This was a transparent hint from Shen Lan that in any case, sooner or later, Tan Heng's gambling establishments awaited one inevitable fate. Shen Lan hurried the man, telling him that it was late and his wife was waiting for him at home with dinner ready. And if he was late, the food would be cold and unpalatable. That might cause additional distress, and he wouldn't want that. Chan Heng had only one desire. He wanted nothing more than to kill the young man. Again, here and now, right here, in front of everyone. The man was holding the stick with which he had beaten and maimed his sons the day before. The man swung it and was about to strike. Tan Heng endured as much as he could, tolerated everything. But this was already a prohibitive level. All that was left was to deliver the death blow, and nothing else was needed. He knew that everything would be solved in an instant. Suddenly, the head of Tan approached his servant and asked to see a piece of paper. He was holding a note addressed to Tian Heng. The man took the paper and unfolded it. The message had the following text written on it. Just do as Shen Lan says. Give him the money. The family customs in Xuanwu County are very strict. They will not tolerate dirty money from casino winnings. The count will personally break his legs. The head of Tian immediately realized that this order came from the Zhang family. The man looked around and saw a representative of the Zhang family watching everything that was going on from the second floor window of the Fortune Corps. In his own way, this reassured him. Then Tan Hang decided to quench his rage at least a little and broke into his stick that was still in his hand. Throwing away the useless pieces of wood and waiting another minute, the man said to his interlocutor that he agreed to give him some of the money. Head Tian called the casino clerk and told him that Mr. Shen Lan won money in their institution and told him to immediately go to the vault and bring from there 2,000 gold coins to pay him. The servant immediately went to carry out the order of the head. After a short time, there were two chests of gold on the table and there was a bill of debt. Chief Tian again turned to Shen Lan and asked if he was now finally satisfied with everything. The young man went over and looked at everything he had collected. 
He took the envelope, unfolded the promissory note, and began to read. When he studied the paper closely, he was in complete agreement, which he declared to the head. Xin Hang thought to himself at that moment that everything was fine with the receipt, except that he, this upstart, would never be able to cash any money with it. The man thought he had thought of everything and could now control the repayment of the debt, or rather not the repayment. The plan was to work out, most of the gold would stay with him, and also Count Xuan Wu would break his legs when he found out about the source of his son-in-law's earnings. Shen Lan, meanwhile, opened the chests of gold and checked their contents. The people who watched everything that was going on did not leave until now. They saw every scene and every event, heard every word. When Shen Lan opened the chests, they too saw the coins. They were amazed and delighted by such a large amount of gold that could be seen in one moment. The common people had never seen so much gold before. The young man checked everything and told the head of Tian Hang that he was satisfied with the way the man kept his word. Tian Hang thought to himself that he should take his coins and go to Count Xuan Wu, where he would be left with broken legs. He daydreamed and saw the furious father-in-law punishing his son-in-law for actions that humiliated him as head and put a stain on the reputation of the entire county. But this day and its events were by no means over for Tian Hang. Suddenly Shen Lan stated that it was only 2,000 gold coins. The young man questioningly continued his speech and added why he should care about them. Then he asked Tian Hang how many people in his gambling houses had gone bankrupt and destroyed their families over the years. Shen Lan formidably asked the head of Tian how he could watch, tolerate all of this, and even allow this kind of thing to happen. The man was puzzled by the new questions that suddenly flew in him. He was no longer expecting any blows on his head for today. As he came to his senses, Shen Lan added that he perceived the money to be mere dirt. He noted that he had not come to their casino to win gold coins. His purpose was to teach a lesson to some greedy and cruel people, and to bring justice to thousands of abused families. People took Shen Lan's words particularly emotionally. They began to exclaim that Mr. Shen was very humane and had a high sense of duty. The young man continued to speak. He said that his father-in-law, Count Xuanwu, always reminded him to love the people as his children. Shen Lan added that today he had taught the House of Fortune a lesson, and he did it not for himself, but for the countless people of Xuanwu who had suffered all these years at the hands of lawless people. People were shocked by what they heard. Then Shen Lan declared that he would not take a single gold coin from all that money. He said that they had all been shamelessly taken from the people and were now partly back. The young man took the coins and began to toss them to the people. There was a lot of gold. It turned out to be a whole rain of gold. The locals could not believe that so much money was falling on them. They began to snatch every coin. A stampede ensued. The head of Tian watched all this and plunged abruptly into another fit of furious rage. The man angrily shouted to Shen Lan that he had made him break the arms and legs of his own two sons, and now he was buying people's hearts. Only he's doing it all with his money too. In the eyes of the head of Tian, everything that was going on was not just an insult to his personality, but an insult to his personal intelligence. The man was once again on the verge of madness. Nothing was stopping him now, and there was nothing that could stop him. Tan Hang could only shout that together with Shen Lanu, they could not exist on this earth. At that moment, people were enthusiastically chanting Shen Lan's name. They wished him long life. They wished long years and prosperity for Xuan Wu County. And in the midst of these cries came the cries of the head of Tian that they could not exist together. From the second floor of the House of Fortune, the representative of the House of Zhang continued to watch everything that was going on. He himself could not understand how things had come to such an end. The man concluded that Shen Lan's pretty face was just a mask hiding a treacherous person underneath. The observer turned to Mr. City Councilor, who was across the street. The official was out of sight of the people. The vis-a-vis -vis asked him about Shen Lan. Specifically, he was interested in the following question, whether the young man was rejoicing ahead of time, given the presence of such chaos around him. The mayor answered unequivocally and categorically. He believed it could not be otherwise. In his eyes, everything was under control and not out of danger. 
The young man who was openly observing said, snidely, that now, with so many people surrounding Shenlan and collecting gold coins next to him, there might be a sudden accident in the crush. The man stressed that this was a very fortunate moment to take advantage of. Most importantly, it would have nothing to do with them directly. The rain of gold coins continued to fall on the assembled crowd. The little crush continued too. People greedily grabbed every coin, trying to get it before their neighbor and collect more. The mayor confirmed that in such a suitable situation, it is very convenient to set up an accident for a certain person. At the same time, he noted that no one would be able to accuse them or even draw any link with them or discover a trail leading to specific people. The representative of the Zhang family decided to clear the air once more and make sure of his reasoning. He questioned the town manager about the fact that if Shen Lana was accidentally run over or maimed today, it would just be business as usual. The man asked for confirmation of what he had said. He immediately received an unequivocal and categorical positive answer. The mayor decided to make an even more detailed clarification. He said that since it was a crush, of course, many people could die. It could be dozens or even hundreds. And all these accidental casualties would be considered commonplace. In doing so, neither Shen Lan nor Xuanwu County will be able to be exonerated. The man sitting across from the town clerk thought to himself that what he heard was worthy of a civil servant. In his eyes, the official was petty and calculating, and in addition to all that, cold-blooded and bloodthirsty. He concluded that the man was indeed more violent than the officer. The representative of the Zhang family had another thought that slipped through his mind. Namely, what kind of heart a person must have in order to just kill dozens of innocent people just to destroy Xuanwu County at the same time. A third thought flashed through his young mind as well, whether his vis-a-vis -vis was afraid of giving birth to a child backwards. A fourth thought reached him, that as long as there was a goal, and it was one, it didn't matter how many people might die, even if they were innocent. In his voice he dared to say only the following, that this was not a bad thing and urged a hurry. He noted that they should proceed with their plan. The men drank to their common cause and laughed. Down below, meanwhile, golden rain continued to fall on the locals. People did not stop to greet Count Xuanwu. They chanted the young master's name. People wished Shen Lan a long life. Meanwhile, a dozen Zanjin warriors disguised and already mingled in the crowd of people. The intention of the malefactors was that the dummy warriors, under the pretext of fighting for gold coins, quietly infiltrated the crowd of ordinary people. Here they would quietly be able to get close to Shen Lan and wrap up some great chaos beside him, and then in the midst of the confusion, trample the young man to death on the spot. They were also to cause further unrest among the people and complete the ensuing crush, which would lead to the deaths of others as well. In the end, all of the crimes could be blamed on the county and its worshippers. The plan was already in motion. Disguised soldiers infiltrated the crowd and dispersed. Only there was a little mix-up. Shen Lan was watching the assembled crowd. No one accounted for his keen eye and piercing mind. He noticed several people who were at his wedding. The young man remembered exactly that they were people who served Zhang Jin and Li Wang. It was now clear to the young man why Tai and Heng's subordinates had been silent all this time and offered no resistance. Until this moment, Shen Lan thought this circumstance strange, and he still could not find a suitable explanation. But now everything became clear to him. He saw that to the head of Tian came to the rescue of his patrons. Only, they did not take into account the clever brain Shen Lan knew, which allowed him to easily remember many faces. This ability helped and bailed him out in this difficult situation as well. The young man clapped his hands and drew everyone's attention. He asked for absolute silence. Then he told no one to move. People listened to him. There was complete silence. No one moved. Then Shen Lanu picked up the open chests and reported that the gold coins had run out. Then the disguised messengers began to create chaos among the people. One of them shouted that there was definitely more money. The other offered to take it all for themselves. They began to incite the people to revolt and work to create any provocation. Shen Lan analyzed the situation. He figured out who was doing the dirty work. The young man saw that they were exactly the same disguised men he had recognized earlier. 
He concluded that they were indeed plotting bad things. Then Shen Lan held up the promissory note written by Tian Heng and shouted that there was more of it. The young man explained that this paper held 17,000 gold coins that Tian Heng owed him. Shen Lan promised the people that he would not take a single copper for himself out of it either. People were deeply impressed and at the same time delighted by Shen Lan's deed. The man, meanwhile, continued to speak to the people. He asked where Tian Heng got the money, where so much gold came from in the House of Fortune. And he himself answered the questions asked. Shen Lan said that it was money earned by the people, their sweat and blood. He added that these coins were also not his. He said that every last dime belonged to the people gathered here. Shen Lan also said that he would send this document to the mayor so that he could collect the full amount of the said debt for the people of Xuanwu. He again stressed that he didn't need a penny of that amount, and he promised that all the gold coins would be used to help the poor families of their city, and this mission would fall on the shoulders of the responsible official. The head of Tian had another attack of particular rage at that moment. A wave of rage swept over him and carried him to the bottom. This time, he couldn't even stay on his feet. Now the man was on all fours and spitting blood. This time, his son-in-law's count drove him to bloody vomit. People continued to praise Shen Lan and the generous county of Xuanwu. The young man saw that the disguised, familiar soldiers were slowly moving between people toward him. He wondered what would happen if he let them get close, but then he changed his mind to calculate the situation and at the last moment decided to make a move, and tried to speed up his decision. Finally, he shouted out to the people that they should trust the mayor Li Wol, who would do everything necessary for his people. Shen Lan headed inside the House of Fortune and ran upstairs. The men, who were watching everything from the second floor, witnessed the latest events as well. They didn't even have time to discuss what had happened. Events continued to unfold rapidly. The town governor decided to quickly leave the room and quietly leave through the back door. He had already said goodbye to the representative of the Zhang family when suddenly he was greeted by Shen Lan, who ran into the room. He quickly grabbed the mayor by his clothes and led him to the window. Then Count Xuan was son-in-law, shouted loudly, addressing the assembled citizens. Shen Lan said that Mr. Town Governor had also decided to attend the event and was now with them. People began shouting out how wonderful it was that the mayor, as an honest official, was also here. Some of the people wondered why the high-ranking man was staying at the House of Fortune. At these moments, Shen Lan noticed that the dummy warriors, who were scattered among the people, were not moving, but they were not leaving either. He concluded that they were afraid of causing a disturbance and bringing unwanted fire down on the town governor. Then Shen Lan took out a promissory note of Tai and Heng and said at the top of his voice, addressing the Lord Mayor, that this document is the hope of countless poor people of Xuanwu City. He said he knew how much the official loves the people here, and he stressed that his love was like his love for his own children. And this all meant that the young man could entrust him with this important mission. Shen Lan said that he was a small man and could not pay back such a mass of gold on this debt. The young son-in-law said that if an official like the magnanimous town governor intervened in the case, he was confident that justice would be done. Shen Lan again stressed that only he was able to intervene in this difficult matter and fully pull down the debts for the benefit of the poor. He also stated that Tai and Heng would not dare refuse the town governor and would not dare to pay the due amount of gold. Now an attack of particular fury was upon the mayor. He was bereft of both mobility and the power of speech. Only somewhere inside his head was the thought that this is how it works. The mayor continued to be in a state of frenzied rage. Additionally, a wave of rage and indignation overtook him. He yelled that this bill of debt should have been an ordinary piece of paper. The representative of the Zhang family himself was shocked by what was happening and just silently watched everything. Shen Lang was pleased with the result of the work that had been done. He remained calm, looking at the people and smiling at them. The town governor, just like everyone else present, understood that there was no way he could get away with it now. The situation had now developed in such a way that he would indeed have to pay back the entire sum of money assigned to him. It was an unthinkable amount of gold, 
and most importantly, it was hitting the wallets of the officials themselves. The town governor couldn't stand it and yelled that Shen Lan was a real poisonous snake. At this moment, he imagined nothing else but a kind of snake monster that Count Xuan Wu's son-in-law instantly turned into. This creature was not just standing in front of him. It was now obliging him from head to toe and binding his hands tightly. The official was well aware that the gambling house only formally belonged to Tai and Heng. This meant that losing money was a loss to their property. The man was also clearly aware that if he did not take this receipt of debt into his hands now, unnecessary rumors would start spreading one after another tomorrow. He even imagined people talking about how their town manager and Tyne Heng were in cahoots. Then the man imagined the constant conversations among the locals discussing his patronage of gambling houses. And he decided that this definitely could not be allowed to happen. A decision had to be made to take concrete action. So he pulled himself together. He put on his most charming smile and grabbed the promissory note in his hands and mouth to Shen Lan not to worry. Then the town governor added that he would not deceive the young man's expectations, much less those of the locals. Shen Lan looked at the man and said that he could see how the official really loved his people like his own children. It remained to be seen. Then the young man again turned to the assembled locals and mouthed that he entrusted these 17,000 gold coins to the town governor. In parting, Shen Lan added that the official's justice stretched to the heavens and he would certainly not let his people down. Then the young man said that it was late and it was time for him to leave. He decided to retreat first and, immediately bowing to the people and those present, quickly bid farewell to the locals. The people began to shout his name again enthusiastically. They wished Shen Lan good health. Then they greeted and wished the well-being of Mayor Liu. Shen Lan, meanwhile, fled out the back door. He took his guard and quickly left. At that moment, people burst into the House of Fortune and began looking for the town governor. They asked the official not to leave and continued to cheer him on. The locals asked for help in getting justice for them. The room became increasingly crowded with people. All of this was happening in front of the representative of the Zhang family. The man could not believe what was happening. He clearly saw and understood that Shen Lan, in some amazing way, had easily brought fire down on the head of the town governor. The man watched, analyzed, and made the final conclusion that he had definitely underestimated Shen Lan's abilities. Night fell. The residence of Count Xuanwu was restless. They were all waiting for the return of their son-in-law Shen Lan. The Count's wife did not leave her husband. She sat in an armchair and was worried in her own way. And the Count walked from side to side and did not find his place. Periodically, the father of the family turned to Jin Zhang and inquired whether Shen Lan had returned. But the soldier replied that he had not yet. The Count was nervous and angry. He beat his chest and muttered that he cared too much about his honest name. Because of this, he could not retract his words. And so he allowed Shen Lan to leave. Then the Count's wife turned to her husband and said that nothing terrible would happen if the young man failed. But the Count continued to be nervous and angry. The man clearly understood that Li Wuying and Zhang Jin were behind Tai and Heng. He knew very well that one of them was cunning as a snake and the other was a ruthless scumbag. The Count added that, and Shen Lan among them, was a simple fool who had just stepped onto the path of life and was taking his first timid steps. The man mouthed that he was not afraid of his son-in-law's failure. He was worried that he would simply fall into a cleverly woven trap and it would lead to great distress, if not tragedy. The Count's wife then went over to him and told him that Tan Hang and his patrons would not dare to go too far, even if they thought they had their hands full with the governor. She once again tried to reassure her spouse. Count Suan Wu could only hope for the fear of these unscrupulous and unfit men. But he was attacked by doubts. The Count himself was no longer as strong as before. Even the Earl doubted his own strength and abilities. But despite all this, he was convinced that Li Wan knew his place and would not provoke the Count to extreme actions. Finally, the Count added that let Shen Lan suffer great losses this time and may it allow him to gain experience, to learn lessons, and in the future, to teach him to be careful of his mistakes. The couple were on their way to their chambers. At that moment, Master Jin Hui of Xuanwu County ran into the corridor.
He called out to the lady and the master. The count turned around and questioningly shouted how badly Shen Lang was hurt and whether Tianheng had injured him. The man was displeased and alarmed at the same time. His speech was definitely indicative of that. Then Jin Hui declared that the son-in-law of the count had won an unqualified and flawless victory. The man added that he had practically bankrupted Tian Heng. The clerk also added that Shen Lan had caused the head of Tian to break Tian Shizen's legs and break Tian Shizen's legs and arms. Jin Hui stated that this all happened in front of the locals, and stressed that Shen Lan eventually managed to publicly make Tian Heng vomit bloodily. The Exuan Wu spouses listened to the report and were deeply shocked. The Count asked how all this was possible, and the men did not put what they heard in their heads. The Count thought to himself that Shen Lan is a simple little man. At the same time, the man wondered how he was able to cope with the local serpent Shen Heng and resist the forces that stood behind him. Count Xuan Wu ordered Jin Hui to get up and walk with them inside the house where everyone could talk together. The servant followed the couple. The couple sat across from the messenger and listened attentively to the whole story of the day from Jin Hui's lips. Count Xuan Wu learned the details of Shen Lan's and Tai and Hing's jousting. When he heard that Shen Lan went to the casino and allowed himself to gamble, Count Xuan Wu became indescribably furious. The man stood up and demanded to repeat what he had said earlier. The Count could not believe that Shen Lan dared to go to the casino and gamble. But when the man heard that his son-in-law had gone on a killing spree and won all the money, the man began to have doubts. Contradictory thoughts overtook him at the same time. The Count was both happy and angry. The man then asked if Shen Lan had taken the gold coins he had won at the casino with him. Jin Hui clarified the situation. He said that Shen Lan had given all the money away to the poor people of Xuanwu City. The man specified that every last coin. In addition, it turned out that he had ruined the treacherous plan Zhang Jin and Li Wang. When the wife Ex Wu heard what Jin Hui said, they were surprised and happy with the actions of her son-in-law even more. The Count's wife cried and said that Shen Lan was a wonderful son-in-law. The woman added that the young man was not only able to maintain the greatness of their family, but also to raise his own reputation to an unreachable height. Jin Hui stood up and reported that this was now all that had happened for today. The Count then commented on what had happened. He said that the scumbag, meaning his trembling son-in-law, was incredibly cunning. His wife laughed and added that she thought Shen Lan had a very good character. She emphasized that her attitude and respect for her parents alone already proved such conclusions. Count Xuan Wu slipped his mind that Shen Lan had not only ruined Li Wan and Zhang Zheng's plot, but also brought his anger down on the head of the town governor. What struck him most was that his son-in-law avoided defeat and did not fail and achieved a magnificent victory. The Count sat down and continued his reflections. It was a great surprise to the man that Li Wang and his henchmen actually dared to strike at the Jin family. It appeared that the Xuanwu County was powerless and no longer good for anything. The Count understood the price of Shen Lan's victory today, but he was also clearly aware of the level of danger of all the events that had occurred. At this point, Count Xuanwu slapped his palm on the table. The man then stood up and said that things could not go on like this. He continued his speech and said that who knows how this boy will get out of hand in the future and what it will lead to. The Count was going to take this opportunity to crush Shen Lan's arrogance to the root. Otherwise, according to his father-in-law, at this rate, he would soon go to rest in heaven. The Count's wife heard her husband's words and said not to worry her husband, as she intends to help him teach Shen Lan a worthy lesson. A short time passed. Now the young man was trying to sneak unnoticed into his chambers, located in Xuanwu County. Shen Lan knew that his father-in-law was an extremely conservative man and would not accept what his son-in-law did today. The young man decided not to run into trouble and enter the house silently. He thought it would be best to go to Mulan's room first and hide for a while in her room, and when things had calmed down and the house had fallen asleep, then he would move to his own room, where he would rest peacefully after a hard day. But he was unexpectedly met by an angry father-in-law. The young man immediately bowed to the man. The Count also greeted Shen Lan, 
calling him a gambling god, and congratulated him on his safe return home. The meeting was not just unexpected, it was super sudden. It clearly did not correspond to the status of the count. It turned out that the majestic husband was hiding behind the door and waiting for his son-in-law. Shen Lang was even more surprised by the sarcastic manner of such a decent man. He just had time to think when the Count learned to speak and behave in such a way. The young man immediately admitted to his father-in-law his mistake, but the Count was angry and frankly indignant. He immediately chided his son-in-law for being too brave and for not telling him how to defeat Chen Heng. The man cried out that he thought of something ingenious that Shen Lan had come up with, and his son-in-law just went to the casino to gamble. The Count angrily added that in hundreds of years of history, there had never been a son in his county who, before he could finish, Shen Lan rushed to sincerely apologize and convince his father-in-law that he would never dare to do anything like that again. He assured the man that his foot would never again step over the boundaries of the gambling houses. The Count was gaining momentum in expressing his displeasure at his son-in-law's behavior today. But the latter did not give up either. The young man kept shouting that he would never enter another casino again. Shen Lan claimed that he was naughty and very wrong today, fully admitting his guilt. He asked not to be angry with him, not to ruin his precious health. At last, the son-in-law told his father-in-law that he had said all the right things, and he admitted that he had learned a good lesson. The young man also promised that he would certainly follow the Count's instructions in future. He further bowed and begged. Shen Lan's behavior baffled the man. Now his wife rushed to the rescue of her son-in-law. She ran up to the Count and began to calm him. The woman asked him not to be angry with the young and unintelligent young man. Then she added that among other things, Shen Lan had exceptionally good intentions. The wife affectionately asked her husband to stop scolding the boy. The Count did not understand why his wife was so quick to rush to defend her son-in-law. Moreover, she herself said that she would help him to teach this rascal a lesson. He voiced his thoughts to his wife in displeasure. Then the woman reacted quickly. She immediately turned towards Shen Lang and threatened him to never visit such places again. The Count's wife warned the lad that if he went there again, she would have to punish him severely. Shen Lang bowed and accepted her exhortations and agreed with her every word. Then his mother-in-law again changed her anger for mercy and asked if he was hungry. Then, without waiting for an answer, she told him to hurry up and go to the house, where dinner and his wife were waiting for him. The Count was utterly confused. He expected anything from his wife, but certainly not this. His husband turned to his wife and questioningly whispered through his teeth what was happening to her. She didn't look like herself. The spouse told his wife that she is usually strict, even with her own son, and added that if she said she would beat him, she goes and punishes him. The husband questioned where his wife's firmness to her son-in-law had now gone. At the moment of clarification between the couple, Shen Lan decided to retreat stealthily. But at that moment, the Count grabbed him by the arm and told his son-in-law that he was under house arrest again as of today. The young man thought that the same punishment had only just ended, but the count went on. He said that Shen Lan was only allowed to move around the residence and not to leave its boundaries, not a single step, under any circumstances. The young man began to think over the situation. It turned out that even though he was forbidden to go outside the residence, there might be conditions for lifting the ban like the last time. He remembered that he had memorized the family rules at the time and they said that house arrest or something else could not stop him. Shen Lan barely opened his mouth to object, but the Count beat him to it and informed him that no memorization, no hieroglyphics, no conditions. The man said that it was not worth worrying, straining, and making up anything, as nothing would help him this time, and stressed that he should just stay in residence and work on himself. The Count added that he would only let him out when he deemed him ready to do so. Shen Lan was offended. He was in a complete misunderstanding of the situation. The young man tried to understand why his father-in-law had changed so much and when it had happened. He remembered that Earl had been straightforward before, but now he had become exceptionally calculating. But the head of the family had his own ideas. He thought it would be better for his son-in-law. 
The man felt that by staying at home, Shen Lan would be safe from the storm. And this way, he would be protected from the attacks of Tai and Heng's gang. In addition, the ex Wan Wu family members would not be as worried about their son in law's life. The Count came out into the courtyard and announced that everyone should obey his new order from now on. He said that from today, his son in law was forbidden to leave the county. Anyone who sees him leave must detain him and bring him back. The soldiers accepted the Count's order. And Shen Lan slowly sank into the hopelessness of the new circumstances that overtook him with incredible speed. He did not expect that he, the very one who had destroyed many and fought superbly today, would be locked up in a small dark room upon his return home. And all this would happen on the orders of his own father-in-law. Shen Lan was on his knees. In despair, he beat his fists on the floor and lamented about his fate. The Count, having completed his plan, decided to go to rest. But the thought occurred to him that something was missing. The man wondered. After a while, from outside the Count's boundaries came the blows of the whip and the man's shouts. The Count was enforcing the punishment determined for Jin Mutson. He had already been beaten in the morning and now in the evening. But he still could not understand why he bore such a cruel punishment. After all, the young man had simply been reading books on martial arts and was about to follow in the footsteps of his ancestors, focusing on the study of martial arts. He tried to explain his own actions to his parents and pleaded for mercy, but his pleas were in vain. Meanwhile, in the courtyard in front of the dining hall, Shen Lan met his wife. She offered to eat together. The young man immediately inquired why his spouse was wearing armor while at home. Mulan then replied that if anything happened to her husband, she would personally and immediately lead troops into the city. Shen Lan was shocked by his wife's reply. Having come to his senses, he offered to go into the room and help her take off her armor, and then go to the table together and have dinner. The woman agreed and did not resist having her spouse take off her clothes. She stood, turned toward him, and spread her arms. Shen Lan approached her and began to remove her military garment piece by piece, and then he saw what a snake-like waist she had. The man stared. The woman's curves were more perfect than those of the hottest samba dancers. Mulan was perfect. When he saw the woman's smooth and rounded hips, he was indescribably thrilled. Lan was flattered that his wife had waited for him, perhaps worried, so she went out to dinner with him. His wife said she was very proud of her husband, but she should not forget that there are people who are worried about him. And lest some trouble happen, it is better to think twice. To which Lan simply said, I understand, and walked over to his wife from behind, hugging her while crossing his arms around her waist. Of course, Mulan was pleased by her husband's attitude. However, when his hands began to descend lower, she erupted. Lan began to make excuses, saying that it was not his fault, it was all because of his wife's smooth skin, so his hands just slipped down, unintentionally, promising that it would not happen again, and that if it happened again, she could cut off his hands. After that moment, only 30 seconds passed as Lan's hands repeated their action. Will she cut off his hands? No. After all, it is better to believe a hundred-year-old man who cheats on his wife than to believe the words of a man. In spite of this mishap, the couple continued to dine. After eating, Mulan, although it was quite late, went to lead the cavalry on a night patrol of the coast. At the same time, she punished her husband to stay home to avoid problems. In the great Yui, arithmetic is not taken as an exam, but it is highly valued among noble families. The subject is good for the mind, training it and taking the brain to a new level of ability. That is why Chin Mutsun, who has just suffered repeated beatings from his parents, is tormented in the arithmetic classroom. The hair apparent's teacher is the most famous arithmetic teacher, Axtu Wenzhou. It is worth noting that he is not only a mentor for Jin, but also the chief administrator of Xuan County. He is also in charge of distributing money and resources for the entire county. To put someone in such a position is to show respect and trust. After all, money is everything to the county. Su Wenzhou is both the assistant earl and the de facto manager of the county, while keeping the books for more than 20 years. The successor's progress shows little but progress. In this class, he made only eight mistakes out of a possible 10. Progress, but his mind still couldn't comprehend why his mother was beating him. 
After all, if before the beatings could be explained by failure in learning, now, when there is a shift for the better, the bullying continues. Of course, at such moments one wonders if I am my own son, and here as always, teacher Xu happens to be by my side. He says that the Count is beating his son because of Shen Lan. The hare's mind is already messy, and here the son-in-law is also guilty. But how? What does he have to do with it? Master Xu talks about his son-in-law's past, how he was kicked out for stealing money and molesting maids. But since the Count can't beat his daughter's husband, he beats his son. On top of that, the father cannot accept the fact that his daughter married a man like Shen Lan because of a son who is not of intelligence or skill. An understanding of his parents' actions begins to emerge in the heir apparent, and Master, watching as Jin Mutsong, begins to make sense of the story, continues. He says that the Count be his son because his son-in-law spoiled the reputation of the county. This is unacceptable for the head of the family, but he has no choice but to take it out on his son. Since the Earl can't deal with his son-in-law, he has to deal with someone. And that someone turns out to be the son. Now that the hare's mind has seen the essence of his parents' deeds, anger is aroused in him at Shen Lun. He looks back at his assistant and smiles evilly, and then he adds fuel to the fire by describing how he saw one of his maids crying. The hare is already in a rage. He wishes to go to his son-in-law to teach him a lesson. But suddenly, a thought arises. By the way, Mr. Xu, how is Shen Lan doing with martial arts? Receiving the answer that his son-in-law can't even tie up a chicken, he runs to reprisal. The servants run into Shen Lun's room and warn him the hare is coming and will beat him. And no punishment frightens him. Our hare is a fool who doesn't care what he does. But instead of hiding somewhere or running away altogether, the son-in-law reassures the maid and tells her that he has his own thoughts on how to deal with the situation. The indignant girl leaves the room because there is nothing else for her to do. Moments later, the hare shouts to the entire residence that he will beat Shen Lan or he will not be able to carry his name. Shouting that he is going to stand up for Xiao Bing because he treats her like a sister and he, the bastard, dares to mock her. But no sounds came from the son-in-law's room, which seemed strange to Jin Mutsun. He gently pushed open the door and saw Shen Lan climbing in with a ladder attached to the wall and writing some names directly on it. This was their first meeting. And of course, the hare wondered what names his son-in-law was writing. He recognizes that they are the names of enemies, and he writes them because he is afraid to forget. And he writes them so that he can always remember them and take revenge. In his eyes there is madness, anger, rage, a desire for revenge. The hare fears him. Mutsun sees Shen Lan crossing out the names of two people. When the son-in-law says these are the names of those he has already taken care of. Taken revenge. Lan, overflowing with rage and a devilish grin, says he rereads the names of his enemies three times when he wakes up and three more times before going to sleep. And when Mutsun learns that these men have dared to open their mouths to threaten his son-in-law, and that he has broken the arms and legs of his abusers, he becomes uncomfortable. He looks in horror at the man standing in front of him. He is covered with sweat from fear. He fears him like the devil. He is afraid of having his name read three times in the morning and as many more times before going to bed. He is afraid to even think about what will happen to him if the hare strikes his son-in-law. He thinks Shen Lan is vindictive and petty, but after a couple of seconds he wonders, as if nothing has happened, why the hare was looking for him. Lan is charming as hell, so he has no trouble switching from one state to another. Now he's smiling at Mutsun, as if he hadn't told him anything bad or sinister. Of course, Mutsun would not say the true reason for his appearance in this room. He said only that he was strolling around idly and decided to stop by. Shen Lan, for his part, speaks of hearing someone shouting that he wanted to beat him up. But the hare, turning blue with fright, makes a look of indignation on his sweaty face. No one would dare hit the Count's son-in-law, for it is clear to everyone that after such a thing there is no living. After which she leaves the room in a hurry. Lan has but one conclusion to draw, what a coward he is. But the hare does not manage to leave his son-in-law's room. A loud cry of halt is uttered. Mutsun turns around and sees, mother, she is swearing, shouting, yelling at her son. 
Outraged, how dare he think of beating Shen Lan? Screams that after doing such an act, not killing Mutsen means admitting he's not related. She grabbed her son by the ear and began to pull him until he blushed. The hare yelled, making excuses, saying he did not hit his son-in-law, asking how she came so quickly. The mother says that Shen Lana is a decent man who fought for the honor of the county and defended the name and the son cannot beat him. The countess grabs him by the scruff of the neck and drags him along, letting all of her own son's screams pass her ears. But Lan gets in their way and stops them. The woman declares that she will deal with this on her own, especially for her son-in-law. Shen Lan begins to vindicate the hare, saying they were simply having a conversation and a quarrel, much less a fight, is out of the question. The mother gives her son the hardest slap in the face. His eyes almost popped out at the unexpected action of his mother. She understands, of course, that he is now being exonerated. She lectures her son, saying that their son-in-law treated him so well that even now he was begging to be spared. Lan understood that the son has most likely been beaten since he was a child. However, his mother is unapproachable and promises to punish, so that the son will always remember that a man like Shen Lan should be respected. But the young man does not back down either. He is still determined to spare the hare from the coming torment, suggesting that instead of a beating he should talk. He says that anger is harmful to his mistress' health, so it is better to calm down, and in the meantime he will speak with the hare. Such an act further convinces the mother-in-law of how intelligent and respectful her daughter's husband is to her parents. 33 in Shen Lan's chambers. The son-in-law decided to talk to the hare after all. There were words of gratitude to him for saving him before his mother. Then he heard that the hare would be willing to help in any way that Lan asked. The son-in-law decided to take this opportunity to find out who the man was who had turned the hare against him. But by no means will Mutsen say the name, because then he would cease to be a friend to this man, and he wants to continue to be one, not a traitor. After drawing conclusions in his head, Lan realized that he was facing the simplest man he had ever seen. But not only simple, he was also a traitor. And if Mutsun is so protective of the unknown schemer now, he might be just as loyal to his son-in-law himself in the future. After Shen Lan escorted the hare out, he locked all the doors to his room. He took the ripened rye out of the sack, scraped some ergot fungus off the rye, and collected it. If anyone found out, he would have shuddered with fear, wondering who Shen Lan was going to hurt with this mixture. It was early the next morning. As Shen Lan was washing his face, it occurred to him that Xiao Bing was treating his son-in-law much better than before. After the water procedures, he asked her if she knew why white tigers were so rare and most valuable. The answer, as in most cases, suggested an unequal ratio of white and yellow tigers. But Lana's answer threw the girl into a kind of stupor. The son-in-law said it was because time could be exchanged for money, but not vice versa. Bean didn't understand the connection between tigers and time. Was he up to something again? It was flirting on the guy's part. He had already prepared to run away in case she expressed a desire to beat him. But the girl is so chaste that she didn't understand this flirting. Sal Bain decided to ask Miss about it tonight. Perhaps her son-in-law is really up to something. After breakfast, Shen Lan received another errand from the Count. This time, the son-in-law was to study with the young master so as not to run the education. The young man, understandably, was not thrilled with such an order. After all, he who already had such extensive knowledge in a huge number of fields should study. But he had no choice, so he agreed. But for himself, he decided that just for a few days, he would still go to classes for the sake of appearances. Especially since it was still an opportunity for him to enter the environment of the hare. To get close to him and learn about the situation and the people who hate his son-in-law, so much that they incited the young master against him. There is a school in the county that educates the children of the Jin family of school age. The class the hare attended had a small number of students of the same age as both the son-in-law and the young master. But now all attention was directed to only one person, and the gaze was fixed on the new student. Shen Lan, walking past everyone with a smug grin, wondered why everyone was staring like that. Could it be the jealous people who were jealous that Lan was the one who married Mulan? After all, she really is beautiful and desirable to all men. 
A gang of young men approached the son-in-law. What for? To fight. Shen Lan's first thought was about his beautiful appearance, but the hair appeared behind the backs of the young men, and in a rage he began to shout at them, defending his son-in-law. And if they did not show him respect, he would beat them. After that, the gang dispersed. Jin Mutson thus confirmed that he was loyal to the others. In addition, he invited Lan to sit at the same desk, so that no one else dared to pester him. The son-in-law agreed. The lesson begins and the teacher enters the classroom. The students greet him respectfully. Teacher Lin, who is also the teacher of the heir apparent, is one of the Earl's trusted assistants. He is eroded and well-read. Lin talked about the book, how deep it is, how full of meaning. And the longer the students study it, the more they will be affirmed that they themselves are too superficial. Suddenly he noticed a new student in the study, noted his beauty and regretted that Shen Lan was a man. But Lan himself didn't appreciate this kind of pouncing. Lin remembered this young man, remembered how he never managed to finish his education, E10 grades. The son-in-law judged such behavior as an insult and an attempt to provoke the boy. 34 teacher Lin decided to put on a show to expose his son-in-law's uneducation and thereby humiliate him. In oral examination of the Book of Changes, Lin asked him a question, expecting in advance that he would not be able to string words together. However, what was his surprise when Shen Lang was able to correctly interpret what was written in the book? But the examination did not end there. The teacher asked questions, and the young man kept answering them correctly. This shocked Lin. He did not recognize that uneducated boy, who was considered ignorant and even mentally retarded. Shen Lan answered calmly and without stuttering. Everyone in the class was amazed, though few understood what was being said. The son-in-law's various interpretations and quotations perfectly resolved Teacher Lin's questions, some answers far exceeding his perception, for even he could not answer in such a way. The teacher was delighted with this. He saw a talent in the young man and wanted to be sure to tell the Count about it, because in his opinion, such a miracle could not be covered in dust. The next lesson was a lesson in arithmetic. The teacher, Exu Wen Zhao, one of the assistants of the Count of Xuanwu. He is in charge of the county's tangible assets. He has been managing the accounts for more than 20 years. Because the Count and his wife had little understanding of such matters, Ku, brimming with a sense of importance and his own superiority, became increasingly nasty. He immediately noticed the new student in the classroom and stared at him hostilely. Because Shen Lan could instantly read the emotions on the faces of others, he could immediately notice this as well. But he didn't understand the reason for this attitude towards himself. He could not be jealous of Mulen because he was far from young, they had no personal conflicts because they had never crossed paths before. In order not to bother himself with these thoughts, Lan decided to continue his observation, and then to draw conclusions. After a few minutes of the lesson, the son-in-law could not understand why the teacher, who is the best in Xuanwu City, was teaching such simple lectures. After a while, the whole class fell asleep. It was either too easy or too tedious, but the teacher was only mad at Lan. He made him get up, and because he did not listen to Shu properly, he threatened to hit his student ten times with a ruler on his outstretched arms. The young man didn't understand why Su only wanted to punish him, since the whole class was sleeping. Slowly, Shen Lan began to guess. Could it be that Hu Wenzhou is a relative of Wang Liang, or Mo Yi, or Jin Shining? When the teacher had already forcefully stretched out his hands, Shen Lan began to swear, shouting and saying that these blows will help him wake up. However, the son-in-law remained calm. He said that he only slept because he already knew these topics. They were simple for him. The teacher became even more angry. He was sure he was faced with an uneducated boy who only knew how to be defiant of his elders and get into trouble of any kind. For this he gave him not ten but thirty lashes with a ruler. To this added kneeling before the statue of the wise man for six hours. To which Shen Lan said that it was impossible. The hare's face at this moment cannot be described. He was not just surprised. He was shocked by his son-in-law's behavior. The whole class began to see Lan as a hero, a brave young man who could stand up to this tedious teacher. The teacher was furious. 
He had never met such an arrogant student who behaved so arrogantly and felt that he was allowed anything. In unbelievable aggression, he broke his ruler and went to the Count to complain. The hare, knowing all the cruelty of his father, warned his son-in-law that after such rudeness he would be punished severely and would lie in agony and pain for more than half a month. There was no need to pounce on him. Shen Lan immediately guessed that it was the arithmetic teacher who incited the young master to beat him. But the hare, of course, did not confess this, saying that he could not be a loyal friend if he told everything. But Lan did not need any proof. He understood it all. Still, he decided to find out what kind of relationship few had with Wang Lian, Mo Yi, and Jin Shani. It turns out that the teacher is a great uncle of Wang Liang, chief archivist of Xuanwu City, and sort of a distant relative of the Countess. The son-in-law immediately realized that if Wang Liang became the son-in-law of the Jin family, Chu could go even further and rise even higher in his position. But Lan stood in his way, for he was the one who became Mulan's husband. The teacher complained to the Earl about his son-in-law, telling him how uneducated he was. Su complained that he could no longer teach him because of such promiscuity and ignorance. Although the great Yang dynasty takes heaven, earth, emperor, parents, and teacher seriously, this young man acts so impudently that he treats his elders with disdain. He again turned to Shen Lan, furious, saying that his behavior was not only detrimental to the class, but also to the family traditions of the county. Fearing that classmates in the future would do the same as Lan, Xu asked the Earl to severely punish his son-in-law. The student, who had already been beaten when there was an argument between teacher and student, feared that the same thing would be done to Shen Lan as it had been done to him. At the surprise of the hare, who was sure that his father would immediately beat his son-in-law, the Count first obliged Lan to give the reason why he was behaving so permissively. To which he received the answer that he deeply respected his teacher, but it would be even more disrespectful to him if the student, knowing the whole subject, pretended to listen carefully to his every word. Shu could not believe his ears. Was his arithmetic so simple for this young man? He immediately remembered Lan Yu saying that he had studied in Hanshui, but never made it to arithmetic class. And now he said it was too easy for him. Nonsense. Bragging. Ridiculous. And there's the exam again. Second teacher and second test. Tzu decides to ask ten questions of the student. But the kind that are almost impossible to solve in the two hours given to Ek Su. The teacher collects all his anger and decides to take it out on the student. A student who is so inappropriately behaved, and if he can answer at least three questions correctly, he will be forgiven. We already understand how difficult the questions will be, but if he doesn't answer, he will be flogged thirty times. Thirty times. Tu was sure that Shen Lan would not answer, because he himself could count on the fingers of two hands the number of people in Xuanwu City who knew arithmetic. Not like this boy, who never made it to the subject in school. Chu could already see how he would whip his son-in-law. But despite such intimidation, Shen Lan was confident in himself and in his abilities. Therefore, he decided that it would be fair to put his conditions in case he solved all ten problems. The teacher was furious. He was convinced that arithmetic was such a deep science that this boy was just bluffing. But still accepting his son-in-law's terms, he said that in that case, he would apologize to him publicly. Lan agreed and asked all those present to be witnesses to the agreement. Even the Count himself doubted his son-in-law's victory. And the teacher, knowing that Shen Lang had an excellent memory, did not doubt in the slightest that he would win in this fight, because arithmetic is a science that takes a very long time to learn, and to be exact, several years of complete immersion in it. Understanding the absurdity of the situation, the Count tried to stop this mess, but then Teacher Lin came forward and said that he agreed to be a witness. The Count was surprised that even though Lin was over 70 years old, he was still quite lively on such matters. Shen Lan, smirking smugly, asked the arithmetic teacher to finally ask his questions. The Count was already full of anger and aggression. His son-in-law had already made enough noise, but still not enough for him. Su Wenzhou began to prepare questions in full determination not to let Shen Lan get off easy.
As he prepared the questions, he anticipated his student screaming at the top of his throat in pain as he was beaten. He decided that he would ask him the most difficult questions that there were in the world so that his son-in-law would not be able to answer any of them. His whole mind was picturing how this self-righteous insolent had already been beaten for daring to defy his teacher. Even if the Count favored his son-in-law, it would not change anything, because the county could not do without a smart man like Exu Wenzhou. So, thought the teacher. Half an hour later, the questions were ready. Shen Lan only had two hours to give the answers, at least three correct answers, but the young man was confident that he would solve everything. He was even surprised at the simplicity of this deal. How could a prominent magister be allowed to solve such easy arithmetic problems? It would be like killing a pig with a bull knife. So the exam time was two hours, and the time was up. The first question was as follows. The first person holds one grain of rice, the second person holds two grains of rice, and the third person holds three grains of rice, for a total of 100 people. The question is, how many grains of rice in total do these hundred people have? Naturally, for Shen Lan, this question turned out to be a breeze. After all, this question, he thought, was a math question for elementary school. Second question. The expected number was unknown, but dividing it by 3 left 2, by 5 left 3, by 7 left 2, and the number itself was no more than 100. The task seemed interesting, but still too simple. The third question. Three people go together, and seventy is rare, twenty-one plum blossoms on five trees, seven suns reunite at half moon, divide by one hundred and five to find out. Shen Lan even managed to notice that this question sounds like a poem. Of course to him, this task was as simple as all the previous ones. No matter how difficult the teacher thought the question was, the young man answered it with ease and a smile on his face. For him, it was as easy as pie. It was as if he was in junior high school. Very easy. Last question. The tenth. There are only twenty trees planted in an orchard, with exactly four trees in each row. What is the maximum number of rows planted in the orchard? Draw a diagram of the method of planting. If the rows are less than sixteen, the answer to this question is incorrect. This problem seemed a little interesting to Shen Lan. It is a worldwide mathematical puzzle and the young man couldn't believe he'd come across it here. It turns out that an ordinary person is definitely not capable of getting 16 rows. Every way a person could think of was wrong. It was always less than 16. But Shen Lan is no ordinary man. He could use 21st century technology to answer this question. He decided to do more than just surprise his teacher. He decided to scare him to death. Xu <laughs> Wen Zhao watching as the young man quickly moved on to the last task, decided that he simply answered at random and now hoped for the last one. Gloating and already anticipating the taste of victory, he took a sip of his drink. After all, it had taken him, Kexu Wenzhou, over 10 years to bring the number of rows to 16. Over 10 years, of course, it was impossible to do this in two hours. Of this, the teacher was absolutely certain. Watching his son-in-law answer questions, the Count thought he was doing it blind. And to avoid further conflict, the master asked the servant to call his mistress. He himself would not be able to help in any way during the flogging, but the mistress is a woman, and it would not be a problem for her. When Shen Lan stood up and declared that all the tasks had been completed, the Count was surprised. No, he was not just surprised, he was shocked. Unspeakable thoughts raced through his mind. Why was this guy in such a hurry to pass his exam? What could happen now if his wife was late? And the classmates were already at the door, waiting in anticipation for my son-in-law to answer all the questions. After all, absolutely everyone was sure that he would fail this exam. They were just as eager as Hu Wenzhou's teacher to see how the Count's son-in-law himself would be flogged in front of everyone. But the hare tried to calm down the crowd of chattering classmates, because otherwise they might notice that they were eavesdropping and peeping on what was going on in class. The teacher, seeing that the son-in-law was going to pass what he had written, smiled smugly and began to check the work. When he saw that the first problem was solved correctly, he could not believe his eyes. He could not understand how this ignorant bastard could do it. 
But what was his surprise when all up to the ninth question had been solved correctly? How was that possible? After all, few people in the city could solve these nine problems. Even he, Aksu Wenzhou himself, would have to spend a lot of time calculating before he could answer all these questions. But it only took his son-in-law a few minutes to complete them all. Is he really more talented than the teacher in arithmetic? Moving on to the next and final question, the teacher was already just hoping that he could not do 16 rows. But after looking at his work, Xu jumped up from his seat in shock. He counted the rows over and over again, afraid he was just wrong. But 23. 23 rows. That was how many rows he counted each time. He did not understand why his son-in-law had made this one so quickly. After all, it had taken him, the best arithmetician in town, more than 10 years to come up with 16. And his son-in-law did 23. That's impossible. Who is this young man, man or devil? But almost without thinking straight, Exu tears into tiny shreds and tramples the paper where all the answers were written on the floor. He starts screaming that everything is wrong, and his son-in-law is just a moron. But Shang Lan, anticipating this outcome as well, said that he had plenty of time, so he wrote another copy. Possessing a high intelligence, the son-in-law asked Teacher Lin, who was also good at arithmetic, to help him find out how many questions he had answered correctly. Sue was about to tear out that copy as well. But the Count intervened and obliged Mr. Xu to let Teacher Lin take a look at this exam. Noting that he, Lin, had not studied arithmetic in a long time, he said it would be a great opportunity to practice. Sue was sure that Lin's teacher would deliberately go against him and understand the chasmin. This was Shen Lan's guile, and Sue understood that. Checking his work, Lin noted that the first seven questions were indeed correct, and Shen Lan had talent. The eighth, ninth questions. The answers were also correct. Teacher Lin was shocked when he saw the answer to the last, tenth question. He joyfully began to congratulate the Count that he had acquired such a genius of arithmetic as Shen Lan. Lin himself had never met anything like it. He reported that his son-in-law had answered all the questions correctly, and that this young man's arithmetic ability had far exceeded the limit of those ten questions. Lin bowed to Lan and admitted that he was ashamed that he was not as good as this young gentleman. Lan said that he had trained for everything on his own. Of course, he couldn't help but talk about his genius too. After all, math is a subject that is 99% genius and 1% sweat. However, watching this self-assured young man behave so selfishly, both his son-in-law and his classmates peeking in on what was going on somehow wanted to beat him up. No sooner had Teacher Xu stealthily left the classroom than his son-in-law stopped him. Of course, Shen Lan remembered the deal. The terms were that if the student answered all ten questions correctly, the teacher would apologize to him publicly, and the first part of the agreement was fulfilled. The second part was not yet fulfilled. Feelings of anger, of hatred awoke again in the teacher. Although you could say they didn't even go to sleep. But feelings of shame were added to them. But as you know, the best defense is an offense. Sue wanted to shame Lan for asking his teacher to apologize to his student, but the Count interceded for his son-in-law. He reminded him that the most important thing for a teacher is to be an example to his students. The lady who appeared supported her husband, saying that if Yu Wenzo himself was wrong, he should take responsibility for it. The son-in-law immediately realized that the mother-in-law, who is a distant relative of Haksu Wenzo and is considered his patroness, spoke out in favor of the son-in-law than this. This is a public slap in the face for Exu Wenzhou, stepping over himself with all the anger there was in this world and without a drop of remorse. The teacher still apologized to his student for wrongly accusing the latter. The classmates, who had previously been convinced of Shen Lan's defeat, now solemnly cheered for his victory and began to scold the teacher already, comparing him with the old dog. The son-in-law smiled victoriously and smugly again. But Aksu Wenzhou was now openly belligerent against this young man, promising in his head to himself that he would not rest until one of them was dead. He ran away from the classroom. Meanwhile, Lan's classmates and the Hare's classmates were already openly cheering his victory, and saying that the Earl's son-in-law was strong. However, the Count himself did not share the joy of victory. 
He glared angrily at his son-in-law and ordered him to stretch out his arms. Shen Lan realized that even if he won, he would still get hit and did as he was ordered. The count hit the young man hard. So hard that he almost had tears flowing from his eyes. The count forbade him to get cocky and told him not to be too self-righteous. Late at night, a small courtyard in the countryside. Master Aksu Wenzhou, dressed in a gray cloak, most likely so that no one would recognize him, was carrying some kind of dark maroon small chest. He knocked on the door. A sullen man opened it. It became clear that Xu had brought his offering to Lord Zhang Jin for these six months. After looking around, the man censured the teacher, instructing him not to shout Lord Zhang's name from now on. He took the chest and inquired about the other things Lord Zhang needed. Taking out a neat roll from the inside pocket of his cloak, Xu assured that there was some information about the residents there. But he had not yet figured out how long the county's finances would last, however, he had almost figured it out. All that remained was to figure out where their secret vault was. The man looked at the teacher haughtily and sullenly and said that if he wanted his son to pass his martial arts exam, he should hurry up. And he closed the door right in front of him. Sometime later, at Su Wenzhou's house. Su Wenzhou walked into the house. In the middle of the room, sitting on a chair, was Tian Hang. He was an unexpected guest in this house. He found out that the teacher wanted to get rid of that vile brat Shen Lan. However, Xu himself no longer understood how this was possible, since the Count was pleased with his son-in-law. Now Xu Wenzhou saw no point in getting rid of him, but Chien Heng had his own view of the problem. Even though the Count is satisfied with Shen Lan's tricks, it does not change the fact that the hare is incompetent. And when the Count passes away, there is no guarantee that Jin Mutsun will be able to control this self-righteous boy. Whose surname will the earldom bear after the master's death? Shen or Jin? Tian Heng suggested that he portray his son-in-law as ambitious, start spreading rumors about how brilliant Shen Lan was and how the hair was stupid, and that one day Shen Lan would surely take his place. And the teacher will need to slander him in front of the count and his wife. And if he fails at the tenth time, he must do it at least at the hundredth, even at the thousandth attempt. The fire under that boy's ass must be lit at all costs. But Xidu was adamant. He compared the strength of ten men against one tiger. But Chien Heng wanted revenge on the Count's son-in-law more than anything. He was sure that if they jointly attacked from inside and outside and make the Count wary, then at the crucial moment, he would not defend his brother-in-law Shen Lan. And then Tian Heng could use a deadly hold and finish him off with one punch. After such powerful and convincing facts and arguments, teacher Su Wenxiao agreed to cooperate. They were now on the same side. Su vowed that he would tear Shen Lan to pieces. Lan called for his mother-in-law and father-in-law. However, when he saw their heated bodies, he realized that he had distracted them from their important business. Of course, the Count could barely restrain himself from hitting his son-in-law. But Madame was interested. What had happened? And Lan's question was indeed an important one. Since Mr. Xu got angry and left, and most likely he would be gone for a few days, and the Count's accounts needed to be kept, the son-in-law offered his help and asked permission to take care of it. After all, if the county's accounts were to be delayed for a few days, it might affect the value of the gold and silver bullion. But when Mr. Xu returns, the authority will go back to him. The Earl wanted to refuse his son-in-law, but his wife pinched him. After all, if Lan has good intentions, why not allow it? After that, she invited him into the room. This caused the Earl some bewilderment, but he remained silent. Lan explained the reasons for his proposal and request. It turned out that the son-in-law suspected Mr. Xu Wenzhou of embezzling the Count's money, and that is why he wants to take a good look at his accounts. The Count shouted that nonsense. After all, he knows about the conflict between the two. He had already fought back with the teacher. There was no need to go back to that. Enraged, he slapped his hand on the table. Without dropping his hands before his first failure, Lan went on to tell why he thought so. Xu Wenzhou's annual salary is only 200 gold coins, but his sons are dressed in gold and silver. In addition, he has real estate in the city of Xuanwu and even in the bridal of Nujiang. 
Taken together, this greatly exceeds the level of his salary. Defending his point, the Count conceded that there are no fish in too clear a water. He is sure that even if there was embezzlement, it was in small amounts. But his son-in-law suggested that if Hu Wenzhou embezzled money, greatly exceeding the Count's imagination and tolerance, the mistress entered the conversation. She asked if there was any evidence. Shen Lan threw Ex Su Wenzhou's two account books on the table. Even though they were only a couple of books, he had already discovered serious corruption in them. Asked by the Count where he got the books, the son-in-law, shifting from foot to foot, answered uncertainly that he had asked the hare to help fetch them from the accounting office. Like a master asking a doggy to bring him a toy after the word, a port, the parents covered their faces with their hands. Oh, that silly son. However, the mistress gently covered her husband's hand with her own and asked permission to check. After all, since she married into the Jin family, she was also part of it and had the right to make some decisions. If Su Wenzhou has appropriated too much, this cannot be left unpunished. The Count's mind was seething with thoughts. He could not break trust so easily. Su Wenzhou had been with him for decades without receiving any credit. He could not stop trusting this man. Both his wife and son-in-law were forcing the Count to be a villain. So he thought, but he allowed the inspection to take place. Subject to three conditions. The first was that Shen Lan had to be with Master Lin. Two, the results of the inspection must first be made available to the Count himself so that he could take action. Three, as soon as Hu Wenzhou returned, the son-in-law would have to stop immediately and not ruin his reputation. Shen Lan agreed. He realized that the Count was still too soft and too lenient and didn't want to be a villain. Well, Lan would have to be one. He left the room. The Count sighed, for Lan was indeed too vindictive. His mistress rose from her chair, walked up from the back to her husband, and put her arms around him to reassure him. She noted that their daughter was already small-minded. What would happen to the family if Lan was the same way? Her husband agreed, and they went back to the chambers together, continuing what their son-in-law had distracted them from. Meanwhile, in the accounting office, Shen Lan, together with Teacher Lin, entered the accounting office. The son-in-law was greatly surprised to see huge pillars all the way to the top. They were piles of ledgers that had grown into skyscrapers. These were all the county's accounts for more than 20 years. Lin was calm because he expected this volume. He was sure it would take at least several months to go through them, and even more to count them. And his son-in-law only had one night. While Shen Lan gradually began to sort out the notes, Lin said that the guy who now opened the door for them was Hao Wenzhou's favorite disciple. When he sees that they came to check the accounts, even before dawn, he will pass the line, and tomorrow morning, Su Wenzhou will return. Hearing this, the son-in-law asked the teacher to help, but Lin was skeptical. He said that three years ago, he had sent a student to secretly infiltrate the accounting department, and he soon died of sudden illness. He said the water in that place was deep. There was no coincidence in that. But the son-in-law was indifferent to the story because he was confident in his powers and also knew clearly that no one would dare kill him. But the only problem was that they only had one night to go over it all. For everyone else, finding a gap in the accounts in such a short time might be unusually difficult, but not for Shen Lan. He asked Teacher Lin to pick out the key books and give them to him. That way he would do the calculations as quickly as possible. The teacher, of course, agreed to help him once. Indeed, when Shen Lan and Teacher Lin went into the accounting office, there were two men whispering outside. The first thing Su Wenzhou's informants decided was that as soon as the Count's residence opened its doors in the morning, they would spread the word that Shen Lan was checking the accounts. They really didn't dare to burn the accounting office with their son-in-law, but they dared to approach Su Wenzhou. Once he goes to the Count to ask for leniency, Shen Lan will not be able to continue the investigation. It is a pity that these people did not realize that Shen Lan is very clever. He has had enough of this night. These accounts, which required several people to work together for half a month to calculate, quickly divided into categories in Shen Lan's mind and were summarized even faster. He scanned these books, memorizing all the information in them verbatim. 
When he saw how much Hu Wenzhou had appropriated, he was shocked. Kazu Wenzhou's house. A servant runs into the house screaming. Su Wenzhou asks him what happened. The servant, covered in sweat, tells him what happened. Su, furious at his son-in-law's behavior, runs out of the house in a flash. How dare he? How dare he check my accounts? Chu was determined to make not only leave without bread, but also to pay for it. Falling to his knees before the count, the teacher asks why he no longer believes him. He asks the incomprehensible master why his son-in-law Shen Lan checks the accounts night after night and checks him, an old man who has served him with all his heart and soul for over 20 years. After all, he, Aksu Wenchao, is only a humble servant and cannot compete with son-in-law Shen. Fu Wenzhou said all this with tears in his eyes. With the words I wish I had died today, he tries to run out of the residence. However, he is prevented from doing so by one of the guards. He forcibly pulls the teacher back into place. Su is already sobbing. He tries to convey to the Earl that he entered the county at the age of 10 plus, that he grew up in front of his old master, and that there is no one in the entire county as devoted as he is. A whole hysteria ensues at the residence about this. The old man does his best to have the Earl immediately order Shen Lan to stop. Fibzu shouts that if the master does not believe him, he can tear out his heart and show it whether it is red or white. The Count calmly and judiciously says that he knows about the loyalty of Aksu Wenzhou, goes up to Xuan Wu County, and orders the servant to tell Shen Lan to stop checking and come to him. Aksu Wenzhou, who was only pretending and masterfully played out a real scene of hysteria, was confident that the Count trusts his loyal servant more than his own son-in-law. The teacher knows that the Count is clever, but soft-hearted and very attentive to the good name of his subordinates. While the Count and the teacher waited for his son-in-law, Su approached his master and said that there is one more thing, but he does not know whether to tell it or not. After permission, Aksu Wenzhou began to slander his son-in-law. He said that lately there have been rumors in Xuanwu City that Shen Lan pretended to be a pig in order to eat a tiger, that he was obviously very smart, but deliberately pretended to be stupid and untalented in order to confuse himself with Lady Mulan. Hu fears that her son-in-law has some sort of evil intent. After putting all the facts together in his head, the Count, he didn't believe it. Shen Lan has many faults, but he has no malice. The Count admits that he, Jin Zuo, is good-hearted, condescending, and gullible, but he is not blind. Yes, indeed, there is something wrong here. But not with his son-in-law, but with Exu Wenzhou. He, in turn, began to talk about the fact that when the hare will manage the county, whether he can keep Shen Lan under control, it could also happen that the county in Xuan Wu further change his master. At this moment, Shen Lan came up. At him immediately began to shout teacher, pretending as if he did not understand why he hurt his son-in-law, if he really has some ulterior motives. But Shen Lan, smiling smugly again, remained calm. He admitted aloud that he thought the teacher was greedy, but he hadn't even imagined that the latter would be so unclean. Of course, Aksu Wenzhou was sure that his son-in-law was bluffing, because nothing could be found in one night. No trace of it. The young man screamed in rage that he, Aksu Wenzhou, the lowly chief accountant of the county, had embezzled almost 30,000 gold coins in 20 years. The count and his wife trusted him so much, where was his conscience to go? For the record, 30,000 gold coins is enough to sustain the entire county for a year. The Earl's family loves the people like their children and never raises taxes. Every year they live frugally to save that amount and the average family in this world cannot accumulate even two gold coins in a year of hard work. All this, of course, everyone present knew. The Count, shocked by what was happening, could not believe it. He knew that Su Wenzhou was a thief, but he did not assume that on such a scale. Seeing that the Count believed his son-in-law's words, the old man knelt before him, trying to justify himself. In these attempts, he slandered his son-in-law again and again. But Shen Lan was fully convinced and cited facts. The cost of maintaining the troops went up and up, but the number of soldiers in the Count's household did not increase. Where do horses, armor, and weapons go every year? 
If they are melted down, why is there no increase in the production of iron, but instead it decreases? Salt production in the county has also declined, while bag and basket bamboo production has greatly increased. Because of what? No matter how much Hu Wenzhou justified himself, he could not say anything concrete in his excuse. And the old man had no choice but to go for broke. He was sure that his son-in-law had no evidence. After all, he had only spent one night in the accounting office. One night. In that time, it was impossible to find anything. But a book fell on the table. And Xu Wenxiao had another drop of sweat on his face. This book is a report on the work done by his son-in-law during the night. With a little guidance from Shen Lan, the Count was able to read the report on his own, and from what he saw he was more than stunned. He bulged his eyes and turned all white, becoming more like a dead man than a living one. The Count completely didn't expect that Shen Lang could make the data so detailed, leafing through it the man was more and more surprised, because different kinds of incomes were so clear that even such a layman as the Count could understand them. As for the flaws in the accounts of Hu Wen Zhao, he was able to cope here too. Shen Lan found a whole heap of flaws and just outrageous shortcomings. For example, for the celebration of the Thousand Year Spring Festival, where the county had allocated a huge amount of money, it turned out that about a thousand extra bottles of wine were bought, which later, of course, were not finished and, of course, had to be returned. Thus, Xiao Wen Zhao himself made money on the expenses, because only 70% of the money had been returned to the county treasury. Just because of this case alone, it had lost a dozen gold coins. The Count, realizing that he, and not only him impudently cheated, became furious, his face and neck were covered with red spots, and he himself shook, clenched his hands into fists, yelling to his advisors that it was all just incredible. Hu Wen Zhao. He could not expect that he could cooperate with the enemy, could not even think that he would dare to embezzle so much money. The Count ordered his subordinate Jin Zhang to call Mr. Lin to look at this report. The latter bowed and ran off to do the Count's bidding. A little while later, the dried-out, small, and gray-haired old man, with a huge bald spot on his head, was looking at this report with the same surprised face as the Count had earlier. To himself, the latter was surprised that Shen Lan had really managed to cope, that he really, really did it. The Count turned to his teacher. Lin, on the other hand, made a long, ornate speech, saying that Shen Lan was a heaven-gifted exceptional talent. Teacher Lin raved that until this very moment, he had never seen or heard of the kind of record-keeping that Shen Lan had used in these papers. This report was unbelievable. The master congratulated his master on such a find as Shen Lan bowed to the Count. Still later, still angry at his subordinate's deceptions, the Count paid a visit to the liar, Xiao so Wen Zhao. He asked what he had to say about his actions. The latter began to ponder aggressively. Under no circumstances could he admit his guilt, otherwise everything would come to an end. If he did not confess and gave all that money to young Master Zhang and the others, perhaps he would still have a chance to save himself and escape punishment. So he suddenly shrilled at his master. As he wanted subtlety to punish Xu Wen Zhao, and there is always a reason. The Count was up to his ears in debt, and that's why he wanted to take advantage of them, subordinates. Why is the Count pouring mud on him when he could have grabbed right away? He turned to the people around, shouting to everyone to come and see how son-in-law Shen is trying to get rid of dissenters, saying he wants to take on them, the elders of the county. Xu Wen Zhao would not accept his writing as a crime, even if he died. The Count was already shaking with anger and couldn't even find the words to characterize this subordinate of his. Suddenly, an unpleasant sound was heard. The chair was dragged across the polished parquet without even being lifted. Shen Lan, a blue-haired young man with sly bright blue eyes, the very genius of the reports, placed the seat next to Xu Wen Zhao and sat down cross-legged. He turned to the subordinate who had been shouting, saying that he had uncovered his secret fault. And this is already irrefutable proof. But he laughed back. How could the lad have known about it? Does he think he's a visionary? The man only grinned back. He took a piece of paper from his pocket and offered his father-in-law to go there and check it out. The count immediately agreed and ordered to assemble a hundred cavalrymen.
An hour later, they were already walking through a ravine in the middle of nowhere. Su Wen Zhao was cursing Shen Lan. How could he even know about this? The guy dragged him forward as suddenly one of the soldiers caught an arrow flying at them. The Count, when he realized it was an ambush, ordered the area cleared as quickly as possible, and Zagya was told to be more careful. Some time later, the soldiers reported that the area had been neglected and that they had been able to catch the man. It was the one who shot the Count. He turned out to be the son of Su Wen Zhao Tzu Qian. The young man said as if he was having fun here, at an abandoned post, and while the guards questioned Su Qian. Shen, who did nothing but sarcasm and did not want to answer their questions, used some of his ability. The space around him illuminated with neon green threads that only the guy himself could see after a moment woven into the outline of the stairs doors and signs of various things and objects that were under him and the interrogators thus discovered that under them there was a special secret door and ordered the guards to open it. A quarter of an hour later, the cavalry guards still managed to dig out the old iron door, which had already become quite rusty, with white paint peeling around the edges, but it turned out that it was locked, and it was impossible to open it, because... As it turned out, the lock was so strong that even the best swords of Count's soldiers broke when they tried to open it. Soon the reason for such strange properties of the lock was found out. It turned out that it was made of ferrovolfram, which meant that it, so strong ambiguous lock, could be opened only with a key. One of the guards, the most important, the general asked Shen Lan's son-in-law if he knew where the key was and if he had the key. Shen Lan didn't answer this question, only looking at Hextu Wen Zhao with his ultra-magical gaze. The little inconspicuous key appeared to be hiding in his hair. Who would have thought that the shouting and unlocking advisor would be able to hide the key right there? Su Wen Zhao is very good at hiding. However, he could not hide from the titanic eyes of Shen Lan's son-in-law. Shen Lan pulled the man's bundle and soon pulled out a small, beautiful metal key from the intertwined hair. Kaksu Wen Zhao shouted, questioning how this guy could even know where he was hiding this key. It was virtually impossible. Who was he, human or demon? With eyes flushed with anger, he kept shouting while the guards held him by both hands. At this, Shen Lan's son-in-law only smiled enigmatically, stretching his lips into a half-smirk and flashing his bright blue eyes, colored now in the same neon green hue that was used in his ability. No one can reveal the secret of his ability. Shen Lan took the key and quickly opened the old iron lock, already covered in the first rust. The door gave way almost immediately. He opened it and found the passage down the stairs. This cellar was very deep, as the guard who had followed him, Shen Lan's son-in-law, had warned him. But as they descended into the cellar, they all discovered much more than they had expected to see in principle. And even after those supplies were opened, Hexu Wen Zhao's corruption was even more terrifying than anyone thought. All the drawers in the room were filled to the brim with gold and coins, various jewels stolen from the treasury by this man, jewelry, antiques and jewels, everything that could be valuable was here. It appears that the man had been stealing for a very long time and a great deal. Looking at this, everyone looked differently everything already, Shen Lan was much calmer than, for example, the guards who held Aksu Weizhou trembling and pale more and more with each passing minute, but against the general who was finally angry, even the traitorous criminal looked completely calm, except pale. He was already shaking with the anger that was gnawing at him from the inside, as if smoke was about to billow from his ears, so tense and angry was he. Finally unable to cope with himself, he turned to Xu Wen Zhao and shouted at him in his loudest and angriest tone. Xu Wen Zhao, at one time he was a simple poor scholar who was sheltered by the Count, and if it had not happened, he would now achieve the same position in society in which he stayed to this day, and the merits are all thanks to the Count, and what has Aksu Wen Zhao paid back to his state, which literally fed him a golden spoon this man is unscrupulous he is worse than an animal. Meanwhile, Shen Lan rummaged through one of the chests that were on the floor and finally found one inconspicuous book. By then, Aksu Wen Zhao couldn't stand it, he suddenly shouted, 
asking how and how could Shen Lan still find this repository, because even his wife doesn't know about it, and he was able to uncover it all. Lan, however, smiled and answered the man's question. It was even too simple, even childish, because in a good way he had not thought of anything, relying on his half-measures. From the ledger, Shen Lan learned that nine years ago. The man had stolen 20,000 Jing of iron from the treasury and bought 25 Jing of pharaoh frames, which equaled about 10 tons and 12 and a half kilograms, and, in fact, he, cattle, even provided the county to pay to build a vault for these jewels here, his treasury. No, this man had no shame or conscience. Shen Lan's son-in-law ordered this traitor to be returned to the county, and the guards brought another man to Shen Lan the one they caught inspecting the grounds who had shot Shen with an arrow while he was inside. Shen Lan squeamishly looked at this man now dressed in rags. Perhaps he had been sitting here for a very long time and on purpose, knowing that today these people would come here. The guards asked, what would be the best thing to do with him? To which Shen Lan said flatly that it would be a very good option now to kill him burn the corpse, and scatter the ashes over the sea. This would be a fitting punishment for such a traitor as the son of Xu Wen Zhao. He suddenly went all pale, large grains of sweat rolled down his forehead, and he himself mouthed fearfully that he cannot do so because the local nobles do not have the right to punish the officials, but he is an official. Dog he is, the last, but that was alas the new policy of the state of Yu, and because of this case, could be thought that the county is plotting treason, the enterprise was in danger. In that case, they would all become traitors and soon die. So a new way had to be found to punish this traitor, but Shen Lan's son-in-law quickly found a way to deal with him. He said that he was an ordinary man, a son-in-law in his wife's house, and therefore he could draw his sword, which he did immediately. It wasn't long before he was blowing the head off the traitor who had just been squaring up to him. The moment the body fell to the floor with a resounding thud, the guards watched the scene in silence. Even though one of them had been thinking the whole time about how it came out that Lan's son-in-law's technique of cutting people was better than his own, the general's. Finished with Xu Qian, Shen Lan asked the general for help in finding one person. Soon Shen Lan was sitting in his room by the window, pondering what had happened. After all, his hands ended up covered in blood. It turns out that in order to live off a woman, he must have a hard time too. It was, but now his whole family can be safe, after all, no one can threaten them. On the same day in Xuanwu County, Xu Wen Zhao appeared before the count. The general said that in his vault was found 11,000 gold coins, as well as 52 paintings and calligraphy from famous people, and five chests with jade and jewelry. The general was very proud of his son-in-law, because he had saved their county from such a huge loss, but even that did not diminish his anger. That's why the Count shouted at his former subordinate Exu Wen Zhao, while he, like a worm, crawled at the feet of Counts and cried crocodile tears, begging to save his miserable life, because he, supposedly, already a man in years, and the fact that he was a traitor to his state did not bother him, he just wanted to live. He said that he was ready to be a horse, if only the Count saved his skin, because he was stupid and not discreet. The Count, alas, blamed himself for being so lenient to others, that he raised such a wolf among his subordinates. He mercilessly kicked this former subordinate of his. He had never before imagined that the human heart could be so treacherous, he ordered, not to arrange for his performances he knew what the whole Hu Wen Zhao was capable of. Shen Lan ruthlessly said that this man is a true traitor, and therefore must be killed immediately. From the world order of the best son-in-law in history, in the feudal era, educated people took imperial examinations to obtain titles and official positions. In that epoch, the country was ruled by civil officials, and people of merit and glory had a lucky ticket to the ruling class and became members of it. They had many privileges in various places and procedures, such as not kneeling before judicial officers, not being arbitrarily taken into custody, and being exempted from paying taxes. With a little guidance from Shen Lan, the Count was able to read the report on his own, and from what he saw he was more than stunned. He bulged his eyes and turned all white, becoming more like a dead man than a living one. The Count completely didn't expect that Shen Lang could make the data so detailed, 
Leafing through it, the man was more and more surprised, because different kinds of incomes were so clear that even such a layman as the Count could understand them. As for the flaws in the accounts of Hu Wen Zhao, he was able to cope here too. Shen Lan found a whole heap of flaws and just outrageous shortcomings. For example, for the celebration of the Thousand Year Spring Festival, where the county had allocated a huge amount of money, it turned out that about a thousand extra bottles of wine were bought, which later, of course, were not finished and, of course, had to be returned. Thus, Xiao Wen Zhao himself made money on the expenses, because only 70% of the money had been returned to the county treasury. Just because of this case alone, it had lost a dozen gold coins. The count, realizing that he, and not only him impudently cheated, became furious, his face and neck were covered with red spots, and he himself shook, clenched his hands into fists, yelling to his advisors that it was all just incredible. Fu Wen Zhao. He could not expect that he could cooperate with the enemy, could not even think that he would dare to embezzle so much money. The Count ordered his subordinate Jin Zhang to call Mr. Lin to look at this report. The latter bowed and ran off to do the Count's bidding. A little while later, the dried-out, small, and gray-haired old man, with a huge bald spot on his head, was looking at this report with the same surprised face as the Count had earlier. To himself, the latter was surprised that Shen Lan had really managed to cope, that he really, really did it. The Count turned to his teacher. Lin, on the other hand, made a long, ornate speech, saying that Shen Lan was a heaven-gifted exceptional talent. Teacher Lin raved that until this very moment, he had never seen or heard of the kind of record-keeping that Shen Lan had used in these papers. This report was unbelievable. The master congratulated his master on such a find as Shen Lan bowed to the Count. Still later, still angry at his subordinate's deceptions, the Count paid a visit to the liar So Wen Zhao. He asked what he had to say about his actions. The latter began to ponder aggressively. Under no circumstances could he admit his guilt, otherwise everything would come to an end. If he did not confess and gave all that money to young Master Zhang and the others, perhaps he would still have a chance to save himself and escape punishment. So he suddenly shrilled at his master, as he wanted subtlety to punish Exu Wen Zhao, and there is always a reason. The Count was up to his ears in debt, and that's why he wanted to take advantage of them, subordinates. Why is the Count pouring mud on him when he could have grabbed right away? He turned to the people around, shouting to everyone to come and see how son-in-law Shen is trying to get rid of dissenters, saying he wants to take on them, the elders of the county. Fu Wen Zhao would not accept his writing as a crime, even if he died. The Count was already shaking with anger and couldn't even find the words to characterize this subordinate of his. Suddenly, an unpleasant sound was heard. The chair was dragged across the polished parquet without even being lifted. Shen Lan, a blue-haired young man with sly bright blue eyes, the very genius of the reports, placed the seat next to Exu Wen Zhao and sat down cross-legged. He turned to the subordinate who had been shouting, saying that he had uncovered his secret fault, and this is already irrefutable proof, but he laughed back. How could the lad have known about it? Does he think he's a visionary? The man only grinned back. He took a piece of paper from his pocket and offered his father-in-law to go there and check it out. The Count immediately agreed and ordered to assemble a hundred cavalrymen. An hour later, they were already walking through a ravine in the middle of nowhere. Su Wen Zhao was cursing Shen Lan. How could he even know about this? The guy dragged him forward as suddenly one of the soldiers caught an arrow flying at them. The Count, when he realized it was an ambush, ordered the area cleared as quickly as possible, and Zagya was told to be more careful. Some time later, the soldiers reported that the area had been neglected and that they had been able to catch the man. It was the one who shot the Count. He turned out to be the son of Su Wen Zhao Tzu Qian. The young man said as if he was having fun here at an abandoned post, and while the guards questioned Su Qian, Shen, who did nothing but sarcasm and did not want to answer their questions, used some of his ability, 
the space around him illuminated with neon green threads that only the guy himself could see after a moment woven into the outline of the stairs doors and signs of various things and objects that were under him and the interrogators thus discovered that under them there was a special secret door and ordered the guards to open it. A quarter of an hour later, the cavalry guards still managed to dig out the old iron door, which had already become quite rusty, with white paint peeling around the edges, but it turned out that it was locked, and it was impossible to open it, because... As it turned out, the lock was so strong that even the best swords of Count's soldiers broke when they tried to open it. Soon the reason for such strange properties of the lock was found out. It turned out that it was made of ferrovolfram which meant that it, so strong, ambiguous lock, could be opened only with a key. One of the guards, the most important, the general asked Shen Lan's son-in-law if he knew where the key was and if he had the key. Shen Lan didn't answer this question, only looking at Axtu Wen Zhao with his ultra-magical gaze. The little inconspicuous key appeared to be hiding in his hair. Who would have thought that the shouting and unlocking advisor would be able to hide the key right there? Su Wen Zhao is very good at hiding. However, he could not hide from the titanic eyes of Shen Lan's son-in-law. Shen Lan pulled the man's bundle and soon pulled out a small, beautiful metal key from the intertwined hair. Kak Su Wen Zhao shouted, questioning how this guy could even know where he was hiding this key. It was virtually impossible. Who was he, human or demon? With eyes flushed with anger, he kept shouting while the guards held him by both hands. At this, Shen Lan's son-in-law only smiled enigmatically, stretching his lips into a half-smirk and flashing his bright blue eyes, colored now in the same neon green hue that was used in his ability. No one can reveal the secret of his ability. Shen Lan took the key and quickly opened the old iron lock, already covered in the first rust. The door gave way almost immediately. He opened it and found the passage down the stairs. This cellar was very deep, as the guard who had followed him, Shen Lan's son-in-law, had warned him. But as they descended into the cellar, they all discovered much more than they had expected to see in principle. And even after those supplies were opened, Haxu Wen Zhao's corruption was even more terrifying than anyone thought. All the drawers in the room were filled to the brim with gold and coins, various jewels stolen from the treasury by this man, jewelry, antiques and jewels, everything that could be valuable was here. It appears that the man had been stealing for a very long time and a great deal. Looking at this, everyone looked differently everything already, Shen Lan was much calmer than, for example, the guards who held Aksu Weizhou trembling and pale more and more with each passing minute, but against the general who was finally angry, even the traitorous criminal looked completely calm, except pale. He was already shaking with the anger that was gnawing at him from the inside, as if smoke was about to billow from his ears, so tense and angry was he. Finally unable to cope with himself, he turned to Exu Wen Zhao and shouted at him in his loudest and angriest tone. Exu Wen Zhao, at one time he was a simple poor scholar who was sheltered by the Count, and if it had not happened, he would now achieve the same position in society in which he stayed to this day, and the merits are all thanks to the Count, and what has Aktu Wen Zhao paid back to his state, which literally fed him a golden spoon this man is unscrupulous he is worse than an animal. Meanwhile, Shen Lan rummaged through one of the chests that were on the floor and finally found one inconspicuous book. By then, Aksu Wen Zhao couldn't stand it. He suddenly shouted, asking how and how could Shen Lan still find this repository, because even his wife doesn't know about it and he was able to uncover it all. Lan, however, smiled and answered the man's question. It was even too simple, even childish, because in a good way he had not thought of anything, relying on his half-measures. From the ledger, Shen Lan learned that nine years ago. The man had stolen 20,000 Jing of iron from the treasury and bought 25 Jing of pharaoh frames, which equaled about 10 tons and 12 and a half kilograms, and in fact, he, cattle, even provided the county to pay to build a vault for these jewels here, his treasury. No, this man had no shame or conscience. Shen Lan's son-in-law ordered this traitor to be returned to the county, and the guards brought another man to Shen Lan, the one they caught inspecting the grounds who had shot Shen with an arrow while he was inside. 
Shen Lan squeamishly looked at this man now dressed in rags. Perhaps he had been sitting here for a very long time, and on purpose, knowing that today these people would come here. The guards asked, what would be the best thing to do with him? To which Shen Lan said flatly that it would be a very good option now to kill him, burn the corpse, and scatter the ashes over the sea. This would be a fitting punishment for such a traitor as the son of Hextu Wen Zhao. He suddenly went all pale, large grains of sweat rolled down his forehead, and he himself mouthed fearfully that he cannot do so because the local nobles do not have the right to punish the officials, but he is an official. Dog he is, the last, but that was alas the new policy of the state of Yu, and because of this case, could be thought that the county is plotting treason, the enterprise was in danger. In that case, they would all become traitors and soon die. So a new way had to be found to punish this traitor, but Shen Lan's son-in-law quickly found a way to deal with him. He said that he was an ordinary man, a son-in-law in his wife's house, and therefore he could draw his sword, which he did immediately. It wasn't long before he was blowing the head off the traitor who had just been squaring up to him. The moment the body fell to the floor with a resounding thud, the guards watched the scene in silence. Even though one of them had been thinking the whole time about how it came out that Lan's son-in-law's technique of cutting people was better than his own, the generals. Finished with Hu Qian, Shen Lan asked the general for help in finding one person soon Shen Lan was sitting in his room by the window, pondering what had happened. After all, his hands ended up covered in blood. It turns out that in order to live off a woman, he must have a hard time too. It was, but now his whole family can be safe, after all, no one can threaten them. On the same day in Xuanwu County, Xu Wen Zhao appeared before the count. The general said that in his vault was found 11,000 gold coins, as well as 52 paintings and calligraphy from famous people, and five chests with jade and jewelry. The general was very proud of his son-in-law because he had saved their county from such a huge loss, but even that did not diminish his anger. That's why the Count shouted at his former subordinate Exu Wen Zhao, while he, like a worm, crawled at the feet of Counts and cried crocodile tears, begging to save his miserable life, because he, supposedly, already a man in years. And the fact that he was a traitor to his state did not bother him, he just wanted to live. He said that he was ready to be a horse, if only the Count saved his skin, because he was stupid and not discreet. The Count, alas, blamed himself for being so lenient to others that he raised such a wolf among his subordinates. He mercilessly kicked this former subordinate of his. He had never before imagined that the human heart could be so treacherous. He ordered not to arrange for his performances. He knew what the whole Hu Wen Zhao was capable of. Shen Lan ruthlessly said that this man is a true traitor and therefore must be killed immediately. From the world order of the best son-in-law in history, in the feudal era, educated people took imperial examinations to obtain titles and official positions. In that epoch, the country was ruled by civil officials, and people of merit and glory had a lucky ticket to the ruling class and became members of it. They had many privileges in various places and procedures, such as not kneeling before judicial officers, not being arbitrarily taken into custody, and being exempted from paying taxes. The mentor of the Count approached Shen Lan. He told him that Hu Wen Zhao was not a servant of the county, but only a hired worker, and moreover, a man of high position, and this already meant that their county simply had no right to kill him. After all, according to the new rules of the state of Yu, they should have only sent Xu Wen Zhao to the residence of the county governor to take any action. Shen Lan strongly disagreed with this, for it was all nonsense. If they were sending Xu Wen Zhao to the residence of the town governor, what are the chances that he would actually be punished, and already the residence of a few co-days, he would not be blessed with absolute impunity? This is unfair. He has stolen and embezzled a total of about 30,000 gold coins, although there were only 11,000 in the stash, and his land and possessions are worth only 5,000 gold pieces. Hence the question for the agenda. Where, then, is the rest of the money now? It was obvious that the guy was angry, because such injustice, deceit, and dodginess should not go unpunished, and they will remain, because most likely the remaining gold 
Shen Lan's son-in-law was sure. Kaxu Wen Zhao probably sent to the residence of the town governor and governor, and his second son. He is now in the capital and must now be one of the best graduates of the military academy of Juzhen. How does he know this? This question suddenly interested the count, questioningly looking at his son-in-law, to which he only smiled and pointed to an unsightly looking book, which was pulled out in the vault. Shen Lan said that here, in this blue notebook, Exu Wen Zhao wrote down every gold coin, which was paid to him as a bribe. At these words, the count was surprised. He frowned and asked to see the curious notebook. And so, a little book with yellowed, in some places torn pages, lay in the count's hands. He thumbed through it about halfway, examining every page, despite the fact that the ledger has no names, and instead of them, number one, number two, and number three, any fool would guess to whom they belong. The man turned white again, drew his eyebrows to the bridge of his nose, and shook his whole body. The rage that had just ended and subsided in him was suddenly playing on his nerves with renewed vigor. That, that was ridiculous. Had Count ever allowed himself to offend Hu Wen Zhao, even once or in any way in all the years of service of this scoundrel, who was now even ashamed to be called a human? How dare he do such a thing? Su Wen Zhao only laughed hysterically, as if in a fit. He suddenly recalled the incident that happened three years ago with the Count, Exu Wen Zhao Exu, and his son asked to serve as centurion in the army, but the latter simply refused him. To this bold but far-fetched announcement, the Count said he gave him a chance. But he had simply failed every exam he could think of, both the martial arts and the written exam. How could he hire such an employee? He had much better candidates. Su Wen Zhao was angry. He had faithfully served the county for over 20 years, and this is what the Count decided to repay him for it. Deprived of his son's future, wasn't that insensitive and inhumane, dishonest after all? And besides, the new course was in full swing, and the county of Xuan Wu in it was like a sinking ship in the middle of the ocean. Why should he go down with them if he could try his luck elsewhere? At these words, the Count was furious. That is, Xu Wen Zhao was ready to betray, just not to lose his honor and lukewarm place, to compromise human principles. Betray the Jin family. A man who has achieved great achievements, do not bother with trifles. That was the answer. At this point, the Count couldn't take it anymore. He yelled that he would kill the bastard and renewed his sword. His tutor tried to stop him, for if he killed him, underscore they underscore would have a terrible advantage. The men outside would be sure to take advantage of the situation and by any means necessary. He reminded Count Dunghai, who had died at the hands of Zhang Chong, reminded him of the new laws of the Southeast State. Here deserves to die, but they can't kill him here. Su Wen Zhou laughed, demanding to send him to the residence of the town governor, to which the count became angry and shoved the mentor away, rushing with his sword at Xu Wen Zhou, and he was jerked across by Shen Lan, who stopped him. He suddenly asked if Xu Wen Zhou was afraid of the laws of the Xu family. Suddenly, at this very moment, several people appeared on the doorstep, among them was the old head of the Xu family. He asked for forgiveness from Count Jin. How could they even beget such a brat and wolf like Exu Wen Zhao? The elder ordered that he be taken back to Exu's ancestral temple and beaten to death. Su Wen Zhao was furious. They had no right after all. Treasury theft was not on the list of reasons to kill. But Shen Lan clarified this point, saying with a sweet smile on his lips that they would kill him not for embezzlement, but for seducing his aunt, the aunt in this case, is the woman of his father's younger brother. The aunt, Wen Zhou's mistress, is only thirty-something and has not yet lost the charm of her youth and adultery. Su Wen Zhou turned all white. How does he know that? It's just a little investigation, that was the answer. Shen Lan told Xuan to go on. Su Wen Zhou was still trying to shout, even revealing the great secret that Tian Heng wanted to harm Shen Lan, to which the latter only grinned, as if he needed to be reminded of that. A few hours later, Exu Wen Zhao, who was brought to Xu's ancestral temple, was stripped naked and beaten to death in front of several hundred people.
Shen Lan and even heard afterwards that Su Wen Zhao had been beaten the crap out of him. A little later, when Shen Lan and the Count were sitting together, the latter suggested that he ask for what he really wanted. The latter jumped up and demanded that the son-in-law subdue his daughter and make Mulan spend her wedding night with her husband. But apparently, it turned out to be only a joke, because he immediately changed his shoes and said that he had nothing to ask. But his father-in-law insisted, so Shen Lan wanted to go to his parents. All he needed was for the Count to lift his house arrest. But it was impossible to fool him, because this trickster is sure to do things outside the walls of the house, and therefore decided to bypass his move. And having said that Shen Yu had better be at home, he promised his father 300 mu of land. But Shen Lan does not need it, he needs freedom. However, the decision was not discussed, and the Count decided to leave as soon as possible out of sight, leaving Shen Lan alone in the hall. Meanwhile, in the house where there was Jin Mulan, her maid admired how to give in one night, was able to disarm and punish Fu Wen Zhao, when Mulan was not so enthusiastic about it, telling her not to bring up this subject in the house again. Then she spoke of the white tigers, about their value and about time and money, but after the phrase that came out of the girl's mouth, Mulan perked up. She said her son-in-law told her that the reason why white tigers are rare is that time can be exchanged for money, and it is difficult to buy time with money. Then Newland got up from the bathroom and told her to bring her things. She was going to punish evil and punish good, because men, in her opinion, needed to be controlled, because as soon as she stopped watching him, he could already do things. A short time later, her husband entered the courtyard where Zisa Mala was. She excitedly exclaimed that she was just waiting for him, and he thought, what a lovely voice this girl has after all. Unbelievable. It's crazy. It must be some kind of conspiracy. But he just jumped up to her for a moment, taking her by the arms and said with a quick phrase that she had had a hard time these past couple of days and Shen Lian, as her husband, was very worried about her, which meant his wife should rest properly but he had some more books to finish, and he would probably take his leave. And indeed, he would have run away as soon as possible, if she had not suddenly mentioned an interesting game that she had, and which the girl would very much like to play with him. And Shen Lan had to stay. He looked at her and thought about how beautifully shaped his wife was, especially her rounded hips and this flexibility. He did not seem to be able to cope with himself in the future. It was too late to strengthen his body now, wasn't it? As for the game, though, he had to ask again. Was it some kind of binding or melted wax? He seemed to have a fantasy run amok. The girl smiled in a smile, slightly squinting her slanted eyes, and replied that this game is that people imitate the behavior of primitive animals and with a strong clash of bodies. Shen Lun was already impatient to know what this game was, but he should have kept his cool. For some reason, though he was looking forward to it, his intuition told him that it would not end well and that he should not stay here. So he muttered something vaguely that it was not worth it and that dinner would be soon. But still, since his wife had so kindly invited her husband, would he dare refuse her such a thing? And after three minutes, he really regretted going to such a thing as agreeing to her game at all. It was painful and unpleasant, and it felt as if he was going to break. The twine was a nightmare. And after all, she was talking about them having a game of body collision, like primitive animals, so what did they do? But it was all right. Her game was called Six Species of Wild Birds, and it mimicked primitive animals. What didn't Shen Lan like? She said her husband had a weak body, and she was just free, so she would help him practice once. And afterwards, she let him rest for a while. She said he did not need to be so polite, they were a married couple. And then she noted that they were already familiar with the movements, so they could repeat them ten more times. Inwardly, he was indignant and frightened, but he couldn't do anything about it. Obviously, his girlfriend Mulan decided to ruin him. Does she have the cruelty to watch such a beautiful man like him being literally killed, destroyed by such exercises? Shen Lan bowed to her and said he was wrong, but Mulan pretended not to understand what he was talking about at all. They say she just helped him to train his body. But no matter what happened, it was always his fault. The wife is always right and always fair, always majestic. If there is any disagreement, refer to the previous line. And what? Does he really not know what is wrong? 
In any case, he was really wrong, sitting on his knees in front of her. He told her with the look of a guilt-ridden puppy. Mulan was adamant. She asked how he knew her secret, and how dare he use it to flirt with Xiao Bing. But these words caused him to be surprised and even stupefied. Does he know any secret? After all, she told him Xiao Bing herself, so what's angry about him flirting with her? And then she realized the crook didn't know any of her secrets at all. It was all said unintentionally and just like that when he was hitting on Xiao Bing. Her cheeks lit up with a scarlet blush. It was embarrassing. He suddenly gave out that she could not worry and that he would never discredit her for it. Got carried away. And for that, got carried away and carried away, he got 20 more repetitions of her exercises. At night, when she went into his room, Mulan found him already asleep. It suddenly occurred to her that he had let him play dirty tonight, and also that he was sleeping strangely, curling up with his whole body like a little baby. Does he sleep like that because he never felt safe as a child? Mulan shook her head and suddenly leaned over and kissed Shen Lan on the cheek, thinking she was asleep, and then she left. And Shen Lan suddenly jumped up and smiled heavily. He didn't think he could use the sleeping pose as a way to get even. Isn't she now blaming herself for torturing him so much with today's training? Speaking of acting, who could ever be better at it than him, Shen Lana? Next, he is left with the priority of figuring out how to get out of the house and deal with Tian Heng. But before that, Shen Lan decided to make sure that his next move was accurate. Putting on his gloves, he pulled out a small silver vial from somewhere. It was a super strong hallucinogenic drug. Although the degree of purity was not of the highest order, the result promised to be more than satisfactory. At least because there was enough of it. And this one had cost him several hundred kilos of rye, which he had personally grinded overnight. There was one last important point to be made. It was worth sneaking into Mulan's courtyard. Meanwhile, in the secret room in the city of Xuanwu, the two were talking about Hexu Wen Zhao is dead. Kill by that concubine. Their plan must be carried out, and immediately, because Shen Lan is too cruel and cunning. If they are too late, everything will change. So said the fiery first man, covered in scars and looking very threatening. But no, the time has not yet come, the flames have not yet been kindled, but the east wind has come, for the governor general's messenger is on his way, and will arrive in the county of Suanwu tomorrow evening, accompanied by the governor himself. The second man immediately changed his mind, telling Qian Han that he could make his move tomorrow night. He thought, turning to Shen Lan, that he had never aimed at him, for his target was the county of Suanwu. But since the guy had come this far ahead, he would naturally become cannon fodder this time. The next morning in the county of Suanwu in Mulan's yard, it turned out that the girl's blue dress was missing. But is it really? Off. The morning after breakfast, Mulan kept thinking about her dress, had her husband taken it. But she was afraid to tell him. She was ashamed. And Shen Lan suddenly asked if her neck and shoulders were sore and offered to give her a massage, saying, I'm not plotting anything, I just have a heart ache for you. And she didn't even know that he knew how to massage. And so Shen Lan is already standing behind her back and reassuring himself that everything in the world is illusory, as a case is a case, and starts massaging her neck. After a while she guesses that he wants something from her, so she informs him that her father recently talked to her and told her that under no circumstances should he leave the house and the same way he should not be arrested because Chen Lan might run into danger as soon as she goes outside. But if she does not, she is not. But without even letting her finish, the guy ran off, saying he was on urgent business. Isn't her husband too practical? If people don't do things for him, he resolutely turns away. Annoyingly, he suspended a man in space and ran away. But in a few moments, Shen Lan was already in the Jin family's living room, handling Mulan's mother. He put a mask on her face and kneaded her shoulders, just as he had just done with his daughter. He told his mother-in-law about the mask and paid flattering compliments to her, and the woman was melting from such attention and words that with such care she would look younger than her daughter. But she also guessed that Shen Lang wanted something from her. The son-in-law cautiously said that he needed something outside the house. Only his father-in-law put him under house arrest, 
and in a quarter of an hour, the house arrest was completely removed from the boy. Unnoticed by everyone in the house, a new clear order was formed. Shen Lan listened to Mulin, Mulin listened to the Count's father, the Count in turn listened to the mistress, and the mistress listened to Shen Lan. All that was missing in this perfect substitution circle was a fat couch potato named Jin Mutsen. One could eat, sleep, and beat up Mutsen. That's where he belongs. Before leaving the county, Shen Lan found Jin Huai again and asked him some questions. Then the latter secretly left. However, after leaving the county, Shen Lan did not return home, but came to a dense forest. There are some taboos that must be broken at all costs, some doors to other worlds that must always be kept slightly ajar. Aren't these just women's clothes? If Saima could wear it too, why couldn't Shen Lan? This is the sacrifice of strong morals that must be made in order to defeat Qian Hang and Lu Wu Yang. Inside the Black Robe Gang, Dasha Song Yi's father was walking with some man into the building and very focused, waiting to meet someone. When Dasha's younger brother was left without offspring by Shen Lan's blow, Song Yi wanted revenge but was stopped by the village headman and others. They would have dared to oppose the ruined Shen family, but not the county. Intent on revenge, Song Yi found Tian Hang. He feared that he would not be able to sue Shen Lan because he was the Count's son-in-law. But isn't murder punishable equally for a prince and a commoner? It is the same crime. If the Count defends the murderer, there will be a popular uprising. But what I don't get is this. Didn't Shen Lana just kick the boy? What does murder have to do with it? But kicking wasn't enough to prosecute. You had to arrange her murder. You have to make Shen Long pay with his life. Meanwhile, stepmother Dasha in Xuanwu City was still unsuspecting and sitting at the table lamenting the injustice of life and Shen Lan drinking honey water. As she suddenly realized that she was getting sick, as from alcohol and clinging to sleep, she suddenly dropped her head on the table and passed out, 45. The woman woke up to realize that everything around her had changed. The house had turned into a fairy tale forest with a bunch of predatory plants with huge thorns, and a lady appeared in front of her as if out of thin air, immediately attacking her with the words, how dare this woman harm her Dasha. The woman guessed it was the ghost of Dasha's birth mother. The woman guessed it is the ghost of Dasha's mother. Green fire soared above the hand of the ghost, which the mother Dasha has directed at the stepmother, and it seized her hand, yes, so that it was impossible to put out. The woman screamed and writhed in pain, begging for an end to her torment, the devil's fire, the devil's woman. What does she want here? But she was not the one who had thrown her son out. It was not her. It really wasn't her. And Dasha's stepmother bowed and begged for mercy. Finally, the ghost put out her informal fire. She spoke, heaven and forgiveness. Her son did not die. He was saved by a star blessed by heaven. But her son, Sunshin, was dead. But the woman did not believe it. She babbled that he could not be dead, he was only wounded. But the ghost made it clear to her. Her husband would come back very soon and tell her that her son had passed away. He will tell her that he was beaten by the lunatic Shenlan and died after being kicked in the lower body, and then take her to the county to identify Shenlan as the murderer. But that's not what really happened, the murder itself, because her son was taken away by her husband and Tan Hang. And the unfortunate woman was babbling that her son was not dead and could not die, suddenly realizing that she couldn't move and that this might be a dream. Sleep paralysis. What does this ghost want? At last he got the answer to his question. The ghost promised to kill her if she moved and let her live if she did. Dasha's stepmother was willing to do anything. The ghost began. Shen Lan is her son's savior, and Tai and Hang will be asked to frame Shen Lan tonight in front of high-ranking officials. Here's what she has to do. First agree to all of Tai and Hang's demands without hesitation, and then when they arrive in the county, in front of all high-ranking officials, she will immediately retract her words and say that they heard was badly beaten and injured her husband because he did not follow some errands. Then she will say that it was Tian Hang who made her falsely accuse Shen Lan by saying that he killed her son. But the stepmother gets scared. She would be killed for such a thing. The ghost threatened. If she did not comply with her demands, she would drag her to the 18th step of hell, roast her alive on the frying pan of hell. 
Does she want such a death? But she can stay alive if she fulfills all the requirements, and the county will protect her. When Tai and Hang dies, she can return home, and the ghost will reward her with treasures of gold. She will be able to take that money, remarry, and live a better life than she does now. And for the moment there are thirty golds buried under her bed, and she will dig up three hundred there too, when she identifies Tai and Hang. Life or death, fame and fortune, or the eighteenth step of hell is up to her. And the holding disappeared. The stepmother's head ached terribly, but the burn on her left hand helped her to believe that it was not a dream. The woman remembered the golden moments under the bed and dug in to dig them out. The money turned out to be frozen in a box of ice with the inscription, Do you want to die or do you want to live? on it. But how could it be easy on such a hot day? It's definitely a ghost. The stepmother promised to do as the ghost told her, and so she bound to the floor in the standing room. Suddenly, the ice quickly melted. The woman took it as a sign from the ghost. Meanwhile, in one of the hidden corners of the city again, Shen Lan was already undressing from the woman's dress. White phosphorus for the ghost fire, saltpeter for the ice box, and a silver needle stuck into Sun Ji's chest. Although there were some flaws, Sun Ji, who was in a psychedelic state, honored that it was all a hundred percent real. Shen Lan really is incredible, but women's clothing is indeed a peculiar experience. But a beautiful man like him remains beautiful even in women's clothes. If he goes to Thailand, there will be nothing left for the lady of the house. Maybe if he has nothing better to do, he'll wear. No. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh. You can't leave physical evidence behind. I wonder if his wife will find the dress missing. And how will she explain it to him if she finds out? He can't say he didn't hold back his feelings for her and stole her dress, did something untoward, and then burned it to get rid of the evidence. No, no, my wife has so many dresses, she's not likely to notice anything. And even if she did, how would she know it was him? That he stole it, and not somebody else. Meanwhile, in the black-robed gang, a man wept over the body of his body, while a man named Hang, on the contrary, smiled. Now he had definitely beaten Shen Lan. Kicking an innocent young man is much less of a crime than beating him to death. One pays for murder with one's life. The emperor's son who broke the law was as guilty as a commoner in his position. He was told that the governor general will soon be here. The heir to the county of Xuanwu and Jin Mulan will personally lead the cavalry ten kilometers away to greet them. The governor will personally accompany them. Everything is ready. The wind of change is finally blowing. Shen Lan is finished. As he was a dog, he's still a dog, even if he made it up to the county. Yes, crushing this stray dog is a secondary goal. The main goal is the absolute destruction of the county. As soon as Shen Lan goes to jail, his family will immediately be shackled, sent to the mines, and killed. The father, weeping over his murdered son, he ordered to go to his wife, have her put on mourning, and take on a sorrowful appearance. Have her brought to the county to identify Shen Lan's murderer. She is the only witness. The man obediently rose, stood crying before Hang, bowed, took his child's corpse, and went to carry out his superior's orders. Sungji's room greeted the man with his dead son in his arms with silence and semi-darkness. He came to one knee before his wife and told the sad news of mourning in their family. Their child's wound was incompatible with life, and he was soon to die. Had the ghost sister really not lied to her? She didn't. She didn't lie about anything. Sun Yai is a high-born lowlife. He really could have given Tan Hang to kill her son. She had refused to believe it for so long, and the man, choking back tears, kept talking. Shen Lan did it, that animal, he killed their son. The man suddenly offered to pull himself together and avenge the death of their child. For their son, the woman also understood the tears. Her face became very fearful, and she hissed through her teeth that she would do anything to avenge her son. Let the murderer pay for his deed with his life. Her husband wanted to tell her to put on her mourning robes, but there was no need. He told her to go now with him. The governor's ambassadors and the governor's general would definitely support them. After Qian Heng and Sun Ji testified, he gathered all the members of the black-robed gang and carried Sun Chun's dead body to the county. They must give up Shen Lan. 
The murderer will pay for it with his life. These words were chanted by the people walking down the street with the coffin in their hands. Tan Hang chose this moment to bring his men to the county and make a commotion, because Count Xuan Wu was to host two very influential people today. One of them was the envoy of the residence of the Governor General of Tanin Province, Zhu Rong's assistant Governor General, Yan Wuji. The other was Zhang Chong, Governor of Nujing County, Tanin Province. To pay them his respects, Count Xuan Wu personally led 200 cavalrymen out 10 kilometers to meet them. At sunset, this meeting took place. Yan Wuji paid his respects to Count Xuan Wu. This man was the flower seeker, the person who came in third place in the state examination of Yu, an aide to the governor, General Zhu Rong. Forced to leave officialdom for some obscure reason, Yan Wuji winged the academy and taught for ten years, making him famous throughout the state of Yu. He was later appreciated by Governor Zhu Rong, who visited him three times, only to make him his assistant. The second to pay his respects was Zhang Chong. Zhang Chong was the father of Zhang Jin, the governor of Nujing County, Tangan Province. This man was skilled in both civilian and military affairs. He had served as town governor for five terms, had a long record of service, and was known for his outstanding list of political achievements. Three years ago, when he took over as town governor of Wangya in Dongxin County, he played an important role in implementing new policies in the state of Yu. During those years, Dongjing County took over and carefully and comprehensively administered the entire Dongjing County. The city of Wangya, where the county was located, was known as the place of death of officialdom. The new politics could not advance an inch in Wangya City. It only took Zhang Chong five years to bring Dongjing County to a standstill. The proud, brutal Count Dongjing took the attack on the Count's palace, but Zhang Chong defeated the enemy even with a small force. From then on, Donjing County and Rod Hai lost their influence, and Zhang Chong was transferred back. For three years, he stayed in the shadows and waited for his time. Now he was sent to Nujing County to act as governor to promote new policies aimed at the local despot of Nujing County, Xuanwu County. In the banquet hall of Xuanwu County, a variety of high-ranking officials gathered. They chatted and talked among themselves. But he, the ordinary son-in-law of Shen Lan, who was adopted into his wife's house, was not yet time to go on stage. And so he decided to just come on to his wife, the most attractive girl he could ever have. One of the newcomers, Yan Wuji, the governor's aide, drew the earl's understanding by tapping his sticks on the table. He suddenly said that it had been twenty years, glaring expressively at the earl. The governor general had sent him here to ask what he was going to do about the conflict on Jinshan Island, and to find out if the governor general's palace could act as a peace mediator. Shen Lan was surprised. It turns out Yan Wuji showed up here to talk about the conflict on the island, Jinshan, and he had already heard about it from Yulin a couple of days ago. Initially, the conflict over the Jinshan break was born more than a hundred years ago when both the northern count of Jinhai and the count of Xuanwu both felt that the island belonged to them. If it had been an ordinary fiery island, everything would have been fine, but here it was a question of resources. Jinshan has deposits of high-quality iron ore and other related materials. If Xuanwu County got this island, its annual income would increase by about 30%. The two families fought for this island table so many times that they completely blew their brains out. As a result, the previous sovereign issued a decree that once every 20 years, the two countries must compete in politics and in the military art of dueling, with the winner taking possession of the island for the next 20 years. It is a pity that the county of Xuan Wu lost 20 years ago, for it had lost a great source of funds and suffered greatly. The governor general himself suggested that the island be divided into two parts, the north and the south, and the north, to the county of Jingshan, and the main fossils were in the north, and the south was just barren soil and sandy beaches. How can you all tolerate such an annoying conciliator? Yan Wuji thought to himself that he was just passing on the words of the governor general, although he himself was not against the counties fighting among themselves for as long as possible, let them even tear each other's throats out. So much the better. 
Suddenly, indignant cries were heard from behind the door. Someone was chanting a call to give Shen Lan's men back. They shouted that the murderer must pay with his life. Finally, the fun part began. Shen Lan was bored out of his mind and almost fell asleep. But it was no good there were smart people around, no one to talk to, and without that the show would not begin. There was no way out, had to Shen Lan. But then Jin Mutsen spoke up and Shen Lan even praised him to himself. A few moments later, a guard entered the hall. He reported that the people in the streets are going to storm the county. It turned out that Sun Yi's youngest son was dead, and the angry mob demanded Shen Lan. But how could he die if even Jin Zhang said that the boy's life is not in danger? They forced the count to give them Shen Lan, but there were several weighty butts. He couldn't do it. The Count ordered the parents to be let in with the coffin. A few minutes later, several men were placing the wooden coffin in a conference in the middle of the room. They kept blaming Shen Lan for their son's death. The mayor was indignant that they had made a scandal in such a place, where many respected people are sitting. The dead man's father, with tears in his eyes, asked the town governor and the Count to order for the sake of the people, and then the town governor asked to tell them more about what had happened and the father began to tell about Shen Lan's past, that before his marriage he was an ordinary commoner in the village of Maple Leaf, and since childhood he was withdrawn and did not get along with anyone, but in his youth he often competed with his son, Sun Chun, but said that he could not think that Shen Lan mean man, with the arrival of power and entering the family of the Count, he returned to the village and began to brag about his strength and beat Song Chun in front of him. And when he took his son to the hospital, it was too late. Shen Lan beat Sun Chun to death. He stripped his son and showed the high-ranking lords that he had beaten him to death after an argument with the Count's son-in-law. And he asked them to do something about it. Mulan seriously asked when he died. And Sun Chun's father said that he died the same night that Shen Lan severely beat him. And then Mulan asked why they procrastinated and did not come to the county then to get justice, but just procrastinated. And Sung Chun's father tearfully parried that he wanted to come to the county immediately after his son's death to get justice, but on the same day to his surprise, he was met by a man who introduced himself as a confidant of the count. He gave him a lot of dejins and threatened him to keep his mouth shut, or else he and his family would be killed. Graf was quite surprised at Father Sun Chung's story. He thought to himself that out of his conservatism, people now thought that Xuan Mu Counts was no longer dangerous. And then the county governor asked Sun Yi proof that Shen Lan had killed Sun Chun. And Sun Yi said that there were many witnesses who saw Shen Lan break into their house that day. Then the town governor ordered the witnesses to be called. And a few moments later, the witnesses were already sitting on their knees. And one of them began that he had seen with his own eyes how Shen Lang had entered Sun Chan's house and confirmed his words. And another also joined in, saying that he had heard the sounds of fighting and shouting coming from the victim's house, and he too could confirm Sheg Lan's arrival. Now this time the town governor asked his son-in-law if he had anything to say. And then the son-in-law began to say that he had indeed come to Sun's house, but that he had not beaten anyone. And he only came by to deliver money to them, because Dasha is his close friend, and he asked Sun Ji to feed him plenty every day. Then Suni shouted that he was lying, and that he was the one who beat Sun Ji to death, and his wife saw everything too. And his wife could be a witness too. Everyone's attention shifted to Sun Ju's mother, who was holding her dead son weeping. And the town governor asked Sun Ju's mother if she could confirm her husband's words. And then she said that she had indeed seen. Soon Yulai fell to his knees and asked them to bring justice to the common people. The gang leader approached him from behind and began to calm him down. And already he shouted that the law of the state of Yu states that a murderer must pay for his life, and the prince who broke the law is as guilty as a commoner, and moreover, Shen Lan is only a son-in-law admitted to the counts, and he asks everyone sitting here, and the Count in particular to be impartial and do justice for his subordinate Suni. And the crowd from behind began to shout that Shen Lan is a murderer, and he must pay with his life for his life. The town governor was stuck in a stupor and did not know what to say, and the people from behind still continued to shout that the murderer must be killed. And then the town governor appealed to the Count, 
that they must by law pay with their lives for their lives, and they had better give Shen land to investigate the matter. The Count was furious. He didn't know what to do, because if they gave them land, they could make up anything they wanted. The gang leader grinned evilly and said to himself that no matter how cunning Shen Lan was, now that he had all the evidence, how could he get out of this situation? Right. No way, and he can only await his death. And at the same moment, Sun Chu's mother cried out that she had seen with her own eyes how her husband and the head of the gang had beaten his son in frenzy and sent him flying with one foot. Everyone arrived in shock of amazement. And Suni's wife went on to say that initially Sunju was not seriously injured and had been sent to the hospital for treatment in Xuanmu City, and he had already recovered. But after his arrival, his son died suddenly, but died a violent death. Suni was already all sweaty and could not get up, as at that time, the town governor and the gang leader did not understand what was happening and why she had done so. And they both began to turn to Suni with angry eyes, and asked why exactly at that moment his wife began to speak differently, but Suni himself did not understand the reason. Sun Chan's mother looked at the gang leader angrily and angrily. That's when the gang leader realized that everything was going according to Shen Lang's plan. And that was exactly the kind of big conspiracy Shen Lang had set up. And Shen Lang looked at him like a tiger with angry eyes and a snide smile. And then the head of the gang realized that he could not get away, he just could not. Because the smarmy and vicious Shen Lan clung to his prey, and he would never let her go. And then the town governor corrected Sunji, saying that out of grief, she began to carry heresy. And Suni supported the words of the town governor and hugged his wife and began to manipulate saying that she saw everything, saw how Shen Lan beat her son, and why now she refuses to retract her words. Then she angrily, with eyes red from tears, looked at her husband, and he said that he was the one who killed Chun, and Shen Lan had come to give them silver because he was afraid for Da Shu and thought they had no food. And the husband at this moment bounced off her and asked if she was crazy or if Shen Lan could threaten her. And at the same moment, the town governor supported Suni and said that her lying is also punishable and besides, Sun Chun is their beloved son and Suni could not kick him. Then the head of the gang also got furious and started yelling that Shen Lan threatened her. And then the woman said that Chun was curious about something from the women and was sneaking a peek at her. And then Suni came back and kicked him in a fit of rage. Then everyone, absolutely everyone, was shocked. Then Suni began to openly insult her. But the head of the gang stood his ground and said she could safely tell the truth, because high-ranking officials were sitting here and they could help her. At that time, the ambassador was already angry that Tian Hang was using his father's name to put pressure on people. So Sun Jet fell to her knees and asked her to punish those two men. The mother of the dead child was asked to rise from her knees. Zhang Chong, governor of Nujing County in Tainan province, asked the woman to say what her grievance was. She said that after her mind kicked her son, he would not have died. In addition, the healer's office told Xuanwu that his life was not in danger, only that his testicles would have to be cut off and he would not be able to continue his lineage. The servants who helped the woman to her feet had such surprise and shock on their faces, as if they had seen something previously unseen. Of course, for every man, this is the most painful thing. Sun Ji continued her story. She had been caring for her son at his bedside for the past few days, but yesterday afternoon she was suddenly sent home by force. And when her husband returned home at noon today, he informed her that her son Chun was already dead. She screamed with grief. But her husband kept repeating and repeating that she should drag Shen Lan into it and say that he was the one who had beaten their son to death. Then Tian Hang also told her to identify Shen Lan as the murderer. He even said that if he killed Shen Lan, Sun Yi would become Han Shui's caretaker. Shen Heng was angry, for his whole plan was going down the drain. The only thing on his mind was that it was a lie. A lie consisting of seven parts truth and three parts lies. And that is the hardest lie of all, and he understood that. Then he only said, falling to his knees and addressing the governor, that this was definitely a conspiracy by Shen Lan, for this young man is incredibly evil. The Count, Mistress, and Mulan looked suspiciously at the son-in-law, and he caught their glances and pretended to be the most honest and innocent person. 
At this time, Zhang Chong ordered Liu Wang's arrest. The man yelled, ordering his subordinates to arrest Xian Heng and Sun Yi, and to take Sun Zhang to the town governor's residence as well, to make sure they got to the truth. The men were tied up so that they could not make an unnecessary move. Of course, Chien Heng was terribly angry at what was happening to him now, but Sun Yi was at a loss, because he was sure that everything would go quickly and easily, and he ended up getting arrested. Shen Lan immediately realized that this order to arrest them could not be called anything other than a timely fixation of losses and a firm grip on the initiative. Otherwise, if he holds Chien Heng accountable for instructing Sun Zhang to falsely accuse me and frame the count, they will be in trouble. And the woman, who was already wanted to be taken to the town governor's residence, knew that now it was definitely over, she would now be taken away, and the end would come. However, the countess did not allow this to happen. She came up to her with a cloth in her hands and blotted the poor woman's face with it. The woman tried to feel how this poor woman would endure all the torment. In addition, she said that the dead are more important and asked someone to carry this young man's body downstairs and find a good grave for burial. She also told Sun Jai that as a mother she understood her pain. She is Lan's fellow villager and also a person of their Xuanwu County, so she should stay at the Countess's house for a few days so that she would not be frightened again and risk her life. She then turned to the governor and asked if he thought it was appropriate to do so. Zhang Chong agreed and said that it would be best if Sun Ji remained in the county. He then turned to Mr. Yang and said that it was getting late, so it would be necessary to return to the city and rest. The gearinator then told Li Wang that he should investigate the matter and give everyone an explanation. To which he replied that he would put Tian Heng and Sun Miai in jail until tomorrow's trial. While his subordinates were carrying the corpse away, the governor of Mujin County in Tainan province came up to the count and said that the son-in-law was really impressive. After a while, the count came out to see everyone off. As he stood with Zhang Chong and Yan Wuji, Shen Lan looked victoriously at the bound Chin Hen. He asked him why he, as an aristi, was looking at the county's son-in-law with that look, for it was very frightening. The man was already furious. He realized that this young man was proud of himself. However, the son-in-law denied everything because Tian Heng was not dead yet. Their evil doom was not over yet. How could he be proud of himself? After all, he is not that superficial a person. The man, who was barely held back by the guards, laughed angrily across the courtyard. Tian Heng was sure that it was just Shen Lan's air castles that he was building, because no one would kill him. Who would dare to do that? The town governor? Or maybe the town governor? He had assured Lan that he would be out of jail in three days without a single crime. This made Lan a little wary, but outwardly he remained unperturbed. Shen Heng was about to break free of the guard's hands, so the guards of the Count's family ran up to him, grabbed the culprit, and warned his son-in-law to be careful. When the young fellows laid hand face down on the floor, he was still trying to convey to his son-in-law that he would remain innocent. He would give his gambling house to someone else to free himself from his weaknesses, and then use all his time, all his strength, all his resources to do only one thing every day. Every day to find a way to kill Shen Lan. He shouted this, spouting all his anger, all his rage. However, Shen Lana only calmly looked up at the man trying to say something, to hurt him somehow, but it was all pointless. The young man simply said that Tian Heng was about to die. The man stopped at first. Then he laughed out loud, saying that the brute was just daydreaming. Liu Wang came up to them and said, Son-in-law Shen Lan, that the case is not over yet, so there is no need to speak so categorically. A little later he added that maybe he would summon the young man to the town governor's palace tomorrow. Then he, the Aristi, and the two escorts went to the carriage. Meanwhile, outside Xuanwu County, a crowd was still standing and chanting the same phrase, asking that Shen Lan be handed over to them, that the murderer should pay with his life. Li Wang turned to the governor, asking how he thought the case should be judged, to which Zhang Chong simply remained silent and walked away with Yan Wuji to the carriage. But Wang was not far behind with his questions. He ran up again and said that it would be a shame to miss the opportunity like this. The governor looked sternly at the man. 
Then he turned to Tyne Hang and asked who told him to show up today. The man only kneeled down and said that he was really at fault. He thought he should have framed Shen Lan, he and he to the enemy, so he had to show up here. But he couldn't help himself, he really couldn't help himself. The man decided that this time they hadn't lost yet, he still had a chance to kill him. However, he only thought so, and only said aloud, turning to the governor, that such a chance comes once in a lifetime, they can not only kill Shen Lan, but also drag the county after him. The main link is this woman, Sun Jie. If only the town governor and the governor would call her in and find a way to get her to retract her words. Yan Wuji only looked at Tian Heng, but said nothing and sat down in the carriage, while Zhang Chong looked at him menacingly again and asked if he still wanted to get even. Without waiting for an answer, said that people take one step and look at three, and they stare in front of them, and hold on to their trough cannot part with it. Shen Lan does not just want to win the round, he wants Heng dead. Tan Heng looked questioningly at the governor. Does he really want to kill him thanks to Sun Ji's counter-accusation? Is it easy for him to get out of the case of Sun Chun's death? While Tian Heng was pondering Zhang Chong's words, the latter had already managed to get into a carriage and ordered his subordinates to kill Shizen. Both the town governor and Tian Heng looked at the man in surprise and question, but he answered nothing and left in his carriage. All that was heard was that they were not going to Xuanwu City, but were returning to Nujing County. Chen Heng looked at Li Wang. Tan Heng thought that Tian Shizen is a crony, he knows all his secrets, and what if he and Shen Lan are in on it? Then he himself had already yelled for someone to be sent to kill Tian Shizen as soon as possible. Meanwhile, at the county house, Shen Lan persuaded his wife to get on the horse as soon as possible. He asked if she was good at martial arts, to which he received only a brief positive reply. He thought this was rather immodest of his wife. The young man himself was dressed so that his face was completely hidden. He asked if she could win against the three waves of masters sent by Li Wang, Zhang Jin, and Tan Heng. To which he again received a short, positive answer. The young man wondered if his wife was that strong. He had some doubts about it, but he didn't say anything out loud. He just told her to hurry up, take the masters, and go to Tian Shizen's house and save him. To which he again received a short, positive response. A little while later, he rushed after her, saying that he would go with them. His wife said nothing, only ordered her subordinates, Jin Hui, Jin Zhang, and Jin Cheng, to get on their fastest horses and follow her. They knelt down and set off. Shen Lan turned to his wife, saying that he did not know how to ride, so he asked permission to ride with her on the same horse. He immediately assured her that he would keep his hands to himself. But Mulan did not wait for her husband to speak, but immediately grabbed him and put him on the horse, then quickly climbed in behind herself. So, they rushed forward. The speed of the horses was so great that Shen Lan was shocked at how one could rush so fast. One of the subordinates asked his son-in-law why they were only riding now, and still in such a hurry, since they could have gone to rescue Tian Shizen earlier. Shen Lan thought that this man of all present has the lowest level of intelligence, but just remained silent and did not answer. At this time, on the other side, the second subordinate said that if the enemy had not attacked Tian Shizen, his rescue would have been pointless, they could not turn him and Tian Hang against each other, and could not condemn the latter to death. The son-in-law was silent again, thinking that Jin Cheng was too fond of speeches, and of the five people here, he had the second lowest level of intelligence. Meanwhile, at Tian Shizen's house, the third day after Qian Shizen had his legs broken, and for the past three nights he had not slept a wink. His world had collapsed, he really thought of Tian Heng as his father, his idol, his master. Earlier, Zhang Jin and Li Wing had tried to recruit him, but he didn't agree, and stayed by the side of his named father. It was only because Tian Heng had supported him when he was at his worst, before his eyes immediately flashed back to the memory of how the man had first told him that from now on he would learn martial arts with him. However, when Tian Hain broke his legs for the benefit of the casino, the idol in Tian Shizen's heart died.
To Shen Lan, however, he did not feel much hatred at this point. He was carrying out the order to capture Shen Lan's family, and Shen Lan only punished him as an admonition to others to break both of his legs. However, Tian Hang also did not comply with Shen Lan's demand. That day, he personally came to Tian Shizen's house, set his bones right, and gave his parents 100 gold coins. He told his parents not to worry, because he would ask the best doctor in Xuanmu City to use the best medicine and cure their son's wounds. As he was about to leave their house, he turned around and told Shizen not to worry, because he would surely avenge him and tear Shen Lan's corpse into little pieces. The only one who would inherit his road in the future would be him, Tian Shizen. After these words, he withdrew from the house. Tan Heng did not follow what Shen Lan had said, did not send money, did not visit, did not heal, he came to him personally. This made Tian Shizen feel a little warmer, and the wounds inside him healed a little. The young man understood that although his named father had broken his legs, it was a forced situation, so there was no way he would betray him. Shizen understood that Shen Lana would probably use the money and status to buy him off. He wants him to turn against his father in return, doesn't he? However, the young man was sure that this was only in the dreams of this insolent concubine. He was going to punch him properly and spit in the face of this insolent son-in-law. Why haven't you come yet? Chan Shizen hadn't slept a wink for three days and three nights, all in order to punch the insolent boy in the face. Suddenly, the young man heard footsteps. He rejoiced, for he thought it was at last the son-in-law of the county who had come to bribe him. But what was his surprise when he saw men in kimono? Their faces were masked, but he could not be mistaken, he knew these men. The city lord of the palace city, Chief Liu Chenjin. There was also Tian Da and Tian Kai. Then Shizen understood everything. He asked Brother Da, Brother Qi, if he understood correctly that the named father had sent them to kill him. The men remained silent. Then the young man clenched his teeth, blood playing in his body with anger, and the jaws on his face were setting. He asked Tian Da and Tian Qi to do so, but to let his parents go, for they knew nothing. However, one of the masked ones apologized, saying that it was necessary to destroy the problem at the root. Then the young man yelled that the family had nothing to do with it. He knelt down in front of them, trying to stop them somehow. But all he got was a sword blow to the body. One of the bandits ordered the other to go get his parents. The young man's parents fell to their knees. The father begged not to kill, because he needed to take care of his son. And the mother asked to kill her, but to sit with her husband and son. Meanwhile, Shizen couldn't understand why, why he was being treated this way. One of the masked men said that he knew too much, so if he survived, he would jeopardize his named father's safety, so they could not take such reckless risks. Then Shizen thought he was the only one keeping the loyalty. He thought he was cool, and he ended up being a fool. He laughed across the room, it was a historic laugh. Then one of his former comrades told the others to make it, so they would send Shizen's brother and his family to the other side of the world adding to make it neat. Although the young man understood that resistance was futile, he could not sit idly by. He grabbed a blanket from his bed and threw it in the young man's face. He would have liked to run, but he felt a dagger stab him in the leg. All this was happening in front of his parents. They were crying. They also knew they couldn't help it. Shizen said that he knew he could not save his parents, but as a son he must at least try, even if he had to give his life so he could die without regrets. Then the mother screamed again, asking that they not kill her son. She repeated the phrase endlessly. At that moment, Shizen realized how Shen Lan felt when he was threatened to kill his parents. Then the young man realized that it was no wonder that he had chosen to take his chances and go to Jin Mulan. It seems that it was too late, because one of the bandits put his sword to his mother's throat and ordered him to surrender. Not a moment later, the parents were released, all the bandits had parts cut off on their right hands. One of the bandits recognized the girl as the princess of Xuanwu City, the most beautiful woman, Jin Mulan. He did not understand how old she was, how she could be so good at the art of war. With such skill, only her father, Tan Hang, could compare to her. Shen Lan, who was watching what was happening from around the corner, was shocked. He also did not understand how his wife managed so quickly, he had not yet gone in, she had already finished. He turned to her, 
told her that he hadn't seen anything, then asked her to show him again. Everyone present looked at each other. The bandits even swallowed the saliva that had built up from the newfound fear. Shen Lan thought that the elephant he did not notice. It turns out his wife is so strong, he was not prepared for this psychologically. He turned to her, told her that she was incredibly strong, she had done quite well on her own, then questioned why it was necessary to bring three masters here. She just looked at him, probably thinking that he wasn't smart after all. But the young man realized after a few seconds that the three weren't here to fight, they were here to protect his handsome men. Of course, the young man understood this from the beginning, but now he continued to play on the nerves of the masked guys. Again, he asked his wife if they were to fight, would she hit him or not? Then he took his wife's hands in his own and said that, in case one day she was filled with anger, for the love of husband and wife, she should tell him so that he could run away. But the girl rolled her eyes, remained silent, and answered nothing. Then Shen Lan asked again if it was safe for him to talk to the bandits at this distance, to which he received a brief positive answer. Then Shen Lan coughed and told them to go back and tell Tain Hang to wash his neck and wait to die. He also asked them to tell the town governor, Li Wu Yan and Zhang Jin, that when Tain Hang died, they should remember to invite him to the ceremony, for he had never seen his head cut off in his life. Lan said this rather smugly and even arrogantly. One of the bandits thought that Shen Lan was so cruel that if Qian Shizhen fell into his hands, all the secrets he knows also seem to be in this scumbag's possession. Thus, the named father will become a huge weak spot for Li Wu Yang, and either Shen Lan will come to point him out or Li Wu Yang will destroy the flaw with his own hands. Either way, named father will die. Even a mere bandit understood this. Shen Lan, pretending to be either a fool or a child or a foolish child, asked the men in the black kimono if he could take Tai and Shizen with him. They were silent and said nothing. Then the son-in-law told them to go back and remember to pass on his words. He also said that the place where their hands were cut off was squeaking with blood, so they must not die on the way, even if they really wanted to. They must by all means deliver the message before they die. One of the bandits was already so incredibly angry with the brat that his eyes filled with red bursting vessels. He even thought that even with his hands cut off he could finish the asshole off, but he resisted, because his guards were very strong. And still he wanted to live. So no one dared say a word, so they just kept quiet and went on their way. They realized that it was over, that great hardship was coming, that great trouble was coming. Meanwhile, in Tan Shizen's house, after the bandits and the others left, a conversation was going on between Shen Lan and Shizen. The son-in-law tried to pull the dagger out of the young man's leg, but he could not do it because the sword was very deep in his leg. No matter how hard he tried, nothing worked. Then Mulin, watching her spouse trying to pull the sword out, just took it and did it, smirking to herself. Meanwhile, Shizen realized that no gold, no status, no promise was needed for Shenlan to bribe him. He is already his. So the young man immediately knelt before his son-in-law and bowed to him. He cried for the situation was simply nightmarish. His sworn father tried to kill him and Shenlan saved him. Shizen realized that he was now Shen Lan's dog. Watching Shizen cry, the son-in-law of the county said that he was crying so pitifully that apparently he was not so ready to talk. Then Shizen wiped his tears with his hand and bowed again, addressing the young man with the word master. After this, the son-in-law was pleased. He said that from now on the young man would be called Shen Shizen. Of course, the latter agreed. Shen Lan told Shizen that it would be better for his parents to settle in the county. If he did something wrong, his parents would be in his hands, and that way they would both feel at ease. Behind her stood Mulin, putting her hand to her forehead. She thought that holding other people's parents hostage was very cruel. Plus, he was so confident about it, it was a nightmare. She didn't know why, but she really wanted to disassociate herself from such a husband. Meanwhile, Shen Shizen bowed to his master. He smiled beamingly and told his servant to get up. If he had a wound in his leg, how could he kneel on the floor? The floor was damp and cold. Mulan thought her husband's acting was too false. 
At this time, inside the town governor's residence, one of the subordinates reported that the assassin they had sent had failed, that Xuan Shizhen had been saved by Shen Lan, and that two of their assassins were dead. Liu Wu Yan was angry. He didn't understand how this damn subordinate could be one step ahead in everything. He continued to ponder. Tian Hang had so many lives and crimes on his hands, it would not be enough to execute him ten times, and Tian Shizhen was his confidant. He knew all the secrets of the Black Robe Gang. Now everyone is in big trouble. The servant, as if reading his master's thoughts, confirmed aloud that Tian Hang could not be saved. Li Wu Yan then slammed his fist on the table and stood up. He understood that everyone knew that Tian Hang was his henchman. In addition, Tian Hang gave him 20% of his profits every year. Now he was already looking for an answer to the question, where should he look for this money in the future? The man tried to pull himself together. He sat down at his desk, then continued to ponder aloud in front of his servant. He asked, if he beats Chin Hang, he will cut off his hand and lose face. Moreover, no sooner had Count Xuanmu made a move than he had already suffered great losses at the hands of his son-in-law. Wouldn't he be disgraced if this became known? The servant didn't have time to say anything Liu Wu Yan continued. He asked, what about Zhang Jin? He was more patronized by Tai Hang, after all, and nominally earned more money every year. The subordinate said that when he found out about Shizen's unfortunate murder, he would gallop off to report to the Lord Governor. Just as Liu Wu Yan's subordinate had said, Zhang Jin turned his horse around at the first opportunity and rushed behind his father's carriage as fast as he could. After riding for more than two hours, he finally caught up with it. He told his father that they had failed to kill Tian Shizhen, and now this man had fallen into the hands of Shen Lan. Zhang Chong was angry. He asked why his son was still here, because he had to go and do what he had to do. Zhang Jin's eyes went up to his forehead. Should he kill Tian Heng? I mean, he was giving the Zhang family 35% of his annual income, and they hadn't even received that money yet. How much of a loss would it be to let him die like this? The young man only said that Tian Hang had just joined their family. If they let him die like this, it would be detrimental to their morale. And he himself realized that this is exactly what this vile brat Shen Lan wants. Then the governor asked, does he think Count Xuan Mu will compare to Count Deng Hai? Zhang Jin replied that Count Deng Hai is cruel and arrogant. He looks powerful, but he is full of flaws. Count Xuan Mu is conservative and seems weak, but like a turtle, he has nowhere to strike. The father agreed with his son and added that this is why the fight with Count Xuan Mu will not end overnight. Jin wanted to object, but didn't have time because he was interrupted. Chong asked what was important to the commander-in-chief. Jin replied that it was important for a commander-in-chief to be able to plan. He should see the whole picture, not worry about losing a city or territory when losing a battle, stop losses immediately, and never rush into battle, especially to avoid constantly pouring funds into nothing. Father listened to this and asked irritably, if he knew everything, why ask him? Zhang Jin thought angrily that if they killed Tian Heng, wouldn't they let that creep Shen Lan get his? But he didn't dare to say it out loud. So after receiving the order to kill Tian Heng once more and waiting for the carriage to leave, the young man swung around and struck the ground with all his might with the tourniquet. Anger was boiling in him. He realized that such a scene had already happened when the same shame Shen Heng had experienced when he was forced to execute his men in the city street. He realized that if he was forced to kill Tian Heng, it would be the same humiliation. He stood in the midst of the night forest and looked up into the sky, trying to find answers to his questions. He realized that it would be as simple as letting such a thing happen as framing his eek and allowing Shen Lan to strike. Meanwhile, inside the Black Robe Gang, those in Shizhen's house told Tian Heng that Shizhen had been rescued by Shen Lan and that the brute was waiting on purpose for them to attack Tian Shizhen before his wife Jin Mulin came to his aid. Tan Hang asked everyone to come out. The man got up from his desk, walked out of his office, passed all of his subordinates, and went to the exit of his residence. He was sure that once Tian Shizhen told everything, no one in the whole world would be able to save him. In all these years, how many people he had killed, how many crimes he had committed, 
how many big people he had done dirty work for. Now would it finally be over? He realized he'd made a mistake. He'd really made a mistake. Even then, he should have torn Shen Lan into little pieces. He screamed across the street, at the top of his lungs, not caring that he might just blast his voice away. It was the middle of the night which added to the pressure. Tan Hain's entire state of mind said only that there was no one to save him now. He was simply dead. Soon, everything would happen exactly as that little asshole Shen Lan said it would. Tan Hang struck the wall, blood flowing from his hand. The blow was so strong that the concrete wall in that place crumbled into small pieces. Tan Hang wept bitter tears, asking for forgiveness. He just stood by the wall and cried loudly, repenting. He asked for forgiveness without ceasing. After a while he pulled himself together, pulled himself together, and went back into the house. He went into one of the rooms and pushed a bookcase away from the wall. Behind this bookcase was a hidden basement with stairs leading somewhere down. Tan Hang went down there. Two hours later in Xuan Wu City in the Exu family. Zhang Jin was shouting at the lady. He was angry, asking if Shen Lan wasn't a half-witted idiot before. Why has he become so treacherous now? Why didn't your family kill him then? These questions remained unanswered. The girl did not understand how in such a short period her ex-husband became so smart and calculating, how this fool became smarter than a monkey and more venomous than a viper. She just looked at the man with a stern look and asked what her father-in-law had said. Zhang Jin recounted the conversation with his father, concluded that he had received an order to kill Tian Hang. Hearing this, Mayor Liu burst into the room shouting that Tian Hang should not be killed. Zhang Jin looked at him wearily. Li Wu Yan continued his angry monologue. He was saying that firstly, if they killed him, they would lose face and lose this battle to that vile brat Shen Lang. Secondly, if they killed him, no one would be able to run the black robe gang in gambling houses, and no one would do the dirty work. So they will lose so much money every year that it is impossible to calculate. But Zhang Jin looked angrily at the mayor and asked if it was incomprehensible to anyone in this room. Liu Wu Yan continued. Besides all that said, if Chine Hang dies, that lowly bastard Shen Lan's complacency will skyrocket. The governor's son wearily covered his eyes with his hands and began to think out loud. If they don't kill Chine Hang, what he did for them will become known to everyone around. Everyone fell silent, trying to find a way out of this situation. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. They turned around in fright at the door. A servant stood in the doorway and reported that Tian Hang had secretly requested an audience. The next day, in Xuan Wu City, the courtroom of the mayor's residence. People crowded around, but most of them didn't understand what was going on. They asked each other, someone asked to move so that they would make way and let the way pass. Then everything became known, and information was passed from one person to another. The fact is that the criminal, Tan Hang, who was a thousand-year-old, arbitrarily did evil, freely committed lawlessness, killed and robbed, forcibly took away property and sold ordinary women. Now there was a public hearing of the case of the murder of Song Chun from Maple Leaf Village by Tan Hang and the case of the false accusation of Song Yi against Shen Lan, the son-in-law of the Count. Tan Hang stood in the stocks, covered in blood, as if he had been tortured for more than one day. It was announced on the square that for repeated crimes committed in Xuan Wu City, violations of the king's statutes, violations of moral principles, for crimes against God and people, Tian Hang is sentenced. But he laughed. He laughed angrily. The man who was sent by the county's son-in-law to find out what kind of meeting was taking place in the square did not understand how it happened that the trial took place so quickly that the son-in-law and the lady did not even have time to come. Shen Hang shouted that death would not stop him. Even if he died, he would die grandiosely. He would never become a ghost from the sword. He turned to the officials, said that when they needed him, they made him an honored guest, and when they no longer needed him, they made him a prisoner. He also added that it is obvious that they are unable to cope with Shen Lang, but they want Hang to die. Having finished his monologue, Tan Hang ran away from the forces that remained in him and crashed his head against the table with all speed, breaking it into pieces. He dropped dead. His brains were lying on the floor, 
The people gathered in the square were shocked by what had happened. They opened their mouths. The county man couldn't believe his eyes. Did Tai and Hang just die like that? An hour later in Xuanwu County, this man was already in the room and talking to his son-in-law. The young servant recounted everything he had seen and knew, but Shen Lan couldn't quite believe it. He asked again if he was sure that it was Tian Hang. The servant replied that whether it was temperament, appearance, or even the martial arts aura that erupted when he ended up killing himself, it was undoubtedly Tian. Meanwhile, Shen Shizang was sitting in his chambers and learning to read and write. He was writing something down in his notebook when suddenly it was torn out from under the pen. It was Shen Lan. He came into the room and said that Tian Hang was dead. Shizen opened his eyes as wide as possible. Then he asked the owner, Li Wu Yan, and Zhang Jin killed him. But the young gentleman only shook his head. Then he put his hands on the desk, bent over Shizen with his whole body, and said that he was the closest person to Tian Hang, and then asked if he knew if Tian Hang had a double. But Shen Shizang seriously thought about this question. He put his fingers to his chin, frowned and said that he had never seen or heard of such a thing. Then the young master thought that like two drops of water, a similar person is a rarity, some very large figures may have such, but Shen Hang, of course, was not of this level, but still, something made Shen Lan think. Something told him that his enemy was still alive, that something was still not as it seemed. After that, he decided to sit with his wife in the garden and have lunch. Jin Miulin, noticing the thoughtful state of her husband, decided to ask him directly what had happened to him. After all, Tian Hang is dead. This should be good news for him. You can already draw a red cross on this name on his wall. Shen Lan asked his wife if she believed in intuition. Seeing Mu Lin's slightly uncomprehending look, he continued. The spouse said that the more beautiful you look, the more accurate your intuition is, and there is a scientific justification for this. Mulan continued to drink coffee, listening to her husband. A handsome person attracts more attention, so he will be more perceptive and, therefore, will have a sharper intuition. For example, he is such a person. Whenever he walks down the street, he always feels when people point at him behind his back, hide behind the window, and say that he is beautiful. Mulan, who seems to have lost the essence of the conversation, confirmed only that he is the most beautiful. Shen Lan then went straight to the point. He looked straight into his eyes and said he thought Tian Hang wasn't dead. They don't have proof, so it's just a guess. Mulan said Jin Hai is a very serious person. But her husband did not listen to her. He said he thought Jin Hai was right, but if he were Zhang Jin, he would secretly execute Tian Hang at the first opportunity. After all, Shen Shizen fell into their hands, and Tian Hang's monstrous crimes are connected with many big people who simply cannot afford to answer for the consequences if they are revealed. But as soon as Tian Hang dies, everything will be decided once and for all. Therefore, the murder of Tian Hang is necessary, but it should not be an open trial and a public execution, he should die in prison. Then the thought of the spouse was picked up by Jin Mulan herself. She continued, he must die in prison, because the office of the mayor can sentence a prisoner to death, but this must be confirmed by the office of the governor. It would take at least ten days and half a month to get there and back, so if they wanted Tian Hang to die quickly, they had to let him commit suicide in prison. Shen Lan was glad that his wife was not only beautiful, brave, but also smart. He added that Tian Hang could have committed suicide and died in prison, but doing it in front of everyone is very unwise, as if he died specifically for. And they already said in one voice together that it was as if he had died in order for them to see. Shen Lan asked his wife where Tian Hang's body was and if they had access to it. His wife replied that she would show him this place and take him there. They came to the storage place of Tian Hang's body. When Shen Lan lifted the canvas that covered the body of the deceased, he saw a terrible picture. Just in case, he asked Mulan if it was really Han's body, to which he received an affirmative answer. Shen Lan thought that it was already too late, because the body had completely burned to the ground, so there was no way to confirm it externally. But, one brilliant idea came to his head. The young man decided to scan Tian Hang's body, as he had already done, and compare the tests. Found it. He found what was bothering him.
Without revealing all the cards to his wife, he only said that it was more fun to bring to death with his own hand than indirectly. Therefore, he and his wife need to prepare, because they will have a good show tonight. Jin Mulan looked at her husband questioningly, but he did not let her finish. He just said that even though the performance hadn't started yet, he was already seeing the finale. When Mulan was already leaving, not understanding what was happening, Shen Lan looked like a real narcissist in the mirror and said that sometimes it's a real sin when a person is so beautiful. But when he noticed that his wife already wanted to leave, he rushed to her. He asked what it was, but got the answer, they say nothing, everything is fine. The young man did not lag behind his wife, he asked her to wait for him, because tonight she would have to work again, and after finishing he would feed her deliciously. But the girl left without answering it. Inside a secret room in Xuanmu City, Tan Hang was sitting on the chair. Shen Lan's ex-wife, Mayor Liu Wu Yan, and Zhang Jin were also in the room. The lady brought some kind of mask to Tan Hang's face and said that little iron vitriol was used in it. You just need to press it to his face, and it would completely disfigure his face. Iron vitriol oil was purified by monks in the past. It is necessary for stuffing and dyeing, so the Exu family also has a legacy. Chen Heng took this mask in his hands and looked at it carefully. He needed to mentally prepare for what might happen now. He glanced at her and saw how this mask was laughing at him, as if mocking and accusing the man of Cordis. Then Chen Heng shouted that even if he died, he would die grandiosely. He would never become a ghost from the sword. The damn officials, when they needed him, they made him an honored guest, and when the need for him disappeared, they made him a defendant. Obviously, they could not cope with Shen Lang, but they want him to die. However, it was not Qian Heng himself who said this. This phrase was spoken by his brother, who was an exact copy of him. The man remembered this, looked at the mask, and shed tears. A day ago, Tan Heng is standing in front of the door to that very room. He hears the counting behind the wall. 287,352, 287,353. Then the man opens the door with a key and enters his secret room with a bag in his hands. He is met by his brother, smiling, saying that he has not yet counted to 300,000 and he has already come to him. But Tian Hang was frowning that day. He put the bag on the table and opened it. It was the food that attracted my brother so much. He immediately began to eat because, most likely, he had been eating for a very long time. He ate everything in a row, well, chewing, swallowing, drinking. Meanwhile, Tian Hang clenched his fists, not letting the anger come out. The brother noticed this and asked if he was injured. He asked if it was because of what happened to them in P. Boss Lai of the Heavenly Dragon Bodyguards came to kill us. But Chan Heng said that brother shouldn't worry, you just need to keep hiding here. Boss Lai hasn't come yet. And he thought that his brother was stupid, because it was all 20 years ago, and Lee's boss would never come. Then the brother said that Boss Lai had raised him from an early age and taught martial arts. Han really shouldn't have killed all the brothers for the sake of treasures. Then he continued, saying that Hang made him kill so many people that they had to flee here and they still constantly have to worry that Boss Lee will come and kill them, and he himself has to hide underground here. And even then, he shouldn't have slept with Sister Exu San and killed her, because the twins still wanted to marry her. For this, Tian Hang apologized, clearing his throat. And then he said, turning to his brother, the second fool, so that he would let him see how things were with his martial arts. The second fool began to show all his skills, which for several years of imprisonment, it would seem, could have been spent a long time ago. However, it seems that this young man did not waste time in vain, training and honing his skills every day. At some point, the young man almost smashed the wall. He did it deliberately, as if showing all his majesty. Tan Hang thought that even though his twin brother was dumb, he really was a martial artist. Then he asked his brother to undress so that he could assess what form his younger brother was in, the same as the older one or not. When the brother bared his torso, it was visible that both on the right shoulder and under the left side of the ribs, there were crossed out stripes that resembled the letter X, like the older brother. They were both bare to the waist. It was difficult to distinguish them. It's just impossible. They were like two drops of water. 
hair, scars on the face, on the body, their physical form was one in one. Therefore, Tynhain was pleased. He said that since the youngest likes to imitate his older brother since childhood, he needs to show Han how similar he can do it. Then, the twin copied exactly the state of his brother when he is angry. Everything was reproduced exactly how Han would have behaved. With anger in his face, with his teeth clenched, with an annoying grin, and with threats in his voice and speech. Even Han himself noted that it was as if there was another him standing in front of him. My brother also doubted. He asked if he looked like him, if he was doing well. To which, of course, I received an affirmative answer. The elder brother praised him. After that, Tan Hang said that he would teach him a couple of phrases that he should memorize well and reproduce exactly. The younger one said he would do it without question. This is probably what his older brother taught him. That phrase about the fact that even death will not stop him, that even if he dies, he will die grandiosely, that he will never become a ghost from the sword, and so on. And about the fact that earlier, when officials needed him, they made him an honored guest, and when the need for him disappeared, they made him a prisoner. And about the fact that they are no longer able to cope with Shen Lang, so they want Tian Hang to die. All these phrases were repeated by the twin brother exactly as his older brother demanded of him. Looking at the very mask that was now disfiguring his face, Tian Hang recalled all this. He decided that since Shen Lan killed his younger brother and destroyed his biggest trump card, he swears that he will not be human until he takes revenge. The man put on this mask and pressed it to his face. Steam and smoke were coming from him. It was a terrible sight, but Han didn't say a word. He sat motionless. The girl told everyone present what was happening to the man. Strong acid corrodes the flesh, the gas released, getting into the eyes, can affect vision. She also asked Tyan Hang to pay attention to this. She thought that a really ruthless man was sitting in front of her because he hadn't taken a single breath. After it became clear that the man's face was disfigured, the girl said that from now on, the man Tian Hang had completely disappeared and now it was possible to do many things that it was inconvenient to do before. The man got up from his chair and went to the door. The mayor Liu Wu Yan asked if Tian Hang was going to take revenge now. He replied that Shen Lan never lingers when he takes revenge, so he is not going to waste a second. He only subtly hinted that Shen Lan loves his parents and brother, and he Tian Hang lost his brother because of this nasty cute guy, so he will let him feel what it's like to lose loved ones. Liu Wu Yan only said that the scapegoat is already ready, so he can go and do his job without worrying about anything. It was not difficult to understand that Sun Yi became such a person. The mayor told his thoughts. Song Yi falsely accused Shen Lan and was exiled to the mines for life-hard labor. Of course, he absolutely hates him. It is logical to escape halfway and return to kill Shen Lan's entire family. Tan Heng listened to Li Wu Yan's speech and, as he left, said that when he killed Shen Lan's entire family, he would use their blood to make wine for the Lord. Soon after, Shen Lan's house in Maple Leaf Village. Chin Heng, disguised in a mask, in a black, inconspicuous kimono, and with a sword in his hands, approached the house of his enemy, anticipating his victory. He noted that there are three people breathing in the house, one of them is breathing unevenly. Everything should be right, this person should be Shen Lan's father, who has lung problems. With his sharp sword, he cut the latch on the door, opened the door, and entered the house. On one of the beds he saw a young man whose leg was bandaged. It was the brother-in-law. Then Tian Hang firmly decided that Shen Lan should feel this pain of losing people close and dear to his heart. The man longed for him to regret for the rest of his life that he had become his enemy. Shen Hang raised his sword high into the sky and plunged it into the head of Shen Lan's mother. He disfigured her face as if enjoying what he saw. Then he moved on to his father. He decided that he would divide the body in half, and this old man would not need to breathe heavily and cough. Last of all, he decided to get rid of his brother. He looked at the young man and thought that before the Xu family hired the Black Robe Gang to destroy him, the little brute, he was so insignificant that he could not even consider Tian Hang an enemy. But because of Shen Lan, he was just lucky, so they would break his bones with their own hands. The man clutched his sword and with all his anger broke the guy's legs, 
breaking the already broken shattered bones into small pieces. And then he took and stuck his sword right into Brother Shenlan's stomach. He started laughing heartily because he was pleased with himself. He finally did what he had been dreaming about for a long time. At the same time, he understood that he would definitely remain unpunished. After all, officially he is no longer alive. And this cute kept man won't even be able to guess anything. A pleasant warmth spread over the body. He said aloud to Shen Lang that even in hell, he would regret having sinned against a man like him. Now it remains only to wait for the moment when Tai and Hang will kill him and send him to the real hell. But then the door of the house suddenly opened. Tai and Hang turned around and his eyes were open like never before. He saw Shen Lan. He laughed because the coincidence of circumstances was more successful than ever, because this brute Lan himself appeared. Of course, the man introduced himself as if he was Song Yi and said that he would kill Lan right away. But the young man stood still and calm. He only asked Tai and Hang not to pretend. A thought process immediately began in the man's head. He knew that it was impossible, because his brother is one on one like himself, so there can be no mistakes, and this brat just takes him on a show, he's just bluffing and lying. However, Shen Lan began to speak with the help of facts. He said that he knew that the one who smashed his head was his twin brother, because how else could a person of his level find such a similar double? These words strained Tian Heng. The young man did not stop. He continued. Shen Lan said that Tian Heng was indeed an animal who did not hesitate to sacrifice his own brother's life in order to stay alive himself. Looking at how the man is trying to figure out how this little boy guessed everything that happened, Shen Lan decided not to torment the man and said that the game that Hang implanted in his twin brother told the young man a lot. Lan appreciated Han's idea. He said that it was a very powerful tool, but unfortunately, the man could not have known and did not know that the needle in the man's body, which had been in his body for several years, bent. Unlike the one that was inserted quite recently into his brother's body, she was straight. This helped Shen Lang to compare all the facts about what had recently happened. Tan Heng's eyes almost popped out of their sockets. He was clearly shocked. Such an insignificant flaw put simply destroyed such a brilliant plan. But how did Lan find out about this? No, it's just not possible. This kid is trying to deceive the great and terrible Tan Heng again. Shen Lan, watching the man rushing around, trying to make a choice in his head, ordered his servants to bring someone. A man who looks very much like the father of the deceased boy is thrown at the door. It was Song Yi. His whole face was covered in burns, as if he, too, had put on the very mask that burns all beauty. He shouted that he was in a lot of pain. He clutched his face in an attempt to somehow ease his pain. He asked for water, at least some water. However, neither Shen Lan nor Tian Hang paid almost any attention to the man tossing and writhing in pain. The son-in-law has already begun to openly mock. He asked which of the two of them was the real Song Yi. He openly said that the one with the sword is more similar. Then with a mocking smile in his voice, he asked who had managed to make fun of poor men by disfiguring their faces with sulfuric acid. He assumed it was Hu Guan Yu, or maybe Hu Kankin. However, this did not make Tai and Hing feel like a winner either. He laughed, looking at how this pathetic brat is trying to come out on top in their race. The man, smiling maliciously, said that the son-in-law of the county was late, because he had already managed to kill his entire family before the arrival of the boy. He pointed the sword at the young man with one hand, and with the other pointed at the bed where the slaughtered relatives lay. The man asked if Shen Lan didn't love his family. Now that they've all died in front of him, and he can't do anything about it, isn't he heartbroken? Why is he so calmly still trying to prove that Tian Hang is not dead, that he is here and now standing right in front of him? However, Shen Lan stopped the man's story. He put his hand in front of him and told him to stop. Moreover, he also decided to make fun of Han, saying that, apparently, he had very bad eyesight. The young man asked to look at those whom he had killed. The man took the torch, not understanding at all what he was driving at, brought it to the beds and was horrified. He almost fainted. His whole heart sank into his heels. He saw the dead. But it wasn't Shen Lan's family. It was his family. His own family. His wife, whose mouth has already stopped bleeding, leaving red traces behind her.
His trusted manager, who even had a trickle of blood flowing from his eyes, as if crying from the fact that the owner could do this to him. And his son, who seemed to be dying in agony, because his eyeballs were pumped up, his mouth was open, as if his son was trying to get air into his lungs and blood was flowing from his eyes and ears. He killed his family. Tain Hain yelled at the whole house, not believing his own eyes. This can't be happening. No. 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 He looked around and saw that the whole house was stained with the blood of his relatives, those closer to whom there was simply no one in the world. The man realized that now he had no one left in this world. With that, he killed them all himself. Shen Lan watched his enemy's tantrum and did not take his eyes off. He didn't want to stop there. The young man said that there was no crime that Tai and Hang's wife would not commit. She forced girls to engage in prostitution. His son, a major who squeezed out competitors, was also not a good person. Shen Lan continued to mock Han, mocking him more and more. He continued by saying that the head of Tan had sacrificed family relations for the common good, and that this time he had really done justice. Tan Han was furious. He had nothing left to lose. He attacked Lan, began shouting that he would kill him, that he would tear his corpse into a thousand small pieces. However, something stopped him. In the aisle, he saw a woman holding a small sleeping boy in her arms. Her face was saddened. Shen Lan said that he had heard that Tian Hang's wife was the daughter of the former leader of the Black Robe Gang, and that he had married her only for profit, and he didn't care about this already dead major. Lan added that he knows that only they, his youngest son, and this kind woman, whom the man bullied, should worry about Han. This girl looked at Tan Hang with pleading eyes. Then Lan's servant took her away, carefully escorting her and not causing any harm to her or the child. The young son-in-law continued his torture of the enemy. He said that this woman didn't deserve to be threatened with Tian Hang. He continued, adding that he just wanted to tell him, Tian Hang, that he had no chance of winning. Shen Lan won. Then the man threw his sword, raised his hand to the mask, and tore it from his face with all the rigidity that is inherent in this scoundrel. Pieces of skin flew off a few centimeters, so abruptly he tore it off. But the man did not scream, because it seems that after what happened to him recently, he just lost some emotions and feelings. He said that he had heard that Ms. Jin was an outstanding martial artist, and he wanted to experience it once. The man understood that, most likely, he would lose. But what did he have to lose? He has nothing to lose now. He's already dead. And so at least he will try to prolong his life. His miserable life for a few minutes, Mulan appeared out of nowhere and said she agreed. So, at midnight, two men stood in an open space with swords in their hands. Ms. Jin, as befits a military man, stood all in uniform. But her outfit was not like the rest of the warriors. That was what set her apart from everyone else. It was both ammunition and a dress and something that always helped her in battles. The girl stood confidently not a single gram doubting herself, her abilities, and her victory. And Tian Hang was standing, slightly hunched over from the pain, which for some reason began to manifest itself. He raised his sword while Mulan did the same. They looked into each other's eyes. Their looks reflected different feelings and emotions. Han looked at her with all the hatred that is not only in him, but in all evil people in this world. He hated this girl, whose husband had ruined his whole life, and Yulen looked seriously, objectively, with cold calculation. She didn't let feelings flood her mind. Like a real warrior, she was already standing and calculating her every blow, her every move, her every swing. Finally, Tian Hain could not stand this iceberg-cold gaze and rushed to the girl with a cry of die. Yulen continued to remain calm. They were both fighting for their lives. The only difference was that Han was hampered by a lack of motivation, because now he had no one left, he was already crushed. But Mulan was the girl on whom the future of not only her family, but the entire county depended. Only she in the future time could really competently manage the city. Therefore, she will definitely kill this person who stands in her way. And she will do it without hesitation. And so it happened. She cut Tain Hang in half, his sword broke and split into two parts, and he himself fell to his knees exhausted. Shen Lan opened his mouth in surprise. 
Tan Heng slowly getting down on his knees, helping himself with his hands not to fall with his whole body directly to the ground, did not have time to understand anything. Did he lose so fast that I didn't notice anything at all? Their battle lasted less than a minute. And now he's dying. Memories flashed before his eyes. He saw Boss Lai, a huge pearly man, stand in front of him and his brother and say that they had good bones so these two would guard with him. He saw how he and his brother were carrying boards with a saucer of water on their heads, how his brother condemned him, saying that he had made a mistake during training, and now they were both punished for catching the ball with his head. Then Tan Hang saw himself standing over the glowing bag and realized that there was no point in being a security guard, because right now he could just take it and get rid once and for all of the worries about water and food for the rest of his life. Then the man saw them together with his brother, having killed everyone to death, taking several bags with them, leaving home. Chin Hang thought that if he hadn't been greedy back then, they could still work in a security office together with his brother, marry grumpy women from there, and just live their lives peacefully. But then a smug grin appeared on his face. He didn't allow himself to regret anything. No, he, Chin Hang, has no regrets, although it's very sad. He bowed his head and accepted the fact that he was about to die. However, he heard a voice telling him not to die. The voice said he couldn't die yet. This voice was heard somewhere in the distance, so it was difficult to understand who it belonged to. Finally, the order to wake up became clear and clear. Who could it be? Chan Hang only saw the palm that was stretched out to him. It was Shen Lan. He punched Han in the face several times to make him finally come to his senses. He said that he had spent so much effort to kill him, so he had to give him something before he died. Spitting out blood, Chan Hang wondered if his life was so insignificant. But the young man did not even hide the fact that he gets incredible pleasure from what he is doing now. He said he tried so hard to bring his son here to see a man repent of farting or something like that. Therefore, for all his efforts, Tain Hang is simply obliged to give Shen Lang at least something. The former leader of the Black Robe Gang simply hated this half-witted brat, his eyes filled with blood from hatred for him. He shouted that Lan was an asshole, that he didn't dare threaten him, Tan Hang, with his son's life. But the young man did not listen to this nonsense, and did not let the man finish, who would die in martyrdom any minute, either from loss of blood or from pain. He needed information and he couldn't waste time on idle chatter. He only said that he is not what Han thinks. He is not like a man. He still has humanity. But for now, Han must promise him, Lana, that his son-in-law will take care of his son in the future. That is, the young man agreed to take care of the younger, living, only son, who is still dear to Chai and Hang. If the man tells useful information, dirt, then the leader agreed. He said, spitting out another portion of blood, that there is a secret vault of Li Wu Yan's gold in Beixu Villa in the left, where most of the gold coins with which Hang bribed him all these years are stored. When Tai and Hang was about to pass away, Lan slapped him on the cheeks again, saying that he did not dare to die yet because he had not told everything. The son-in-law asked if this was all for sure, perhaps there was something that the man had not yet had time to tell, for example, evidence of Li Wu Yan's crimes or something else. But Chen Heng screamed with the last of his strength, saying that all these civil officials are traitors and bastards like Shen Lan, so the mayor would never in his life have given the deadly evidence into Heng's hands. There was no longer hatred for his son-in-law in his eyes. There was only one request in his eyes, to die peacefully and stop all this torment. He later added that there was no way he could have any evidence with him. The only thing is a trap, because of which he died. Then Shen Lan put his hand on Tian Heng's head and said, complacently, imperiously, and haughtily grinning, that since he had nothing more to give, he could safely go to hell. Tian Heng wanted to yell at this snotty kid, but his strength had already run out. He coughed, new blood poured out of his stomach, or rather its remnants. His eyes rolled up, and his soul went to another world. He did not close his eyes, which means that he will not find peace after death. Shen Lan was well aware of this. After that, the young man ordered his subordinates to cut off the man's head, put it in the best box, and send it to Mr. Zhang Jin and Mr. Mayor. He ran up to his wife, 
pretending to be a cute little boy again, said that time was running out and they already needed to go to Beksu right away and earn a fortune. Villa Beksu Shen Lan, along with his beautiful wife Jin Mulan, stood and looked at several chests that glittered with gold inside them every now and then. Shen Lan turned to his wife, saying that this time the corrupt official was simply terrible. Liu Wu Yan was the mayor for three years, and he accumulated so many gold coins, only about 10,000. Mulan agreed and added that most of it went to bribe the higher ranks, and the rest remained with Liu Wu Yan. Of course, 13,000 gold coins is just a huge amount. If you recalculate for today's currency, you can reach tens of millions. Shen Lan laughed smugly and noted that he was done with Li Wu Yan's pension. However, Mulan said that this money, together with those confiscated from Kao Wenzhou, an arithmetic teacher, could significantly ease the county's financial crisis. The young son-in-law changed a lot in his face after these words, asking if the county was severely short of funds. The count's daughter was terribly angry, replied that she was very lacking, their current situation was incomparable with anything. Was the situation really that bad? Of course. Suanwu County, which lost Jinshan Island, overspends every year, and has been losing astronomical amounts for 40 years. The secret treasury of the county, which Xu Wenzhou dreamed of so much, has long been in the red. Only because the previous Count Xuan Mu was too generous and incurred huge debts. For many years, Jin Zhu has been paying off debts every year, and the financial situation of the county remains constantly difficult. At this time, Shen Lan obtained two large sums of gold coins for the county, which, one can say, was a great relief to the pressing needs. For a while, leaving the analysis of the current situation of the county, the husband turned on again, revived as Mulan noted. He said it would be inappropriate and inhumane to just move Li Wu Yan's storage and leave nothing behind. He ordered to leave something for the mayor. Meanwhile, at the residence of the mayor, Li Wu Yan was calmly drinking tea from his cup and reading a book. With him in the room was his servant, who, as usual, listened to all the thoughts of his master. The mayor was thinking out loud. He turned to the servant, noting that Tai and Hang should have finished and returned by now. The young man replied that he had to, but there are fears that before returning, Tai and Hang will want to torment these people properly and tear them apart. Then he added that if anyone is to blame, it's only this dog Shen Lan. He bit people indiscriminately, but even if the bite hurts, he's still just a dog. The mayor was holding a book in his hands and smiling smugly. He said that all this time he considered the stupid fool a powerful enemy. Yes, it seems that he has completely lost his mind. That's why they, educated people, must constantly read, because reading is the only way to have a calm mind and a pure heart. Then the servant's voice was heard from behind the door. It said that someone had sent a box. They said that it was from the head of Tian, and that the case was completed. When the box was brought, the mayor radiated only joy. He ordered the box to be opened, but his eyes widened when he saw Tian hang, or rather, only his head. One of the guards immediately flew in and reported that things were bad because all the gold they had at Beixu Villa had been stolen. Liu Wu Yan couldn't believe his ears. For how many years, all these years, this money was used not only for his pension, but also for bribing top officials. How could this happen? But the answer never entered his mind. The servant reported that the robbers of the vault had left a note. It said that it wasn't Shen Lan who took all the gold. Liu Wu Yan roared with hatred. He immediately realized that only this asshole could do that. It was his son-in-law who robbed him. The mayor shouted at the entire residence, his face turned blue. Heart. He collapsed in a fit. The servants began to shout for a doctor to be brought urgently, because the owner had lost consciousness. Meanwhile, in Shen Lan's room, Chan Heng's name was finally crossed out. The young man was smiling contentedly, sitting on the stairs. There was one less enemy, only he didn't use even a third of his strength. Life is so boring, the son-in-law thought. The wife, holding the ladder, said nothing, just rolling her eyes. But Shen Lan attributed one name to Li Wu Yan. He said aloud, as if threatening that now Liu Wu Yan could start worrying, it was expensive to go to heaven. 
He did not go. He broke into hell without doors. He spat three times over himself, because only yesterday Tan Hang said it. Shen Lan thought that this was a bad sign, but did not pay much attention to it. Mulin moved away from the stairs and was about to leave. She only said that her husband should have fun himself. The main thing is that he should have fun. However, Lan did not want to let his wife go so easily. He said he was going to jump off from here, so she had to catch him, because it was too high here, and it wouldn't be good if he fell and hurt himself. Mulan rolled his eyes. Her husband is already fed up with her childish antics. As soon as the young man said that he was jumping, he immediately found himself on the floor next to his wife, who a few seconds ago was standing near the door. He didn't understand why he was standing still, because he should be in his wife's arms right now. As Maple Leaf Village was no longer safe, Shen Lan planned to ask his parents to move to the outskirts of the county after he settled the matter with Tian Heng. Although his younger brother, Shen Jian, immediately agreed, Shen Lan's parents refused, simply because they felt that their son was accepted as a son-in-law, eating, drinking, and living in someone else's house. Would it be too shameless if the two of them came too? His parents stubbornly refused, and his younger brother rejected their disagreement, but here was his father shut him out. But luckily he has Jin Mulan, who was able to help him. Even though his mother told him that they were better off here, since they were not used to living so far away. Mulan cautiously sat down in front of his mother and took her hand and told her that her husband wanted to visit them every three days, for he was respectful of his parents. But their place of residence was very far from the county, so it takes most of his time to travel. He had money, so they would not live in the residence. They would build them a new home outside of it. She told her that she was aware that his mother was good at weaving and just as good at embroidery, but she herself was quite unskilled in this area, and her mother was even more unskilled in comparison. If she wanted to make clothes for her husband, she should be consulted. She had bright, scarlet eyes as she spoke that her mother could not refuse her. In fact, Mother Shen could not resist Mulan's soft methods, and she was thus persuaded to move. All with a big smile on their faces said goodbye before leaving. Meanwhile, Shen Lan was pleased with his sweet and understanding wife, who is not only of noble descent, but also a great martial artist. In addition, she is so affectionate to his parents, which causes him admiration. Suan Wu County. The couple were walking down an empty corridor. Jin Mulan, who was walking in front, abruptly turned around and asked her husband if he had seen her missing blue cloth dress, which was missing along with her underwear. The guy was thrown into a shiver. An unforeseen anxiety began to set in. At moments like this, Shen Lan began to quickly ponder the answer. And there were only two ways to answer this question. Option A. Lion say that he did not see it. Option B. Answer honestly that he saw and stole. He could lie, but he could not lie about such a small thing. The man's performance is very important to him. As a manly man, he could not lie to her. So he honestly admitted that he stole when he saw it, even though he hesitated. His wife rated this act pretty good. He has a lot of different thoughts, but he is honest at home. Mulan's face didn't change after his answer. You couldn't tell from his expression that she was angry. But she asked another question. This time she asked why he took it. She was going to wear this linen dress to gather mulberry leaves in a few days when silkworm cubs would appear in the out. Shen began to ponder the matter deeply again. Even this time, he had two options for answering this question. Option 1A, say he burned it. Option 2B, say he took it and put it on. If he chooses the first option, he might be considered a pervert. If option 2 is chosen, he will be seen as a gay man cheating on his marriage. Sometimes in life, a person seems to have a choice, but in fact, there is no choice. One can only choose the first option. Being treated as a pervert is better than being treated as a gay marriage cheat. After much thought, he called out to his wife and apologized in a loud voice, and then said that he had been tossing and turning last night, and all he could think about was his wife's figure. So he couldn't resist taking her dress and doing something untoward with it. His words were cut short when it came to the cause. His actions stunned the girl. After a brief pause, the boy clenched his teeth, closed his eyes tensely, and shakily said that he had burned her dress in the fire. Inwardly, he thought that was the end of it. 
He mentally repeated the phrase, it's over. He thinks he is doomed this time. Shen is sure that Mulan will take him for a pervert, but in his opinion, to be a man, he must possess a firmness of spirit. Then with dilated eyes, he cried out her name and honestly confessed the shameful thing he had done. Therefore he told her to kill him and tear him to pieces as her heart desired. He even told her that if he scowled, he was not worthy to be her husband. The guy asked her to rush into this decision. Whatever she chooses to torment him, she should speed up. But Jim Mulan had no intention of doing anything about it. She was embarrassed that her husband was so confidently making excuses after such a shameful act. So without further thought, she looked at him with a grim expression. She calmly asked her husband why he had burned her dress. After all, it would have been enough just to wash it, and she would wear it later. At present, their county could not afford to spend too much. But not just now, they couldn't afford any extra spending at all. Her words surprised the lad a little, for he had not expected such words. Mulan went to a small table that stood at the edge of the road and carefully set down a certain bottle. She mouthed that his health was more important, so he should not be intemperate. On the chair she placed the medicine she had asked Dr. Ann to prescribe for him. Shen has impotence. He was literally petrified at the mere sight of this medicine. On its surface was written in large letters, Pills Six Flavors of Yellow Earth. Shen Lan, who had defeated Chien Hang, finally got a rest, and the county too had a short period of peace and quiet. The autumn silkworms were about to make cocoons, and this is the time to furiously gather mulberry leaves, so the countess and Mulan gathered them together. But after gathering a dozen leaves, the countess took a break. She went to her husband right after a little picking, and asked for his help to rub her shoulders, as she was tired from picking. And Mulan collected several thousand a day. She filled several large baskets. Though slightly sweaty, she is still full of energy. Others have no choice but to marvel at her speed and stamina. Shen Lan, in turn, was punished again by his father-in-law when he asked to go to Xuanwu City to have some fun. He was too bored at home. His father-in-law looked away from the book and rolled his eyes at young Master Sheng. He asked what kind of entertainment he wanted. In response, Shen gave a few examples, glowing brightly. He said that if he noticed any injustice, he would come to the rescue, or if he saw a woman being mocked, he would intercede. Hearing his answer, his father-in-law immediately took his whip, and Shen saw it and hurriedly carried his feet away. The sun is setting over the horizon. Shen Lan lies looking up at the varied sky. He pondered the doctor's words. The doctor had told him that the patient's wounds healed incredibly quickly, both internally and externally. To him he seemed a strange man. Even so, he still wasn't awake. When Shen asked him about it, the doctor told him it was God's will. And then he realized that Shay really does sleep a lot all the time. His beloved wife is gone, and he is not allowed to go to school either. The guy can't even get out of the house to walk the bird and rub people. He is terribly bored. Shen rose abruptly from his seat as the girl approached him with the invitation letter. She called out and told him that an invitation had arrived for him and his mistress. Shen was expecting just that letter. It was beautifully decorated, bright red. It is an invitation from Hu Kain Kian. She is throwing an engagement banquet. In Shen Lan's room, Shen stands in front of the names written on the wall and looks at them. Three of them are painted with red crosses. The names written on the wall are Su Kan Kian, Hextu Guanyu, Zhang Jin, Qian Shizi, Qian Shizen. He relaxed, almost forgetting the Xu family. He and Mulan got married in such a hurry, and they're throwing a big engagement party. It seems to him as if she is trying to outdo Yilin. He gets mad just thinking about it. He gets mad about it. His eyes just glow with anger. He wants revenge on them. Xu Guangyin, whose ancestors were engaged in trade, has never been able to join the powerful estate. Stu Kanchen, who often attended poetry gatherings of noble women in Nujing County to befriend the rich and powerful, after two years of hard work, she finally made a name for herself as the third most beautiful woman in Nujing County. She also used this to grab hold of Zhang Jin of the governor's residence. In addition to his reputation, 
Cho Kanchen also worried about his family's silk and cloth business. In that case, the first thing he decided to do was to destroy her reputation and then to destroy their business. Though he has a cunning plan, he is satisfied with this perfect plan. As he mentally chuckled, the fat man walked in. He came to him to show him something good. The fat man handed him an album. An erotic album. Chan's eyes immediately glittered. When he looked at the guy with those sparkling eyes, he got goosebumps. He was slightly frightened by his intense gaze. Jin Mutson asked why he was looking at him like that. Shang didn't answer and asked if he had a girlfriend who liked him, but his question struck him right in the heart. He treated him like a friend, coming to share with him when he had something good, and he stabbed him in the heart. Mutson took offense and turned around and told him he was leaving and would pretend like he never knew him. He headed back toward the door, and Shen asked another intriguing question. Shen asked if he knew why girls didn't like him. In the hope of hearing a decent answer, Shurin's ears perked up. Then Shen confidently said that it was because he was ugly. This time it hit him several times harder. He entrusted him, but now he was finally disappointed. Shen just watched him get frustrated. As Mutsun slowly walked away once more, Shen quickly grabbed him by the shoulder and stopped him, telling him an interesting way to get girls' attention. He has many beautiful features, but he can't borrow them but he can lend him his dazzling talent. According to him, all it takes is talent and fame, and then he can make the beauties fall in love with the heir apparent. His words interested the boy. He turned to him and asked if he could really borrow. Shen suggested that he write a terrific book together and make it popular throughout the state of Yu. Afterwards, he and his question prompted him to imagine what it would be like if he became one of the authors of such a book. Shurin imagined being surrounded by beautiful girls, asking for his body autograph and how they would admire him. Imagined how some would call him a groupie and ask him to work out together in the house. It seemed to him to be really exercisable. The thought of it made his nose bleed. The brother-in-law asked his son-in-law in anticipation what book they would be writing. Shen pointed to a table and chair and told him to take a seat there. He would tell him what to write. The story began with the phrase, lived was. Shen dictated the story. In their story, a great silk and cloth merchant, his name was Simon Kane, his middle name was Guan Yun, and people called him Master Simon. He also had a daughter, whose name was Simon Kankin. He was an unchanging and shameless promiscuous man, and he harmed many women of good families. According to his story, it is said that the dragon is born of the dragon, and the phoenix of the phoenix, and the daughter of the silver thief loved to make love. Shen Lan also greatly improved on the original story about the affairs of men and women, and wrote it so colorfully that it made the heart flutter and the soul fly beyond the sky. As for Simon Kankin, he described her particularly carefully, trying to prescribe every finger of hers. In order to become a famous talent, Jin Mutsen, even though he knew that Shen Lang had used him to denigrate Xu Kanqin. Nevertheless, he still perfectly rewrote Shen Lang's story. The hair with quick brush strokes rewrote the story even as his nose bled. He sat with absorbent cotton in his nostrils. When he finished, he sighed in relief. He managed to write in a pile of pieces of paper. Shen Lang praised him for working so quickly. The hair did indeed write quickly, which is commendable. The guy told him that he was talented, he had the potential to be a godsend in writing. A tired Mutsen freely told him that he, too, would write fast if he were punished by rewriting books ten times a day from the age of eight. To this, Shen said nothing and simply remained silent. Shen Lan then set about drawing illustrations, and they were extremely large-scale. He drew vigorously, and the hare watched in amazement. Words alone were not enough. Shen Lan used a Western-style drawing technique, so the women drawn were extremely realistic. For men of this era, it was a real blast. Looking at these realistic drawings, at the waists and curves, Mutsen was completely aroused. His eyes went out of their orbits, his face turned red, and a stream of blood flowed from his nose. And Shen winked his eye and talked about his admirable work. He boasted that he was so charming that women flocked to him like moths to a flame and were unstoppable. That's why he knows so well. He can't tell him it's all just made up by him. He really had zero experience in it. 
but only a virgin like him could write with such passion. As he admired his work, the hare asked him why the women in those drawings seemed familiar to him. The unclothed women all looked like Exu Kankin. This struck him as a little strange and upset him, and Shen replied that it was just a simple coincidence. Next, they worked together, with Shen Lan drawing and the fat man taking notes. It was a long process, but they put their hearts into it. They worked diligently on their part of the case. Finally, 25 days before Hu Kangshin's engagement, the writing was completed. Now all that was left for them to do was to give the book a title. Mutsun asked him what the book would be called. Shen decided to call it The Wind and the Moon. He said it would later be called Lan, Laughing Over the Grave. That's a title he particularly likes. Not bad. He thinks this book is going to be a hit. They plan to publish it in large quantities within half a month. Munson patted his son-in-law on the back and said not to worry, and that if he gave it his best effort and money, there would be no problem. Satisfied, he changed his face, taking on a nicer atmosphere. He asked his son-in-law about the manuscript of this book to be turned in tomorrow for typesetting and further into print. Shen understood his intentions and asked what he wanted. Mutson then held out his hands and said he wanted to read it in detail because it was a really great book. He had been copying it for the past few days and had not had a chance to read it properly, so he asked his son-in-law to lend it to him tonight. At first, Shen was reluctant to give it to him, but then he did, telling him not to soil it. Though it was merciful of him, he kept the drawings and only gave him the story itself. The hare wanted them, too, and shakily held out his hands. But Shen tucked them behind his back and told him that he cared about him. He would not harm himself if he stayed up late and read a lot. Mutsun silently took the manuscript and happily strode to the door. Shen was sure that Jin Mutsun would become a great writer. It was already nighttime. The full moon and many stars shone brightly in the sky. A sharp knock on the door distracted Shen Lan. He hastily covered the book he was reading and looked anxiously toward the door. A battered Mutsun had come to him. His body trembled, though his voice came out loud. He showed up in his son-in-law's room to tell him that his father was coming to kill. The hare told him to run away. Upon hearing such a message, Shen jumped out of his seat. He questioned his words again. Mutsun hesitated to answer. But he muttered that he was so absorbed in the manuscript that he didn't even notice when his father walked in. And then he beat him half to death, and after flipping through a few pages of the manuscript for a while, he left in a rage, took the manuscript, and told him that he would beat Shen Lan to death. Shen Lan then asked him with a shout to make sure that he was not doing anything so concentrated while he was reading the manuscript that his father found out about it. Mutsun instantly denied it, saying that he had not done so. With a sharp movement of his hand, however, he covered his mouth and shook slightly. In doing so, he squeezed himself out. Then he quickly ran away, telling him to hurry and save himself. So he left his son-in-law alone and ran away himself. Shen can't thank him enough for the hare to come all this way to give him the news. Now he needs to come up with a plan. He pondered his next move. A conservative man like his father-in-law, upon learning that his son-in-law and son had actually cooperated in writing a pornographic work harmful to society, would probably want to kill someone. As he pondered this, he paced back and forth. He was incessantly wondering what to do. Even an hour later, he was repeating those words, though this time he was not stomping around in the same place. Shen held his head with both hands as he sat at the table, thinking anxiously. Two hours later, he was already lying down on his bed and relaxed. He assumes his father-in-law will be doing this later. Three hours later, Shen Lan was completely relaxed. He didn't understand why his father-in-law still hadn't come. The guy couldn't wait any longer, so he decided to download a better deal. As he lay searingly covered with a blanket, a huge shadow of a man fell over him. Shen woke up deeply shocked. His eyes were ready to burst out his pupils narrowed. He himself was confused. He shouted out father-in-law in surprise. Mr. Jin stared at him intently and menacingly from above, holding the manuscript in his hand. 
Shen quickly sat down and greeted his father-in-law as if to say hello. Mr. Jin placed the manuscript on the table and asked if he had written it. Shen answered briefly, confirming his words. Then the Lord told him to hold out his hand. In his hand, he held a whip. Shen held out his hand and his father-in-law struck him excessively with the whip. Jin Mutsen made a mistake on his account. This time he had played the game, and he was aware of it himself. The guy tensely closed his eyes and waited for the next blow, continuing to extend his hand. And his right hand was already pretty badly scratched from his father-in-law's hard blow. But the next blow did not come. Shen slowly opened his eyes and peered through, really nothing. Mr. Jin was not going to strike again. He took the manuscript in his hands and said that it was not badly written. Shane Lan gasped incomprehensibly, and the master said adding that this manuscript is very well written. The guy is terribly angry that he was beating him up despite his well-written work, though of course he couldn't tell him that directly. According to his father-in-law, the book is very well written and its presentation of human nature, the nature of society, you might say heartfelt. Also called his book a good, really good book. He described the book as the work of a master which is extremely rare in recent years. And Shen watched and listened to him in indignation. It turned out that the Count's reaction when he first saw this kind of work really matched Shen Lan's assumptions. Although the Count was angry at the beginning and beat up the hare son, he was not enraged. Rather, the Count was surprised that Shen Mutsen, who did not attend school properly, and started reading such a book. Then he calmed down a little when he learned that he had written it together with Shen Lan. But once Earl, a traditional and conservative man, had read a few chapters, he could not stop. As he read, he praised the book over and over again, admiring it. Coming from a family of nobility of centuries, he grew up reading all books and had a great appreciation for literature. He immediately realized how high the literary value of this book was, and then he could not resist sharing it with his wife. This book impressed the Countess as well. Both enjoyed this book. And then, inadvertently, his body was completely emptied. This caused Shen Lan to spend several hours. The Count sat down with his son-in-law at the table. They talked quietly about the manuscript. The Count confessed his intemperance. At that moment, in an impulse, he almost tore it up, but fortunately he did not, or he would have become a criminal. Although Mr. Jin is a traditional and conservative man, he is quite open-minded about art and literature. So-called plays are merely tools of literature and art, and many modern literary masters have such works. Although Shen was silent in this situation, in his mind he thought about the validity of his words, and that, if so, it means the world is so unfettered. Suddenly the aura around the Count changed noticeably. He asked Sheng why he had to stuff that masterpiece with all the nonsense and nonsense of the Yuxu family. Afterwards, he asked if there was any point in having so much unnecessary stuff in an outstanding work that should remain pure. It was possible to understand Shen Lan's ulterior motive through the content of the book, only by reading it. Naturally, the Count noticed this as well. Such superficial revenge. The Count told him to give him the abridged and corrected text. However, Shen didn't give his suggestion a moment's thought. He absent-mindedly objected to it, showing a cross with his hands. After all, he had written this book solely to avenge Exu Guangyin and Exu Kankin. He could not sacrifice the main purpose of revenge for the pursuit of literature and art. This annoyed the Count, acting on his nerves, but he remained silent. The Count was aware that his son-in-law was clearly writing this alone. So he asked why he had attracted Jin Mutsong and used a pseudonym together. Shen Lan explained that it had two purposes. According to him, at first glance, he avoided suspicion, otherwise Hu Kankin's revenge would be too open, and it would look very petty. The Count mentally wondered, are there people in this world more petty than you? But he immediately remembered that there was such a man, but Sheng had killed him. Though it annoyed him, he asked about his other purpose. Then Shen Lan tilted his head slightly and said firmly that it was an argument about Jinshan Island. He said it with such a focused, serious expression that it showed his confidence. His purpose struck the Count. The Count thought that there was not even a hint of it yet, and he had already begun his preparations. Indeed, he has one step counted for three. He regarded him as a genius. 
Shen retained an ingenious plan and a delicate calculation, a wisdom almost demonic. In this case, he could be considered the perfect man, eliciting raptures. Shen asked his father-in-law if their book would be a hit. The Count confidently said it would be more than that. He told him that their book would rock the literary world. After the Count's words, Shen Lan was sure that if the conservative father-in-law gave such a review, Exu Guanjin and Exu Kanchen, the father-daughter Du, would surely be disgraced. These insidious thoughts made him giggle and chuckle. The atmosphere served him changed. Mr. Jin remained silent and quietly thought to himself that heaven is truly unfair to bestow talent on someone like Shen Lan. It really wasn't to his liking. He turned and left him. Eventually, under the pressure of his father-in-law, Shen Lan made some changes to the wind and the moon. Now it is not known whether readers will be able to associate Kanchen with this name, but he still hopes that it will work. The original names have now changed from Simon Kinsey Guan Yun to Simon Kinsey and Fu, and Simon Kainken to Simon Kanchen. This hurt him and was not to his liking. The next day, Shen Lan and Jin Mutsen went on a horse-drawn carriage 50 kilometers to the city of Lanshan. They set out in bright sunny weather. Many famous books were published in Lanshan City, and it was famous as a city of enlightenment. At a time when Xuanwu City was the city of silk, Lanshan City was known as the city of books. Silk Xuanwu and Lanshan books, if you want to make a huge impact, then go to Lanshan City to publish a book is the best choice. Although Lanshan City is next to Xuanwu, it is not part of Nujing County and is a dependency of Yangwu County. It is also home to an old noble family, the Viscountcy of Lanshan, the Zhu family. Unlike other old nobles, the Zhu clan voluntarily gave up their fiefdoms and military power as soon as the new policy was introduced, in exchange for the praise of the monarch and the wealth donated by the emperor. He became a popular figure of the time. This action, however, caused resentment among the other ancient noble families, as if they were disloyal vassals because they did not offer to transfer their power. They were all united by the same essence of cunning. The other clans looked upon this clan with malice. After more than four hours, the wagon finally entered the city. This city is a very lively place. You can tell right away that it's really a city of books. The merchants are all about the book. They ask you to come in and look at their good books. The rest of the way is on foot. When Shen Lan and Jin Mutsen drove down the street, people were talking about the book Yuan Ying's Dream. This book was very marketable. People were buying its first and last volume. They were at the peak of popularity this moment. Shen couldn't help but notice that. This is Yuan Ying's dream a bestseller, but when his book comes out, he was confident in his success laughing from the inside out about it. There are five major bookstores in Lanshan City, which not only sell and print books, but also have networks of stores in dozens of surrounding towns and the two largest of them are the House of Fragrant Ink and the Jeju Pavilion. And Shen Lan planned to go to the less serious-sounding Jeju Pavilion first to make arrangements for publishing and printing. He and the hare came to the very same shop. There the salesman greeted them with a broad smile. Then, as all salesmen should, he asked what they were looking for. But he continued his speech without waiting for an answer. The salesman recommended them a book called Yuan's Dream which had recently been on sale in their store. According to him, this book is really addictive, and countless young ladies and gentlemen have been fascinated by it, so it certainly won't disappoint them. The salesman literally glowed as he handed them this book. Shen Lan took the book in his hands and snorted, just opening the book. Standing next to him, Jin Mutsen was surprised by his reaction. Shen knew at a glance that this book was snot and sugar, fooling the hearts of ignorant young maidens and siphoning pocket money out of them. Unlike his book, in which he not only pulls pocket money out of men, but also squeezes the vitality out of them. Then a man standing nearby asked if he thought it was funny. He was dressed very elegantly, as charitable families are supposed to be. So Shen politely asked who this excellency was. The stranger identified himself as Zhu Wenhua of Lanshan. He had straight eyebrows and narrow eyes, and was the second son of the Viscount of the House of Lanshan. Zhu Wenhua. He held a fan with one hand and showed a billboard with the other, and said that Song Yuanying was his humble work. Then he asked what he could tell him. 
and Shen knew quite a bit about him, so he recognized him. Zhu Wenhua was the male version of Ku Kankin. He was extremely famous, was the idol of many educated people, and even the dream of countless girls. His second son passed the state examination of Jushin at the age of 16, and he also wrote the best-selling masterpiece song of Yuanyang. It can be said that his influence is quite great, but from Shen Lan's point of view, he was nothing more than a female version of Hu Kanchen, embellishing his glory. Although he was the son of a viscount, he was the second son, and therefore could not inherit the title, so he had to look for another way out. First he got a degree in Jutan, then wrote, promoted, and distributed his book to build his reputation as a talented man. And now he is enjoying the fame he got from writing his popular book, and the way out he chose was to use his merit and fame to become Governor Zhang Chong's son-in-law, become the husband of Zhang Chunhua, the most beautiful and talented daughter of Xuanmu City, and live off his wife. Zhu Wenhua is the son of an old nobleman who actually plans to join Zhang Chong's New Deal faction and live off his wife. Shen cannot allow this to happen, as he is an enemy of the faction. Plus, he's actually his colleague, so that makes it even more unacceptable. And their Viscount House Lanshan, not having had time to pass on his military power to his fief, has become the henchman of a sovereign who wants to destroy his Suanwu County. Shen presents this as a chained dog with a collar around its neck, ruled by the sovereign. These actions naturally displease the inhabitant of this city, the son-in-law of the count of the city. It is simply unforgivable for him. He looked up from the book and said that he did not know why, but the mere title of that idiotic book made him want to laugh a little. Then Zhu Wenwu's face changed slightly. Though not much, there was a subtle displeasure on his face. He asked who they were. His question was already answered by the hare. He bravely said in a loud voice that he was Jin Mutsun, son of Count Xuanwu, and the man standing next to him was his son-in-law Shenlan. He confidently stood with a noticeable smile on his face, as if affirming his words. Zhu Wenhua smirked and called them both a disgrace to nobility. He showed two fingers of his hands and said about the hare, that although he is of noble descent, but so stupid that Madame Jin Mulin could not marry and was forced to take into the family of a vain, uneducated Shen Lan. For him, meeting Count Xuan Wu's son and son-in-law was only to his advantage. He was just worried about how to please Lady Zhang Chunhua. Now he came up with a cunning plan. He decided that he should take Mr. Zhang's headache off instead of Zhang Chunhua. Shen took the manuscript in his hand and simply confirmed his words, calling himself an uneducated handsome Alphonse. The second son's words did not hurt his steadfastness in the slightest. Shen Lan called out to the shopkeeper standing off to the side. He held out the manuscript and told him to take a look at the book, written by the handsome man himself, and to help him follow the ideas. A fat man with raised thick eyebrows approached him. A bright face, Master Mo took the book in his hands. He smilingly said that he was a kind young master, and that he would familiarize himself with it here. Then Zhu Wenhua frowned and muttered that book writing had become lowbro if books like Shen Lan's were being published. His words angered the young hare. He was about to lose his temper, but his son-in-law stopped him. The master looking at the book thought he was out of luck today, and young master Zhu did not want to offend, and with Shen Lan and Jin Mutsong, it was not so easy for him to cope. He considered them as two majors. It seemed to him that they had no reason to write a book. It seemed pointless to him, so he thought of an excuse to send them both away. But after flipping through a few pages, he noticed the value of this book. At first he came to shock, and then to astonishment. His pupils narrowed, further almost out of their orbit. His jaw dropped in surprise. The master marveled that such a work could have been written by Shen Lan and Jin Mutsun. He, too, understood the true content of the book. A profound analysis of human nature and worldly essence between what was written. The book made exquisite use of words and illusions. In this way, it drew him in. Oh, and an unexpected plot twist, too. But the main customers in Jade Ju Pavilion were women. They love love stories and love-hate relationships between the rich and powerful. While the man marveled at the book and thought about it, Zhu Wenhua took the book from him. The master was slightly puzzled, and Zhu Wenhua, 
with a displeased face, flipped through the book with quick movements. Then he looked at Shen Lan with contempt, stuck his tongue out, and said that his book was too vulgar and the person who had written it was a disgrace to readers. He threw the book away, the host barely caught it, and he himself hailed Mo's host and told him that the manuscript of this book was unpleasant to read. According to him, if they wanted to publish that book, his book could not be published in their store. He told him that his book could not stand with such vulgar and filthy things. Master Mo was confused, because there were so many fans of Yuan Ying stream, to offend Zhu Wenhua would be a great loss to them. So he tilted his head, handed the book to its authors, and said that the Hare's book is extremely original, and it really deserves to belong to the famous family. But though he was sorry, their store had no plans to publish any new books anytime soon. So he recommended that they go to other bookstores, such as the House of Fragrance Inc. This finally put the young hair of Jin Mutson out of his mind. His eyes blazed with the fire of anger. He grabbed the owner by his clothes and yelled at him, asking if they were blind for not noticing a good book. The shopkeeper became agitated and gloomy, and Shen Lan calmly agreed to leave. Mutson looked at his son-in-law in surprise, leaving just like that. But at this moment, Shen Lan already had a plan matured in his mind. How could the wind and the moon quickly become a hit? By stepping on the most popular talent to get to the top, of course. Already fully formed is not only a plan to propel Zhu Wenhua to the top, but also a plan to take him down. There are even three options A, B, C, so if he didn't just walk away, he walked away with a wide grin on his face. It's nighttime already. The street lamps and candles of the houses are burning. There is not a soul on the street, except for Shen Lan and Jin Mutsun. Mutsun is already exhausted from running around the other bookstores, not to mention the House of Fragrance Inc. No one wants to take their book. And Shen Lan told him that Zhu Wenhua wanted to stand out in front of Zhang Chunhua and would definitely do anything to prevent the publication of The Wind and the Moon. So they came to another bookstore. This bookstore was very modest. They were met by the owner of the bookstore, Deng Xian. He asked if they wanted to publish a book. Everyone was seated in chairs. Deng Xian, the shopkeeper, was looking for bed scenes while flipping through the book. He found them and immediately burst out in pleasure. It was as if he had been doused with paint. He began to praise their book, calling it terrific. The book was well illustrated and realistic, he said, and it was gorgeous. Jin Mutson asked if he would publish their book. The host gladly agreed. Mutson then asked why he thought the book was great, just after flipping through a few pages. Mr. Deng Xian told him that he had read many books and his heart hadn't cared about anything for a long time. But there were passages in their book that made his heart skip a beat, so he thought it was great. Afterward, the hare leaped from his chair and asked if he was afraid of Zhu Wenhua's ban. But he was selling erotic books, so he had nothing to fear. When Mutson found out the reason, he was greatly surprised and questioned again. Looking at him, Shen Lan told him not to think so highly of bookstores as the best way to publish books they needed Mr. Deng. Deng Xian is the main seller of erotic albums in Lanshan City, even funeral supply stores have their products. To the extent that his goods are distributed in four or five surrounding counties and more than 20 cities. Master Dan suggests that such a masterpiece would sell well and sell 3,000 copies, but Shen Lan had one request. He asked his master to put it on sale along with Zhu Wenhua's Yuan Ying's dream and then smash it. This was a little difficult for Mr. Dan. The first volume of Yuan Ying's dream sold 4,600 copies. It is the best-selling book of all those for sale in Lanshan City, not counting the top three that were exported. Lanshan City's channels can cover 30 to 40 cities, with a market of several million people. Combined with the Zhu Wenhua fandom, many ladies from wealthy families could buy 100 copies at a time to give away to others. This is what led to the record sales. The maximum you can sell is 2,700 copies of your own book, which is still very vulgar and explicit. Also, the level of their book is high for Dan's customers to adjust to. The reason for his estimate of 3,000 copies is that their bed scenes are well written and the illustrations are even better. According to him, even the flavor of wine is afraid of deep alleys. He can't beat Zhu Wenhua's next book, Yuan Ying's Son.
Shen then asked approximately how many copies of Yuan Hu's dream will be sold in the next book. Deng Xian suggests about 5,000 or 6,000. Shen smiled mockingly and asked if that was all. His goal, after all, is to break all records. Then he got up from behind his chair and asked him a question about the phrase he had exemplified, and asked if he wasn't attracting attention. That's not a problem for him. He'll make sure the book comes out on time. But he understated it, and then mouthed that the flavor would be overwhelming when it came out. He put a bag of gold coins in front of the owner and told him to print as many as he could. If 3,000 copies don't sell, Shen himself would pay him out of his own pocket to make up for it. But if the book sold more than 3,000 copies, he would receive 20% of each copy. Shen picked up the papers and told Mr. Deng that he would add a few more illustrations to see how it turned out. What Shen Lan removed were not only illustrations, but also some text added to the manuscript. Only because he added a new character named Zhu Wenshen. This man came from an impoverished noble family and was the son of his second wife in order to bask in wealth and honor, he becomes the lover of Mr. Xiamen. In the story, they make love twice, in the room and on the roof. Moreover, this Zhu Wenshen also had an affair with Shimon Xiangshen, and Shen Lan specifically illustrated this. Shen tossed papers with drawings of characters having an affair hugging and others clearly drawn on the table. Mr. Deng happily examined each one with a flushed face. He praised and called the book very fascinating, terrific. And Mutsen, looking at him, fully understood him, and thought that his son-in-law was really tough. If this book became a hit, Zhu Wenhua's reputation would come to an end. When everyone was sort of resolved, Shen Lan asked if Deng Xiang would have a problem, and he calmly said that there could be no problem. Shen Lan and Jin Mutsen decided to leave. And he thought that man also had patrons, since he didn't put Zhu Wenhua in any way. Before he left, he informed Master Dan that he was returning in that case. He told him that he would make sure that on the day their book went on sale, it would be attractive and titillating. After Shen Lan returned home, he immediately transformed himself into an artist and began to paint again. This time he drew a very large poster, with movements, shapes, clothes. In a world without photographs, the impact of such realistic paintings is explosive. Mr. Shaman, Zhu Wenshin, Shaman Xianxin, he drew one by one. The hair, seeing such a stunning picture, could not hold back the flowing blood from his nose. He was speechless. Four days later, Jin Mutsun was very exhausted. His soul left his body, and Shen Lan breathed a sigh of relief when he was finally finished. Now everything was ready. At first, Mutsen covered his eyes with his hands, saying he couldn't. But still through the slits of his fingers he looked. His mixed feelings only got worse. He was a little sorry he had looked. The hare told his son-in-law that being an artist was so hard, just like putting shit in your mouth. Shen was silent, and then putting his hand on his head pressed lightly. He told him not to speak. Then his wife, Jin Yulin, entered the room. But they didn't even notice the door open. Mulin, with a big smile flashing, asked what her husband was doing with her brother. Only then did they pay attention to her, and Jim Mulin noticed the album of erotic drawings. She flinched and, without saying anything, instantly turned and walked away. She found out that her husband liked such things. Shen hurried after her. He tried to stop her, also to explain everything. Shen's excuse was that it wasn't all what it seemed. Shen Lan struggled to prepare the billboard. While Dan employed all his human and material resources, as well as the latest method of tin printing, to finally finish the work before it went on sale. Fifteen days later, the book The Wind and the Moon, co-authored by Shen Lan and Jin Mutsong, and the second volume of Yuan Ying's Dream by Zhu Wenhua went on sale on the same day. To buy the book Yuan Ying's Dream, a crowd gathered in front of the bookstore. It was her second top, and it was enough for everyone to buy it. Other merchants took advantage of this. A shipment of fried patties arrived. Someone was selling a fan with the subjects of Yuan Yin's dream. Men and women gathered, but many of them were still young girls. They adored Zhu Wenhua's book. One called him a literary genius and praised his book. And another liked the poem at the beginning of the poem, which was a perfect example of the bitterness of life.
They called him the most talented man in Lanshan City, and someone hoped to get a glimpse of the young master when he came to the release of his new book, but was able to get a glimpse of him, thinking that he did not come. Zhu Wenhua was peeking behind them at this moment, eavesdropping on everything. He deliberately covered himself among the crowd. According to readers, Mr. Zhu is also a superficial man. He is arrogant, that's all. They say he just needed to write the best work he could. He doesn't care about sales volume. He doesn't even care if he has readers. Meanwhile, he smirks, wondering how dare such mediocrities not think of me at all. To him, they only create a name for him and become just a backdrop against which he can shine. He believes that only such a beautiful, talented woman with a noble background as Zhang Chunhua is worthy of him. Suddenly, a girl said in a loud voice to look over there, pointing. Everyone turned their heads. On the roof of the shop, a huge poster was revealed with a picture of the main character and the protagonist of the book, The Wind and the Moon. The crowd cheered even more. For the men, it was a treat for the eyes. Everyone was interested in the unfamiliar book, which looked too good to be true. Zhu Wenhua thought it was an erotic album, but that wondered if so, why so grandiose? It didn't sit well with him that they exhibited something like this along with his Yuanjing's dream. The salesman shouted as he talked about the book. He told the people gathered that it was a work about a wealthy family, The Wind and the Moon, a masterpiece written by a real nobleman based on a true story. He told them to take a look for as long as they wanted. It was free to take a look. If they didn't like it, they wouldn't pay. The people gathered in front of him. Everyone was taking the book. Some even licked the page with the open scenes. The guy handing out the books warned him that he would have to pay if he didn't stop. And the book cost 60 coppers, 20% more expensive than Yuanyin's dream. If one wasn't going to buy, the other asked to give it to him because the books would soon be sold out. They were sure of it. After the sale of The Wind and the Moon, 13 bookstores throughout Lanshan City saw unprecedented sales. Shen Lan's new book sold like crazy, simply overwhelming the popularity of Zhu Wenhua. Shen Lan's outstanding writing, brilliant plot, hot descriptions, and realistic illustrations caught everyone's attention. Mr. Deng Xian ran out to Shen Lan with a shout. He called out to him again and again to tell him about the crazy sale of the book. Deng Xian told him that 3,000 copies had been sold in one day. And Zhu Wenhua's book, Yuan's Dream, sold only five or six hundred copies. He had never seen books bought so well. It was unfathomable. Then Mutsun asked how many copies they could eventually sell. He held his hand up and said that God only knows and a satisfied Shen Lan lay quietly behind them. Meanwhile, Zhu Wenhua enjoyed the flattery of his foxy friends at his residence. They praised him in every way possible. They even confidently said that Zhang Chunhua would surely fall in love with him. They celebrated together to celebrate the sale of his book. Before the arrival of Zhang Chunying, the owner of the Jade Pavilion, Zhu, as soon as he arrived, Zhu Wenhua asked about book sales. Owner Zhang told him that he had sold a limited number of books, and sales of the second book, Song Yuanyin, were really good. He said they sold all 260 copies in two hours, and about 530 copies were sold in the whole city. And he suddenly understated, stopping at the word, only. He looked worried. Zhu Wenhua asked what was wrong. Then Zhang Chenya told him that more than 3,000 copies of The Wind and the Moon had been sold today. This news surprised everyone present. Most of all, Zhu Wenhua was surprised, who didn't expect it and thought Shen Lan was an ignorant scum. He blurted out the impossibility of it. In his opinion, it was impossible even if the sun rose in the west today, because there were more than 3,000 literate people in Lanshan City. Then Mr. Zhang came over and held out the book to him, confirming his words. He told the young master to flip through and look at the book in his normal state of mind. Zhu Wenhua involuntarily took the book from his hands. A minute later, he was reading with a murdered look, thinking it was just dirt to his eyes. An hour later, he was already interested in the unexpected plot. Two hours later, having absorbed the book, he wanted to read on and on. He didn't even notice how he was talking out loud. When he lifted his head from the book, he saw his friends staring at him stunned. 
Zhu Wenhua immediately became angry and threw the book on the floor, calling it trashy. Despite his passionate reading, he began to call it impossibly vulgar. He was angry at the use of vile words and illustrations that he thought were used to attract people. According to him, this book is of low quality and vulgar to the extreme. The person who wrote it must be morally corrupt. He also says that this book corrupts moral morals, tramples on the morals of mankind, is diabolical. His friends looked at the book as they came closer, and the man in the drawing seemed familiar to them. Except one didn't understand what the drops on his butt were. The other said it was definitely a secretion. The third wondered about the man in the picture, and then all three of them stared at Zhu Wenhua. Zhu Wenhua leaned over the book and looked closer. He was turning blue and even sweating. His voice began to sound regretful. Looking closer at the drawing, the guy lost his temper. He viciously started tearing up the book. It was destroying him, destroying everything. He desperately began to yell. After all, it would ruin his reputation, his image, his future. Zhu Wenhua was determined not to stop until one of them was dead. He calmed down a little, began to reflect. Zhu Wenhua has asked his dear brothers to summon all they can. He plans to go with them to the palace of the town governor to obtain justice. As educated people, they want to clean up the filth, clear the air of filth, and return peaceful times to the educated people of Lanshan City. His friends with both hands were in favor. Zhu Wenhua tries to cause a riot and get the town governor to ban Shen Lan's book. Meanwhile, at the residence of the Lanshan town governor, Li Fang, the Lanshan town governor, was in his room enjoying the reading of Wind and the Moon. A mustachioed man. In his opinion, at first glance, it is vulgar and lowbro, but on closer inspection, it turns out to be insightful and subtle. It is undoubtedly a masterpiece. To him, Zhu Wenhua's Yuan Ying's dream initially seemed quite interesting, but now it looks too immature, too deliberate, too pretentious, too pretentious, in fact, vulgar. But the pictures were so exquisite that he got carried away. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. He was not happy for being distracted. Someone had been sent out in the night. One of the servants opened the door and reported that things were bad. He reported that several hundred scholars had surrounded the residents outside. The town governor shuddered. Problems with educated people are a real headache for provincial officials. This group of people must not be beaten or scolded, and if they are not treated properly, it will affect political affairs. The town governor asked him a host of questions. He asked him about what had happened, whether someone had cheated in the exams or some autocrat had killed someone. The last one he asked was who their leader was. When the servant answered that it was the great genius Zhu Wenhua, the town governor was surprised. Even though he didn't want to, he told him to let him in. Zhu Wenhua politely greeted Mayor Lai and got right to the point. He asked Mr. Lai to order the banning of the book Wind and the Moon. Also to arrest and prosecute whoever printed it, and to burn all the books and close the print shop. He told him that this book was vulgar and vulgar, that it defamed the holy doctrine, poisoned the thoughts of the people, and corrupted the morals of society. The town governor shared his opinion that he considered the book in question to be an ordinary and simple book. Then he asked where it denies holy doctrine, or whether it is a book that blames the government. To this question, Zhu Wenhua had nothing to answer. He only clenched his teeth in silence. Then town superintendent Lai said that it contained neither, so he was not obligated to ban it. Zhu Wenhua said in a loud voice that the book was not only vulgar and disgusting, it also showed him as a hero, which defamed and violated his reputation. Then he asked if it was against the law too. After that, he began to crack up and speak somewhat shakily. He was hurt that he was in that piece. He recalled the character of the work Zhu Wenchen, but he didn't say it enough. The town governor asked the name again, and he told him that there are many famous people in the world, and they even have different names. Zhu Wenhua looked at him doubtfully and asked if he was defending Shen Lan. Then the town governor took the book in his hand and congratulated him on Juzin. He advised him to think more broadly and not to envy the wise and able just because they write better books than he did. And then he said that he had already read The Wind and the Moon and thought it was good, much better than his books, Yuanjing's dream. Again he advised me to read it in peace.
In his opinion, it really is a book that makes people applaud. But before he could finish his speech, Zhu Wenhua turned and headed for the exit. Before he left, he told the mayor that he understood him, so he would go and seek justice himself. The door closed with a bang. The servant turned to the town governor and asked if Zhu Wenhua would cause more trouble and stop him. But the town governor, Lai, even got up from his seat. He thought that Shen Lang was a wonderful man, since he could write such an amazing piece of work. So he decided to make a little storm to see what he was made of. Su Wenhua spent 30 gold pieces and instructed his dogs to hire 200 students. And on the way to Deng Shan's bookstore, the residents who had gathered together joined them. And by the time they arrived at the store, there were at least a thousand people there. One of Zhu Wenhua's friends, friend Wang Shimin, was at their head. He shouted in front of the shop, blaming Deng Shan for the publication of The Wind and the Moon. He is blamed for poisoning the minds of educated people. They tell him that he is making an enemy in the form of all the readers of Lanshan City. Deng Xian was tensely eavesdropping outside the door, and just a third of the 3,000 books sold today were bought by them, educated people. He thought they, the educated people, were the most unscrupulous of all. Wang Shimin suggested that he give him an ultimatum. The shopkeeper should give all the copies of The Wind and the Moon and burn them in front of everyone. Then Deng Xian stuck his head out of the shop and told them that he didn't have the book in his house right now. But the guy didn't believe what he said, that the book dealer said he didn't have the books. So he slandered him as a liar. Wang Shimin told others to break into the bookstore and destroy, and then burn all of Shen Lan's books that harmed them. The assembled crowd broke into the bookstore despite the owner's protest. They jostled inside as if they were having fun. Mr. Deng Xian told them that they would cause a lot of trouble that way. However, no one took his words into consideration. Zhu Wenhua was also among the crowd at this time, but he was just observing the situation. He was only too happy to cause such a commotion. It was Lanshan, not Xuanwu. His wish was to burn all of Shen Lan's books. A group of students found his books. Many packed boxes were found under the canvas. On the package was written The Wind and the Moon. Someone ripped the edge open, and it really turned out to be the book they were looking for. All the boxes were taken outside and collected in one place. Zhu Wenhua smirked as he looked at his friend, mentally praising him. His dear friend nodded affirmatively. Zhu Wenhua had promised him two silver coins for burning a hundred spears, but this time he would give him quite a few. Wang Shimin turned toward the boxes and shouted saying that there really were a lot of obscene books hidden there about 2,000 copies. Deng Xian was blamed for his false words. The crowd shouted, saying burn. Wang Shimin turned their attention to himself. He said it was an abomination corroding their society, poisoning the mind, and denigrating holy teachings. He said he would burn these books in front of everyone so that there would be peaceful times in literary circles in Lanshan City. He pointed the torch at the boxes. The fire quickly dispersed. Everyone was overjoyed as they watched the spectacle. Zhu Wenhua smirked, scoffing at Shen Lan's well-written book. He delighted in burning to the ground all of his books, which had recently sold at an insane rate. This gave him unreal pleasure and delight. He thought that since he had taken the trick, it would be difficult for him now. Zhu Wenhua had indeed resorted to subterfuge. While he was enjoying his victory, Deng Xian and his colleagues from the bookstore were putting out the fire. They hauled buckets of water to keep everyone from burning. But Zhu Wenhua's foxy friends stopped them by crucifying them. Deng Xian fell to the ground from a blow to the stomach, and Wang Shimin told them not to stop them from burning the poison. He asked if they wanted to become criminals of Lanshan City. Deng Xian was not going to lie under their feet. He picked up the bucket again and began to put out the fire telling them that it was not poison. According to him, it was the sovereign's edition of the decree on new policies. Deng Xian asked how dare they call it poison and burn everything. Then he declared it a crime against the ruler. These were his words that greatly surprised Zhu Wenhua and Wang Shimin. They had no idea what he was saying. Wang Shimin anxiously took the man's clothes and told him that since he was still fluttering at this time, Mentioning the sovereign, he was definitely looking for death. Deng Xian gritted his teeth, then instantly took the extinguished book from the ground 
and told him to look if he did not believe. Zhu Wenhua was coming in for a shock. It really is the decree on new policies. His jaw dropped in indignation, and Wang Shimin fell to the ground altogether. His body was shaking all over. He was barely resting his hands on the ground. His voice sounded very shaky. He wondered one thing, why would a merchant print this? The new policy ordinance was in the tens of thousands of words, printed in large quantities and not for sale, and usually had to be forcibly distributed. Why would an ordinary merchant print something like that? Deng Xian shouted in a loud voice to look at what had happened. This is clearly the sovereign's new policy decree. He said, and, that they were persistently trying to slander him as a book-poisoning society and burn him. He called it an insurrection and asked for help. All the clamor of the crowd fell silent. Except for the sound of flames, nothing could be heard. Wang Shimin walked over to Deng Xian, who was desperately trying to get the books out of the fire. He told him that the books he had just burned looked like the wind and the moon, and what they were saying was about her. Then he looked at the books lying on the ground, and his eyes almost popped out of his orbits, and his jaw dropped in surprise. How was that possible? Suddenly, Shen Lan appeared behind him. He told them that they had burned the sovereign's decree on new policies, a grievance and intention to stage a rebellion. His appearance amazed Zhu Wenhua. It made him open his mouth, shouting his name. All attention was turned to Shen Lan, who, opening his arms to the side, spoke about their crime committed. According to him, openly speaking against the new policy of the sovereign is a serious crime. A person who has committed such a thing should be deprived of all merits, punished with thirty strokes of a stick, and exiled to Nanshan Island. The whole crowd began to tremble with all their bodies. Someone fell down. Being deprived of a degree is a severe enough punishment for educated people, and thirty strokes of the stick can beat a man to a pulp. As for exile on Nanshan Island, it's a one-way trip. It is an isolated island across the sea, cut off from civilized society and full of poisonous fumes and wild animals. At this moment, people looked anxiously at Zhu Wenhua, who had a gloomy face, and Shen Lan looked at them with a smile. In his opinion, some things cannot be seen initially, but when they are heated on fire, they manifest. It is a technique they cannot understand. An exasperated Wang Shimin glared at him, lunging at him with his fist, ready to fight him to the death. But to his hand arrived a hard blow with a bat. The guy was hit by a certain man, all in armor. His arm was badly hurt, perhaps even broken. Tears streamed down his eyes from the bloody pain. Exile is his official punishment. Shen Lan has others. Shen crouched down in front of Wang Shimin and told him that no one else who had contacted him had ever come out of this unscathed. The poor guy shuddered even more. Shen stood up and turned to everyone else and said that they all saw the way he was attacked and they were only defending themselves. Zhu Wenhua gritted his teeth. He snorted and acknowledged his victory this time. The guy turned around telling everyone to leave. Then Shen asked them if there were those among them who wanted redemption or who wanted a lenient sentence. Zhu Wenhua slowed his steps and stopped for a moment. According to Shen, all that was needed was to bring them out in the open to accomplish the deed and he could look for a way to help them. He told them to tell them who ordered them to burn the new policy decree, then clearly asked who ordered them to oppose it. The people turned their heads towards Zhu Wenhua and he inwardly called Shen Lan unconscionable. And then the town governor arrived. In fact, the town governor Li Fang had brought his men to the vicinity of the bookstore beforehand, and if Shen Lan couldn't handle Zhu Wenhua, he would come to the rescue. He asked what happened here that caused such a fuss. Only it didn't turn out at all the way he had expected. Shen Lan went up to him to tell him everything. He said that Zhu Wenhua incited people to stop the spread of the decree of the new policy and came to the bookstore to burn books with the decree, only because his Viscount Lanshan had recently lost his estates and military might, he held a grudge. An irritated Zhu Wenhua accused him of insolent slander, and Shen Lan calmly looked around and asked if he was wrong. Then he asked Zhu Wenhua if he had called them here. Then one of his foxy friends admitted that he would pay them to burn the books. He also said that he really didn't know that inside the book was the decree on new policies. 
After him, a second friend also spoke. According to him, Zhu Wenhua had always been dissatisfied with the new policy, but he could not say the reason, and his voice was shaky. After their words, Zhu Wenhua opened his mouth. His friends had no shame or conscience. He darkened even more. Shen Lan told the mayor to conclude the case, since all the evidence is collected. The mayor, Lei Fang, was silent. After all, he just didn't want the guy to disappoint him. But he couldn't think that Shen Lang would be so cruel as to take a man's life with a wave of his hand. He tilted his head slightly and told him that he had long been friends in absentia with him, and called the book he had written The Wind and the Moon a holy book. And as the author of that book, he is even more outstanding. So he asked if he could talk to him. Shen Lan agreed to talk. The town governor, Li Feng, tells him that he knows what he wants, to kill Zhu Wenhua and wishes to drag Zhu's Rai away after him. But according to him, the sovereign has recently honored the Viscount Lanshan and praised them for transferring fiefs and military power. And if the matter of Zhu Wenhua's opposition to the new policy arose now, it would be a slap in the face to the sovereign. And if he reported it now, it would be difficult for him to do so, for it would surely infuriate the sovereign greatly. He then asked if the state could really condemn the Viscount Lanshan. The Viscount Lanshan were the first nobles to support the new policy. If the sovereign destroys even them, what will the other nobles think? They will definitely fight to the end and never give up their military power and fiefdoms. The town governor, Li Feng, thinks that Shen Lan understands everything. He tells Shen Lan that he can't blame Zhu Wenhua for opposing the new policy and is in no position to take up the cause. Shen Lan was slightly taken aback. He took the mayor's hand and told him that he understood everything perfectly, and told him to just watch the show from the sidelines. The town governor, Li Fan, wondered why he was hitting such a price and then knocking it down. But Shen Lan only told him to go. Under the moonlight, his image looked very beautiful. Count Lai was amazed at the moment and mentally called him handsome. They went back to the scene of the accident. As soon as he arrived, Zhu Wenhua started rambling. He said that even though Shen Lan was a lying liar, he was of low birth and knew how the powerful played the game. He asked if Shen accuses him of opposing the new policy. Zhu Wenhua is sure that the mayor, Li Feng, and all the high-ranking officials won't help Shen Lan, and he can't hurt him in any way. Then Shen Lan snapped his finger and asked for a couch. He advised him to wait for his father to come and discuss their business with him. Zhu Wenhua laughed. He laughed at how someone like Shen, the son-in-law accepted into his wife's house, wanted to meet his father in person. Suddenly someone said that Viscount Lanshan had arrived. Zhu Wenhua turned sharply to follow the voice. He wondered what had brought him here. But an elderly man with a gray mustache and gray hair silently approached them. He is Viscount Lanshan Zhu Lanting. The mayor respectfully bows to the Viscount and his son, wearing the same long white and purple robes, to which the man responds with a similar gesture. Straightening up and walking a little further, to Mr. Shenlan, the Viscount said that the young master's wedding had happened so quickly that he had not had time to come and participate in it. The Viscount also added that such behavior would have been disrespectful to a neighbor who had lived nearby all his life. The young gentleman, dressed in beautiful and rather expensive clothes of white and emerald cloth with gold inlays, lying on a chaise long, with his hands peacefully folded on his belly, opened his eyes the color of an azure sky, and looking at the Viscount standing before him, said that he did not know Viscount Zhu Lantin. These words angered the Viscount and his son, and then Chu Wenhua, the son of Viscount Zhu Lanting, turned to Shen Lan asking if he knew who he was talking to, and that he should stand up and not disgrace the county of Xuanwu. Slowly sitting down in the chaise lounge, young master Shen Lan said that he would not beat around the bush and had only two conditions. The first was that Viscount Zhu Lanting must give his son two hard slaps, and so that Zhu Wenhuo would bleed, for his son had provoked him, which meant that his father had raised him badly and must punish him publicly. The second condition was that Zhu Wen was the dream of Yuan Yang be burned, because, in Shen Lan's opinion, it is nonsense and infantile snot and sugar. The Viscount should order him to collect all unsold books and burn them. An enraged Zhu Wenhua said he would kill Shen Lan and already took a few steps forward, 
but his father stopped him and asked why on earth he had to comply with all of young Master Shen's conditions. Shen Lan said that Viscount Lanshan no longer has any fiefdoms or military power, so his sons would go off to serve. The Viscount wants his eldest son to become a military official, and his second son, Zhu Wenhua, to surrender the Kejui and become a civilian official. The Viscount also wants his eldest son, Zhu Wentai, to become related to General Pinxi's family, and his second son, Zhu Wenhua, to become related to Zhang Chong. Shen Lan asked if the Viscount had thought about the fact that people in government circles value reputation. He, Shen Lan, writes Bastellists, and when the time comes, he will happen to write a story about their family. The Viscount replied that he had read Shen Lan's book, in which he tried his best to smear his son, but a lie is a lie, and if he wants to use it to disrupt the unification of the Zhu family with Zhang Chom, then Shen Lan thinks too much of himself. The young man replied that Mr. Zhang Chong is very pragmatic and sees only profit, not paying attention to reputation, but General Pinksy is very concerned about his reputation and the reputation of all his cronies. If the protagonist of Shen Lan's book becomes the Viscount's eldest son, Zhu Wentai, or if he incorporates a daughter-in-law, by then the Viscount Lanshan will have become so famous in the state of Yu, even Zhang Chong, not to mention Zheng Tu will be unable to put up with it. Then gossip about their family will be passed on by word of mouth, and human gossip is a terrible thing. Viscount was very angry, and the head of the publishing house thought already very highly appreciated the fighting qualities of Shen Lan, but he did not expect that this young handsome man is actually so unprincipled. Shen Lan went on to say and said that maybe the Viscount Lanshan was just shameless, and no matter how much he wrote, they wouldn't care. If so, he would have to send his complaint to court. Zhu Wenhua burned the new policy decree, and the provincial officials can't do anything about it. Then he will go to the governor general and complain to the sovereign. He asked what the sovereign would do. Anyway, he would have to punish him a little, and he might just suspend Zhu Wenhua from the cagery. The Viscount's son, Zhu Wenhua, was very angry and thought that Shen Lan was very cruel. Turning away to leave, the lad thought that at last the Viscount and his son were frightened. The Viscount Lanshan, from the moment they betrayed the old noble faction, had become enemies of Master Shen Lan. But he said aloud that it was time for him to return home, to write a word or two about the Viscount's daughter-in-law, and to write a letter of complaint. He wished the Viscount to prepare to leave the country. The Viscount gave in and told Shen Lan to take his time. A satisfied Shen Lan turned around, and the Viscount said that he agreed to all the young lad's terms. Shen Lan said that since the Viscount agreed, then he could proceed. Zhu Wenhua was surprised, but his father had already slapped the lad with the first slap. Shen Lan watched this with pleasure, and thought that Viscount Zhu Lanting was indeed a conscientious man, for he had only said about two slaps, and there were already more than ten. Somewhat sadistically, he thought that the sound of the slaps was just great, and one could actually get used to it. Turning to Shen Lan, the Viscount asked if the young master was satisfied. Shen Lan recalled the second condition, according to which the Viscount must collect all the unsold books of Yuan Ying's dream in the square. Shen Lan told the Viscount to bring all the available books so that Zhu Wenhua could burn them himself. The Viscount himself ordered the servants to do so, and they rushed to carry out the order. In just a few minutes, all the boxes were brought to the square. The head of the publishing house turned to the Viscount and said that a total of 6,000 copies of the last volume of Yuan's Dream had been printed, and about 500 copies had been sold today. There were more than 5,000 copies left, and they were all here. Approaching Zhu Wenhua with a torch in his hand, Shen Lan said that the marriage between him and the young mistress Zhang Chunhua was basically already predetermined, so there was no need to write the heck out of it so he could start burning. In a fit of anger, the young man turned away. Then Shen Lan said he would do it himself and asked his servant, Deng Xian, to bring oil to pour over the books, and joked that this would allow Zhu Wenhua to burn a little brighter. Dan Xian wondered how being human could add oil to the fire. He also wondered why he had no morals left at all after cooperating with young Master Shen. Shen Lan approached the oil-soaked books and held a burning torch to them. 
The flames burst into flames, rising two or even three times higher than Shen Lan standing in front of him. People stared at the fire in amazement, and Zhu Wenhua closed his eyes, unable to watch his creation burn. The owner of the publishing house was painful to watch, because now his money was literally on fire. He regretted listening to Zhu Wenhua, because instead of his novel, he could have sold The Wind and the Moon which surely no one would have burned, and that work could definitely have brought him more money. Zhu Wenhua took to his heart and said he couldn't bear to have his books burned. As a result, Hu, the owner of the Jade Pavilion, lost money, and Zhu Wenhua lost countless readers and his position as leader of the youth of Lanshan City. From now on, all everyone will remember about Zhu Wenhua is that he was a pathetic misunderstanding who was trampled by Shen Lan. Kneeling before the blazing fire, Zhu Wenhua turned to Shen Lan and said that one of them could not live as long as the other lived. Folding his hands in a respectful gesture, Shen Lan replied that he would wait for that moment and turned around, about to return home. The Viscount told the young master to be careful on the road, hinting that the road would be slippery at night, but Shen Lan twisted this to his advantage, shouting that if anything happened to him on the road, it would be Zhu Lanting's doing. The Viscount was shocked, for he himself had just hinted that the future of Xuanwu County would be bad, but the young man twisted it as if the Viscount had said that he would kill Shen Lan. On that note, Shen Lan left Lanshan City, and Jin Mulin was already leading the cavalry behind him to the city, so his whole journey was safe, especially since Zhu Lanting had sent a dozen of his men with him to guard him all the way to Xuanwu City. Sitting in his carriage, Shen Lan thought that Zhu Lanting was indeed a good man. The next day, sails of the wind and the moon rose even more because of the events of the previous night. It became such a popular topic of discussion that it sold out immediately, and those who supported Shen Long and those who supported Zhu Wenhua bought the wind and the moon to make their own opinions about it. Two days later, Dan Xian arrived in the city of Xuan Wu with dozens of vendors and brought over 3,000 copies of The Wind and the Moon. This amazing masterpiece finally went on sale in Shen Lan's main camp. In addition, before selling the book, Shen Lan spent a lot of money to hire a lot of people to promote it. There were even rumors that this book had special healing properties, which led to 3,000 copies of the book being sold out within four hours of the start of the sale. At the Exu residence, the head of the Exu family, Hatu Guangin, sits in an armchair wearing expensive robes of the finest purple and burgundy cloth, framed in gold patterns that emphasize his status, and, sipping his tea, asks his daughter if Jin Mulan and Shen Lan will come to his daughter's engagement banquet. The girl, dressed in a beautiful light dress of delicate shades of pink, with elements of blue inserts and a pale yellow sash, with the same color shoulder pads adorned with blue and yellow ruffles and pom-poms sweeping down the girl's elegant arms, holding some kind of box with golden patterns on it, answers that it does not matter whether they come or not, for they will have a messenger from the Governor General, and they will have a visit from Mr. Ning of the Capital Weaving House, and the heir of the Count of Jin Hai from the North will personally come. The maid brought another such box to the girl and readily waited to receive her friend from the lady's hands. Also, Governor Xu's daughter said that Shen Lan was only a lowly son in law so he would not be destined to take the main place on the stage this evening. The head of the family wondered if the Tang clan of Count Jin Hai would go over to the side of the new politics. The girl replied that not yet, but that would not stop Tang from cooperating with the new politics. First, they need to destroy Xuan Wu, and that would not be that difficult, as the dispute over Jinshan Island would completely destroy the foundations of the county. The maid took some more boxes and took them somewhere. Apparently, the young mistress was already bored with the boxes. The man said that if Mr. Zhang Chong destroyed two counties at once, he would be on top of power, if not as the highest official of the governor general, then as the head of some order in the capital. The girl remarked that perhaps Zhang Chong would even go to Yantou to become a low-ranking governor general. The man cheerfully remarked that this was indeed a shortcut to success. Within the borders of Yu State, there are three provinces and one autonomous region, Yantu.
This isolated autonomous region cannot compare with the provinces either in area or population, but it is so special that it ranks far above the ordinary counties and only half a rank below the provinces. The office of the highest ruler of this region is defined as that of inferior governor general. The head of the Exu family remarked that soon the Xuanwu County ship will sink, and then Shen Lan will once again be flitting from side to side. He added that Tai and Hang died in vain, and if you can't kill a fly by swatting it, then you just need to remove the rotting meat on which it sits, so the fly will also die. At this point, the manager of the Exu estate bursts into the hall, telling the lord and mistress that they are in trouble. The man asked why he was dashing off, to which manager Xu bowed in a courteous bow, folding his hands in a polite gesture and clearly nervous, turning to Mr. and Mrs. again, said that Shen Lan wrote the book The Wind and the Moon, which in less than two days sold over 3,000 copies in the state of Xuanwu. The man said not to worry about it, because how much money can be made from a few shabby books? He said that the more such trash is sold, the more damage will be done to the reputation of Xuanwu County. Then the servant took out a book and said that the lord and master should take a look at it. The design of the book could not help but attract attention, because on the cover was drawn an incredibly beautiful girl, the appearance and curves of the slender body resembling something like the governor's daughter, Sue Kankin. Taking the book in his hands, the head of the Exu family said that Shen Lan is really good at drawing, and no wonder that the book sold so well. But when he saw the woman in the illustration, she seemed very familiar to him. Only after a few moments he recognized his daughter in the image and was frankly shocked. The girl went over to see what had aroused such emotion in her father and asked how he liked the book, but when she saw herself in one of the illustrations, she mentally cursed Shen Lan in horror, thinking that he wanted to ruin her reputation and the reputation of the entire two family. The girl had spent so much time and money to achieve everything and get the title of Talented Girl of Mujing County, and now Shen Lan wants to ruin everything. Soon, people who had read the novel began to gather at the gate of the manor and began to ask if this was the house of Simon Tian Xian. But then why did the sign say Tsu? Then someone in the crowd suggested that the laughing man couldn't openly write the names of real people, so they had to change it a bit. Suddenly someone noticed Mistress Hu on the balcony and started calling her Simon Tian Xian, saying that he recognized her even in her clothes. This made the young mistress faint. Her servants immediately ran up to her and began to fuss. In the crowd, a beam almost fell on some people and they, making an analogy with the plot of the book, began to vie with one another to say that they were in Kaiman, and that this girl really is Simon Xanxian. After recovering from her fainting, the girl asked to bring the book because she wanted to read it carefully. Su Kaiman and Aksu Guangin gathered their spirits and opened the book Wind and Moon and read it quickly and carefully. While reading, Exu Guangyun exclaimed how this Shen Lan could be so cruel as to use the second son of Lanshan County to make up all sorts of nonsense. They used to invite young master Zhu to every book meeting, but now Exu Guangyun doesn't even know what to do. Xu Kainshin thought that the problem was not Zhu Wenhua, but that the book the wind and the moon was so well written, and it would definitely become famous and become a real classic for decades. At that moment, young Mr. Zhang bursts into the hall. Young Mr. Zhang, dressed in a seemingly quite simple, but at the same time expensive fabric clothes of pale green color with dark swamp color inserts, decorated with an interesting oral, a bit like eyes, like a fury burst into the hall and flying up to his bride, slaps her not a weak one and yells at her asking why she did not kill that lowly Shen Lan. He then asks her why she didn't kill that low-life Shen Lan. She leaves a red mark on her cheek and tears in her eyes, either from anger or pain, but in the next seconds she pulls herself together and says with a nonchalant expression that young Mr. Ju cannot take it out on his bride when she is already hurt. The man gets even angrier and slams his fist into the floor, which leaves a huge crack and dent, saying that he really wishes he had killed that brute Shen Lan back then. Xu Xanxin puts her hand on her husband-to-be's shoulder, telling him to calm down. After a few seconds, the young man drops his bride's hand and walks away, saying that he needs to find his father. 
City of Mujing County, residence of the governor. In the hall, young Mr. Zhang sits opposite his father, who has just finished reading The Wind and the Moon. No longer a young, gray-haired man sitting in a chair, but even so inspires respect for his person. The image of the man was in dark gray tones with metal inlays in which were inlaid bright green stones, most likely jade, the same were on his short gloves and open hands with impressive muscles, said that despite his age, this man is better not to mess with. The governor says quietly that this book is beautifully written, and Shen Lan has real talent, no sense at all that the novel was written by a young man. Young Master Zhang folded his hands in a respectful gesture and wanted to say something, but his father interrupted him and, putting his hand to his face and stroking his neat goatee, asked if he wanted to ask him to ban the book in question. The son jumped up from his seat and said emotionally that he wanted to, but the father interrupted him again, asking his son if he had heard that the more you ban a book, the more popular it becomes. He could, of course, ban it, but that would only increase his popularity. Governor Zhang said that they could only completely destroy the popularity of the book by killing Shen Lan, and if they wanted him dead, they needed to destroy Xuan Wu County first. The shocked young lord says, should they really allow Shen Lan to tarnish Fu Kanchen's reputation, for the reputation of the Zhang family might also suffer and they might become a laughingstock. Governor Zhang replied that he did not care. The governor is just a sword in the hands of the sovereign and has long been called a tyrant official, and he is not going to be famous forever, he does not need fame at all. He told his son to remember that they have only one goal, to win the county of Xuanwu and make this age-old noble family completely disappeared. Young Master Zhang humbly bowed his head to his father. General Zhang said to have his son and his bride have a beautiful wedding. It would be a dress rehearsal and a harbinger of the coming of a new regime in Xuanwu County. He advised his son to broaden his horizons, not to mess with Shen Lan, and always remember his goal. The son bowed respectfully, but the governor suddenly asked why young Master Zhang had hit Su Kanchen. The boy was surprised that his father had predicted even that and said he had been stupid, but the governor did not scold his son. He only said to let people look down on him, and when his son returned, let him demonstrate himself properly. Walking down the corridor, young Master Zhang pondered that all that was needed was to wipe out the Xuanwu County. His father was able to become the low governor of Yanshu only because of his merits, but the Exu family needs a hundred thousand gold coins, the only way they can silence their enemies. All that remains now is to put aside the issue of Shen Lan for the time being, for the first priority is the attack on the county. In the residence of Xuanwu County, Shen Lan sits on the stairs and writes some names high up on the wall and nonchalantly tells his wife that he tried so hard, but for some reason the number of names of his enemies on the wall is not decreasing, but only increasing. He crossed out one tie and hang with great difficulty, and now two more have appeared. He complained that there would be no end to this, and he would never be able to end this endless revenge and live a happy and joyful life. To such speeches his wife, Jin Mulan, a beautiful girl with long dark hair that took on a red hue at the end, stood beside Shen Lan in a beautiful white dress with red elements and replied with a smile that her husband's enemies were her enemies too. Climbing down the stairs, Shen Lan says there is an engagement banquet tonight, but it is not an engagement, but a precursor to a political attack on Xuanwu County. The guy says whoever dares to stick their necks out at this time will die. He promises to make them pay for everything. At this time, a maid came into the room and turned to Shen Lan and said that Mr. Count was looking for him. The boy was a little surprised, but quickly pulled himself together and went to the Count. Although Shen Lan was full of confidence, Count Xuanwu was under tremendous pressure. The Count was sitting all tense in front of his advisor, and at that moment, Shen Lan walks into the room. The Count told him that among the guests the Count had not expected at all were three who were also going to attend Zhang Jin's engagement party. The first of these is Tang Yun, the son of Count Hai from the north. The Count said that Count Jin Hai had had conflicts with the Count of Xuanwu, and this was between the old nobility, but now he sided with the faction of the new politics. The second, Nangong Bin, was the second son of the Marquis of Zhenbai.
Mengong Ao is the Marquis of Shenbai, a famous general of the state of Yu, commands a large army in the north, and so far he has taken a neutral position between the old nobility and the new politics faction. But now he sent his own son to Zhang Jin's engagement. The third guest was the one whom Count Xuan Wu least expected to see. It was the ambassador of the Yuan Secret Society. The Yuan Secret Society was one of the largest banks of the Great Yan Dynasty, had an astronomical fortune, and did business in more than a dozen countries. For several centuries, the Yuan Secret Society had close ties with the old nobility, but now they are also going to be present at Zhang Jin's engagement ceremony. Most importantly, the Yuan Secret Society was the largest debtor to the county of Xuanwu. After explaining the situation to his son-in-law, the count said that now that Xuanwu County was surrounded by enemies on all sides, he was really exhausted. The count is getting harder, and he feels that everything is about to collapse. The count says that Zhang Jin will train with Su Kanshin and Shen Lan will not need to go there. But the young man nonchalantly replied not to worry about his father-in-law, because he knows what Zhang Chong and the others are after. The count looked at his son-in-law in shock, but he continued to say with a carefree smile that in order for him to sit quietly on the neck of his wife and enjoy the wealth and honors, he often put himself in Zhang Chong's place and puzzled how to destroy the county of Xuanwu and finally saw the real situation. The count was a little angry and told Shen Lan to watch his tongue. Ignoring his father-in-law's words, Shen Lan continued to speculate and his first question was what Xuanwu County was most afraid of. First of all, it is isolation. He put a black pebble symbolizing Xuanwu County on the table in front of his father-in-law and next to it he put two more white pebbles symbolizing Lanshan and Kinhai counties. He said that Kinhai County was also joining forces with the new regime faction to kill them. Shen Lan put another black-colored pebble next to it, symbolizing the Marquis of Chenbei, and said that all this time, they could only rely on the Marquis of Chenbei, as he had his own personal army of 2,000 men and a territory of 800 square kilometers. Although he became a Marquis due to his military merits and is relatively distant from the old nobility, he has always been in close proximity to them. But now Zhang Chong has employed dishonest means to make the Marcus Chen Bai's position change to a faction of the new politics. Thus, Xuanwu County became the largest faction of the old gentry in Tangan province, and they were left alone in the rays of the new policies of the sovereign. Dong Chong has been preparing for this for a very long time, but the county still has the means to fight back. Shen Lan turned to his father-in-law and said that this move by Zhang Chong is just a distraction. In fact, he wants them to focus strategic resources on the Marquis of Chenbei and use all their forces to restore Chenbei's position. The young son-in-law said that they would not do as their enemy wanted and let the Marquis of Chenbei do as he pleased and do as he pleased. Next, in the second step, Zhang Chaoning wants to deprive them of having money in circulation. Suanwu County is mired in astronomical debt, so once the circulation of funds stops, the consequences for the county will be unthinkable. Shen Lan said that if he were in Zhang Chong's shoes, after the first two steps he would take the third step to kill them. This would have been the battle for Jinshan Island and the complete destruction of Xuanwu County. The count was shocked by such plans of the enemy, and Shen Lan went on to say that if he was right, the sovereign would soon issue an edict that would once and for all determine the ownership of Jinshan Island. As Zhang Zhang and Zhu Rong have been preparing the ground for the Chinchin Island dispute for more than six months, their complete loss of the island looks like a completely predetermined fact. When they lose Jinshan Island completely, their creditors will be able to demand a lion based on their inability to pay their debts. The collateral of Xuanwu County is Wanya Island, whose salt and iron revenues account for more than 60% of the county's total annual income. If the creditor asked the sovereign to intervene and claim Wangya Island, it would be very difficult for the county to fight against it. With such a manipulation, the financial chain of the county would be completely broken, and then the earl would have to reduce the army and sell some lands. When this happens, without his army, Xuanwu County will be like a wolf without teeth and claws, as if a piece of meat on a plate, given to be devoured by the others.
Therefore, according to Shen Lan, the key to victory or defeat between them and Zhang Chong lies in the battle for Jinshan Island. If they lose Jinshan Island, they will also lose their army and ultimately their lands. If the county of Xuanwu recaptures Jinshan Island, everyone wins and they can increase their army to become even stronger. The count was surprised and said that this was the key to how their Jin clan would be able to break the siege. The counselor was also surprised at how, with only a drop of information, one could analyze so many things. Both men were amazed that there was such a clever man in the world as Shen Lan. The advisor said that they now knew that Jinshan Island was the key to victory or defeat, but they would not only face High County in this battle. Zhang Zhang, Zhu Rong, and even the head of state are behind it, which means that Xuanwu County is facing a huge faction. Shen Lan said that he still has two things to overcome in the battle for the island, but if everything works out, victory will be theirs. Count Xuanwu said that Shen Lan should not have come to their house as an ordinary son-in-law, because this is a waste of talent, and with such a mind he could help the sovereign. Shen Lan said it was no use, for Mulan is his queen in and out of bed. Suddenly, realizing what he had blurted out, he looked apprehensively at his father-in-law, catching himself thinking that he was not some friend from the dormitory to tell him so easily. Deciding to change the subject, the boy asked why the Count's father had borrowed such a huge sum of money. The Count answered that his father had hired an army of 3,000 men and a whole fleet, and then that whole army was wiped out. Shen Lan wondered what the past Count wanted to achieve by this. Only a small country could afford such spending. Did the past Earl really do that? He thought to himself that it was no wonder that Count Jin Zhu had been saving for 20 years, but had never been able to pay off his debt. The Count, turning to his son-in-law, said that he was worried about him at this engagement, because enemies would be pressured from all sides. Shen Lang may be strong, but to stand up to the whole room of people, even he would not be able to. Shen Lan excitedly asked if his enemies could beat him, but when the Count said they couldn't, he said that in this case, he need not worry. He said that if he didn't beat the crap out of them at this engagement banquet, others might think that Xuanwu County was easily intimidated. The guy said he doesn't know why, but he's so excited about the upcoming event that his hands are even shaking. Then, as if remembering something, Shen Lang said that a man from the Yuan Secret Society should come soon. It should be in about three quarters of an hour. Shen Lang advised the Count that no matter what the representative said, the Count should only nod his head and agree with everything as if he was talking nonsense. The Count was surprised to think that since when Shen Lang had become a god capable of predicting some event with the accuracy of a quarter of an hour. After 45 minutes, the servant of Xuan Wu Manor informs his lord that he has an important guest from the north. The Count was a little surprised because everything happened exactly as his son-in-law said. Visiting the Count, the ambassador said that he was going to attend the engagement of Zhang Jin and said that he had not changed his position. The ambassador said that throughout the Great Yan Dynasty, there are dozens of princes and hundreds of old nobles with the states granted to them. He also added that their mutually beneficial relationship with the Count of Xuanwu is deeply rooted, so they have absolutely no intention of changing their position. At this, the Count thought that was why the ambassador was running to engage Zhang Jin and called him a fraud. He also remembered that Shen Lang had told him to agree with everything he said, so he would not be verbose with the ambassador. That afternoon, Zhang Jin and Hu Kangqin were engaged to be married. At the entrance to the banquet hall, many people greeted each other courteously, but everyone was distracted at one point to look at the carriage that had just arrived, or rather at the handsome young man who stepped out of it. Shen Lan was dressed in expensive robes of dark gray and bright azure cloth with the usual gold inlays. On the inside, his broad-sleeved cloak was trimmed with a beautiful emerald-colored fabric, and tall boots accentuated the young nobleman's slender legs. Immediately people began to whisper, asking each other who this handsome young man was until one of them said that since this is the carriage of the Jin family, it was clearly Shen Lan, the son-in-law of Count Xuanwu. Shen Lan, catching the rapturous looks on him, thought that as soon as he slightly dressed up, he immediately became a divine man, which Shu Kainkin will never be able to touch.
He had come to put a fat end to the unfortunate relationship between him and Kainkin. A woman's voice called out from Shen Lan's carriage, saying that tonight he would pull the attention of even the protagonist of the evening. Jin Mulin was gorgeous this evening. A beautiful white dress with cutouts down to the thighs on either side beautifully encircled the girl's body, emphasizing her slender figure and lush forms. A brooch in the form of a golden flower with red ribbons was attached just above the left hip of the girl, and a jewelry in the form of golden feathers blended perfectly into the image and matched the dark hair of the beauty. The cape with wide sleeves and fur, not covering the girl's shoulders, perfectly harmonized and complemented her whole image, and under the hand with Shen Lan, the young couple looked just great. After giving his hand to the exiting girl, Shen Lang said that he was certainly beautiful, but his wife should not worry about this, because she looked worthy of him and should not be ashamed of herself for anything, and to appear in the image of the first beauty of the evening. As soon as the girl stepped out of the carriage, all the attention of the male half of the guests was quickly completely focused on her. She told her husband that she would support him and in no way let him lose face. The guests, enraptured by Jin Mulin's beauty, vied with one another to say that not even Zhang Chun'a could compare to her. The herald introduced the guests, and the beautiful couple moved into the banquet hall. On the way, Shen Lan caught the hostile looks of the other guests. Suddenly, from the crowd of guests to Shen Lang, rushed some woman in obscenely short clothes, saying how glad she was to find the Lord. The woman spoke in awe of the fact that she and Shen Lan had become entwined in a passionate embrace of love a few days before in Lanshan City, and that she would never be able to forget him. She also said that he had told her then that she was better than his wife, and that she was a dead fish. She also added that Shen Lan allegedly said that his wife might have another man on her heart, and that she might even be able to cheat on him. Jin Mulin was angry at this girl, and wondered why she was standing here now, at the top of her voice, denigrating their family's reputation. To demonstrate her words, the woman pulled out a body locket from somewhere and shouted that Shen Lan had promised to take her to Xuanwu City and keep her there as a second wife, and even gave her a body locket. Shen Lan recognized the amulet, and indeed, it was an amulet made by his father, but he took it off and left it with the Exu family. At this moment, the guy understood everything and called Jin Hai to him, and whispered something in his ear. He understood what his master wanted from him, and quickly ran off somewhere. The woman kept talking about their relationship with Shen Lan, and said that he had not paid her for her services. Then people started whispering about what a disgusting man Shen Lan was, but the young master didn't notice it. He asked the woman how much he owed her for that night. She said only five pieces of silver, to which the fellow poured ten gold coins into her hands. He said that minus the five pieces of silver he owed her, that left another 195 pieces of silver. For that money, she could serve 390 more customers. The girl agreed to this, glowing with joy for the gift of money. But Shen Lan immediately called out to Jin Hai. Right behind the guy was a crowd of beggars waiting for scraps at the gate of the hall. Shen Lan shamelessly told the beggars that he leaves the woman to them, and they immediately began to thank their lord for this. The woman, obviously frightened of his future fate, began to call for help and tried to escape, but the guards blocked her path. Shen Lun said that she could not escape, because he had already paid, which meant that she had to serve customers anyway. Terrified of what was coming, the girl began to beg for mercy from Superintendent Kexu. She said that she worked for him to slander Mr. Shen, so now he must protect her. Manager Kexu was frightened by the exposure, saying that the woman was talking nonsense, and how could he, a man of such position, know someone like her? Shen Lan thought he just wanted to know who arranged this plot, and it turned out to be Superintendent Kexu, who had been looking for him every day before, and it seemed interesting to him. Trying to defend himself, the steward said that today was the wedding of his lord's daughter, and he would not bother with someone like her and ordered the woman to get out. She said that the steward himself had sought her out a couple of days ago and asked her to pour mud on young Master Shen. The steward himself was from that woman's village and all the villagers knew him well. A satisfied Shen Lan asked if these words meant that he hadn't slept with this woman, to which the woman replied that of course not. 
She said that she had never even met Mr. Shen, and she was only here because the manager had paid her to hurt the Lord. He even paid her extra money to say that she had infected the Lord with some disease, but she refused. Then manager Aksu realized that this situation was beginning to smell fried to him and decided to get out of there quickly, but Shen Lan ordered him to stand. The man turned around and with courage, he said that even though Mr. Shen Lang is the son-in-law of the Count, but he can't control his family. If people see this, then rumors might go around that the Count of Xuanwu is self-rule, and that it is the master of Xuanwu City. Turning around again, the man said goodbye to the young master, but Shen Lan Five told him to stop. Then Superintendent Exu said that not to say that this woman is talking nonsense, such cases should be dealt with in the residence of the town governor. Suwaimu County has no right to enforce the law. To put it bluntly, Shen Lan can't do anything to Manager Xu, so the man can leave in peace. Manager Xu thought, what of the fact that Shen Lan is the son-in-law of the Count, because there is nothing he can do to him, because the manager decided to send a man to slander the young lord. He thought that Shen Lan was ignorant of life and did not expect that the man could play on it. But suddenly, Shen Lan turned to Jin Mulan, saying that there were many bad people in this place trying to hurt him, so they should go home. Jin Mulan supported her husband and agreed to go home. They both turned toward their carriage, but it was young Master Zhang who noticed. He was dressed very smartly on the day of his engagement. He wore a sleeveless cape of red cloth framed with gold threads over a long cassock of dark, almost black fabric with a bright fiery accent. A brooch resembling a green jade eye rested on the left side of his chest. He couldn't let this happen because then they wouldn't be able to have a dress rehearsal of the attack on Xuanwu County if Shen Lan left. Then the young man decided to intervene. He stood in front of Shen Lang and Jin Mulan's carriage and asked why they wanted to leave so early because the banquet had not even started yet. Shen Lan said angrily that someone inside was trying to hurt him, but if they broke his leg, the young master wouldn't leave. Young Master Zhang thought that Shen Lan had done it on purpose, and in fact, he didn't want to leave at all, but was trying to provoke them. But giving in to Shen Lan, young Lord Zhang went to the steward and asked who allowed him to bribe a prostitute to slander young Lord Shen Lan. He ordered the guards to seize the steward. Then the head of the Exu family, Chu Guiyin, decided to intervene and said whether it was okay to do so, but the young man replied that today is his wedding day, and some person out of personal animosity committed such a shameful act. If they don't punish him, how will they explain themselves later to the guests? Young Master Zhang ordered to pin manager Xu to the ground and break his legs, but as soon as the guards put him on the ground, Shen Lan told them to stop. Young Master Zhang asked if Mr. Shen Lan needed anything, to which the lad replied not to bother the guards and taking a stick in his hand, he said he would do everything himself. Swinging it, the guy struck a sharp and hard blow right at the legs of Manager Exu, and both of them screamed. Manager Exu screamed in pain because of his broken legs, and Shen Lan screamed because he pulled his lower back. He asked Jin Mulan to come closer to him and massage his back, while Manager Exu cursed him in his mind and vowed to kill him. Young Master Zhang ordered to send Manager Exu to the family home and find a doctor to cure him. He also said that the floor should be cleaned. In this round, Shen Lan came out victorious, and all the guests finally made their way to the banquet hall. The room was sumptuously decorated with red curtains and gold symbols affixed to the ceiling. The floor was lined with gorgeous brown tiles with intricate gold patterns, and the tables at which the guests were seated were arranged in two rows on either side of the room. The young men's table was at the head, at the wall opposite the entrance to the hall. There, Exu Kainchen and young Master Zhang greeted the guests together. The bride wore a beautiful red dress with black and gold inlays. The sides of the girl's dress, just like Mulan's, had long necklines to the top of her thighs, and her arms were adorned with separately attached wide sleeves made of the same red fabric as the dress. The bride's hair was gathered into a beautiful hairstyle and adorned with gold hairpins made in the shape of golden flowers. When she saw Jin Mulan, Chu Kanchen folded her hands in a courteous gesture and greeted the girl, politely asking how her father was doing.
Jin Yulin replied that the count was fine, and Shen Lang noticed that Xu Kanchen completely ignored him and deliberately asked indifferently about the count's health. Shen Lan approached his wife and asked if she had taken money, then she replied that she had knitted some. Then Shen Lan gave the money to Xu Kanchen with the words that a man can owe money for anything but a night, so this money is payment to Xu Kanchen for three months with him. He said that once they became spouses, they should take care of each other, and in three months they were spouses about 200 times. In addition, that woman set the price at half a silver coin, and Kyankin, he should pay at least 10 times as much. The bag he gave the girl had 50 gold coins in it, which is equal to 1,000 silver coins. Su Kanshin and her future husband, young Master Zhang, were furious, but the girl managed to pull herself together in time and said that after a while they would make a toast to Lady Jin Mulin. Although at first glance, Xu Kanshin was courteous, at the banquet she placed Shen Lan and Jin Mulin in ninth place. This was totally inconsistent with the status of Xuanwu County and was blatant harassment. Although there were several dignitaries present at the banquet, the X1 house should not have occupied such seats. Shen Lan thought that he would not tolerate such unfair treatment of his wife. The heir of the Count of Jin Hai and the envoy of the Governor General's residence were announced. People were surprised that Tang Yun had also arrived. Many had heard that the Governor General's envoy was not so simple this time either. The Governor General's envoy turned out to be Zhu Wubian, Zhu Rong's nephew. He is the son of the chief commander of Ping Nai, the envoy of the governor general's residence. The young man wore a long robe of either dark gray or gray blue, and his top was completely covered, giving away the fact that he was a man close to the military. The next guest was Tang Yun. He is a two-time Jinchi in literature and military affairs. Third in the capital examination this year and fourth in the palace examination. The guy looked more relaxed than the guest presented before him, and one might even say defiant. An open shirt of dark gray and turquoise fabric, shoulder pads and cuffs, loose pants with high boots, a sword strapped to his belt, and a long earring in his left already. Yes, young master Tang Yun's image could definitely be called as bold as his smirk. Shen Lan and Tang Yun crossed tense glances, and the young son-in-law of Xuanwu County immediately had a dislike for Tang Yun, and he asked his wife who she thought was more handsome him or Tang Yun. Jim Yulin replied that the prettier, of course, Shen Lan, and he thought that his wife had a keen eye. Tang Yuan's status was so high that a third of those present rose to greet him, and another two-thirds wanted to rise, but were not in a high enough position to do so. Even Li Wu Yan, who took one of the top three places in the Jinxi examination, was completely unable to straighten his back. Lai Wen Zhen, a truly diligent student from Xuanwu City, said that it had been several months since he and Tang Yun had left the capital, and he really missed his named brother. During his life, Shen Lan was beaten by his teacher more than 800 times, and 90% of them he had to hear Lai Wenching. Lai Wenching and Tang Yun passed the state examinations together, and in his 28 years he came second in the Jinchi, so he is the pride of Xuanwu City. Now he still performs the duties of an inspector in a silver cassock, touring all the counties of the Celestial Empire. Although his official position is not high, his power is astounding, and even the governor must bow to him three times. The last to appear were Nangong Ping, the second son of Marquisite Shenbei, and a representative of the Yuan Shu Tinyu Secret Society. As a result, all of the chief guests had a certain amount of influence in some areas. Liu Wu Yang had influence in the city of Xuanwu. Zhang Jin had influence in Nujing County because his father was the governor of that place. Nangong Ping had influence in the Zhenbi territories because he was the second son of the Marquis of Zhenbai. Tang Yun had influence in Jinhai County. Lai Wenxing had influence in the state inspection organization. Zhu Yuyuan had influence in Pingnan as he was the son of the commander-in-chief. Xu Tingyu had influence in the Yuan secret society. All the important figures appeared on the stage of this banquet, so the show could begin. When all the guests were seated, the engagement banquet began. Jin Mulan asked her husband if he thought there would be a second attack. 
Shen Lan wrote the name Wang Liang on the table. The young woman asked if Shen Lan thought there would be a second cousin Wang Lan. The young man said that there was a 90% chance it would be their second. Wang Lian did appear in the aisle and Jin Mulin was surprised that her husband guessed it. Young Master Zhang said that Wang Lian was late and would be punished with three penalty glasses later. Usually Wang Lian is hostile to Zhang Jin, but today he is friendly, which means he is really against Suanwu County. Already a little drunk, Wang Lian made his way to the table where Jin Mulin and Shen Lan were sitting and, staring at it, began to shout at the girl how she could forget their vow of eternal love. He recalled how, on the night of the full moon at the mid-autumn festival the year before, under the osmanthus tree, they had made a promise to each other to be together until death. He spoke of how that day under the moon, amidst the flowers, they bonded together in matrimonial love and fell asleep together like mandarin ducks and promised to be husband and wife until death do them part. Jin Mulin was surprised by these words, and Wang Lying went on to say that because of her, he refused to participate in the capital's examination and came to Xuanwu City to become an archivist. He said that he gave up a great career and everything for her, but then why did she betray him and marry Shen Lan? Jin Mulin became angry and was about to stand up and show the guy his place, but Shen Lan stopped her by extending his hand in front of the girl and saying that in an hour her name would be cleared and Wang Lian would die. The guests present in the hall began to whisper that they did not expect such a thing from Jin Mulin. Shen Lan was sitting and writing something down on paper. Jim Mulan asked what he was doing, and the guy said he was writing down the names of all those people who had dared to insult his wife's reputation, and he would make those people live worse than death and wish they had been born at all. Young Master Zhang Jin came up to their table and, taking Wang Liang by the shoulder, said that the banquet had just begun and asked where he had already gotten so drunk. He offered to take the boy to his place. Taking his friend away, Zhang Jin thought that Shen Liang was shameless for not being afraid to slop on other people, now let him feel what it was like to slop on his wife. Shen Lan wrote Lai Wenjin's name on his paper. Jin Mulin noticed this and asked if this man would be the enemy's third move. Shen Lan said that she was right and that with this man, the enemy wants to strike the final blow and corner the guy. Jin Mulin said that the enemies are so well prepared does Chen Lan have a way to deal with all of this? The young master asked his wife if she remembered the people who had come to see them last month. The girl remembered them, but could not understand the point, for those people had come to Dr. An to help care for the sick. With a gloating face, Chen Lan said that this was the point. Jim Yulin nonchalantly said that she trusted her husband, and if those people dared to do anything, she would kill them all. Young Master Zhang Jin stood in the center of the hall and said that he had invited everyone to come this way to congratulate him, so he would like to make this toast in honor of all his guests. After the first toast, people began to chat among themselves, and suddenly, one of the people asked the others if they had heard about a wonderful new book coming out. At that moment, Shen Lan grinned maliciously. The second man said that it's hard not to know, because this book is like fire spread throughout the counties of Yangwu and Nujing, and is rapidly spreading throughout the province of Tangnan. The third man said that this book is well written. The third man said that this book is well written and rich in content, it tells the story of the world. The first man, drawing attention to himself and the book, said that the guests did not yet know, but that the author of this book, Lan, laughing over the grave, was among them in this room. All the guests were shocked by this and could not believe such a surprise. Together, they began to ask the author to reveal the author's secret, and then he gave in and said that Lan laughing over the grave was the son-in-law of Shen of the Xuanwu house. One of the men who spoke earlier said that Shen Lan was incredibly talented and that he really liked the poems in his book. He said that the poems were written so well and heartfelt that every time he read them, the man couldn't help but feel a strong emotion in his heart. He quoted one of Shen Lan's poems, and the guests began to say that the young gentleman had a brilliant literary talent. After drinking a shot of sake in one gulp, Wang Lying slapped his palm on the table and stood up, saying that Shen Lan was shameless and had not only stolen his woman, but also stolen his poems. He insulted Count Xuanwu's son-in-law, saying that he was just a shameless literary brat, 
and that Wang Lin had written the poem, and that Shen Lan had simply appropriated it for himself. Young Master Zhang Jin thought contentedly that it was impolite not to repay the evil, after all, isn't that the basis of the fight? He and the other enemies of Shen Lan prepared for him three techniques, one stronger than the other, cannot Shen Lan cannot handle even the second blow. Everyone in the hall had abruptly changed their position regarding Shen Lang and were now whispering about what Wang Lin had said. They felt that Shen Lan had acted meanly and demanded an explanation. Shen Lan was interceded for by an elderly man, saying that Shen Lan was his disciple. The man said that even though his disciple had been untalented in the past, if the young master had no proof, he could not accuse his disciple of appropriating poetry. The old teacher said that one should not slander a man rashly. Wang Liang said there was proof. Pulling out some papers from his sleeve, he showed them to everyone and said that they were his essays from the county exam eight years ago. It could not be faked. The county examination is the first examination of the Jukai. Those who passed the county examination could take the court examination, and those who passed the court examination could receive the degree of Suking, and they were then able to continue to participate in the provincial Uguichen examination. Although the provincial examination was not of high standard, it was still an official state examination. One of the guests said that it was really an examination paper from Nujiang eight years ago. It even bore the seal of the governor and administrator of Tanyin province at the time. He urged everyone to look at the handwriting and paper, which could not be faked. Thus, people decided that it was all true and Shen Lang really had stolen poetry from Wang Liang. Once again, his old teacher came to the student's defense. He said that Wang Liang and Shen Lang had never even crossed paths, and his student could not steal a poem. Then Wang Liang said that at the time when Shen Lan was injured, he felt sorry for the guy and for half a month came to his house to help him repeat lessons and teach him how to read, but he did not expect that Shen Lan would be so unscrupulous that he would steal his poem. After these words, even the teacher sided with Wang Liang. Then Shen Lang asked to be allowed to look at Wang Liang's examination paper. One of the guests said how could someone as uneducated as Chen Lan touch the palace examination papers, but agreed to put them on the table for the young man to read. Shen Lan thought about seeing everything even from this distance. With his ability, he realized that it was indeed Wang Lian's handwriting, but the poems were still fake. Each word was indeed written by Wang Lian eight years ago, but it is a fake because each of the 21 words is often found. Wang Lang cut them out of previously written works and combined all the words in this poem. The parchment consists of 21 pieces. Wang Lang then found the most famous and skilled restorers, and the words were simply pasted onto this eight-year-old examination sheet, and finally a transparent layer of paper was applied to its surface. The most interesting thing is that this layer of paper was taken from some blank areas of calligraphy and painting from eight years ago, so it is full of traces of time. Wang Liang said that this was irrefutable proof. The old teacher said that Shen Lan was as ignorant as a rotten tree at Henshui Village School, and only when the teacher could stand it no longer, he took the young master home. The teacher said that at that time he was honest and kind, but now he had learned to steal and embezzle. He called Shen Lan a disgrace to educated society and personally his own disgrace. Already quite drunk, Wang Liang asked Shen Liang if he had anything else to say. A woman intervened in the whole situation and said she didn't believe that Shen Lan could have stolen a poem. She said that his poem and Master Wang Liang's poem were pure coincidence. She suggested that Shen Lan compose some even better poems to prove to everyone that he was really talented. People supported this suggestion, and Hu Kang Kin thought that Shen Lan is unable to prove his innocence, but this time it's not the clueless Wang Liang who will ruin everything, because now everyone around him is his enemies. One of the distinguished guests said that there were many scholars present, so if anyone wanted to, Shen Lan could compete with them in poetic talent. He offered to give them a theme, and if Shen Lan's written poem surpassed them, he would prove that he had great talent and was not a thief at all. He suggested that since Shen Lan's book was called The Wind and the Moon, let them use the wind and the moon as a theme for their poems. 
The audience fervently supported using this theme, but Shen Lan said that why on earth should he compose poems? Who are they all to ask him to compete with them in the art of poetry? Someone shouted that Shen Lan Day didn't have a degree, and he dared to judge their status and even put himself on the same level as the scholars. Then Shen Lan asked if any of them could successfully pass the highest Jinchi examination. Rising from his seat, the young master said that even if they could, what would they do next? They will work as a government official for a few years, then maybe somehow become city governors. Even if they could eventually achieve the position of governor, their ancestors would roll over in their graves. Let's say they'll be a 50-year-old and become governors, but so what? What fame and fortune they would then enjoy, what wife they could marry, what house they would live in, and how many children they would have. He, Shen Lan, lives on an estate of 700 hectares, in a luxurious estate of 70 hectares, with 10 female servants. The brocade robes that he now wears cost hundreds of gold coins, and his wife, the first beauty of Nazim County, is exceptionally lovely in appearance and possesses the greatest martial arts skills. But what is the end of their lives is only the beginning of Shen Lan's journey. What all these people dream of and what they could only dream of is reality to him. He asked who they were to compare themselves to him. He said that everyone had come to this banquet to be dogs, but that today the event was arranged almost in his honor. Such words made people furious, but they knew it was all true. Trying to get me to compose a better poem to prove your point, nervously exclaimed Shen Lan, pointing his finger at those present. Do you want to play with a trained monkey? Before I, Shen Lan, was only a commoner, and your Ksu family could crush me at any moment, and I had to fight to the end to prove my innocence. And now, Shen Lan's face expressed complete dislike for such demands addressed to him. Right, Dan Poems. Shen Lan's gaze darted to Wang Liang sitting at the table. Catching a good moment when Wang Liang's attention focused on Shen Lana, Jin Yulin deftly tossed a tiny pill into the glass to the accuser. Which Wang Liang immediately swallowed with another serving of alcohol. Shen Lan, if you are still a man, confess to your wife and in front of everyone present that you stole my poems. Jumping up from behind the table, began to shout the alcohol-fueled Wang Liang. Shen Lan, you know what, I despise you. Wang Liang went on to public indignation. You dare to do something you are not worthy of. Unfortunately, Wang Lian, you did not want to live peacefully and became a pawn of other people. Shen Lan pondered, scrutinizing his accuser. So, don't blame me. You stained my wife's honor, I won't stand for it. The hallucinogenic substance that Shen Lang had previously perfected caused hallucinations when consumed in small quantities, and in larger quantities, it was like a truth serum that made people answer all questions. What was in Jin Mulin's hands, what she added to Wang Liang's glass, was enough to make a person tell the truth. Wang Liang drank wine to boost his courage, and the large amount of alcohol helped accelerate the absorption of the medicine. The countship of Xuan Mu will soon come to an end since they found a son-in-law like you. Wang Lian continued his attacks, blushing in front of his eyes. You despicable man, I am ashamed to be in your company. It's a pleasure, Wang Lian exalted to himself. It really is a pleasure. Shen Lan can't object to anything. Aren't you terribly strong, Shen Lan? The accuser laughed in his heart. Aren't you tough? I just slandered you, and you can't do anything. Wang Lian felt some unfamiliar emotional lift, euphoria rushed in. What's wrong with me? Am I drunk? No, the pleasure of victory must have made me so cheerful. Wang Liang, you slandered and framed me, right? Noticing the change in Wang Lian's appearance, he smiled and asked Shen Lan. Yes, Shen Lan, I set you up. With a wave of his hands, Wang Lian joyfully exclaimed. Everyone present only gasped at such a statement of the accuser. Then, did I steal your poems? Convinced of the effects of the hallucinogenic drug, Shen Lan continued to ask. I'm not afraid to tell you the truth. Rather cheerful, Wang Lian replied. Although this poem is very short, only 21 words, but it is so amazing that I would not be able to write it. The prosecutor revealed all his cards, being completely positive. Wang Lang, someone ordered you to slander me? Catching his opponent by the tongue, continued to press Chen Lan. Yes, Mayor Liu Wu Yan. 
Without even thinking for a second, Wang Lion replied with a finger. What are you talking about? The town mayor, Li Wu Yan, who was sitting at the table, immediately burst out. I'm flying, I'm flying, I'm flying. Dancing, Wang Lion chattered. It was you, Li Wu Yan, it was you who ordered me to slander Shen Lan. Wang Lion was approached by two servants. Archivist Wang Lion, please come with us. One of them tried to say. Let him talk. Jin Mulin abruptly intervened in the situation. Liu Wu Yan, you yell at me every day and tell me what to do. Wang Lion continued to tell the truth as much as possible. Did you know? I made you a cuckold. I slept with your concubine eight times, eight times. Looking at the town governor with a sneer, Wang Lion narrated. Your concubine says you're no good. Every time a single woman, she can't even spend three seconds with you. But still she has to scream for a quarter of an hour, giving the impression that you're great. Someone take Wang Liang away. Liu Wu Yan shouted in anger. His warriors rushed to carry out the order. No need. Everyone is curious to hear. Declared the commander of the squad that blocked their way. Wang Lian, how did you forge this examination paper? Asked Shen Lan, showing the document. Obviously, it is an examination paper from eight years ago. Why is my poem here? Shen Lan, you did not expect this. Wang Lian just laughed at that. I chose these words from the essays I wrote in the past. Then I asked the best master restorers to peel off these words and paste them on the examination sheet, and in the end, the sheet was framed with a layer of the finest paper. Did you know that the top layer was also removed from the paintings from eight years ago, and after the framing was completed, the sheet was dried for several hours at a distance of one meter from the surface of the flame, that's how it turned out. Throwing his hands up, Wang Lion gave away the secret. You know what? Then I was so shocked that it was possible to pass off lies as truth in such a way. Shen Lan, I will bury you alive. Wang Lian continued to have fun. Why did you do that? Calmly, as if a child asked Shen Lan. It was originally supposed to be mine. Suan Wu County was supposed to be mine. All I had to do was to marry and enter the county. My uncle and I would be able to join forces and control the financial power of the county. After Count Suan Wu died, we would have gotten rid of that scum Jin Mutsong, and my son would have become the new legitimate Count of Xuan Wu. But you son of a bitch beat me to it and killed my uncle Aksu Wenzhou. I want revenge besides, once I set you up, I will be accepted into the new politics faction. They even want to help me in the next capital exams. Shen Lan, Zhang Jin has prepared for you a death blow. You will soon come to an end. Without realizing it, Wang Lian continued revelations. Jin Mulin, marry me. Marry me. That's how it seems to be called. What's on a sober person's mind is on a drunkard's tongue, said, smiling Shen Lan. I never thought that Wang Lian would lose his mind and do everything to get back at you. Zhang Jin said brokenly. Shen Lan, Wang Lian set you up and tried to appropriate your poem for himself. Our mayor, Liu Wu Yan, will definitely get justice for you. Report to the Provincial Superintendent of Academic Affairs, deprive Wang Liang of his degree, fine him 20 gold pieces, and give them to the injured Shen Lan. Liu Wu Yan hurriedly said without raising his eyes. Brother-in-law Shen Lan, are you satisfied with this punishment? Asked Zhang Jin. Happy. Clapping his hands, Shen Lan replied. First, take Wang Liang home to sober him up. Ordered Zhang Jin, looking at the merry Wang Liang. Wang Liang, it's okay, even if you slandered me for stealing. Shen Lan thought about it, but how dare you slander the decency of my wife and call me a cuckold. I'm sorry, but you're finished and you won't die easy, you'll die original, you'll die humiliated. The warriors escorted Wang Liang no more than a mile and a half, where he was robbed by several black-clad masters. Your Excellency Lai Wenshin, you have just asked me to compose a poem on the theme of the wind and the moon, and also offered me to compete with the scholars of Zhuzhen, which I declined. Shen Lan was approached, as I considered them unworthy. Now on reflection. Shen Lan, what's wrong with you? Zhang Jin was surprised to himself. You suddenly became a normal person again. Ah, uh, now on reflection, they are still not worthy. Shen Lan stated snidely. 
but I think, since Mr. Zhang Jin has already set the topic, it would be wrong for me to compose a poem. After all, then I would be unworthy of my reputation as a talented person. Listen everyone, now I, Shen Lan, will compose a poem in seven steps. The title of the poem is Don't Be an Official. Raising his glass of wine, Shen Lan exclaimed picturesquely. The sun and the moon alternate, red water flows in a thin stream, thin and strong, shallow and deep again. There is a chuckle on his face, but his eyes melt with sadness. Love me, Kankin, as the wind and the moon love each other. The glass burst with anger in Zhang Jin's hands. Bandit, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, Zhang Jin's mind flashed. Hey, why is there no applause? Shen Lan turned to the audience with his arms outstretched to his sides. Did I not compose this poem well? Then how about singing a song for you? Aichin suggested Shen Lan. Kan Kin, you are my old friend. A woman who looks like a rose with her little scarlet lips. You made me lose my head many nights. Tugged on the song by Shen Lan, with as much expression as possible. Out of indignation and out of shame, Kan Kin bit her lips with such force that a scarlet trickle of blood ran down her face. Kan Kin, your lip is bleeding. Shen Lun faked it. What happened? I did not sing well. Should I change the song again? Wife, no one seems to like my poems, and even more dislike my singing. We'd better go home. Seeing Zhang Jin's angry mood, Shen Lan suggested, turning to Jin Yulin. Husband, I like your singing. Come on, I'll listen to you sing when we get back. Playing along with Shen Lan, smirking, Jin Yulin replied, Shen Lan, you can't leave. Suddenly, Lai Wenchen broke his silence. Brother Tan, do you know what is the funniest thing about people? Lai Wenjing turned to Tan, who was sitting next to him. A man who is close to death, but does not understand it, jumps off like a jerk. Shen Lan, your conspiracy is exposed. Lai Wenjin said menacingly, pointing a finger in Shen Lan's direction. Capture Shen Lan, put him in irons, and take him to the capital. The climax has come, my landmine has finally been stepped on. Feeling his success, thought Shen Lan. You outstanding scholar Jinchi, but ended up being a sword in the hands of another man. Master Lai Wenjin, what have I done to deserve death? Showing his incomprehension, Shen Lan appealed. Not only are you close to death, Xuanmu County could also suffer. Rather stated Lai Wenjin. Madam Jin Mulin, your family could probably be dragged into this. In a few days, the Sovereign will send a silver robe envoy to inspect your Xuanmu residence. Brush and ink, Lai Wenchen asked. Taking his brush, he began to write a poem, saying it out loud in parallel. If I had known that your love was gone, I would not have been jealous of who had bred in you such strong feelings that you had cheated. At dawn, the longing fell asleep in the canopy of punishments. At sunset, the tears fell in the women's chambers. The center of heaven solely possessed the soul, the desire remained the same. Shen Lan, you haven't forgotten, have you? It's a poem from your book. Finished writing, said Lai Wenjin. These words, if read backwards, mean heaven will punish the ruler of Jin. Lai Wenjin showed a sheet with a highlighted line. Heaven will punish the ruler of Jin, murmured those present. How can it be Shen Lan seeks death? The very word punish is found in the version put up by Shen Lan for sale in Xuanwu City, and in the Lanshan City version it is read as in bright red. Lai Wenjin went on to say, So this poem is no accident, this word was deliberately added by Shen Lan. The audience in the hall began to actively discuss the insolence of Shen Lan, as well as his imminent demise. The ruler's name is Ning Jin, and he is the sovereign's adopted son, as well as his son-in-law. His original name was Sha, and he was the crown prince of the small state of Nanu, with a population of a million people south of the state of Yu. Nanyu is located in an incredibly important place. It is a neutral zone between the kingdom of Yu and the Sand Barbarians. Twenty years ago, when the kingdom of Yu was fighting the Sand Barbarians, the ruler of Nanyu raised the country's elite in the vanguard, but unfortunately died on the battlefield. The emperor of Yu, heartbroken, took the nine-year-old crown prince Nanu into the state of Yu and made him his adopted son. Jin means sleeve of a garment and symbolizes that the state of Yu and the state of Nanu will forever remain brothers.
And the first report on the new policy of the state of Yu was also written by Ning Jin. Therefore, according to everyone's opinion, Shen Lan was heading for death, hiding such content in the wind and moon. Shen Lan did not the ruler Jin wrote the report ten years ago. Lai Wenjin angrily exclaimed, So you cursed him in your verses like crazy. This is a big and carefully planned affair. As an inspector in the Silver Cassock, it is my duty to conduct a detailed investigation to find out who is behind you, Shen Lan. This way, arrest Shen Lang. A command sounded and the warriors who had previously stood motionless headed towards Shen Lang. Immediately Jin Mulan drew her sword, showing her readiness to defend her husband. Madam Jin Mulan, please, it is too late for you and Shen Lan to draw the boundary, but to pretend is better than doing nothing, don't you agree? Smiling wickedly, Lai Wenjin asked. In his heart, Lai Wenjin admired the charms of Jin Mulan, the princess of Xuanwu City and the number one beauty of Nanjing County. But he could never get Jin Mulan because he was a sovereign's man and had to stand up to the old nobility. However, a woman he could not have would not be available to another man either. Shen Lan and I are spouses, one and the same, so Mr. Lai Wenxing should not worry. Clenching her teeth, Jin Mulan replied, Then in the future, you may have to visit Shen Lan in the capital's prison. Arrest Shen Lan, put shackles on him, and escort him to the capital. Once again, Lai Wenjin gave the command, switching to shouting. With a sharp swing of her blade, Jin Mulan sliced the table in half, cooling the fervor of the soldiers. Who dares? The girl exclaimed furiously. Lai Wenjin, you should hear what else I have to say, right? Proclaimed Shen Lan. Lai Wenjin, are you on good terms with Ruler Jin? Last year in the capital, I had the good fortune to visit the sovereign when he came to wish the sovereign longevity. Lai Wenjin replied. Ruler Jin appreciated me. We talked with him for several days. After that, we sent each other poems. And Ruler Jin treated me as a good friend. So, you have visited the ruler of Jin many times and even had a few secret conversations with him. You really have the nerve, completed Shen Lan. Shen Lan, what did you say? Lai Wenjin got angry. What did you call secret conversations? What did you call insolence? Who do you take the ruler of Jin for? Lai Wenjin, I wrote this poem on purpose, Shen Lan stated firmly. How dare you? Seize him for confessing treason. Lai Wenjin shouted. With a few strokes of the sword, Jin Mulan drove away the approaching warriors, protecting Shen Lan. Jin Mulan, how dare Xuanwu County protect the conspirator? Angry with anger, shouted Lai Wenchen, while taking out the sign of the silver cassock. City Chief Liu Wu Yan, General Zhang Jin, you are also servants of the state of Yu and must fight for your country. Raising his hand upward, Lai Wenchen urged, As inspector of the silver robe, I order you to immediately dispatch all your troops to arrest Shen Lan and the conspirators and to kill all those who obstruct. Yes, in one voice Li Wu Yan and Zhang Jin answered, and immediately a second squad of warriors completely surrounded Jin Mulan and Shen Lan. Surrender! A confident command sounded. Mr. Lai Wenxin, please accept the sign of the warlord. Li Wu Yan held out a dark figure in the form of an animal. Jin Mulan, no matter how skilled you are in combat, can you defeat hundreds of people here? On reflection, Lai Wenjin rejoiced. You and Xuanmu County is finished. Lai Wenjin, you really are an idiot, reluctantly asked Shen Lan. The second edition came out a few days apart, didn't you think? Why should I correct just one word in it? Capture Jin Mulan and Shen Lan. If they resist, kill on the spot, yelled Lai Wenjin, raising up his hand, clutching the figure, the sign of the military commander. Yes, immediately the soldiers barked back. Ruler of Nanyu, Shi Jin has risen, Shen Lan declared, causing Lai Wenjin and Lu Wu Yan to be surprised. Are you crazy, Shen Lan? With a wry smile, Lai Wenjin said, He is not only the adopted son of the sovereign, but also the husband of Princess Ning Lu. How could he rebel? He was forced to rebel before he could because his plan to poison Princess Ning Lu failed. Shen Lan voiced his vision. I purposely put a landmine in the book to see who would step on it, and to my surprise, it was this idiot who got caught. 
Lai Wenjin, you and Lord Minu were close and had secret conversations for days and nights. You also took part in his affairs, didn't you? Perhaps you were even one of the main conspirators. Lai Wenjin, you are finished. Go back home, visit your mother, wash your neck clean, and wait for death, Chen Lan declared. You lie. How could the Jin ruler start a rebellion? With a wave of his hand, Lai Wenchen snarled. How could you know what even I do not know, Inspector? It's a little harder to explain. With a sly smile, Shen Lan replied. The previous Lord Nanu died on the battlefield only because the main forces of the state of Yu were left behind at a critical moment. And although Shi Jin, at first glance, had infinite trust in the state of Yu, after his return to Nanu, the officials of Nanu listened only to Princess Nin Lu. He was nothing more than a clay Buddha. So Shi Jin fought for several years by all means to regain most of his power. His last step was to get rid of the obstacle in his way, Ning Lu. Princess Ning Lu believed she was suffering from a strange disease, so she came to Xuanwu County to visit the famous doctor in Zaishi. Shen Lan also learned of this and took part in the princess healing. She had arterial eye fundus spasms, abdominal cramps, anemia, nausea, vomiting, fever. These symptoms of lead poisoning, Shen Lan recalled that case. But Shen Lan was not sure he could cure her completely, he could only persuade her to take milk and other medicines to slowly flush out the lead. Princess Ning Lu stayed in the county for two days, then returned to the capital, and then went back to the state of Nanu. Only after the secret agent of the county confirmed that the ruler of Jin and Princess Ning Lu had finally quarreled, Shen Lan decided to use this as a trump card. He immediately decided to reprint and bind 3,000 books, which led to what happened today. Impossible, impossible. Lai Wenchen, sweating with anger, screamed. Shen Lan, you are spreading nonsense rumors. You desperately resist like a cornered animal. You will only make your end even more miserable and drag Suan Wu County even deeper into hell. What are you waiting for? Waving his hands, Lai Wenchen shouted, turning to the soldiers. Capture them. I don't believe he won't confess when you get into the Hai Shui prison tower. Lai Wenchen, take your time. Sitting down on a chair, besought him Shen Lan. Lord Jin rose four days ago. The news has already reached the capital. Tomorrow at the latest, the day after tomorrow in Xuanwu, will arrive government messenger from the capital. The town governor. The servant turned, but Liu Wu Yan carelessly gestured him away. Master Zhang Jin, what should we do next? Leaning slightly, the servant asked the pensive master. The banquet will continue until the news is authenticated. Wait, Zhang Jin replied without changing his posture. So the event continued in a tense atmosphere, with everyone sitting and looking at each other predatorily. The lingering hours flew by, reaching midnight. Mr. Lai Wenjin, do you think His Excellency Zhang Chong did not intervene because his keen eyes did not see anything? Asked an uncomfortable question, Shen Lan. Is that why you happily rushed over here? Mr. Lai Wenjin, you are the pride of Xuanwu. It was not easy for your parents to raise a talent but you were so disrespectful that you let your parents bury your child. Shen Lan continued his jabs. Shen Lan, what are you so proud of? Lai Wenjin shouted, unable to stand it. You only made an assumption. It cannot be true. When the truth comes out, you will be executed as an example to others. Because of you will be destroyed Suanmu County and the great legacy of the Jin family. Son-in-law, madam, we have an urgent message from the capital. He said as he bowed and a warrior came in. The lord of Nanu State, Shi Jin, intends to kill Princess Ning Lu and to eliminate the officials of the state of Yu. A cold sweat ran down Lai Wenchen's face. Shen Lang, stop making a spectacle. It will only make your crime worse. With a nervous chuckle, he declared. Mayor, an urgent message from the capital. Liu Wu Yan's trusted confidant reported as he appeared. The Lord of Nanu State has rebelled and is currently killing the officials of the State of Yu. The next one to run into the hall was Governor Zhang Chong's confidant. The second young lord, an urgent message from the capital, he could hardly breathe, said, Lord Jin of the Nanu State has risen. Lai Wenjin, terrified and feeling weak in the legs from the information collapsed, fell to the floor like a sack.
Lai Wenchen, I wrote down everything you said about your collusion with Lord Jin. Smiling with superiority, said Shen Lan. Father-in-law exposed you in the report during the meeting. You can already expect death. From this, Lai Wenchen's face twisted into an unnatural grimace and foam ran from his mouth. Anyone else? Exclaimed Shen Lan, a third absolute victory flashed through his mind. The invincible are always alone. Ah, people left without support are truly pathetic. Shen Lan continued his victory speech. What became of the second Jinchi? Or the inspector in the silver cassock? Couldn't kill with a borrowed sword. People of inferior origin part with their lives by making just one mistake, unlike me who had procured soft rice in advance. Brother Zhang Jin, a lot has happened today, and I have not yet had time to congratulate you on your engagement. Shen Lan addressed him. Even though I have already broken up with Kan Kin, even a one-night stand should take care of each other for a hundred days. I give you this gift, and I wish you to live in harmony. Jockishly, Shen Lan held out the book Wind and Moon in a limited color edition. You shouldn't discriminate against Kan Kin because she's second-hand, although her personal life is a bit of a mess, but she is still a good girl you should cherish. Shen Lan, I want to. Growled through her tears, Kan Kin. Thank you very much for the gift, Brother Shen Lan, Zhang Jin said with a smile. I apologize for such a welcome today. Is there anything else I need to do? Shen Lan asked. Like, is there anyone else who wants to hurt me? I'll just stand here and wait for you to make your move. Without waiting for an answer, Shen Lang took Jin Mulin under his arm and headed for the exit. Are you sure no one is going to hurt me? Turning around, Shen Lan interrogated. No one wants to attack me. Then I'll be on my way. Many people sighed in relief as Shen Lan left the hall. But then suddenly he looked out from around the corner. Doesn't anyone want to hurt me? Then I'm really leaving. Sneering, shouted Shen Lang. Aren't you done yet? Get out of here. Barely holding back her anger, Kanchen gritted her teeth. After the banquet, Shen Lang and the others returned to the county. By that time, it was almost four in the morning. However, Count and Countess Xuan Wu did not sleep. They had long ago received the news that Shen Lang won the banquet. My son is so good, you are unbelievable. The Countess greeted Shen Lang, gently taking his hand. When I heard about it, I was so frightened and happy. The Countess shared her emotions. It is the greatest blessing for the county that Jin Mulan married you. Shen Lan, son-in-law, that is you. Also positively greeted Shen Lan by Jin Mutsun. You want to know if another author of Wind and Moon was mentioned at the banquet today, and if anyone paid you a compliment? Shen Lan asked Jin Mutsong. Yes, yes. Jin Mutsong shook his head vigorously. No, not at all. Briefly replied Shen Lan. Why? Why? Jin Mutsun screamed, falling to his knees in frustration. I was the one who rewrote the whole book. Crying, he said. My arms were about to fall off. I did all the hard work, and I didn't even get praise. You are so beautiful and talented. Old teacher Lin stated admiringly. I knew my son-in-law was amazing. The countess added, you are praising me too much. Parried them, laughing Shen Lan. It was all a lie. You said they loved for their talent, not for their looks. Jin Mutsun resented aside. Liar, women are too superficial. Mr. Father-in-law, it is a pity that Zhang Chong could not be dragged into this today, said Shen Lan to the Count as he strolled around the courtyard. Zhang Chong is a formidable opponent, and defeating him is as difficult as climbing into the sky. The Count explained, I didn't trust you at all before, but I'm very glad that you've made it this far. Shen Lan, you did a good job today. Leave the rest to me and rest, the Count advised. Could. Without thinking, the son-in-law replied. The father-in-law wants to take advantage of the rebellion of the ruler of Jin to fight the sovereign. Decided Shen Lan, bidding farewell to the Count. Mother, let's go to bed. Shen Lan suggested, hugging Jin Mulan's frail shoulders, and she obediently followed her husband. Noon the next day. With a heavy groan, Wang Lying opened his eyes. Not recognizing the room, his consciousness gave a pulse, and he jumped up sharply on the bed. I? Where am I? Wait. This seems to be the secret residence my uncle left me. After calming down a bit, 
Wang Lion realized. My whole body hurts what happened yesterday. Wang Lion tried to remember, rubbing his face. Was I so drunk that I forgot everything? Fortunately, the pain is not sharp. It's nothing serious. Right, I remembered. Shen Lan is over. Cheered up, smiling Wang Lian. And the county of Xuan Wu too. I accused Shen Lan of stealing, and there's nothing he can do about it. Now I will become a member of the new politics faction when the boss and the others carelessly take care of me. I will definitely have no problem giving up Qin Shi. I will be on my way to the top. From the realization of success, Wang Lian laughed, but his joy was broken by the creaking door. Shen Lan, why are you here? Why are you still alive? Wang Lian was sincerely indignant when he saw his opponent. Wang Liang, how cruel you are. Decided to play along with Wang Liang's son-in-law. How dare you conspire with Zhang Jin? You have caused me so much suffering. Wretch, have you seen yourself in the mirror? For what merit did you marry Jin Mulin? Wang Lian asked, believing himself to be superior. The source of your troubles is your limitations. You are going to die anyway. All right, enough games. Changing his intonation, said Shen Lan. What other games? No, how did you find this place? Not understanding the message, shouted Wang Lan. Wang Lan, there is no man who lives well after mocking me. You can slander me for stealing poetry. I don't care, but you chose to slander my wife's reputation. Threateningly, Shen Lan reminded me. I originally planned to let you die in the most original way possible, but I didn't expect heaven to have better plans. Shen Lan, have you lost your mind? With a sly smile, Wang Lian said, You are already just waiting for death, and you still say such things. Mr. Wang Lian, why do you have teeth marks on your shin? Interrupted him Shen Lan. Maybe you were accidentally bitten by a rabid dog last night. It's not just your leg, you've been bitten in the neck as well. Complimented Shen Lan. Get out of the way. I need to see a doctor, wailed Wang Liang, jumping out of bed. But running out of the room, there was an unpleasant surprise waiting for him. What's going on? Why are the warriors of the county here? Bewildered by what he saw, Wang Liang. Master Wang Liang, have you really forgotten what you did last night? Shen Lang snidely asked. You said you gave Li Wu Yang, the mayor, a green hat, Shen Lan reminded me. I think I confessed to tampering and told the town manager. Little by little, a realization came to Wang Liang. Me, I'm finished. No one will worry about me anymore. I have become a stray dog. Li Wu Yan will definitely kill me. Wang Liang's eyes widened at such thoughts. I was going to kill you myself, but on the way you got bitten by two rabid dogs. Shen Lan explained. Perhaps this is heaven's punishment. Mr. Wang Lian, I am very angry with you for slandering my wife last night. Besides, you were drunk last night and felt no pain when the dogs bit you. So I'll let you indulge in some more memories. Shen Lan, let me out. I need to see a doctor. A doctor. Wang Lian thundered in hysterics. Close the door and let the dogs out. Commanded the warriors Shen Lan. What? What are you doing, Shen Lan? Wang Lian managed to exclaim before his voice was cut short by the growling of the huge dogs. The residents of the governor of Nujing County. Father, the dress rehearsal for the siege of Suanwu County at the banquet has failed. Please forgive me, father. Falling to his knees, the young man mouthed. Was it really a conspiracy? The governor thought about it. Zhang Chong had long ago discovered Shen Lang's acrostic, but his first reaction was not happiness. But a premonition of conspiracy. He sent three groups of men at once. The first to the governor general's residence, the second to the capital, and the third to the Nanyu kingdom. Zhang Chong asked several times whether the ruler of Jin really wanted to rebel, but he never received any information, so he decided to hand the sword to Lai Wenjing instead of going forward himself. Shen Lan, how did some, accepted in the house of his wife, knew about the plans of the ruler of Jin. Yes, and also instantly made the decision to hide a death trap in the book, almost making Zhang Jin fall into it. Tell me everything about last night, sternly demanded Governor Zhang Chong. Yes, father, answered the annoyed son. Zhang Jin told Zhang Chong in detail what happened last night. I suffered a total defeat last night and failed my father. Please punish me, Zhang Jin said in a husky voice. 
You were not wrong. You did well last night. Your enemy was too strong. Zhang Chong condescendingly replied to his son. Strong, strong. I haven't met such strong people for a long time. Zhang Chong spoke monotonously. Talent is worthless without wisdom, and wisdom without a ruthless heart. It's a pity that such a man ended up in Xuanmu County. If this guy had followed me, I'm sure I would have risen to the position of Chancellor within ten years. Assume Zhang Chong, taking one book from the shelf. Then should I think of a way to kill him? Zhang Jin suggested. How can you kill him? Zhang Chong was indignant. He's like a cunning fox. You won't even have a chance. By the way, he made his marriage with Jin Mulan. Did he sleep with her? According to inside sources, although the couple apparently live in harmony, they sleep in different rooms. The data was voiced by Zhang Jin. Call your sister Zhang Chunhua and tell her to find a way to get close to Shen Lan and sleep with him. Zhang Chong declared. What about Zhu Wenhua of the Viscounty of Lanshan? The son hastened to remind his father. They are not engaged to Chunhua. Women should always expect a better match. What's unusual about that? Zhang Chong explained. What is most valuable these days? Talent, Zhang Chong exclaimed. If we can get someone as talented as Shen Lang, who cares? Will we displease Viscount Zhu Lanting? Father, will we continue to besiege the county? Zhang Jin inquired. Of course we'll continue, but we have to hold off on that. Zhang Chong replied. Now that the ruler of Jin, who was the first to talk about the new policy, had rebelled, Zhang Chong assumed that Count Suan Wu would surely take the opportunity to send a letter to oppose the new policy. Zhang Chong concluded that Count Suan Wu's first report would be a request to the sovereign to condemn ruler Jin, which would surely be a slap in the face to the sovereign, but he could not refuse. Then Count Xuan Wu would file a second one, in which he would testify that Lai Wenjin had conspired with the ruler of Jin, and would ask for capital punishment. First of all, the Zhang family should focus on choosing a sovereign. If the sovereign executes Lai Wenjin, it will mean that the new policy is suspended. If not, it will continue and even become more intense. Doesn't the sovereign need to ease the conflict in the country when war breaks out? Zhang Jin asked. Why should he strengthen the new policy? What if the ruler issued a decree ordering the old nobles to move their troops to Nanyu to suppress the rebellion, because then it would completely deplete the private army? Zhang Chong pondered aloud. It's risky, but the ruler isn't without pieces on the board either, is he? In the meantime, two reports were prepared in Xuanwu County. The first report, submitted to the sovereign, would destroy the reputation of the ruler of Jin, making him look like a rebel and traitor. The second report would expose the inspector of the silver robe, Lai Wenjin, for his involvement in the rebellion of the ruler of Jin and ask for the imposition of capital punishment. Father-in-law, if the sovereign executes Lai Wenjin, it will mean that the new policy will end, but if not, it will continue or even intensify and the sovereign will surely promote it in an even more brutal way. Shen Lan explained in a serious voice to the Count. Father-in-law, do you really want to send him? It might be against the sovereign's plans, Shen Lan cautioned. Let's send it. After a pause, the Count confidently said, This heritage was created by my Jin ancestors, not bestowed by the Ning family, so why would he want to take it away? The Count said angrily, I, Jin Zuo, may not be capable of much, but I am not a coward. Although his father-in-law is usually conservative and calm, but if things go badly, he is even ready to oppose the sovereign. Thought about the likely moves Count Shen Lan. In this situation, if you show weakness only faster to die, father-in-law is right. Don't worry, father-in-law, I have a backup plan. And that plan will be a brutal blow. Governor Zhang Chong's office. Have you read this book? Zhang Chong turned to his daughter and handed her a dark-covered book. Ten times, I can tell it by heart. Lying on the couch, Zhang Chun Wat replied flamboyantly. Father, why don't I read you a passage to dispel your longing? You don't read good poems, but you read such things, you promiscuous girl. Outrageous. Zhang Chong was indignant, slamming the book on his daughter's head. Father, don't you know me? I'm always a model noble lady in front of strangers, the number one modesty. The author of this book, Shen Lan, have you heard of him? Zhang Chong asked. 
I am already friends with him in absentia, in books, and in dreams. Playfully, my daughter replied. I need you to do something for your father. Get close to Shen Lan. Zhang Chong voiced his idea. And if the opportunity arises, win him over to my side. He and Jin Mulan have not yet consummated their marriage, and he is still a lowly son-in-law. Father, will I finally have to marry that scum Zhu Wenhua? Zhang Chunhua said enthusiastically. Let me seduce Shen Lan, that's what I'm good at. I'm going right now. Wait, Zhang Chong told her daughter off. This is a serious matter. If the opportunity arises, you will have to seize it quickly and grasp it firmly. Father, don't worry. Licking her lips, the daughter replied. You're good at politics and I'm good at seducing men. Here, father, eat an orange. Zhang Chunhua held out a slice. No, Zhang Chong tried to refuse, but her daughter insistently put a slice of orange in her father's mouth. Oh, I almost forgot. I just cleaned up dog shit with these hands. Laughing, Zhang Chunhua said. Go already, her father barked at her. After the engagement of the Zhang family, Suan Wu City was especially quiet. Everyone was waiting for the sovereign's will. And Shen Lan, too, was seized by a rare moment of rest. How boring, said Shen Lan, lying on the bed. The son-in-law, Governor Zhang Chong's daughter, Mrs. Zhang Chunhua, arrived for a visit. A servant broke the peace with unusual news. Wife, I don't know any Zhang Chunhua. I have nothing to do with her. Your husband is innocent. Shen Lan began to make excuses. She is Zhang Chong's daughter, Milan explained, the most beautiful girl in New Jing County. It's all embellished. Wife, all these first beauties are all embellishments. They are all fakes. Only two real ones, massaging Mulan's shoulders, Shen Lan said. First of all, I am the most beautiful man in the world. We mortals cannot resist this, and it saddens me that I am still so young and have to endure this kind of pressure. And then my wife with the most beautiful waist. You're number one. That's definitely not an embellishment. Giving a compliment, Shen Lan said. Wife, just the sight of your thin waist already makes me lose my mind. So what else do you have to worry about? Asked Shen Lan to his blushing wife. In my heart and in my eyes will always be only you. I swear, even in my deepest dreams, you are the only one, and the only name I say is yours. Okay, I get it said Milan, covering her spouse's mouth, and Shen Lan, in turn, kissed his spouse's hand. Let's go. Let's go meet this first beauty. Heading toward the exit, Milan declared, All right, dear wife. Shen Lan hurried after her. Zhang Chong, are you really going to catch me by bait? Dream on, thought Shen Lan, figuring out Zhang Chong's devious plan. A few moments later, the couple entered the room where the guest was waiting. It's her. Shen Lan was surprised at the appearance of the guest. Is this the Shen Lan? Zhang Chunhua thought as she saw her target. He is even more beautiful than in the stories. Sis, we haven't seen each other for over a year, have we? The guest turned to Mulan, taking her hands in greeting. When we met last year, I was a little ashamed of myself. My heart was racing and I didn't dare to come near you. Then why did you come today? Melancholy asked Mulan, and you came all the way here. And you asked for an audience with my husband? Oh, the servants must have misunderstood. Twisting her arm, Zhang Chunhua replied. I said that I asked to meet with the young gentleman of Shen. I can't put my sister's name in front. Wouldn't that seem impolite? I recently received a bottle of a good product, a guest boasted. A fragrance extracted from the snow lotus of the ice mountain. It is very rare. For me to use it would be a waste of such value. After thinking about it, I decided that only Sister Mulan was worthy of it, so I brought it to you. Oh, did you? Mulan asked incredulously. Mulan then kindly recalled her old friendship with John Chunhua. Mulan was clearly uncomfortable making small talk with a famous beauty. While Zhang Chunhua, observing the rules of etiquette, handled every word and gesture with ease. In terms of looks, both girls are equally attractive. Mulan, however, has the best figure. If you compare the charms, Mulan is slightly inferior, thought Shen Lan. Strangely, the guest didn't say a word to me, didn't even look at me. Maybe this fox isn't here as bait. Miss Zhang, do you need anything else? 
Tired of the conversation, Mulan asked, hinting unequivocally at the end of her visit. Nothing, I just missed my sister, so I came to visit, I'll go. Bowing, Zhang Chunhua said. By the way, sister, I recently wrote a poem. The guest boasted. Please help me judge it, but don't laugh if it's bad. I don't know anything about poetry, Mulan replied. I wrote it thoughtlessly, I will read it to you. Zhang Chong's daughter continued to insist. Read it if you like. Mulan indifferently agreed. I come north to watch the drizzling rain and return to mourn the smooth moon in the sky. We are separated by the shadows at use, and the jade pillow serves to separate us. At night I bore by the crossed halberds, but I bypass the gallery and fall asleep alone. The past is but an empty memory. My soul returns to the desert bridge and my body to the spring. Sister, what do you think? When she finished reading, Zhang Chunhua asked. I didn't really understand it, but I don't think it's a bad thing. As kindly as possible, Mulan said. Thank you for your praise, then I'll take my leave. When I have time, I'll visit my sister again. Zhang Chunhua promised. Why did you read such a chaotic poem? On reflection, Mulan asked. An acrostic? Shen Lan thought. With a little play with the words, Shen Lan unraveled the hidden meaning of the verse. I invite you to meet me on the covered bridge after midnight. Zhang Chunhua's manners were magnificent. Her appearance was perfect, long silky hair, a waist that was not inferior to that of Jin Mulan, slightly squinting eyes that gave away her cunning and ruthless nature. Admiring them both, Shen Lan unwittingly noted for himself that the governor's daughter is much more charming and attractive than his own wife. Zhang Chunhua's influence on the young man was so great that Shen Lan hesitated for a few seconds, although before meeting her, he had sworn to Jin Mulan that there was no person in the world who could please him as much as she did. The verse read by Zhang Chunhua during the audience with the young lords of Xuanmu was nothing but a secret invitation to a meeting. Jin Mulan, disturbed by the competitor, might not have noticed the original meaning, but Shen Lan understood it quite clearly. The dreaded hour that Zhang Chunhua was talking about definitely had to happen between 1 and 3 in the morning. The covered bridge is not far away, 5 kilometers, perhaps even a little less. In the dark, plus in high winds and at this hour, the appointed place was perfect for a couple of cheaters to meet and go unnoticed. The thoughts of treason Shen Lan decided to chase away. Zhang Chunhua abruptly appeared in the young family's life could be the very real trap sent by the governor to harm the lord and the entire Xuanwu dynasty. Besides, Jin Mulan was the most influential girl in the city, and Shen Lan loved her very much. During the time that husband and wife spent together, Shen Lan was finally convinced that Jin Mulan and her family were the only people in the city who cared about him. To betray them would be like betraying himself. That was exactly what Shen Mulan thought. But after all, at this moment he had not yet betrayed his wife, he had just given it some thought. Shen Lan assured himself that even if he went crazy, he still wouldn't have the strength to cheat on his beloved Jin Mulan. Even if he embraced the governor's daughter, and even if he kissed her, the young lord would still remain faithful to his wife. Before the meeting on the covered bridge was a few hours, Shen Lan only knew one thing. It was necessary to meet with a seductive vixen, to personally shake out of her all the insidious plans for the Xuan Wu dynasty. Shen Lan had no doubt at all that he would be able to withstand Zhang Chunwu's charms. The guy had seen thousands of beautiful people, and no one he liked more than his beautiful wife, who also had great power in this city. Shen Lan rewrote the acrostic, and without wasting a moment of precious time, went to his wife's office. Jin Mulan was already waiting for her husband. She could not guess at once about the secret message, but then the girl had enough time to think over the words spoken by his sister. Shen Lan put a piece of paper with neatly written hieroglyphs on the table. He explained to Jin Mulan that it was an acrostic. The governor's daughter invites young master Xuan Wu for a midnight rendezvous near the covered bridge. Shen Lan, troubled by thoughts of adultery, decides to repent to his wife as soon as possible. Mr. Xuanmu convinced Jin Mulan that in the future it would be necessary to immediately draw personal boundaries with such intrusive women who are only trying to destroy the marital happiness of honest people. By Jin Mulan's indifferent reaction, 
Shen Lan immediately guessed that his wife had known everything for a long time. Jin Mulan, even in this situation, showed her best qualities, resourcefulness and intelligence. For Shen Lang, it was another test, and it seems that he passed it. Young Master Xuan Wu tensely exhaled, not knowing what to expect from his wife, who at this moment was testing his strength. Shen Lan, unable to wait any longer for Jin Mulan's decision, asked directly if she thought he was to blame. The girl was sure that if Shen Lan hadn't thought of the governor's daughter, he wouldn't have rewritten the acrostic in which Zhang Chunhua had asked him out. Jin Mulan laughed at her gullible husband. She didn't blame him in the slightest for thinking of the governor's daughter. Shen Lan passed the fidelity test, but the question of the night date on the hidden bridge was still unresolved. There was no doubt that the meeting with Zhang Chunhua was a trap. The people in Xuanwu City, who knew Shen Lan as a mere fool, were jealous of his new position, and tried to harm him in every way possible. The young lord, even at home, had to always remain careful. One mistake, and his whole family and himself, would be in serious trouble. Meanwhile, in the old house of the Zhang family, the governor's daughter was looking at a book without worrying about anything. Mrs. Zhang's maid did not understand why the girl was so stubbornly refusing to prepare for the meeting. Zhang Chunhua explained, Shen Lan will be smart enough not to come to the covered bridge at midnight, and if he did decide to cheat, she would despise him for the rest of her life. In any case, this meeting was not meant to take place. Zhang Chunhua just wanted to tease young master Xuanwu to test him, and at the same time, let Jin Mulan know that she was going to steal her man. The governor's daughter wanted to make Jin Mulan angry with her and her husband. Zhang Chunhua, having once encountered Jin Mulan's straightforwardness, expected to piss her off in this situation as well. Although Shen Lan's date with Zhang Chunhua did not take place, young master Xuan Wu still received wonderful news. His best and only friend Da She was finally back. This guy was very strong. Within half a month, he had healed from serious injuries sustained from the sharp claws of a tiger. In just a month, the Shea was able to mend his broken bones, but because of the stress he suffered, he still fell into a coma and only recently came out of it. The aftermath of those terrible days that Da Shea spent heroically on the mountain pass near the remote mountains left an indelible impression on him, but despite all the difficulties, he did not lose his optimism and sought a meeting with Shen Lan. Even when Dashi's life hung in the balance, he only worried about how his other fool would cope with the bullying of the village boys. Shen Lan could not hide his joy. Together with his wife, he immediately went to the healer where he had left his friend. The sage did not deceive, he managed to bring Dasha back to his former life, although the guy now looked much happier than when he lived with his family. Dashi's family did not appreciate him. To his stepmother and father, he was not a desirable son but a slave who could lead an unpretentious life and do several people's jobs at once. Of all the people around him, only his only friend Shen Lan cared about Dashi. Dashi was glad to see Shen Lan. After the boy regained consciousness, he immediately began to ask the healer how Shen Lan was doing now. If Dasha had heard that Shen Lan's life was in danger, he would certainly fall back into a coma and would be unlikely to come out of it. Fortunately, Shen Lan lived a relatively peaceful life and could fend for himself. The healer convinced Da She that there was nothing to worry about and to give him strength, the wise man told him about the imminent arrival of Shen Lan. A lot of time had passed and the friends had a lot to discuss. Da She old memory called Shen Lan the second fool, which upset him a little. Young Master Xuan Mu made several attempts to retrain his friend, but Da She remained adamant. He promised Shen Lan each time to remember his new title, but instead he called him the second fool again. Jin Mulan, watching the reunion of old friends, tried to hold back laughter. She had never seen anything funnier or more touching than this moment recently. Unlike his wife, Shen Lan was slowly beginning to lose patience. He was not offended by Da Shi, he just felt uncomfortable in front of his wife. He had done too much in this world, both bad and good. But to wear the title of second fool, Shen Lan certainly couldn't take it anymore. He had already proved many times to everyone in this and other cities that his knowledge and skills were enough to pass for a very smart person, and only to Da Shi, he was still the same little fool who had to be constantly protected from the cruel boys.
Jim Mullen walked closer to the big man's bed, so that he could hear her for sure. From this day on, he will have to live in this house. After his full recovery, Da She will help the local healer whenever possible, and Shen Lan will visit him regularly. No matter what high title the young lord might have, he would still appreciate the friendship that had saved his life more than once. Dashi looked uncertainly at Jin Mulin. Where is his family now, and why can't he live with his kin? Neither Jin Mulin nor Shen Lan could tell the truth to the big man with the wounded soul. If Dasha found out about that cruel treatment, he would surely be disappointed in people, maybe in his old friend too. Jin Mulin explained to Dasha that his younger brother had gone on a long journey, his father was injured and was nearby, and his stepmother was with him. The girl told the big man that Shen Lan especially needs his support right now. Too many people want to hurt him, and only he, Dasha, can protect his best and only friend. At first, Dasha didn't want to stay in a stranger's house and help a stranger, but when he heard that Shen Lan was in trouble, he abruptly changed his mind. Dasha burst into a rage. His face was filled with crimson paint, and the big man didn't hold back all those horrible words that were now flying towards Shen Lan's abusers. Even now, Shen Lan did not quite understand why Dasha had been so kind to him since he was a child. In fact, the reason was very simple. It was all because Shen Lan, who was weak-minded at the time, gave Dasha a piece of sugar. No one had given Dasha any sweets since he was a child, and no one but Shen Lan wanted to play with him. When Dasha heard that he had to protect Shen Lan, he became unusually obedient and stayed in the county. After a few minutes, Shen Lan and Jin Mulan left Dashi's quarters to let him rest. Jin Mulan suspected that the big man had an innate talent for the study of martial arts skills, so the girl was going to personally examine Dashi's bones and muscles. Shen Lan was not against it. He himself had noticed Dashi's peculiar physique and his incredible ability to recover quickly more than once. Surely all these features of his body would open the way for Dashi to master the martial arts. Shen Lan also wanted to possess abilities like the protagonist, so he too was going to explore his body. The young master had no doubt that the abilities he found would be the same as those of heroes who were born once every hundred years and made history. Shen Lan sat at his desk and was bored. All his thoughts were occupied with dreams of new abilities and the governor's decree. Suddenly, the young master heard the sound of water. Jin Mulan was taking a bath, and Shen Lan immediately wanted to join her. But he immediately pushed the thought away. He was a grown man, and if Jin Mulan caught him doing this, his reputation would be lower than that of bandits and dark cassock. Not fifteen minutes later, Shen Lan was already climbing the walls of the shower room. He had found the perfect excuse for his action, in his opinion. If Jin Mulan still manages to catch him doing this, Shen Lang will say that he simply decided to read a book under the moon. The young master was sitting at the top of the wall and covered his face with the first book he could find. The lad's heart sank, and then the voice of the guard sounded. The long-awaited decree of the sovereign had arrived. Out of surprise, Shen Lan dropped the book, and the manuscript fell right under Jin Mulan's feet. Shen Lan already felt his end. Jin Mulan is not capable of forgiving even the smallest pranks, and such a serious act she would definitely not leave without attention. Shen Lan did not have time to leave the scene, so all the anger of Jin Mulan immediately fell on him. Gathering his strength, the young lord went to meet his late guests. The sovereign's decree could not wait until tomorrow. In the reception rooms of the county, the ambassador was already waiting for Jin Mulan and Shen Lan. The king issued a decree, and the young gentlemen were in no hurry to make a decision, and thus forced the esteemed ambassador to wait. Shen Lan needed to delay the moment of reading the decree, so he politely offered the ambassador a freshly brewed tea infusion. At the same moment, Shen Lang gently handed the ambassador a huge bag full of unknown stuffing. Taking the gift in his hands, the ambassador immediately weighed it in his hands. There seemed to be a great many gold coins in it. The ambassador only laughed at the naivety of the young lord. Even such a huge sum of money has not yet provided anyone with proper security, much less protect a second fool. The sovereign's decree sounded, and Jin Mulan and Shen Lan knelt respectfully.
The sovereign decreed that Shen Lan should receive a place in the higher academy for his expose of Shijin's rebellion. Eavesdropping outside the door, old master Xuan Mu was stunned, and Jin Mulin found no room for the accumulating rage. The higher academy is a place for those who cannot pass the imperial examinations, underachievers, but want to acquire merit. The higher academy was originally intended for the nobility, but wealthy merchants began to use connections to send their children to the academy, which caused discontent among countless nobles. Since it was impossible to ignore the enormous profits derived from the children of merchants seeking wealth and fame, the state academy was opened, and nobles began to enroll there. After that, the high academy became a place where all sorts of fops from rich families could get their diplomas. Now the high academy is the least respected institution. Shen Lan and Count Xuan Wu not only saved the life of Princess Ning Luo, but also uncovered the conspiracy of the ruler of Jin in advance. But Shen Lan received the status of a student of the higher academy, which was a strong slap in the face to the County Xuan Wu, and also had to bow in gratitude. The ex Xuan Wu family didn't have much time left, maybe another five or six days that could be spent in complete peace. Shen Lang was not going to put up with the insulting title of a higher academy student, so he was going to do everything possible to obtain a place in the state academy. But as soon as the young master began his tirade about future exploits, Jin Mulan and his father stealthily withdrew from the chambers. Though they loved Shen Lan, it was impossible to listen to his eternal self-loving tales. The next night, Shen Lan made his way outside the main palace and was going to finish the work he had started earlier. Today, Jin Mulan once again went to the women's quarters to take a shower. This time, Shen Lan prepared himself much better than the last time. He was worried about his face, which was the main reason for the decrease in reputation in case of failure. Shen Lan covered half of his face with a black non-reflective blindfold. In his opinion, it was the best way to avoid unnecessary eyes. Except he didn't know that the dark blindfold would draw even more attention to him than it would without it. A few minutes later, Shen Lan was already standing by the walls of the shower room. He stealthily crept up to the window frame and was already anticipating seeing his wife. Shen Lan acknowledged his past bad trip. Still, reading a book under the moon was not the best decision. No sane person would read a manuscript in the pitch dark. Shen Liang concluded that in such a situation, he needed to attend to more appropriate things for his situation. Jim Yulin was not to be found on the first floor, but the young master did not give up hope of seeing his wife. He got a ladder within moments and was already climbing up to the second floor. There was only a little climb left to peer through the window of the shower room. Shen Lan was not known for his outstanding physical fitness. Many of the yard people even said that his abilities were in order of magnitude lower than that of an ordinary man of his age. And that incident with the horse, which the guards had been telling each other for days, only confirmed it. Shen Lang really put a lot of effort just to admire his wife for a few minutes. Only he was unlucky this time, too. Shen Lan's second attempt to spy on his wife failed just like the first. The windows to the shower chambers were covered with thick curtains, behind which it was impossible to see anything. Shen Lan jabbed his nose into the window frame, but this action did nothing for him either. Then the young lord diligently rubbed his eyes. Even so, dense curtains prevented the young lord from peering into his wife's chambers. Shen Lan was infinitely angry with Jin Mulan. He had made too difficult a journey to her chambers, and now he would have to go back without reaching his goal. Early the next morning, when the young family gathered together at the table, Shen La could not stand it and reproached his wife that she discriminated against him just because he was from a low class. Shen Lan did not relent. It seemed to him that the reason for their estranged relationship was his low social status and the nickname of the second fool. Shen Lan reminded the girl that she swore to love him regardless of external circumstances. Jim Yulin looked at her husband in surprise. She did not understand what had caused such inappropriate behavior at the morning table. Shen Lan had never raised his voice to his wife until this moment, and now he was just demanding her to apologize for something that was not her fault. Jin Mulan truly loved her husband. Dozens of men came to see her, but she chose only one, Shen Lan. She did not need a degree, nor wealth, nor the title of the highest family.
Even as a renowned warrior, Jin Mulin never required Shen Lan to excel in martial prowess. She gave her husband freedom and choice, and never stopped loving him. Jin Mulin tried to find out what caused this morning scandal. The girl did not deny in the slightest that somewhere she had not behaved carefully enough toward Shen Lan. Perhaps she was the cause of the misunderstanding, but Shen Lang couldn't explain anything specifically. He only looked at Jin Mulin disgruntledly, trying to find the strength to say something. The girl once again confessed her love to the young master, hoping thus to instill in him a little confidence, and it worked. Shen Lan blurted out that the reason for their conflict was that Jin Mulin constantly drapes the curtains and hides from him. Young Master Xuan Wu rebuked his wife for the complete lack of trust in their relationship. If they can't trust each other in such simple things, what will they do if the young family is faced with a real problem? Jin Mulin immediately understood what Shen Lan wanted from her and suggested that he play six kinds of wild birds. The young lord had nowhere else to go, and he accepted his punishment with dignity. A few days later, the results of the Da Shi test finally became known. First-generation martial arts master John Chu Qi, Jin Mulin's teacher, had traveled a long way to Xuanwu County to conduct the Da Shi test. John Chu Qi was one of the six great martial arts masters of the state of Yu. He was pleasantly surprised by the results of his new apprentice, and called Diasha, nothing short of a martial arts genius. Such talent was impossible to meet even once in a thousand years. Jun Chu Qi admitted that Dasha had surpassed his abilities and was far more talented than Jin Mulan. Encouraged Shen Lan rushed to ask Master Zhang Chu Qi and about his incredible abilities, which can be found only once in a thousand years. After giving the young master a distrustful and somewhat contemptuous look, Master Jin Mulan replied to the young man that it was simply impossible. The young master definitely had no chance of becoming a martial arts master, but Shen Lang was not discouraged. He was sure that his skills and knowledge were so great that even one of the six great martial arts mages of the state of Yu could not fully appreciate them. That evening, Shen Lang, whom Jin Mulan tormented during the day playing six kinds of wild birds, felt that his whole body ached to the point of breaking, but fortunately, the girl had already prepared a healing bath for her husband. The healing potion had a truly magical effect, and Shen Lan, after sleeping through the night, surprisingly revived and was able to move freely again. Thus he was born with a certain illusion that he not only possessed impressive martial arts, but also an incredible ability to heal. Shen Lan immediately wanted to start training. He was going to surpass his incredible wife in martial abilities and make her feel the same pain that he himself felt after each of their games. But to tell his true purpose of training, Shen Lan could not, so he referred to the fact that he wanted to protect his father-in-law and the ex one Wu dynasty. The young master's demands were quite simple. He was going to train for an hour every day and not try too hard, so that within a year he could defeat some strong enemy. Jin Mulan thought that the powerful enemy that Shen Lan was talking about was herself, but the young master assured her that this was absolutely not the case. The main reason Shen Lan wanted to practice martial arts was because the great master had told her about the unfathomable talent possessed by the great son-in-law of the ex Wu dynasty. The young master's talent was so great that even the most experienced of the six mages could not fully see it. With this amusing fact, Shen Lan was going to surprise his wife. After all, only an exceptional martial arts genius would remain forever incomprehensible to a magnificent master. So, Shen Lan must be a martial arts super genius if Mulan would teach him for an hour every day. For other people, it would be comparable to three years of training. Jin Mulan respected her husband's decision, but already knew in advance that Shen Lan's fighting spirit would not last long. An hour later, Shen Lan was lying unconscious on the ground. One hour of light training was enough to rob the martial arts super genius of all vitality. Jin Mulan asked her husband to get up. The break was long over, and he was still trying to snatch his last moments of peace. Taking martial arts classes was very tiring, boring, and painful for Shen Lan. It takes a whole hour just to get into a rider's stance and not get killed. The young master had no more strength to endure bullying. Shen Lan could find no other appropriate word for training. Gathering his remaining strength, 
The young lord rose sharply and headed in the direction of the palace, explaining to his wife at the same time that he had completely forgotten about the meeting with Dasha, to which he should appear in a matter of minutes. Jin Mulan smirked as she escorted the incredible martial arts talent to rest. Only ten days passed, but for Wen Zheng, each one was a year long, surrounded by a boundless sea of fear. And now, at last, the king's decree had arrived. It was this edict, read any minute now, that would finally decide this man's future life. The royal ambassador read the sovereign's decree in front of the kneeling prisoner. Wen Zheng looked exhausted. The man was hanging on with the last of his strength as he listened to his final verdict. The sovereign ordered Lai Wenzhen to be punished by withholding a year's salary as an admonition to others for his profligacy and indecent behavior. The frightened Wenzhen expected a harsher punishment, so he sighed in relief when the guards undid the shackles around his neck. The man couldn't believe his happiness. It wasn't even the punishment of three glasses of wine. He had simply lost his wages for a year. Did the emperor really appreciate him so much that he could not kill him even in this situation? Lai Wenzheng took the outcome of the case as a divine sign and decided that he was now allowed to prosper, develop and hold a high and powerful position. The royal ambassador once again congratulated the prisoner on his mild punishment. The emperor truly valued his men, so Lai Wenzheng began to bow back. Even smashed to pieces, he would never be able to repay even a little for such a mercy of the sovereign. Everyone congratulated Mr. Lai Wenzhen. He had indeed turned out to be the kind of person that Sovereign Yu himself had noticed and remembered. Now that Lai Wenzhen was free, he would immediately try to take revenge on Count Suan Wu and his daughter Jin Mulan, and with them, Shen Lan would come to an end. In the evening, no one in Xuanwu County could find peace. Old Master Xuanwu was the most worried. Unable to restrain himself, the man smashed everything he could get his hands on. The first object that felt the full force of the old count was the desk. Lai Wenzhen not only did not die, but also did not lose his position of merit, but the emperor embarrassed Shen Lan by giving him the rank of student of the higher academy. The old count understood that the emperor could not wait to deprive the entire Jin family of its heritage. It was the legacy of all the ancestors, not what the Ning clan had bestowed upon them. Old Master Jin went into an even greater frenzy when he realized that his ancestors had done too much good for the Ning clan. Now, the descendants of this family thanked the Xuan Wu dynasty countless piles of problems that could erase this glorious family from the memory of thousands of people forever. Shen Lan asked his father-in-law to be patient. This was not the time to panic, and it was certainly not the time for revenge. Shen Lan had become a student of the higher academy, and therefore one could guess the emperor's true intentions in advance. Old Master Jin was looking for an answer to his main question. He was now trying his best to preserve his ancestral heritage. Shen Lan had no doubt that Count Suan Wu could not only preserve the memory of the heroic past of the Jin family, but also pass it on to the next generations. Shen Lan suggested Count to look at the situation as a whole, and not try to solve some individual petty troubles, which would lead nowhere. It was necessary to prepare little by little for Lai Wenzheng to turn into a rabid dog that would come running and bite the Count. One could not wait and count on the Emperor's favor. Just as hundreds of years ago, the Exuan Wu dynasty would have to defend its right to exist alone. Both Shen Lan and Old Master Jin understood that it was necessary to destroy the hated Lai Wenzhen as soon as possible. To himself, the young master had already imagined how he would deal with the undesirable man. At stake was not only the future of Shen Lan and his new family, but the entire millennial history of the Xuan Wu dynasty's opposition to the outside world. Shen Liang and his father-in-law's musings were interrupted by a servant who unceremoniously burst into the chambers. The man had a good reason for this. The inspector in the silver robe was leading his troops directly to the main palace of the Xuan Wu dynasty to make an arrest. Old Master Jin did not understand how, after hours at large, Lai Wenzhen dared to lead his troops directly to his house to arrest a family member. Perhaps Lai Wenzhen's troops were going to the main palace specifically for Shen Lan. Old Lord Xuanwu, 
receiving unpleasant news from his faithful servant, immediately ordered to gather all the guards and go to the main gate of the county of Xuanwu. Lai Wenzhen, proudly sitting on a horse in a new robe, granted by the emperor, was already waiting for old Lord Xuanmu along with his army of exemplary soldiers. The forces were unequal. Lai Wenzhen, enlisting the support of the most influential person in the state, the emperor, in a short time had assembled an army, which now posed a threat to the less trained palace guards of the Xuanwu dynasty. Lai Wenzhen announced with undisguised pride that he had arrived at the Jin family estate solely to carry out an arrest approved by the emperor himself. The old count of Xuanwu had assumed that the troops had come for his son-in-law, Shen Lan, but Lai Wenzhen's subsequent words shocked the man. The troops assembled by the emperor came for Jin Mulin, but Jin Mulin did not commit any crime. The inspector decided to simply make war between the emperor and the Xuanwu dynasty. Confused Lai Wenzhen did not think of anything better than to accuse the daughter of an old count of killing civilians. At the main gate of Xuanwu County, a whole crowd crowded together. All the residents of the county and neighboring villages fied with one another to demand that the arrest be stopped. They accused Lai Wenzhen of an unfair accusation, because Xuanwu County loved their people more than anyone else. They could not just hurt the people of their city. Lai Wenzhen understood that things were not in his favor, but he could not stop. The cavalry under the command of Jin Mulin disregarded the law and rode on horseback in the peaceful streets, 13 residents were injured and five were run over to death. As an inspector in a silver cassock, Lai Wenzhen toured the lands of the Celestial Empire on behalf of the Sovereign, and when he sees such atrocities, he is simply obligated to intervene. Lai Wenzhen demanded to immediately bring the victims and put their strangled bodies right in front of the main gate of Xuanwu County. Shen Lan directly understood that Lai Wenzhen and his men were ruthless animals who were using real commoners to frame the Jin family. Mulin could no longer listen to baseless accusations. She demanded her cavalry to prove to everyone once and for all that her men were not to blame for what they had done. Lai Wenzhen triumphantly announced that the cavalry had already been arrested by Yanshan's Thousandth Army, one of the three thousandths of Xuanwu County. The rampaging soldiers, that was how Lai Wenzhen referred to the cavalry, or insane people who trampled on innocent citizens in the streets of their towns. Lai Wenzhen promised that as soon as he reported what had happened to the governor general, the entire cavalry, along with its leader, would be sentenced to death. The county's cavalry is very cautious. Even with her filigree skills, Lai Wenzhen tried to fake damage once for compensation, but in contrast he only suffered minor injuries. The cavalry unit simply could not injure so many people and run over several more to death. Lai Wenzhen was confident in his evidence. After all, there is nothing more convincing than a dozen depressed people now lying at the main gate of Xuanwu County. Commander Jin Mulin was not supposed to do anything by herself, only obey Lai Wenzheng's commands. If she did not go to explain herself right away, the Yanshan office would see it as an attempt to evade responsibility and use torture interrogation. They will be especially cruel to the chief assistant Jin Mulin. Jin Jian grew up in the county and was the most loyal of the family warlords. She was excellent in martial arts, but was very shy and blushed every time she saw Shen Lan. Such a pretty woman warlord had fallen into the hands of the enemy, and if she was not rescued in time, the consequences would be unpredictable. And Jin Mulan loved warriors like her children, besides, Jianian was like her sister, so she had to go to save her people by all means, even if the enemy would be the governor himself. But Jin Mulin was not alone. Shen Lan would never let anyone hurt his wife, so he decided to take the situation completely into his own hands. Lai Wenzhen laughed at the courage of the young master. Shen Lan was not afraid of the anger of the man in front of him, not afraid of the anger of the governor, the military leaders, the emperor. Lai Wenzhen asked Shen Lan not to act like a clown, which can be easily laughed at, and reminded him of the ancient proverb. You can't beat a curse with a whip or break a stone with an egg. Both of these phrases are very appropriate to the situation. 
Everything is useless, and absolute power is able to crush all the conspiracies of this world, because these conspiracies are the work of the supreme authorities themselves, and it would cost them nothing to eliminate them just as they were appearing. But Shen Lan didn't stop. He made a face, full of horror and sorrow, and ordered Lai Wensheng to get out of here immediately and take his men away, for they were coming for all of them soon. Six hours ago, they had already entered the county town of Nujing and followed Lai Wensheng directly to the governor's residence, but did not reach what they wanted. Now they were approaching the city of Xuanwu. Shen Lan asked the man with the army to leave as soon as possible. Lai Wenzhen called Shen Lan a fool, for no one in this state could pass against him now. Lai Wenzhen, along with his troops, was completely under the protection of the most powerful man in this state, Emperor Yu. No one could kill the man as long as the sovereign held him in such high esteem, nor could anyone touch the army that the emperor had personally entrusted to Lai Wenzhen. The man decided to share his secret publicly. The eunuch who conveyed the decree personally visited Lai Wenzheng's home and gave his parents a sum of money equal to three years of his salary. The emperor deprived Lai Wenzheng of his annual salary, but instead gave his family an amount equal to three years of a man's salary. Such an act once again proved that the emperor was favorable to Lai Wenzheng, which meant that this insolent man had an advantage over all other, though honest, people. Of course, Lai Wenzhen couldn't just kill Shen Lan, but the Xuanwu County had irrevocably lost its former power, because now they were dissatisfied with the emperor himself. Although Shen Lan was a thousand miles away from the capital of the kingdom, but this did not prevent him to apply the long-prepared cunning and change the course of history. Lai Wenzhen, losing control of the situation, demanded to lead Jin Mulan to the crew. But then the unexpected happened. Both the guards and Lai Wenzhen's army slowly parted and led a man riding a horse through. It was a high Shui order master, a henchman of the sovereign who receives orders directly and does not belong to any existing department at the moment. Lai Wenzhen froze. There was a twinkle in his eyes that did not bode well. The atmosphere was tense. Lai Wenzhen, who was already in a difficult situation, understood that perhaps now he would finally lose his previously earned wealth and honors. The sovereign's henchmen had yet to bribe anyone. This unemotional master of orders knew only one person whose demands could be put into action. If Lai Wenzhen now made even one more mistake, the emperor himself would immediately find out about it and deprive the man of his favor. The people Shen Lan was talking about had indeed changed their original route and arrived at the main palace of the Xuanwu dynasty. Lai Wenzheng had nothing more to lose, so he decided to finally destroy all the members of the Jin family. Lai Wenzhen thanked the master of the order and his men for arriving on time. The Xuanwu County cavalrymen had gone completely wild and crushed many people in Xuanwu City. Commander Jin Mulin was responsible for the damage, but refused to cooperate with the people sent to her house by the emperor himself. Master of the Order Hai Shui demanded that Lai Wenzhen immediately disband his men. A few minutes later, the master of the Order Hai Shui was already apologizing to the injured party. Old Count Jin respectfully accepted the apology from the emperor's henchmen and pretended that nothing had happened. Lai Wenzhen demanded the immediate arrest of Lady Jin Mulan along with her father and husband, but along with the execution of the man's request, Master Hai Shui announced that Lai Wenzhen was sentenced to death by a thousand cuts. Lai Wenzhen was hysterical. He did not understand how he, the emperor's own favorite, could be sentenced to death. Lai Wenzhen lashed out at the guards who had arrived with Master Hai Shui's order. Even though the emperor's henchmen had given him the death sentence, Lai Wenzhen couldn't believe the reality of what was happening. Only today he had been released, after a gruesome ten days spent in a cell for prisoners of the city government. The king could not change his mind overnight, so the guards, with no hesitation in their actions, dragged the screaming man straight to the place of his scheduled execution. As he left, Lai Wenzhen once again blamed Shen Lan for all his misfortunes. More than half a month ago, Shen Lan had already prepared everything. He knew about the approaching conspiracy, so he decided to take control of the situation while it was still possible. 
It was likely that the king would not want to execute Lai Wenzhen, so he had to prepare a backup plan. Shen Lan sent Jin Hui with a few dozen people and a huge amount of coins to the capital in advance. According to his investigation, in the year when Lai Wenzheng was a student of Jinxi, he fell in love with one of the beauties of the capital, He Yuan Yuan, who was a famous courtesan. To get close to He Yuan Yuan, Lai Wenzheng even wrote an excellent poem for her. In this way, he wanted to surpass the other men, who were also unrequited in love with a charming young beauty. Lai Wenzheng thought he would win over the beauty, but he didn't know that he didn't like He Yuan Yuan and although he spent the whole night with her, nothing more happened. When he tried to see her again, she would disappear forever behind the massive wide door and out of his life. After the publication of The Wind and the Moon, He Yuan Yuan secretly sent a man to Shen Lan, asking him to write a poem for her, wanting to use it to win the grand prize at the flower gathering, and thus be able to enter the palace and perform at the emperor's mother's birthday party. Shen Lan had heard about her and Lai Wenzheng's story, so a conspiracy was born that was 50-60% sure. First, Shen Lan secretly sold He Yuan Yuan the song When the Moon is Bright so that she could win the flower competition and enter the emperor's palace. He then designed a sumptuous dress and gave it to He Yuan Yuan as a costume for the performance. While performing at the Empress Mother's birthday party, He Yuan Yuan sang a new song prepared by Shen Lan, which instantly enthralled the audience. Finally, Shen Lan bribed an artist to paint the dazzling and delightful He Yuan Yuan in a painting of the Empress Dowager's birthday that evening. Hearing of He Yuan Yuan's talent and seeing her beautiful in the painting, sovereign Ning Yuan Shan took He Yuan Yuan to the palace. Being a famous courtesan, he Yuan Yuan easily won the emperor's favor and made him fall in love with her unnoticed. And at that very moment, the ears of the sovereign reached the story of a past poem by Lai Wenzhen, Beauty Poem. And it is rumored that the man's poem made an impression on He Yuan Yuan and they became close. The king was furious. He felt cheated. So he immediately sent men to investigate Lai Wenzhen's residence and found a picture of the beautiful He Yuan Yuan. Most importantly, a small man full of silver needles was dug up under Lai Wenzheng's bed with the emperor's name written on his face. Lai Wenzheng had once been accused by the crown prince of misconduct, causing him to wait several months for an official appointment. Afterwards, his case flared up again and culminated in Lai Wenzheng cursing the crown prince. To avoid factional strife at court, the sovereign initially planned to quiet the matter and take his time dealing with Lai Wenzhen. Only fire cannot be wrapped up in paper. When the prince's officials heard the news, they immediately tried to find out who was behind Lai Wenzhen. The sovereign made an immediate decision and sent Hai Shui masters to execute the man on the spot without decree or accusation. According to the sovereign's decree, Lai Wenzhen was executed by a thousand cuts. The sovereign's disgust with him permeated to the marrow, so Lai Wenzheng had to die a painful death. The next day, in the Xuanwu County office, Shen Lan rejoiced and kept saying that it was so boring and sad not to have one's equal, and Jin Mulan sat in the chair next to him and read a book. Shen Lan turned to his wife and asked if she wanted the young master to riddle her. Thinking that Shen Lan's riddle would surely prove to be vulgar, she refused, but seeing how upset her husband was, the girl agreed nonetheless. Shen Lan rejoiced at this and gave the riddle a riddle. It sounded like the unsophisticated seeks the gray-haired, the girl sacrifices her heart for good. The same day the heart is born again, and the pure heart remains under the moon. Hearing the riddle, the girl wondered, but before she could answer anything, one of the guards came into the study. He folded his hands in a respectful gesture and turned to his mistress and son-in-law and said that the Taziatsky of Yanshin was absent and that their cavalry had been arrested by his deputy. This man categorically refuses to release the cavalry and claims that he can only do so if Shen Lan personally comes to him and asks him to release his men. Shen Lan asked who this deputy of the thousand was that dared to say such a thing. The guard replied that it was Lin Zuo, the son of Lin Mo, the owner of Jinshu Pavilion. He had just recently passed the Zushin military degree exam and had taken the position of Deputy Thousandman in Yanshan two days ago.
Shen Lang understood who he was talking about and thought that it was a small world after all, but he said aloud that by such actions, Lin Zhu was seeking his own death. Of course, the lowly Deputy Thousand would not dare to go against Suan Wu County, but Lin Zhuo was not like that, simply because he was living off his wife, just like Shen Lan. He became the son-in-law of Wu Zhaochong, Count of Jing'an, and was about to marry the third girl from Jing'an County, who weighed over 130 kilograms. Shen Lan is already a member of the family of Count Suan Wu, and Lin's family was about to have a disaster, so he had to make such sacrifices. However, Lin Zhu did not hesitate. Wu Zhaochong, who is the second commander of the province of Tangnan, commanded a large army and his power is not inferior to Xuan Wu County. Wu Zhaochong retroactively promoted Lin Zhu to deputy Yanshan, and even Yanshan had to pretend that he was away on official business, hiding and trying to transfer. In the lobby of the Thousandth Department, Lin Zhu sat on the chair and said that Wang Lying was so important that he passed the exam when he was 16, also told him that other people are already starting in the capital, and he could only become a minor archivist in Xuanwu, but what now? Now Lin Zhu, influential deputy of the Thousand, and Wang Lying disappeared, probably Liu Wuyang silenced him. At this point, one of the guards came into the room and said that Shen Lan had come to see the Lord. Lin Zhu said for the son-in-law of Xuanwu County to wait for him in the side chamber. In the side chamber, Shen Lan, seeing Deputy Thousand, thought it was the same Un Zhu who was about to be crushed by the one and a half centimeter Wu Yu. Folding his hands in a respectful gesture, Shen Lan said to say hello to Count Jingin from him. Lin Zhu replied that he did not think he could after all. He is just an adopted son-in-law, and his father-in-law is a high-ranking court official. It would just be inappropriate. Shen Lan cut right to the chase, saying that Lai Wenching was dead. Lin Zhu was surprised and wondered how this could have happened. Shen Lan said that the case of the run over people needed to be closed, so he asked for the innocent cavalry of his Xuanwu County to be released. Lin Zhu said that he could not do that because they had committed a terrible crime, and he must find out who was behind it and turn it over to the governor's residence. He said that an interrogation with torture would be arranged tonight. Shen Lan grudgingly asked if the Thousandth Department had the right to torture them. Deputy Thousandth said that the street where Xuanwu County ran people over to death was under the jurisdiction of the Yangshan office of the Thousandth Department. Also among those trampled were soldiers of Thousandth Department, so he suspects murder. In order to restore justice to the men under his command, he must naturally conduct an interrogation. Lin Zhu said of having heard that the leader of the cavalry was a female knight named Jin Jianian. He really does not have the hand to destroy such a flower. Sighing, Shen Lan asked what he had to do to get Lin Zhao to let his men go. Then the deputy thousandth said that there were two ways. The first option is for the Xuanwu County to take his men by force, but that it would be considered treason. The second option is to come to Ling Zhou and ask for forgiveness before his father and bow down publicly. Shen Lan thought that Lin Zhao was so confident because the sovereign considered Count Xuan Wu a thorn in his side. Count Jimin is the warrior of the sovereign and Lin Zhuo is the warrior of the count. He is inferior in status, but still very confident. Although Count Jingen had no fiefdoms or troops of his own, he still had a little capital to challenge Count Xuanwu. But they underestimated the fact that Xuanwu County still had Shen Lan. The son-in-law of Xuanwu County asked if he could come back and give an answer tomorrow. Lin Zhao said that he would allow it and order the firecrackers and yellow paper, and invite guests to see Shen Lan and Lin Zhuo together laughing over past offenses. Outside the Thousand Yanshan Office Shen Lan thought about the fact that as soon as the signal from the Sovereign came, all the enemies of the county would immediately pounce on them and tear them apart. Suanwu County was now ambushed on all sides, but Shen Lang had found a way to get around this situation without much effort. Wang Lian's Secret Room Wang Lian, whom Lin Zhuo had thought of hundreds of times, was not dead and was now squirming in pain in a fit of rage.
Shen Lan didn't let the rabid dogs tear him to death. It was just that the rabies attacks were so excruciating that he was barely surviving on only the painkillers that Shen Lan was preparing. As soon as Shen Lan entered the room, Wang Lian rushed to him and begged him to save him and give him painkillers. Shen Lan said that he had brought him the remedy, and from tomorrow, the amount of the drug will increase by three-tenths, which will allow Wang Lian to live for five days without seizures, but that he will have to take the medicine again, which will delay the penetration of poison in the brain. But for that, Wang Lian would have to do something for him. Wang Lian said he was very grateful and would do whatever the young master needed. Wang Lian took his medicine, and Shen Lan said that his old friend, Lin Zuo, had returned. He has become the son-in-law of Count Jingen and is prosperous, but he misses Wang Lian very much and has sent men to look for him. Since he wants to see him so much, why not surprise him and meet him, for it is not uncommon, when the two are in love, to drink a little too much in the evening and bite his neck, and then, cuddled up, fall asleep. He asked what Wang Lying thought of this, and he thought Shen Lan was still just as intimidating.